This film is purely fictional. Please do not imitate it. Your like and subscribe are the motivation for me to update. Chapter 1 Prologue In the dark room. Only the large monitor shone brightly. On a boring night in midsummer. The low background sounds intertwined with the chirping of cicadas outside the house. But instead gave off a strange feeling of tranquility. Lines of text appeared quietly on the display. Like inscriptions burned into the soul. You lived in Barclay. A distant landmass southwest of Pender. Your father was. A knight. Life was good when you were a kid. Your father was a weapons master and was often employed as a result. He has extraordinary martial arts and patiently teaches you all the skills and you become a master with swords and lances. Your father was rough, cold, but fair. Your mother was a minor noble in Pinder. She almost never mentioned her past, but she revealed the first time she met your father when your father rescued her from being kidnapped. Your father only mentioned the knighthood he once belonged to once and that was when he was drunk. He said that the knighthood was exiled by the Lion King, but he refused to answer any questions about the order, or even its name. He said he would rather never mention it again. During your teenage years, you had little free time because of your father. You are away from home all year round, and you have to live alone. As a boy who grew up on the streets, no matter what he did, he had to survive. You beg, steal and work for the gang to earn supplies. Surviving day in and day out in a violent world, often just a stone's throw away from the boundaries of the law and malicious people. In a life that seems to be unchanged, you have ushered in new changes. You have a chance to be a bounty hunter. Things never stay the same. You grow as a man under the guidance of some force. And the whole world around you seems to change. You don't want to be like the rest of the people who work hard just for a small profit. You make a living in those hidden corners and earn wealth secretly outside the damn law. You rely on your own skills to do some less than legal transactions and occasionally do some stealing or robbery. These dangerous businesses can be very profitable. But as fate would have it, everything suddenly changes, and you have to leave Buckley for Pender because you have received news of the death of your parents. Their deaths were so sudden and violent, and the identity of their killers remains unknown. Countless enemies also want to kill you, and the Lord even issued a wanted order for you. You have no choice but to leave Buckley and go to Pender in order not to be found by those evil thieves. You took your father's sword which was a family heirloom that was enough to protect your body and reputation. Booked a boat ticket to Pendor and left your familiar hometown alone. You decide, based on some of the rumors you've heard about Pender, take one of Fieldsway's merchant ships to Miss Cage City. The display in front of him began to blur, and his consciousness quickly fell into darkness. In his confusion, Leon seemed to hear someone calling his name, but the call was fleeting accompanied by the chirping of cicadas. He insisted and moved his fingers and an option on the display was selected. Then, at the moment when the interface switched, he fell into a long period of darkness. That selected option is Facing life head-on Unable to save or exit Chapter 2 Need to Add Money Fog City As the largest trading city on the west coast of Pender and the capital of the Fieldsway Alliance, Mist Cage City is undoubtedly a vibrant city. The Vibrant social gangs on the streets are enough to prove this point. The streets are crowded with people. The craftsmen are doing a prosperous business. And the artisans, who roam the streets are also doing a good business cutting wallets. The sounds of shouting and shouting are endless. The arena in the center of the city is even more crowded. Perhaps this is the busiest time in the more than 50 years since the city was founded. Because the Lion Kingdom sent a noble mission to Mist Cloud City to form an alliance. For the leader of Vides in the Fieldsway Alliance. Forming an alliance with the Lion Kingdom means that his right to rule is recognized by the upper class of Pinder. This also means that the leader of the alliance will be called King Vides from now on. Enfield Way, a trade alliance built by pirates and stowaways, will also become a kingdom. Therefore, for the major, historical event of the alliance between the two countries, the leader of Vides and the Lion Kingdom jointly held a grand competitive event in Miss Cage City. Moreover, there was a rare improvement in public security. The members of the Red Brotherhood, who were usually seen everywhere on the streets, and sold all kinds of strange drugs and slaves were all expelled outside the city. Leong stood in the lounge in the corner of the top floor of the arena, looking down at the bustling crowd in the city and the missionary motorcade that filled the entire street. He took a long breath and took off the chainmail helmet on his head. This was the first time in months that he took off the protective gear that covered his face in front of others. Because it will be his turn soon. This is a competitive competition of unprecedented scale. You can only wear designated protective gear and weapons. 
and you cannot use your own equipment to compete. For the event co-organized by the two countries, the Lion Kingdom even presented a Pioneer Baron certificate that had not been issued for a long time as a reward for the champion. Becoming a Pioneer Lord may be the only way to achieve class jump in this era of aristocratic rule. But those who usually become Pioneer Lords are also the descendants of nobles. Ordinary people cannot afford the expense and risks of territorial development. Of course, those who can participate in such competitive competitions are usually not ordinary people. Leon is also a special guy. He has been in the arena for half a year. And now he has even become the arena's resident swordsman, always wearing a visor. This was mainly to avoid the eyes and ears of the Red Brotherhood. This large-scale black organization that runs rampant across Pender is sparing no effort to send assassins to hunt him down. In other words, he is hunting down the original owner of this skin, Leon Griffin. And the secondary reason, he wants to make money. Mr. Leon, this is different from the usual petty quarrels. This is a good deal. Behind him, a fat man with a belly of at least 300 pounds looked at Leon with a smile on his face. This is the owner of the Central Arena in Foglong City and the organizer of this event. Leon looked around and saw that there were only two of them in this secret room. A business that lets me lose or let me win. Leon is already used to this kind of business. He has done this kind of business many times in the past six months. And even the face covering helmet comes from this transaction. See the man over there in the red protective gear? He is Master Fauché, the illegitimate son of the Duke of Alma. The boss pointed to the arena below. On the sidelines, a blonde and fair-skinned nobleman was putting on protective gear with the help of several attendants. His neck was probably hurt by the standard leather blouse. The nobleman kicked an attendant in the face and knocked him down. Somersault? Illegitimate children have no inheritance rights and naturally cannot own titles and territories. But it is estimated that this illegitimate son is very popular with the Duke. So the Duke used this method to make it possible for him to obtain a Pioneer Baron certificate for the largest lord of the Lion Kingdom. It is not difficult to go to the wilderness to establish a Pioneer Barony and let this illegitimate son become a Pioneer Lord with a legal fief and title. On the contrary, it is not easy to obtain the development certificate because the country has been invaded by the Bacchus Empire for many years. Many nobles have lost their fiefdoms, with more wolves and less meat. The Lion Kingdom has not issued a new certificate for several years. So, you want me to help that young man win the championship in this competition? No one of the previous games have been in formation. Leon pouted. This kind of formation battle is to divide the contestants into several groups for melee. The last group can all advance. It is the best way for experts to lead their friends to achieve good results. It saves trouble to talk to smart people. Yes, the Duke of Alma is willing to pay a thousand dinars for this. As long as you can take Master Fauché to the finals. The great swordsman he hired before was in the last game. He was injured, and I have to change his formation members. Otherwise it would be too fake. The boss is greasy. That face had turned into a flower with a smile. And he dragged a red wooden box from behind like a magic trick. The box made a dull scraping sound when placed on the wooden floor. Obviously it was not light. The boss opened the wooden box and revealed the gold coins inside. Gold coins. This is the only good thing in the world that everyone can truly love. Its charm exceeds everything else. Leon stretched out his hand and grabbed a handful. Looking at the yellow gold. Feeling the heavy feel. And his eyes were filled with intoxicating light. As if he was holding the hand of a peerless beauty. Atrium. There are a thousand of these stunning beauties which is really hard to resist. Then it's settled. As long as Master Fauché can reach the finals, you can take away this huge sum of money. The fat boss was obviously a qualified businessman. From Liang's eyes and expression, he seemed to see what he looked like when he was young. This guy will probably build an arena in the future. Oh, forget it. Leon looked at the gold coins in his hand reluctantly. Let go and let them slip from his fingers. And then fell back into the box one by one making a crisp sound. Why? This is a thousand. The boss was shocked. He couldn't understand if he could be a few years younger. Well, if he could have Liang's skills, then he would definitely go into battle by himself. One thousand dinars. This is a lot of wealth. Moreover, the illegitimate young master's opponent in the finals probably also accepted the same business. Leon looked up at the fat boss and pointed at the red gold lion flag hanging on the wall of the arena. The championship prize for this competition is a Pioneer Baron certificate. That means that as a knight, I can re-raise the knight's flag left by my father and re-establish the knight's emblem that carries countless glory 
and glory in the continent of Pender. This will be my best opportunity to enter the aristocracy. Do you understand? There was a slight sweat on the boss's forehead. He knew that with the same equipment, the young man in front of him could indeed win the championship. Every game in the past six months has proved this. But then, the fat boss heard a sonorous and powerful sound that took his breath away. You have to pay more. The boss wiped the sweat from his fat face. 1,500 dinars. No more. 1,080. The Duke gave you at least 2,000 dinars. Right? Liang's words made the fat boss break his guard. Okay. Deal dot Mr. Liang. You are really. The fat boss didn't know what to say. He now felt that this kid might be able to build a chain of arenas in many cities in the future. Liang turned back to look at the fat boss and pointed at Fauché, who was jumping around in protective gear on the sidelines. But this guy is really weak. Maybe no one touches him, and he can fall off the horse. You are you sure this guy won't be doubted if he wins the championship? The boss once again wiped the sweat from his bald head. Young master of the Duke's family. So what if others are suspicious? But you yourself? Don't be careless. Your opponent is not weak. You have to bring Master Fauché into the finals. Our deal can be completed. It's just that the fat boss doesn't know that there is an interface in front of Liang that no one else can see. It showed some data that the Pender people wouldn't understand even if they saw it. Iron Bones, 7. Power Attack, 7. One-Handed Weapons, 502. Two-Handed Weapons, 501. Pull Arms, 503. Bow and Arrow, 335. Crossbow, 67. Throws, 53. Chapter 3 Game Controller. Just like Liang's choice in the game. His body is the son of a member of the Destroyed Knights. Life was good when he was a teenager. And he was taught strictly by his father. But the good times did not last long. When he was a minor, his parents often left home and disappeared. So the boy gradually wandered into the streets, making a living by stealing, stalking, spying on intelligence, or taking on some less legal jobs to survive, get close to the Red Brotherhood. But not long after he came of age, his parents were killed. The murderer was unknown. The only thing that was known was that he was wanted by the Lord. And it seemed that the brothers of the Scarlet Brotherhood were determined to kill him. He could only leave Buckley and cross the sea to Pender. But as soon as he got off the ship, he was beaten by Pender's Scarlet Brotherhood. It seemed that Pender's dark forces were also targeting him. He finally managed to escape into the arena. But he was already dying. Just when he was about to burst into tears, Leon, a soul from another world, took over the life of this unlucky guy. Also brought with it is a horse riding and slashing system or a half mounted and slashing system. As a result, Leon, who was seriously injured, miraculously recovered within a few days, and his skills quickly became stronger. Because in the arena, Leon discovered that, just like in the game, Proficiency can be practiced continuously using straw men and arrow targets. Even after every day of chopping practice, he could directly see the changes in his body. The muscles became pliable. The edges and corners became clear. And the originally thin face gradually became harder and more masculine. Since the skin has been being hunted, Leon decided to practice leveling in the arena. Get enough proficiency. And save some equipment before going out. After all, there are people from the Red Brotherhood everywhere outside and Leon feels that his current situation should be completely harmful, and he is facing life without saving. In Pendor, with such a difficulty of 149% total damage, you can't go out alone, let alone being chased. Besides, the game is a game, and you don't die in the game. Reality is much crueler than games. It's safer to be a little cautious. Fortunately, with constant practice, proficiency improves very quickly. Although only half of the writing and slashing system cannot see basic attributes such as strength and intelligence, and can only add points to some personal skills. However, you can still accumulate usable skill points during training, and they are all added to Iron Bone and Power Attack by Leon. With seven strong attacks, seven Iron Bones, and his rapidly increasing proficiency, he can often play match fixing to earn extra money and buy himself some self defense equipment. It also gave him quite a reputation in the arena and he was known only within the arena as the game controller. Whether it was monthly competitions or real sword fights every day, he never won the championship. Only made money. The prize money for the championship will not be higher than that for match fixing. And the championship is too easy to be targeted. For a person who is avoiding pursuit, being famous is not a good thing. However, half a year has passed. 
and Leong, who has accumulated enough equipment, also has plans to leave Miss Cage City. Fog City is too chaotic. Fields Way is a country jointly established by pirates, smugglers, and slave traders. It is the paradise of the Red Brotherhood. This time the two countries jointly organized a competitive competition, and the villains of the Red Brotherhood were temporarily expelled. This was a good opportunity to grab a vote and leave. Of course, Leon also wanted the Pioneer Baron certificate. But after living in this land for half a year, he already understood that even if he got the certificate, it would be difficult for him to keep it. And it would attract more enemies to himself. Unless you have a strong enough force. In any era and anywhere, truth and morality only exist in the barrel of a gun. In the arena, trumpets sounded, the red lion flag and the green bear flag were raised together, and eight players entered the venue. The first set of games has begun. The game is divided into four teams wearing different colored protective gear, with two people in each team. The winning team will advance to the semifinals, and then compete against each other, with the winner advancing to the final. The other eight people in the second group of games will use the same method to determine another finalist. This kind of competition system is obviously providing convenience to some big people who have paid money. Liang's teammate is of course Fauché, since it was a competition co-organized with the Lion Kingdom. This event used the lances favored by the nobles of the Lion Kingdom. The equipment of the contestants is the same. The arena provides ordinary horses, standard lances and short axes. These are the weapons that the Lion Kingdom and the Filswee people are good at respectively. This is also what Liang is good at. But when Liang entered the scene with a lance in hand, his face was expressionless and veins were pulsing on his forehead. Because of Fauché. Before he entered the scene. He tried the weight of the lance and tried to stab it. But he almost lost his waist. So he had to switch to a shield axe. Leong sighed deeply when he saw this and curled his lips secretly. This wooden competition specific lance only weighs 5 kilograms. And can be used by most people. Clearly Fauché does not belong to the majority. Compared with the tough and strong Leong. This young man looks extremely weak. The greasy white fat on his body does not bring him much strength. It seems that it is difficult to even lift the shield with one hand. I am in good spirits. And I plan to charge forward when I see my opponent. Leon resisted the urge to curse. Looking at Fauché's shaky riding posture. He knew that if he really got up. He would probably be killed by a knife. But this guy doesn't know how much he weighs. Although wooden guns were used in this competition. Dangers existed. In fact. People often died in the arena. Especially when competing with lances. After all. Pindor has a well-known saying that all men are equal under lance. There are only two ways to get someone out of a competitive game. Either by throwing down their weapons and surrendering. Or by being beaten until they lose their fighting ability. And this illegitimate son doesn't look like the kind of smart person who would surrender rationally. The price I asked was still too low. And the difficulty was much higher than I thought. So Leon leveled his lance and stopped Fauché. Don't move yet. Wait until they start fighting first. As he spoke, he took Fauché's horse's rein and took a few steps back, intending to avoid the sight of several groups of opponents on the opposite side. Fauché was a little dissatisfied, and the drake screamed, Are you scared? Bastard! You are actually scared! Leon almost didn't stab the ungrateful guy with a gun in his hand, but he still held back his anger for the sake of Dinar. You have to have some tactics. Mr. Fauché! Real masters win the game with wisdom. Only wild boars only charge when they see people. Fauché also stopped. Probably because he felt that he couldn't at least be a wild boar. He looked at the opposite side and asked Leong. Ben, what is your tactic? The tactic is, you go and hide under the flag of the fierce lion first. And I will charge over and kill one or two first. Leong stared at the opposite side of the arena intently. But found that other players were already fighting together. The tactic was naturally, with the battlefield changing rapidly. It was time to charge. Fauché stared at Leong and rolled his eyes. Okay, Mr. Wild Boar, let me watch your performance. Fauché was blocked for a while, and now his blood was probably gone. He muttered some not-so-elegant words, and moved to the edge of the arena under the golden lion flag with a red background, sitting on a horse just about the same height as the flag, wearing red protective gear and blonde hair and a golden beard. Fauché instantly had a layer of protection, and you could hardly notice him unless you looked carefully. That's right. Only when your employer doesn't do bad things can you make money with confidence. Leon went back in a circle. And after the horse picked up speed, he raised his lance and charged towards the battlefield where shouts continued. With a whistling wind in his ears, Leon had already rushed through half the field. 
one of the people in the melee noticed him and raised his shield to greet him. The opponent's speed is not enough. But the spear has obvious retraction. And it seems that he is going to fight for accuracy head on. But Liang didn't intend to risk his life. He led the horse in a different direction and avoided the man. He held his spear level and rushed directly into the crowd in the melee. His real target now had his back turned. Pong! After a terrible muffled sound, an unlucky guy was thrown directly from the horse and fell to the ground unconscious. The lance charge hit the center of the back. And this guy was clearly out of the game. The entire audience burst into cheers, as the aristocratic men loved this kind of violent scene the most. Chapter 4. Play the most fake. Lose the most real. The tip of Liang's lance also broke off. He simply raised the lance and threw it in the direction of the crowd, using the lance as a spear thrower and disrupting the battlefield. Then, he drew out his hatchet and rode his horse around behind the guy holding the shield. The opponent turned his horse half a circle and planned to defend and counterattack. But Leon quickly got close to him. The fighting distance is too close. And there is no speed blessing. Obviously, holding a three meter long lance has no lethality. But just as he was hurriedly changing the axe, Liang's attack was already in front of him. Boom, boom, boom. The opponent's skill was still very good. He blocked several attacks with his shield in a hurry. But he didn't notice that the players from the other team behind him rushed towards him and shot him. This was exactly the same as Liang's behavior just now. Except that the sprint speed was not that fast. I just didn't poke anyone away. Leon stretched out his hand. Snatched the lance from his opponent, who was slowly falling. And walked away from him again. Now, there were two people in one team. And only one person in the other two teams. The battle naturally turned into two teams fighting one. While Leong and Foshe were watching the show on the other side of the field. The audience booed at this moment. Obviously booing Leon. But the fat boss and another blonde old man in the box upstairs clapped softly. The fat boss stood to the side and was respectful. It was obvious that the blonde old man was Marshall's father. The Duke of Alma. This kid is quite smart. He has black hair and black eyes. Where is he from? Duke Alma seemed to have some appreciation in his eyes. The fat boss smiled and replied. The adventurer from Buckley is said to be the descendant of a certain knight. Although his black hair and black eyes look a bit strange. Buckley has everyone. Alma narrowed her eyes. I know a knight with black hair and black eyes. Shouldn't he? He seemed to remember something from the past. Frowned. And tapped the armrest with his fingers. Lost in thought. On the gauntlet. The golden lion emblem trembles with the movement of the fingers. As if it wants to choose someone to devour. The battle in the field was coming to an end. And at this time. Two more unlucky guys fell in the field. As for the remaining two opponents, one of them had some injuries and seemed to be unable to ride a horse. Liang then called out to Foshe and charged again. Foshe, holding his shield, rode towards the injured unfortunate. The opponent also rushed toward Liang with a shield and a gun. He was obviously a brave man and knew that as long as he solved Liang, he would probably win the battle. After all, Foshe, a rookie who can see through at a glance, is really not worth mentioning in the eyes of experts. The two seem to be about to present the scene that the audience loves to see the most. With two knights clashing with each other like a duel. The audience was obviously aroused by such a scene. The whole audience stood up and started shouting. Some people threw flowers into the field. The scene was as enthusiastic as fire. But Leon obviously doesn't like such a famous scene. If there is a slight mistake, he will burp. And there is a high probability that both sides will suffer losses. Besides, this is a competitive game not a knightly duel that represents dignity and honor. So before the contact, he slightly shifted the angle and then shot the opponent's horse in the head in advance. The position of the horse's head is much further forward than that of a human being, and horses do not block with shields. The expression on his opponent's face changed from determination to shock. The horse only let out a short, extremely painful neigh before falling over, its front hooves digging into the mud. The powerful inertia brought by sprinting at full speed directly through the opponent on horseback far away. Lying ten meters away groaning in pain. Dust was flying and the whole place was silent. Subsequently, the audience booed deafeningly. Obviously very dissatisfied with this obscene style of play without any sense of honor. But Lee raised his head without even looking back. He threw down the broken lance and took out the hatchet again. He knocked down the injured unfortunate guy with the axe before Fauché could do it. Fauché yelled at Leon dissatisfied. What are you doing? Idiot! He is mine! Leon glanced at him and said with ridicule. He was the champion of the last real sword fighting. 
He is best at exchanging injuries for injuries. Most of the people who fought with him were slightly disabled. Fauché glanced behind the man. And sure enough, one of the legs of the man defeated by that guy had been twisted in the opposite direction. The illegitimate young master swallowed and stopped talking. At this time, the horn sounded again. And it was obvious that the opponent, who had been thrown away by the horse, had already surrendered and quit the game. That's a wise, wise man. They advanced successfully. The audience booed louder. But the Duke of Alma in the box clapped and laughed. And seemed to say to himself, This is definitely not his child. He is not so shameless. The most difficult multi-person group melee ended successfully. And the fat boss smiled happily. Because the next semi-final is between Liang and Fauché. In view of the martial arts and acting skills that Liang has shown in the past six months. It seems that everyone is happy. And the dinar seems to have been obtained. Both Liang and Fauché also seemed very relaxed. After all, they both felt that they could get the results they wanted. During the intermission, Liang found the fat boss again. Are there any bets in the next game? The fat boss was stunned for a moment. Of course. It happens in every game. The maximum acceptance for the next game is 200 dinars. But the contestants cannot buy themselves into losing. Then dot how much can you earn by buying Fauché to advance now? Leon rubbed his chin. His eyes filled with glittering gold coins. There are many people who will win by buying you. Therefore, you can earn at least 500 dinars by buying Master Fauché. Leon frowned. That's it? It's easy to see the details of that idiot. Right. I thought it would be at least 5 to 1 for 1. The fat boss shrugged. But everyone in the arena bought you to lose. Which offset a lot of odds. In the past 6 months. Who doesn't know that Mr. Leon has never won the championship. And played the most fake game after every semi-final? The truest loser. Leon grinned. Then you bet 200 for me. I won't take the winnings. How about giving me your Alice? Otherwise, Fauché may not win. The fat boss looked at Leon who was blatantly blackmailing him, with a look of disbelief in his eyes, and then turned into deep admiration with a long sigh. Such a shameless person is even worse than he was back then. This young man is sure to become an arena tycoon across the continent. Okay, I can't ride her now anyway. Alas, my beloved Alice, you have to be nice to her. The fat boss, who weighed more than 300 pounds, looked down at his belly. From the angle of his sight, he definitely couldn't see his feet. Alice is a beautiful golden maned horse. And Leon has been interested in her for more than a day or two. Chapter 5 My Dinar How lonely it is to be invincible. Seeing that everything was going well, Leon went downstairs humming a song. The semifinals were about to begin. The format of the semifinals is foot combat with two-handed sword confrontation. On the one hand, this can add some entertainment. On the other hand, the fat boss probably took into account Fauché's poor riding skills and strength, which is obviously not suitable for a lance duel. Just like Leon said, what if he falls off his horse? But what is unexpected is that in this semifinal, which everyone thought would be unsurprising, something went wrong unexpectedly. Fauché originally acted very bravely, charging towards him with his two-handed sword and slashing randomly, while Leon was also very cooperative in blocking on the left and right, as if he was retreating steadily. But unfortunately, in the last game, the horse that was stabbed by Leon dug a hole before falling to the ground, causing Fauché to miss the mark and twist to the ground. What's even more unfortunate is that when Fauché stepped into the air, he happened to be performing a full-strength slashing action. As a result, not only Leon, but also the audience who were closer to the sidelines heard a crisp bang sound. Then Fauché dropped his sword and cried in pain while holding his feet. At this moment, it was useless for Leon to pretend to lose. Because the only weapon in this game was the two-handed sword. In any battle or competition. Throwing down all weapons has only one meaning. Admitting defeat. The entire audience. Including the Duke and the fat boss in the box. As well as Leon himself. Remained motionless. Staring at this strange scene in stunned silence. It wasn't until the attendants came in and carried Fauché away who couldn't stand up. That the fat boss announced with a sad face that Leon had advanced. My dinar. Leon didn't feel the joy of a winner at all. And there was a wail in his throat that would make a devil's heart tremble upon hearing it. He just felt that countless small coins had grown wings and left him. And together with Alice, they flew into the distance. Well, I can't blame you. Who knew something like this would happen? The fat boss was also very frustrated. As the undertaker, he would obviously lose countless small sums of money. 
and he would also have to bear the wrath of the Duke of Alma. Fortunately, the Duke of Alma is the Duke of the Kingdom of Lions, so it will not determine the life or death of this field's weight businessman. If I win the championship, can I return the Pioneer Baron certificate to the Duke of Alma? Leon was thinking about how not to anger a powerful prince. The fat boss shook his head. This is a reward issued by the House of Lords on behalf of the king. How can it be given to others casually? Besides, Fauché's leg is twisted. There is no point in getting a pioneer certificate for a cripple. The Duke of Alma has also left. Already, Leon shook his head and looked at the fat boss. Forget it. Bet on me to win the championship. Bet as much as you can. The fat boss stared at Leon. The opponent in the final is Lord Lehman of the Lion Kingdom. The famous Lion Knight in the whole continent. Now that there is no agreement with Master Fauché, Sir Lehman will definitely go all out dot end. And what? The fat boss sighed heavily. The Duke of Alma requested that the final be changed to a costume duel. And that he must use his own equipment to fight. There is nothing to say about your skill. But the equipment of the Wild Lion Knight is much better than yours. This is not it's a competition. It's a battle. You might get killed. Leon gritted his teeth and thought about the small amount of money he had lost. If he couldn't win this game, all his savings from the previous bets would be in vain. Moreover, according to the habits of these nobles, as long as they fail to achieve their goals, they are already considered sinners. Judging from the bad temper of the illegitimate young master, he had probably been angered. The Duke of Alma himself will most likely not come forward in person. But those licking dogs who plan to curry favor with the Duke will definitely try their best to kill themselves. When the Duke of Alma asked for a duel in uniform, he was planning to kill himself. So now we can only win the championship. Get the Pioneer Baron certificate. And before the danger comes, run to Lion City to complete the registration and obtain the status of Pioneer Lord. The status of Reserve Baron can block the danger on the surface. Nobles will not kill people openly, but will only do evil things secretly. As for the secret ones, let's talk about it then. Although there may not be a road until the car reaches the mountain, at least we should get over it first. Do you really want to buy yourself a win? The fat boss felt that he had to re-examine this young man again. Leon nodded. I can still spend 500 dinars. My odds should be very high this time. Right. The fat boss nodded. You pay 5 to 1. Not many people think highly of you. Leon. No matter you win or lose. You have to leave here. Be careful all the way. Leon took a deep look at the fat boss. Stepped forward and hugged his round belly. Thank you for taking care of you these six months. Andrew. In return, I should help you solve some problems. If I win, the money I win will be it's all yours. Just give me the group of Menenheim prisoners of war and Alice. And treat them like I bought them. Dot those guys are serious Menenheim swordsmen. They are worth much more than this money. The fat boss was obviously unhappy. But you can't control those Menenheimers. Can you? Rather than letting them waste food, you might as well sell it to me. That group of swordsmen from Menenheim were very powerful. A dozen fellow villagers gathered together to hug them. Boss Andrew had nothing to do with them. These guys were attacked by pirates at sea and were captured after falling into the sea. They were not afraid. Die. Refusing to do anything after being sold into the arena. As a result, Boss Andrew could only watch helplessly as these strongmen lay around all day long. And without food or drink, they continued to cause trouble. The arena would not be able to handle these guys for a while. And a lot of manpower had been lost for this. Okay. I hope you can win. Andrew thought about it. Struggled for a while. And finally agreed. The final horn sounded. And Leon once again put on his chainmail face covering helmet. He was wearing a fairly good set of light chain armor. Which he had acquired in exchange for a costly failure a month ago. He held an old knight's sword in his left hand. Which was a relic of the original owner's father. The coat of arms on the hilt had been smoothed. But he did not hold a shield and held an ordinary lengthened lance in his right hand. The mount is a common black traveling horse. His opponent, Sir Lehman, was covered in silver plate armor, and the full set of equipment of the Lion Knights was far beyond that of ordinary warriors. The long red tassels on his helmet marked him as an undefeated knight. The lion steel shield and heavy lance in his hands are very intimidating, and he also carries a giant silver-plated broadsword on his back. Just looking at the appearance makes him feel murderous. The horse is also covered in heavy armor covering its entire body. The wild lion emblem on the horse armor and coat is intimidating. The equipment gap is too big. No matter how you look at it, it is a one-sided competition. But Leon didn't feel like he had no chance of winning. 
because under the lance, all living beings are equal. Chapter 6, I really don't want to win the championship. Sir Lehman was obviously a neat guy, and he started charging as soon as he came on the field, getting faster and faster. The long tassel on his head fluttered backwards with the charge, and the armored cavalry came towards him, bringing a permeating sense of oppression. Leon accelerated his horse diagonally, got out of Lehman's charge, and started to circle between light armor and heavy armor. The difference in weight, potential energy, and defense power between the two sides is too great. Hedging is equal to death. He could only rely on his light equipment, light load, and agile horses to constantly avoid Lehman's aggressive charges and thrusts. The two horses began to chase and escape, and occasionally, when they approached each other, their relative speeds were not too fast. The spears that were thrust at them were all accurately deflected by Leon with his sword and spear. Liang's successful blocks again, and again, made Sir Lehman realize that this young man has superb skills, and must sprint with a heavy gun at a high speed in order to defeat skill with force. As a result, Lehman charged at full speed again and again. The lance supported by high speed could not be blocked and could only be dodged. After one thrilling dodge after another, Leon finally heard Lehman's horse begin to breathe heavily. He began to consciously distance himself from Lehman, leaned down slightly, and raised his lance as an invitation to fight. This is an invitation to a knight's duel. The stands that were originally filled with boos finally burst into applause. It seems that this slippery young man is finally going to face off. Lehman charged forward again, and Leon led the horse slightly diagonally, maintaining a slight angle and charging towards him. He didn't want to repeat his old tricks. Lehman's war horse was wearing heavy armor, and was not that easy to break. He just wants both sides to be on Lehman's backhand position when the two horses cross. This is a backhand position for two people holding guns with their right hands. It is easier to maintain balance when holding a gun with a backhand. This is a normal way of dueling. But at this moment, Leon suddenly bit the sword in his left hand and handed the lance to his left hand. He doesn't hold a shield. So it's easy to change hands. Moreover, he controlled the path of the two horses within a distance that could not be stabbed with his backhand. Just a little distance makes me grow an inch longer and an inch stronger. The expression on Lehman's face is wonderful. He didn't expect his opponent to be able to do this. Looking at the stability of the gun tip, it was obvious that Leon was also good with a gun with his left hand. That's for sure. After all, the more than 500 proficiency levels don't distinguish between left and right hands. But Sir Lehman is not left-handed, and he cannot change his hands to fight. He can only keep the horse as close to Leon's route as possible. However, the war horse, which had been sprinting for several rounds in pursuit and escape circles, was already tired and could not react so quickly. Moreover, in this kind of high-speed hedging, the two sides get close to each other only in an instant. Liang's left-hand lance has been tilted out. Raymond knew that he couldn't stab Liang with his backhand at this distance. So he simply raised his shield to protect his head and planned to carry it over. But to his surprise, the lance did not hit the shield. Instead, it hit his abdomen and there was an obvious upward movement. Boom! Hey dot hey! A huge lance cracked, followed by the sound of heavy iron cans and weapons falling to the ground. Sir Lehman was knocked off his horse by a shot, but the armor's defense was really good, except for a slight dent in his abdomen. No other external injuries were seen. The moment the lance broke apart, Leon let go and threw away the lance, took off the sword in his mouth, and began to turn around. He didn't choose to attack his opponent's fully defensive face. He just wanted to knock his opponent off his horse. If you fall off a horse while wearing 70 or 80 kilograms of plate armor, it is almost impossible to get back on the horse without help. And the damage might be higher than just slashing the opponent a few times. Liang's equipment is okay against light armor. But against the plate armor of the Mad Lion Knight, the long sword and wooden gun are basically only enough for scraping. Therefore, Lehman, who was knocked off his horse, did not admit defeat. He groaned and got up, spat out a mouthful of bloody saliva, took off the two-handed sword on his back, and assumed a fighting stance again. However, Leon had already turned around on his horse and made a circle. He leaned over and lightly picked it with his sword. Just a few steps away from Lehman, he picked the lance that Lehman had dropped into his hand. This was obviously premeditated. Sir Lehman shook his head, smiled bitterly, and coughed crazily. After coughing up a mouthful of bloody phlegm, he dropped the giant sword, took off his helmet, and slowly walked out of the field. Jazz gave up. There was a roar from the entire audience. 
and they seem to be even more unable to accept this fact than Sir Lehman, this mad lion knight, who has gone through hundreds of battles without a single defeat, actually gave in? Sir Lehman knew his stuff, after his opponent got his lance. Although he was unwilling to do so, he had no choice but to admit defeat, wearing heavy armor and fighting on foot. It was difficult to avoid a lance charge. Not to mention that he did suffer some internal injuries when he fell from the horse. His own heavy lance is not a one-time consumable item like the Aang's that breaks with a poke, but a tough battlefield gun. Even if he wears the toughest plate armor, he will die if he hits it. The entire audience was silent as they watched Lehman walk out of the field. But soon, there were applause and boos. Obviously, the David and Goliath drama satisfied the audience's mentality. But the losing bet also made them angry. This seemed to be a final that most people were not happy with. Leon, who won the championship, was not happy at all. He really doesn't want to win the championship. Because after winning the championship, he must show his face in front of everyone. The black hair and black eyes are very eye-catching and pander. And the eyes of the Red Brotherhood must have discovered him. Besides, there is no prize money for the champion this time. Moreover, he has to go to the House of Lords of Lion City in the center of the continent to cash in on the rewards of this game. Only after registering with a pioneering baron certificate can he become a pioneering lord to be inspected. This journey of thousands of miles is likely to be very dangerous. Outside the cell on the bottom floor of the arena, the fat boss Andrew handed a parchment to Leong. Those Mettenheimers are inside, and they are not easy to control. Leong nodded and entered. He urgently needs some soldiers now. This was originally a place used to hold gladiatorial slaves and the heavy door was extremely strong. There were more than a dozen shirtless muscular men inside, with an average height of nearly two meters. Andrew bought them originally with the intention of making them a cash cow for the arena. Unfortunately, these strong men were not very obedient and were very active in eating, but never got anything done. Andrew sent someone to teach him a lesson, but ended up losing a lot of thugs. I planned to starve them a few times, but these guys ate all the lions and alligators in the arena. Now it seems that those lions and crocodiles have brought them sufficient nutrition. And all of them still look like macho men with big shoulders, round waists and muscular bodies. At this moment, these tough men were sitting or standing close together, looking like a mountain of meat. If muscles are a sin, then all of these people are probably guilty. Chapter 7 The Great Swordsman of Medenheim These muscular men come from Medenheim, a remote land covered with volcanoes. It was a former colony of the Buckley Empire. It became a famous, mercenary camp, after Count Medenheim led the army to resist the war and gained independence a hundred years ago. There are many Medenheim mercenaries, who come to Pender to make a living. They rarely use shields and prefer to fight on foot with two-handed heavy swords. They don't ride horses. And there are rumors that this is because their horses' faces remind them of their yellow-faced women. But in fact it is because the rugged terrain of Medenheim is not suitable for riding horses or forming cavalry regiments. So they don't know how to ride since the country is dotted with volcanoes and iron mines. Medenheim's metallurgical technology is quite advanced, and the heavy armor and two-handed swords they forge are top-notch goods wherever they are placed. But in the eyes of the nobles of Pendor, the Medenheimers are still just a group of barbarians. Although they are brave and fearless as mercenaries, these tall and rough infantry warriors do not conform to Pendor's knightly aesthetics. At this moment, these dozen strong men were all staring at the black-haired young man in front of them with contempt and ridicule in their eyes. Leon is 1.8 meters tall. The past six months of training have given him strong muscles, and he is already an outstanding hunk in Ponde. But standing in front of this group of strong men, it was like a little chicken mixed in next to a group of big geese. Guys, you are my people now. Lee raised the parchment in his hand. Who is your leader? These strong men acted as if they had not heard anything, and the mocking look in their eyes became even more obvious. Uh-huh. No one can talk? It seems that you prefer to be slaves rather than real warriors. Leon didn't want to waste any time, and directly greeted Andrew outside the door. Let's go. Lock the door, and look for someone later. If the noble lady sells them, she will get a good price. A Mettenheimer pushed aside his companions, stood up, and stared at Leon fiercely, compared with other big men. This man is not too tall. He is about 1.9 meters tall, and he is considered short among this group of Mettenheimers but the muscles on his body were surging, which made Leon, who was originally strong, look very thin at this time. This macho man is probably twice as heavy as Leon, but his walking posture does not appear cumbersome, but rather light. 
He is obviously a master who balances strength and flexibility very well. What kind of warriors do we want to be? If we fight as mercenaries, we will die without complaint. But if we go to the arena to fight wild beasts and let others enjoy themselves, we would rather die. There was a scar on his forehead that cut diagonally across half of his face. The sound was as harsh as metal friction, but extremely clear. It fit the characteristics of a junior captain who often gave orders on the battlefield. This was obviously the leader of the group. Well, if you can still make sense, then that's easy to say. And if you have a sense of honor, that's even better. I bought you, of course, so that you can fight for me as mercenaries. I will even pay you for it, of course, maybe a little lower than the market price, until I recoup the cost of buying you. Leon stared into this man's eyes and said seriously. Scarface also stared into Liang's eyes and listened carefully and nodded. Of course you can be a mercenary as long as you have food to eat. It doesn't matter what the reward is, but I can't let my brothers fall into a fatal battle again. I won't do it again. Let them follow a coward who is not worth relying on. Unless you can prove your ability. Buckley man. It seems that this group of people once followed an unreliable employer, which led them to this situation. And their country's history led them to have little affection for the Buckleys. Leon thought for a while and looked at the scarred face. Who is the most skilled among you? We can decide in a more fair way. Scarface remained expressionless. A fair way? What do you mean? Leon grinned. Swordsmanship. Let the two-handed swordsmen of you Mendenheimers decide. If I win, you will follow me and swear allegiance. If I lose, then I will let you go and give you freedom. How about that? The scarred face grinned and the coldness in his eyes receded a lot. What a good idea. There are not many mainlanders who can compete with the great swordsmen of Mendenheim with two-handed swords. Leong turned to look at Andrew outside the door. Do me a favor and find some two-handed swords. The most indispensable thing in the arena is weapons. Although they are all crudely made goods, most of them are very strong and durable, and are more than enough for martial arts competitions. Not long after, several boys came over carrying several weapons. Scarface bumped them one by one with his hands and chose one of suitable weight. He nodded to Leong and raised his sword in a swordsman salute. Great swordsman of Mendenheim. Close. Leon. From Buckley. Leon didn't even choose. He picked up a sword and saluted to indicate that he was ready. In fact, Leon was already secretly happy. This guy was actually a great swordsman. He was a real elite. The room was very spacious. And a big sword was enough to be used. A group of people stood in a circle at a distance. Leaving the open space in the middle for the two people who were about to compete. The two stood opposite each other about five steps apart, lowering their center of gravity at the same time, holding swords in both hands and pointing diagonally at the ground beside them. Then they took a step forward at the same time, blocking the distance. Close raised his sword and stabbed lightly to test, but Leon didn't blink and allowed the sword to stab his eyes, and then watched Close take it back like lightning. This was Close's feint to attract him to take action, but Leon did not take the opportunity to take action. Instead, he firmly stuck his position and moved forward half a step. He is much shorter than his opponent, and his wingspan is shorter than Close's, so he has to keep the distance relatively close first. Close also took half a step back. He was an experienced swordsman. The scar on his forehead that penetrated his face, but was not fatal also proved that he was a master who was good at taking advantage of his body. But after retreating, Leon leaned forward extremely suddenly, swung his sword with his backhand to block Close's block, and then got close to within one step. This distance was no longer suitable for a sword. And a dagger was more suitable. Close could no longer keep the distance. Because the two swords were crossing their sides and wrestling. This happened to be an awkward position where neither of them could use their strength. Whoever backed down would lose the opportunity. But Leon suddenly turned sideways and raised his hands. After a short but heart-wrenching sound of the blade rubbing, the sword hilt accurately hit Close's chin. All this happened in a flash of lightning. Andrew, who was standing a little further away, didn't even see the movements of the two people clearly. He only saw that Close was knocked back a few steps as soon as they made contact. Close, who took a few steps back and almost fell, regained his feet, grinned and rubbed his chin, his face extremely gloomy. Chapter 8 Pirates Close is a battle-hardened warrior who has been between life and death many times. He has never underestimated any opponent. But he never thought that he would be defeated so easily by a Buckley man. 
and it was with the two-handed sword that he was most proud of. Using the hilt of a sword to attack an opponent is not an uncommon move. But what is difficult is that it is used so casually and naturally, as if the sword has become one with the opponent. But it was obviously a low-quality sword picked up by the opponent at random. It was obvious that this mainlander was a true master of swordsmanship, and his understanding of strength, technique, distance, and position were far superior to his own. As a great swordsman, he knew that after he was knocked back by the hilt of the sword, his opponent would have plenty of time to rush up and chop him down with a sword. But the opponent just stood there and waited, waiting for him to rest for a while before continuing to fight. The opponent's confidence in victory is also greater than his own. Close had only seen people with this kind of swordsmanship and confidence in victory at the same time in the Medenheim Death Squadron. They were all old swordsmen and veterans who had been immersed in swords for most of their lives. But the young man in front of him looked to be 20 years old at most. Even if he had been practicing swordplay since his mother's womb, he shouldn't have such skill. Besides, a mainlander with such sword skill should have become famous long ago. Close lowered his head, looked at the bulging muscles on his arms, and then looked at Leong, who was nearly half the size of himself. What determines victory or defeat is not necessarily technology, but also strength. And talking about strength, Close felt that the difference in body shape between the two was fully demonstrated. Although it would be disgraceful to challenge again under such circumstances, Close decided to try again for the sake of the freedom of his tribe. He raised his sword and lowered his head. After saluting again to express his apology, he swung the sword in his hand like a windmill. This is a sacrificial fighting method that follows the movement of the sword. For a moment, there was a loud noise of sword shadows, and Close wielded the giant sword with great strength, truly creating an invincible effect for those who blocked him. If he were on the battlefield, he might be able to use his sword to cut off everything in front of him, whether human, horse, or anything else. But this menacing sword light soon disappeared with a loud boom. Close stared blankly at his empty hands that were shattered by the tiger's mouth, and stared in disbelief at Leong, who was still holding swords in both hands in front of him. Leong just turned and slashed diagonally, and flew the sword in his hand to the side. It looked like a victory of sheer force. The other people in Mendenheim, who were watching also looked incredulous. No one expected that this young man could suppress clothes in a head-to-head -head duel. How could such a terrifying power be hidden under that thin body? This unscientific, heavenly iron god, clothes plopped down on one knee. He knew that the young man in front of him did not surpass him in terms of strength. At most, he was evenly matched. However, this sword slashed diagonally along the direction of his sword. This swordsmanship using force and grasp of timing were the only ones he had ever seen in his life. The cleverness of his opponent's movement far exceeded those of the great swordsmen he had seen. All the people of Medenheim also knelt down on one knee and began to chant their unique gods. And then, Close picked up the giant sword that had been obviously bent into an arc, held it with both hands above his head, and handed it to Leong. We swear allegiance to you, the god of steel. Your sword points at our battlefield. Your Excellency Leong. Leong took the sword, led a dozen big men like mountains of flesh, and led the golden-maned horse out of the arena. Behind him were the fat boss Andrew and several waiters looking at each other with complicated eyes. It's quite complicated because Leong took away those big swords. Although they were just a few crudely made iron swords, the few dozen kilograms of iron alone were worth dozens of dinars. But Andrew obviously had no intention of asking for it back. He knew that Leong was extremely poor now, and he would probably not come back. Besides, those Mettenheimers were not very friendly to him. Moreover, the sight of more than a dozen shirtless men following Leon looked strange, as if he had been summoned by a noble lady to deliver goods. Well, some kind of indescribable business common among nobles. Leon naturally felt that this scene was somewhat weird, but he had no time to think about so many image issues. He had to leave here immediately. Of course, he wanted to take away these big swords. After all, these shirtless men had no equipment at all. This was on the warm west coast. If they were in the north, they would probably freeze to death. So you should seize any opportunity to get some trophies. After all, if these muscular men don't have weapons in their hands, they can't protect themselves. He got these people for his own safety. In Pendor. Except for the dual field. Other places have never advocated one-on-one. -on -one. No matter how skilled he is, he can't stand up to a group fight. The Red Brotherhood, the bandits and heretics everywhere will not challenge him in a one-on-one -on -one fight. Moreover, he had to go to Lion City to register as a pioneer lord to ensure 
that he would not be killed in the street by some nobles. But territory development is not a simple recreational activity. It requires a lot of investment in costs such as equipment, food, and house construction. This requires a huge amount of dinars. But Liang's pocket is cleaner than his face now. And he didn't dare to stay in Foglong City for a long time. If he stayed for a while, some accident might happen. Leon quickly left Foglong City and headed east with this group of newly joined men. But he was quite worried about making money along the way. It's hard to move without money. And I haven't even found the money to go to Lion City yet. But the whole road was deserted. And not even a village was seen. Just desolate hills and forests. Just when he was thinking about whether these tough guys would eat Alice when they were hungry. Chloe suddenly seemed to see something and whispered. Someone dot it's those people. Before Leon could react. A group of Medenheimers entered a state of nervousness as if facing a formidable enemy. And even began to look for bunkers. What happened? Leon was a little confused. It seems to be those pirates. Close explained the situation in a low voice. Weyong City is a natural harbor. And there are many places along the coast outside the city where ships can dock. In fact, the entire Fieldsway Alliance is now a kingdom. Except for some local nobles on the west coast. The other upper class figures were originally pirates. Slave traders and smugglers from Van Scary. But now they are all cleansed. And the former warlords. Gangsters. And illegal businessmen are now lords. So, seeing pirates near the west coast is perfectly normal. But the problem is that they have gone east for more than 10 kilometers. Chloe saw this group of pirates in the valley. This place is 20 kilometers away from the seaside. And there are no towns or villages around it. Then this is a bit abnormal. Why did the pirates come to gather in this useless place? This group of pirates robbed Chloe's employer in nearby waters a month ago. And the employer abandoned them and ran away. Chloe and the others who were unwilling to surrender, had their ships smashed by pirates, fell into the sea and fell into a coma. They were then sold to the nearby Fog Cage City. As we all know, if a business is done and the owner of the business escapes, then generally pirates should avoid the limelight. But the shelter must be in a city or town. After all, only a place with more people can hide people. Unless, this place is a secret stronghold of pirates? The strong men of Mendenham around them were confirming each other through gritted teeth indicating that this was the group of pirates who had made them prisoners of war and slaves, because one of the pirates was carrying their proud weapon, the Mettenheim two-handed sword. But Leong suddenly became excited. On the sea, the van carried pirates truly have few rivals. But now we are on land. It's still mountainous. The group of tough men around him came from Mettenheim, a city whose entire territory is mountainous. Hey hey. Guys, do you want to get your equipment back? Chapter 9 Using Your Skull as a Bowl After seeing their big swords and the opportunity to clear their reputations, the tough men of Mettenheim will certainly not be timid. A group of people sneak closer to the valley. It seemed that this was indeed a pirate hideout. After getting closer, Leon saw a cave. A few pirates were lighting a fire outside the cave, seeming to be cooking soup. The smoke was rising, and the delicious fragrance of wild mushrooms was coming from the fire. Well, as the sun sets, it's indeed dinner time. Liang's abdomen suddenly screamed. And then, like a contagion, more sounds representing hunger came. And the sounds in the stomachs of the strong men in Mendenheim came one after another. They looked at the big clay pot hanging on the fire, their eyes glowing green, as if their desire to eat was far greater than getting back their equipment. Liang suddenly understood what Klo said. As long as there is food to eat. The two shirtless strong men looked really hungry. They raised the crude swords in their hands, and planned to rush forward to fight. But then, they were pulled back by Leong. Leong asked these hungry men to hide behind the mound. And then he dismounted, intending to step forward to inquire about the situation and prepare for a sneak attack. He was actually not willing to do such dangerous work. But why did his subordinates lack equipment? This group of people spent so much money to get it. If there is any damage in the battle here, it will be their own loss. Although my chain armor is not a high-quality product, it has some defensive capabilities. And the chain armor is blue-gray. Which can be used as a protective color in the valley. Therefore, if there is a possibility of a sneak attack, then definitely don't go head-on. But this pirate camp obviously had a hidden sentinel. As soon as Leong touched it and didn't get close, he heard someone above the valley asking, There seems to be someone. Who is that? It was a bad start. And they were discovered dozens of meters away from the cave entrance. I looked towards the place where the sound came from but saw no one. The place where the sound came from was a small forest on the mountainside. 
Of course, it is said to be a mountain, but it is actually just a slope of more than 10 meters high. Liang's hand shook, but he did not draw out his sword. Instead, he pretended to have never seen the world. I, I was passing by here. Can I buy something to eat? After saying that, he spread his hands to show that he meant no harm. Close was still very smart. He was lying behind and saw that Liang did not draw his sword, but was attracting the attention of the pirates. So he led two people around from behind the slope. A pirate holding a light crossbow emerged from the trees on the hillside. He looked at Liang's appearance, glanced around Liang, and then pointed the crossbow at Liang. Several pirates in front of the fire also stood up, drew their weapons, and slowly surrounded him. Liang suddenly felt something was wrong, because no one of these pirates spoke, and their eyes were very wary. The pirate holding a crossbow on the mountainside has been taking aim for several seconds. These pirates were not fooled. Not good. Liang suddenly rolled on the spot and heard the sound of swish breaking through the air. When he looked back, he saw a crossbow arrow piercing deeply into the place where he was standing just now. Kill them! Leon shouted, then drew his sword and rushed towards the nearest pirate. If the sneak attack failed, he would have to resort to force. These pirates were much more vigilant than he thought. One pirate shouted, I'm going to use your skull as a bowl. Several pirates rushed towards Leon. But then, a group of shirtless strong men came out from behind the slope, roared and rushed forward to meet the pirates. The crossbowman on the mountainside was reloading the string. But Close jumped out from behind and cut him into two pieces with a sword. Then Close rushed down from the mountain and rushed directly to the entrance of the cave, just in time to block a group of disheveled guys who heard the noise and came out to check. Leon knew that the Mendenheimers came from a place full of mountains, and they must be very strong in mountain warfare but he found that he still underestimated the fighting power of these strong men from Mendenheim. He could have charged head-on. These Mendenheimers were running like flying on the hillside, and a dozen white shirtless macho men were scuttling around in the mountains, which was dazzling, although they were not wearing armor, and only five of them had swords in their hands. In this mountainous area, the pirates were like a few chickens and were easily defeated by this group of tough men, and they couldn't even run away. Leon could even sit back and watch the show, all he had to do was eat melon seeds. It didn't take long for the battle to end. The pirates completely lost their fighting power. But none of his men suffered any damage. Except for one unlucky guy whose foot was pierced by a sharp stone. The others were basically unscathed. Leon whistled happily. He now felt an unprecedented sense of security. As soon as the battle ended, this group of shirtless men began to drink the fragrant mushroom soup, completely ignoring the pirate corpses scattered beside the fire. Leon curled his lips in disgust, found a clean helmet, filled it with soup, and went into the cave. The sight of these foodies looking so ugly could easily make him think he was in a pigsty. There is indeed some food and ordnance stored in the cave, and many of them are the original equipment of the strong men of Mendenheim. There are some wide infantry hoods, two-handed swords, and infantry hammers. These steel armors have very good defense, but are very heavy. This is the characteristic of Mendenheim's equipment. Rough but practical. However, this practicality is only for the people of Mendenheim. Because these steel armors are all made very wide. They are only suitable for the huge size of the Mendenheimers. Probably because of this. These armors were not sold immediately. They were too big. Most of the penders were not well dressed. And would not be able to sell them for a while. In any case. These dozen shirtless men finally found their familiar equipment. This team finally no longer looked like businessmen. Delivering goods to a lady's house but an army. But Close was still not very satisfied and looked quite ferocious when he inspected the trophies. Leon could probably guess the reason for his bad mood. There were 30 sets of the same armor, but he only had a dozen Medenheimers under his command. There are only a dozen or so pirates here, and most of them have run out of energy. This group of Medenheimers are quite vicious, especially Close, who has basically no survivors. Leon felt a pain in his heart. If he had known that these bastards were so good at fighting in the mountains, he should have sold his chain armor and replaced it with a few blunt weapons, such as infantry hammers. This way the pirates would probably die less. After all, they were caught. Captives could be sold as slaves. But now, the only two remaining prisoners, one lying in the cave. The pirate must have been injured long ago and did not participate in the battle at all. For Leong, this guy is probably useless because he only has one leg and cannot be sold. The other one was a young man whose legs were shackled by iron shackles. He looks quite honest and quite handsome, delicate and pretty. 
Moreover, he was not handcuffed by Leong and his group. He was originally taking care of the injured pirate in the cave. No way. Are these pirates? Leong and Close looked at this handsome young man. They looked at each other. Their eyes were a little unserious. And they obviously thought of something more avant-garde. Chapter 10 The Doctor Who Wants to Be a Knight The poor young man was dressed in shabby noble robes and was obviously a prisoner of pirates. After seeing Leong, he took a long breath and praised the goddess of creation in a low voice. Demaya! Sir! Thank you for saving me! Leong was a little confused. After spending half a year on this continent, there were people from all countries in the arena. He also had some understanding of the gods believed in by various countries. Demaya is not the faith of Fearsway or the Lion Kingdom. Do you believe in Demaya? The goddess of creation? Then you should be a Bacchus. But that should be at the southernmost point of the continent. How come you appear on the west coast? The young man nodded hurriedly, with a smile on his face. Thank you, Demaya. It turns out there are people on the west coast who know about the god of creation. Sir, your friend seems to be injured? I think I can help. You are a doctor? Close also put away his not-so-serious eyes. That's great. I have an unlucky guy here with an injured foot. After saying that, he lifted up the pirate with a broken leg who was lying cowering in the cave, vacated the bed, and turned around and shouted, Colin! Help Samarin! The poor pirate with a broken leg was thrown to the ground and screamed like a slaughtered pig. The young man frowned. Sir! You shouldn't treat a defenseless wounded person like this! Close turned back with a sharp look in his eyes. Kid, you have to know that he is still our enemy. Leon waved his hand in the middle. Okay, okay. Close. Take this poor guy out for a trial first and see if there is any important information. Do you mind checking it for my friend first? Are you looking at the foot injury? Young doctor? The young man looked at the pirates on the ground uneasily. Then at Close and Leon and nodded hesitantly. Close carried the pirate on the ground to the outside of the cave with one hand like a chicken and threw him to the fire. Before the interrogation could begin, the pirate had already started crying. What do you want to know? I'll tell you everything. Don't do anything. Leon drank the soup slowly, found a clean place in the cave and sat down, watching the young man wrap up the injury on the foot of the Menenheim swordsman named Summer. What's your name? Doctor? The young man was very serious when doing things and his methods were quite professional. He replied without turning his head. My name is Anson. I am a student of Bashi City Theological Seminary. Not a doctor. Anson? Leong finally recalled that this name had been in the arena for more than half a year. During the long period of time, there were only training and competitions, and he had almost forgotten many things. Anson came from Ashkaman, a big city in the south, and he was the son of a minor nobleman. However, after losing his fiefdom, his father became a businessman. His family wholeheartedly hopes that he can become a noble priest. They are all loyal believers of Demaya, the goddess of creation. As a result, Anson was sent to the seminary in Bashi City. But like all families, his parents did not ask the young man about his dreams. Anson could not bear the boring chanting and copying in the seminary. He also saw with his own eyes that the clergy showed no mercy to the lower class people and even acted sanctimoniously in front of others, while behind the scenes men stole and women prostituted. He didn't want to be associated with such clergy, so he ran away to find his dream. He still believes in and respects the goddess Tamaya, but he longs to become a knight, a true knight who possesses the eight knightly virtues. He felt that the Knights of the Radiant Cross in Bashi City might be able to fulfill his dream, but unfortunately, he got on the wrong ship in Bashi City, a ship flying the flag of the Shining Cross. The ship took him along the Saba River across half of the continent to the west coast. It was a group of pirates, and the cross flag was just a successful disguise. Fortunately, Anson had learned a lot of medical skills during his years in the seminary, and he became the pirate's temporary doctor, at least until his father paid enough ransom. According to Anson, there were originally about 50 pirates in this camp, but Leong and the others only met less than half because more pirates went to Bashi City again. Anson didn't know why they kept going back and forth to Bashi City, but it didn't look like they were sending a letter to his home for ransom. The pirates didn't ask him to write a letter asking for help, and it didn't take so many people to send a letter. It is precisely because the pirate leader is not here that they will directly attack any stranger they encounter. Then what are you going to do now? Do you plan to go home? Leong asked. He had a good chat with Anson. He was a polite, kind and upright young man. Moreover, 
in Li Ang's somewhat vague memory. This Anson should be the partner he had recruited in the game. However, reality is obviously very different from the game. Anson's face is completely different from the rough modeling in the game. He is extremely youthful and has a few pimples and looks like a high school student. Moreover, you can only meet these companions in the tavern in the game. But Anson appears in the pirate den. Anson shook his head. I have to go to the seminary when I get home. I don't want to go back to the seminary. Mr. Leon. Leon gave a thumbs up in approval. Adhering to one's ideals is a virtue. If you are willing, my team just lacks a doctor. Anson sighed. If possible, I would rather be a knight than a doctor. Thank you for taking me in. Mr. Leon. Leon smiled and looked a little strange. The Knights of the Shining Cross are famous for their medical skills. But I heard that they no longer treat civilians? Are you planning to become such a knight? Anson was stunned and shook his head. No. It should be a knight's duty to treat civilians. No matter what others do. I want to become a true knight. Leon looked at Anson, who was still bandaging the injured meticulously. And finally nodded seriously. A true knight. You will get what you wish for. After speaking, he drank the soup in his hand. Threw down his helmet. Pulled out a piece of wire from the corner of the cave and began to poke at the shackles holding Anson. For a modern person, this simple single spring lock is really easy to open. Moreover, this is also the stunt that Leon Griffin used when he was on the streets as a boy. Tap. A crisp circlip sound sounded. Anson rubbed his ankle and thanked. Thank you, Mr. Leon. Leon stood up with a surprised look on his face. Because his writing and slashing system never gave any prompts. The sentence, Anson has joined your team that he had been waiting for for a long time never appeared. There is still only one great swordsman and twelve Mettenheim adventurers in the team list. And Anson looked at the small piece of wire in Liang's hand with a complicated expression and looked at Liang with a bit of disbelief. Sir, the pirate outside seems to know something strange, but he is only willing to tell the doctor. Close came in and saw his men who had been bandaged and his eyes looked at Anson with a hint of warmth. Leon looked at Anson, but his eyes were a little complicated. Anson walked out of the cave and squatted in front of the pirate. The pirate whispered in his ear for a while, and then looked at him eagerly, his eyes full of desire for survival. Anson was silent for a while, nodded towards the pirate, stood up and turned back to Leon and said, He hopes you can spare his life. Leon grinned strangely and asked the pirate on the ground, You clearly know that I am the leader here. Why do you want to negotiate terms with Anson? He can't make the decision. The pirate bared his teeth and showed what was probably a smile. Because I know he will keep his promise. If you kill me, he won't tell you anything. No one in Pender is a fool. Even a pirate knows what is best for him. Leon looked at Anson. You decide. Future glorious knight. Anson was stunned for a moment. Then he leaned down and saluted with his chest in his arms. Ben, please forgive him. He is disabled and can no longer do evil. Leon nodded and smiled. He heard the long-awaited prompt. Anson has joined your team. Chapter 11 Split Up The news Anson got from the pirate with a broken leg was about a treasure. The news is said to come from a book scribe in the City of Knowledge. These people who deal with old ancient books every day do occasionally make surprising discoveries. But this time, the scribe discovered a big secret. The secret is related to the ancient station of the Griffin Knights that has never been discovered, or an ancient ruin. Those pirates kept going to Bashi City and driving boats to and from the rivers on the mainland just to explore this station. The ancient kingdom of Pender once ruled the entire continent to this day, and the continent is still named after Pender. The Griffin Knights were once the national knights of the ancient Pen kingdom, and they were also one of the strongest knights on this continent. But it is said that 150 years ago, under the conspiracy of the Jata Raiders and Duke Alfred of the Lion, all the Griffin Knights died in Chungha Town. After the fall of the Griffin Knights, the Duke of the Lions stole the country and became king, destroying all the forces loyal to the Pender royal family and establishing the Kingdom of the Lions. The Knights of the Lions who supported him became the National Knights. The Griffin Knights have since been declared an illegal armed force by the Kingdom of Fierce Lions. And the Black Griffin coat of arms with gold background and countless legends has never been seen in the mainland again. And their mysterious location has been buried by the years and no one knows about it. The Griffin Knights, a secret base left by such a legendary force. How many treasures will be hidden there? Just thinking about it makes me feel attractive. The pirates, after a long period of hard work, confirmed that the approximate location of the station was probably 
at the source of a river near Chang'e Town. But there are countless rivers near Chang'e Town. And they haven't found them yet. So they went to Bashi City again, hoping to find any overlooked information from the scribe. Leon understands the mentality of pirates, who are eager to find treasures or obtain a secret settlement. But he scorns this behavior. In order to spend a lot of manpower and material resources to explore thousands of miles for a legendary, mysterious settlement. Is this a pirate or an explorer? Simply not doing his job properly. He just silently wrote down the matter and waited until he encountered a suitable opportunity in the future. The most important thing right now is to go to Lion City to register as a pioneer lord. This team, which has gained a lot of trophies, now has a new look. And its morale and spirit are much better than before. But Leon had to set off alone one step ahead of time. He had to arrive in Lion City before the Duke of Alma and complete the registration at the House of Nobles. This is Anson's advice. As a son of a noble, even if he is not from the Lion Kingdom, Anson still understands the behavior of the nobles better than Leon or Close. Leon can still be regarded as a civilian at best. The knighthood his father belonged to has been destroyed. It may even have been declared an illegal knighthood long ago. Otherwise, he would not have kept silent for the rest of his life. If he arrived at the Lion City after the Duke of Alma or the illegitimate son, then the pioneering baron certificate in his hand would most likely be declared invalid under a few gossips from the Archduke of Alma. King Ulrich must have also hoped that in this way. After all, there are too many nobles. But the territory has never been enough. But this kind of matter usually cannot be solved by a letter or an order from the duke. He must also talk to the king face to face. And the king will issue the order. After all, the certificate issued by the House of Lords represents the authority of the king. Moreover, usually this kind of anger will not lead to any targeted disaster consequences. At least no people will be sent to intercept and kill them. After all, I didn't offend him deeply. I just couldn't fulfill my wish to have an illegitimate child. So it wasn't really any hatred. Therefore, before the Duke of Alma's convoy returns to Lion City, there will probably be no problem in registering as a pioneer lord in the House of Lords. Those who really want his life should be the people of the Red Brotherhood. So the farther away from a chaotic place like the West Coast, the safer it is. Leon felt that what Anson said made sense. So he rode Alice on the road alone and flew through the night. They agreed to regroup near Chang'e Town in order to purchase supplies in Chang'e Town. Leon was not worried at all that his subordinates would abandon him and run away. He could see them in the team panel. This half-baked system that cannot see the basic attributes of characters does not compromise the function of the team panel. Alice was indeed a good horse. At noon on the third day, Leon traveled thousands of miles and arrived outside the Lion City. Lysher City is the capital of the Lysher Kingdom. But its former name was Kavala which was the name of the founder of the ancient Pen Kingdom. It was once the capital of the ancient kingdom of Pander. The city wall is 15 meters high, making it a majestic city that is almost impossible to conquer from the outside. Indeed, the city changed hands three times, each time being breached from within. Although the kingdom of Lion has been in existence for 150 years, from a distance, on the walls of this majestic city, you can still vaguely see the outline of the huge griffin relief. It was only deliberately flattened and then repainted on its surface, in the shape of a lion showing its teeth and claws. But no matter what, the security here is much better than that in Foglong City. At least I didn't see any sneaky little gangs on the streets. The guards at the city gate did not stop Leon, or even let him stop to check. Perhaps they thought that the person who could ride the golden-maned horse Alice into the city must be a nobleman, and there was no need to ask for trouble. This is also the main reason why Leon has always wanted this horse not because of Alice's excellent speed and endurance, but because it sells well. Leon ran wildly in the wide street. The destination is naturally the House of Nobles in the Lion City, the official organization that oversees all noble feet to matters in the Lion City. The House of Nobles is actually not easy to find. This is very inconsistent with tradition. It is said that the Penn House of Nobles more than a hundred years ago was the tallest building in the center of the city, and its high dome can be seen from anywhere in the city. But since the first generation of Lion King, Duke Alfred of Lion, stole the country and became king, the tallest independent building in the territory of Lion has since become the private property of his family, and now it also belongs to King Ulrich. Private property. As for the new noble house, it is hidden in a deep alley on the branch road next to the King's Avenue. It is basically no different from the apartments of the minor nobles. Perhaps this is because there were a large number of documents hidden in the former Pender House of Lords, and they were afraid to be made public. 
perhaps it is to make officials more approachable and reduce corruption. But Leon felt that this was probably because the Lion King did not want taller buildings to appear in the country. Lest anyone become above them. After all, the reason why the country thief became the Lion King was because he was unwilling to be inferior to others. After looking at the towering and magnificent building in the center of the city, which was more than 30 meters high, Leon shook his head and asked all the way along the King's Avenue, and finally found the gate of the noble house. Above the main entrance is carved a solemn-looking goddess wearing a robe, holding a spear in one hand, a coat in the other, and an owl standing on her shoulder. This is the main god of the ancient Pen people and the official god of order and enthusiasm in the kingdom of Lion today. Eudomia. The statue is exquisite, but somewhat incongruous. Originally, Eudomia's chest should have a pendant representing the sequence of the sun and the moon, but this statue replaced it with a lion's head. Even the image of the Lord God has been changed. This ability to flatter someone is obviously extremely high. However, I wonder if the god of order, who has lost the order of the sun and the moon, is still willing to protect the lion kingdom, which is said to have inherited the orthodoxy of ancient Pend. Chapter 12 Cunning is a Virtue Apart from this exquisite statue of the goddess, the House of Lords indeed looks the same as the private residence of the nobleman next to it. There wasn't even a stable outside the door. Leon tied Alice to the stone horse post at the door and stepped onto the steps. A young attendant who straddled the sword door glanced at Leon, walked up to him slowly, and gave him a polite but unenthusiastic smile. Sir, this is the House of Nobles, generally speaking. Those who come to places like the House of Nobles alone are either down-and-out nobles, or those who come to catch up with their relatives. So that smile looks rather perfunctory. Leon Griffin, here to register the fiefdom. Leon took out a scroll sealed with paint from the dirty saddle bag, thought about it and took it back, then took out another piece of crumpled parchment and handed it over. The attendant seemed a little surprised. He raised his eyebrows and took the parchment. While looking at the parchment, he glanced at Leon again. Please come with me, Mr. Leong. After handing the parchment back to Leong, the smile on the attendant's face seemed a little more sincere, but there was obviously a trace of doubt in his eyes. Those who can serve as attendants at the gate of the noble house are usually well-trained knight attendants, the kind who are qualified to carry the swallowtailed flag. In fact, they are all young masters from noble families. Most of them are concubines or side branches who cannot inherit the family business. They learn a lesson called humility here. So, most of the time, they just have that faint polite smile on their face. However, this kind of humility is only for other nobles. Of course, those who dare to register as pioneer lords include those who are either the nephews of great nobles or plutocrats with powerful troops. They are usually very powerful guys. But a guy like Leon who comes alone, who looks neither rich nor noble, but plans to register as a pioneer lord, is very rare. Either he is an arrogant man who is tired of living and plans to die in the wilderness. Or he is the family is powerful but pretends to be low-key. No matter what kind of person they are. In the eyes of these guards, they are the objects of Don't offend and have less contact with them. The attendant led Lee on to the second floor of the noble house and knocked on a wooden door carved with complicated patterns. A calm voice came from the door. Come in! The attendant opened the door, leaned forward to salute politely, stretched out his hand and said, Sir, please come inside. This is a simple room. Apart from the tall bookshelves on the wall, there is only a mahogany desk and two armchairs facing each other. Sitting on the chair facing the door was a thin old man with gray hair. Please take a seat. Your Excellency. The old man didn't even raise his head. He was concentrating on pouring paint on the seal of a parchment roll. Leong sat down quietly, placed the certificate with the lion emblem on the table and waited, watching the old man take off the ring. He used the ring surface to print a double lion shield emblem on the fire paint. Seeing this, the guard outside the door consciously came in and took the parchment with both hands. Is this a reply? Your Majesty the Earl? Right. The old man waved the guard away. Put on the ring again. Filled with a pioneering baron certificate on the table. But did not open it. And looked at Leon with interest. I am Odin. Young man. Do you plan to become a pioneer lord? Leon was stunned. Odin. He had heard of this name. In fact, it was one of the few noble names that Leon could clearly remember. Count Auden Fletcher rose from the Jata grassland in the northeast of the kingdom as a pioneer lord thirty years ago. He built the precipitous brave shield fort on the edge of the Jata grassland. 
using it as a foundation to expand the territory of the Lion Kingdom for hundreds of miles, and blocked many attacks from the Jazz army and the barbarians of the Misty Mountains. On one of these occasions, a lone army of less than 500 men even defended the siege of thousands of Jatta troops. With a brilliant record, it is precisely because of the existence of Fort Brave Shield that the grassland peoples of Jatu are unable to enter the Kingdom of the Lion to plunder on a large scale. This is the benchmark for all pioneer lords in the past 30 years. His name is famous even in Foglong City thousands of miles away. Leon originally thought that such a general with outstanding military exploits should have a fierce and strong image. But he did not expect that he would be so thin and small. And his face was kind and even kind. But why did such a famous general become the administrator of the House of Lords? Young man, I was once a smug warrior like you. But it is actually very difficult to open up a new territory. Very difficult. Seemingly seeing the doubts in Liang's eyes. Odin smiled slightly. I have experienced it and know the difficulties. Of course, I have also received the rewards I deserve. However, when a person gets old, he always something will be different. What do you mean? Leon became even more confused. He felt that something was wrong. Odin smiled even deeper, crossed his hands on the table, stared at Leon with piercing eyes, and spoke directly. The reply I just sent is to my son-in-law Lehman. Lion Knight Raymond? Fieldsway's opponent in the final. Is he Odin's son-in-law? Leon stood up in surprise. Please sit down. Young man, don't be so impatient. Lehman told me about the unexpected situation you encountered in his letter. In fact, he admires your martial arts quite a lot. What's the meaning? Leon felt even more uneasy. I originally wanted Lehman to establish a good relationship with the Duke of Alma, which is related to his future. I think you understand. But Lehman and I are both people who respect the rules. Since the result has been like this, then we will pay tribute to congratulations. But? A but? Liang's heart, which he had just put back in his stomach, was hanging again. Auden showed a weird and mocking smile, and then said, But considering the bad character of Alma's family, I think you may need a little extra help. As an excellent swordsman, Liang's observation skills are very good and will never be inferior to the veteran in front of him. He saw a trace of complicated emotions in Odin's strange smile just now. You have a conflict with the Duke of Alma? Leon keenly sensed the hidden information in Odin's words. Odin was stunned and looked at Leon intently. After a few seconds, he shook his head and sighed. No wonder Lehman said you are a cunning guy. Yes, Alma and I have some differences. You must be able to tell that I don't like staying here with the clerk. As a companion, but Alma recommended me to the king and I couldn't easily refuse the king's trust and invitation. That's right. Unless it's to scare people and recruit them to do things for him. Otherwise, there is no need for Odin to talk such a lot of nonsense. It seems that Odin, a famous general who was supposed to lead the battle, was hampered by Alma's administrative affairs of the House of Lords. Thank you for your compliment. For a pioneer lord, cunning is a virtue. What can I do to help you? Leon started to get straight to the point. Odin also nodded, looked at Liang and praised. Cunning is indeed a virtue. You have two choices. Become a pioneer lord and go to the border to establish your own territory. But it must be near the Long River Forest. Or, become a knight under my command and garrison my brave shield castle. In return, I will give you a village as a knight leader. Becoming a pioneer lord may have a better future. But everything has to start from scratch. Moreover, Chunha Forest is not far from brave shield castle and the surrounding area is very dangerous. Odin probably wants to register his fiefdom as the Chungha Forest. No matter how he expands the territory outside the registered fiefdom, it will not be recognized. Becoming a knight under Odin is the lowest level of formal noble status. It is only a future prospect, and it depends on how far Odin Fletcher's family can go. But in this way, you can get the protection of Count Odin and directly own a knighthood. It's really a hard choice to make. Chapter 13 Shamelessness is also a virtue. Leon was silent for a while, then suddenly asked, If I guess correctly, is Grand Duke Alma playing your territory? Odin's eyes widened in surprise. What a smart boy. Yes, he is competing with me for control of Chang'e Town. And my territory is often harassed by his collusion with gangsters. But I can't escape in the House of Lords. It's a pity that I only have one daughter. Otherwise, I really want you to be my son-in-law. Leon looked at Odin's big nose and small eyes and then at his Mediterranean hairstyle, and felt full of sympathy for Sir Lehman for the daughter born with such a distinguished appearance. 
Fortunately, he only has one daughter. I choose to become a pioneer lord, but I am willing to ally with you. Your Excellency, if you are willing. Without any further hesitation, Leon gave his choice. Auden nodded. Then, I hope you will kill a group of gangsters entrenched there when you pass by Fletcher Village. Gangster? He must be someone from the Duke of Alma. The village of Fletcher was named after Auden. And it was obviously Auden's core territory. It seems that in the private confrontation with the Duke of Alma, Count Auden was at a disadvantage. This probably has something to do with his lack of direct heirs. A new nobleman with no foundation and no son will naturally be missed as he gets older. Since there are bandits destroying the village. Of course, it is my duty. But why don't you let Sir Lehman? Lehman is the deputy leader of the Lion Knights. Before he becomes the grand leader, he cannot have direct conflict with other high-ranking nobles. Odin shook his head, looking somewhat helpless. Leon understood. The Knights of the Lion are a national knighthood, and the Grand Master needs to be selected by all senior nobles. So Sir Lehman needs to maintain a relatively good relationship with the Grand Duke of Alma. Moreover, 150 years ago, it was the Duke of Alma's Horton family who helped Alfred, the country thief, obtain the surrender of the Knights of the Lion. The Archduke of Alma had a high say in the Knights of the Lion. After a few seconds of silence, Leon suddenly grinned. There shouldn't be many people who are willing to offend a powerful prince. Odin seemed to smell something bad and stared at Leon with sharp eyes. But Leon showed a fox-like smile. Probably. I am the best candidate? Or even the only reliable candidate? If that's the case, can you sponsor? Oh no. Lend me a sum of military supplies so that I don't have to deal with it. What difficulties did those gangsters encounter? Auden's tone was no longer gentle. Are you planning to blackmail me? No. No. No dot alone. Just alone. Auden rolled his eyes. Boy, has anyone ever told you that you are a bit shameless? Thank you for your compliment. Leon performed a night salute. Auden was furious. Is being shameless a virtue in your heart? The two began to look at each other. One glared. The other grinned. One thousand dinars is enough. Remember to pay it back. Auden finally uttered a sentence with a glaring look on his face. I will definitely pay it back. I will definitely pay it back. Leon smiled along with him. His attitude was quite good. Auden clenched his fists. His face twitched. And finally opened the certificate on the table. Wrote, Long River Forest. With a pen. And then stamped it with the steel stamp of the House of Nobles. If you are in danger, you can go to Brave Shield Castle or the villages and towns under my rule for help. But similarly, if there is danger in my territory, or when it is inconvenient for some of my people to come forward, I hope you can provide help. You will gain the friendship of the Fletcher family dot, but remember to pay back the money. Okay. It's a deal. In fact, Liang's original plan development direction was the Changha Forest. The meeting places he agreed with Close, and the others were all in Changha Town. The Long River Forest is indeed dangerous. Jatin nomads, Misty Mountain Barbarians, Nolder Elves, and many other forces will appear nearby. But also because it is very dangerous, dark side characters such as killers or heretics rarely appear there. What Leong was worried about was the dagger coming from behind. He was actually not afraid of the battlefield under the sun. When I left the noble house, it was already dusk, and the flaming clouds on the horizon were swallowing up the few lights. Leon has two more things on him. A small emblem of a pioneer lord. And a huge money bag. It was still the smiling young attendant who escorted him out. And the attendant handed him the thousand dinars. Perhaps he didn't expect that Leon came to the house of nobles not only without. Meaning. But instead took money away from the house of nobles. The attendant showed unusual enthusiasm. And even offered to help Leon lift the money bag on the horse. But Leon rejected his kindness. Gold. A big bag of gold. Leong enjoyed the heavy feeling of Jean Z in his arms. He felt basically the same as holding a fairy with a devilish figure. But in fact, the small emblem he put into his arms was far more valuable than this bag of gold coins. It was a silver emblem in the shape of a lion, which represented that Leong had the status of a reserve baron, which was roughly equivalent to the status of a knight. From then on, he could cut off the swallowtail of the flag and become a member of the ruling class. Of course, this requires review and inspection. If the territory is not successfully established, the knighthood will be withdrawn. Years ago, just building a random wooden castle on the border could pass the inspection. But this is no longer feasible. These days, the standards for review have become very complex. 
The land occupied must be outside the national borders. There must be a long-term population living in the territory. And there must be enough troops and buildings to protect the residents. Moreover, there must be a smooth road leading to the territory. And it must be ensured that there are not too many bandits around. After all, the envoy responsible for on-site inspections also has to ensure safety along the way. Leon not. The borrowed 1,000 dinars was actually only enough to purchase luggage and building materials. Most of the trophies obtained in the pirate camp were ones that the pirates had no time to sell or kept for themselves. Only the dozen extra sets of Mettenheim infantry armor were relatively valuable. But the pirates were unable to sell those large pieces of equipment after using them for more than a month. If it fell into Liang's hands, it would naturally not be so easy to cash out. Besides, we have to consider the feelings of the people in Mendenheim. So we can only let close and the others move slowly. After looking at the darkening sky and calculating the distance of close and the others, Leong planned to find a hotel to stay for one night. After traveling for several days, he was really exhausted. Adventurer, hotel or tavern. These days hotels and pubs are one. This seems to be a sign found in most cities and pinned but it is certainly not a chain hotel. After all, the concept of chain stores has only just emerged in the more commercially developed Buckley continent, and Ponde basically does not have this concept yet. When he first arrived in this continent, Leon once thought about opening a hotel chain, but later he gave up the idea because of the inconvenience of being hunted and the terrible security environment in Fog City. Because hotels these days are places where thieves and dynamic social gangs often stay and the Red Brotherhood's killers and slave traders can be found in almost every tavern where they drum up business. Therefore, Leong specially chose this hotel located next to King's Avenue, which he estimated to be relatively safe. When entering the hotel, Leong was also very cautious, not only because he might encounter a killer who wanted his life, but also because he had too much money with him. But, but, whether you are deliberately careful or unprepared, as long as you are unlucky enough, Accidents will always happen. Chapter 14, What Are You Looking At? This hotel is a small wooden building with two floors. The bottom floor is a tavern, which provides catering, with a large bar and many tables and chairs. There were a few drinkers at the bar, drinking and bragging, and there were also many residents sitting on the tables and chairs, which looked very harmonious. But as soon as Leong entered, he met a drunk guy coming towards him with a glass of ale. Although he tried his best to avoid it, the staggering guy still spilled the ale in his hand all over him, and even hugged him. His throat was squirming, and he was about to spit out something. Naturally, Leon pushed the drunkard away as a conditioned reflex, and then stared at the threatening mouth of the other person, thinking about where to hide. The drunk man was stunned for a while, and after swallowing hard twice, he didn't vomit. Instead, he asked a familiar question. You? What are you looking at? Leon replied almost subconsciously. What are you looking at? As a result, the drunkard directly pulled out the sword. Dot bastard. I'm going to kill you. This is truly a disaster. With the conscience of heaven and earth, anyone who hears this classic question will answer like this. This guy who was so drunk that his eyes were blurry could not even walk. He waved the sword in his hand randomly, causing a commotion in the tavern. And then a large group of drunkards were hiding in all directions. The drunkard's sword made the man who called him do whatever he wanted. He picked it up at his fingertips, not knowing where he would stab him next second. There was a man in noble robes who seemed to have been scratched by the tip of a sword. He screamed like a chicken and crawled to hide behind the bar. Leon sighed, took the opportunity to kick the drunkard over, and then twisted the opponent's wrist, preparing to take away the weapon in his hand. Unexpectedly, the drunkard seemed to be so drunk that he no longer felt any pain. With his wrist twisted backwards, he stabbed Leong with his sword without mercy. And the power is unexpectedly great. There was no other way. So Leong had no choice but to retreat in a void. Then turned around, picked up a chair, and smashed it over his head and face. As a result, the drunkard probably subconsciously raised his sword to block. But the chair knocked the sword blade into his face like a hammer. The drunkard staggered down, his own sword embedded in his skull. There wasn't much blood but the red liquid in the white was slowly flowing along the blood groove on the sword body. It was obvious that he was not alive, and his brains had been knocked out. The tavern was quiet, so quiet you can hear a pin drop. Leon was also confused. Is this situation a legitimate defense or an emergency escape? Everyone in the tavern stared at Leon, but it was the pretty boy in aristocratic robes 
hiding behind the bar, who spoke first. Was. Was someone killed? Ah. Killed. Then, he dragged out a long scream and danced out of the tavern. His movement was so fast that Leon was amazed. The tavern owner also came out from behind the bar, looked at the dead drunk on the ground, and then at Leon, who was a little depressed, and said something fair. I think you can probably enjoy that bastard's weapons and wallet. After all, you prevented more people from having their skulls chopped off. But it's not a good thing to have people killed in a store. So you better take that bastard's body with you. Get out of here immediately. Leon sighed helplessly. It was normal for the tavern owner not to want to cause trouble. The pretty boy who ran out yelling would probably attract the city defense troops soon. Although in this era, it was not a big deal for nobles to kill civilians in self-defense. But he is only a reserve baron, and his usual style is within the scope of review and assessment. He does not want to get involved in a life-threatening lawsuit at this juncture. In desperation, he had to drag the body onto the horse and leave the tavern. It was obviously impossible to leave the city with the body, so Leon had to go into the alley, intending to find an inaccessible place in the city to bury the drunkard. However, when people are unlucky, even drinking cold water will hurt their teeth. Just when Leong took advantage of the darkness to take the body to a grassy area next to the city wall and prepared to dig a hole, a large group of black-clothed and masked men emerged from the corner behind him and stood in a row, blocking the only passable alley. The leading guy held an oil lamp and even stepped forward carelessly to take a careful look at Liang's face. Look at this black hair and black eyes. This must be that person. TSK. TSK. I didn't expect to have a bulging money bag. What a double happiness. This voice was exactly the same as the pretty boy who ran out of the tavern screaming. These people are the killers of the Red Brotherhood. Leon drew out his sword and reflected seriously. Could it be that his blackmailing Earl Odin in the afternoon was so shameless that even the gods could not stand it? Otherwise, why would unlucky things happen to me one after another? After all, time travel has already happened, and there may indeed be gods in Pander. Well, I have to be careful about what I say and do in the future. The goddess must at least not hate herself. In the future, try not to extort money in places with statues of gods. Standing up and looking around at the masked men in black carrying various weapons, Leong decided to use the strongest skill he had learned in his life. Run away! Lifting the body on the horse to the ground, Leong flew on the horse and rushed out with his long sword. There was no way. The 36 stratagems was the most profound strategy he had ever learned. Beating a dozen or so people at a time. Unless you have no other choice. Try to do it as little as possible. It will hurt if you are injured. And you will die if you bleed too much. This is no longer a game. Running away immediately was a wise decision. The group of men in black didn't seem to expect that Leon would react so quickly and resolutely. He hurriedly tried to intercept. But Alice had already knocked him out of the way. In the dark alley, the speed of horses cannot be increased. But at least, they are not slower than people. The masked killers behind them began to throw throwing knives. But in the winding alley, the throwing knives could only make small sparks on the wall. Horses are far superior to vehicles such as motorcycles in certain situations. Because horses usually don't hit the wall by themselves when no one is controlling them. Even in the dark, Leon had no control at all now. He knew that pulling the reins might cause Alice to do something wrong. He just kept gently nudging the horse's belly, driving Alice to keep running. Alice did indeed live up to her expectations. After wandering around the alley for a while, she came to a street and successfully got rid of most of the masked robbers behind her. This is already a strange road, with stone house bases next to it. There are torches inserted into the walls, and the firelight is swaying, illuminating this short section of the road. The house is very tall, and there seems to be a lookout on the top. A flag extends horizontally from the lookout with a golden lion emblem on it. When Leong saw the flag, he stopped his horse, turned around, and grinned with his white teeth. It seems that the goddess likes me. The man in black behind him gradually stopped. In fact, there are only three people left who can catch up here, and the movements of one of them are very familiar. He is probably the pretty boy who had excellent physical skills when he escaped from the tavern. Several guys from the Red Brotherhood looked at each other, as if unsure whether to continue the pursuit. But Leon shouted directly, Here comes someone! Killing! This tone was almost exactly the same as when the pretty boy ran out of the tavern. Chapter 15 Anything Can Happen to You A very cooperative voice came from the observation deck. Who is it? The three killers seemed to be frightened. 
and they hunched over and planned to disperse in a hurry. They also realized that this tall house might be the residence of the Lion Knights. However, two crossbow arrows fired from the lookout stopped them from escaping. Don't move! How dare someone make trouble here? Then, a group of strong men dressed like tin cans poured out of the house and surrounded several killers and Leon. This place is the auditorium of the Lion Knights. The National Knights of the Lion Kingdom. The three guys had their turbans pulled off. The leading boy tried to speak. But after a knight knocked out several teeth with a punch, he obediently covered his mouth and squatted down. There were three masked men in black and a foreigner. The knights felt that this matter basically did not require investigation. Therefore, after verifying Li Ang's noble emblem, a knight politely asked Leon what happened. Completely ignoring several criminals who were about to urinate, Leon glanced at the three silent robbers. I saw them robbing and killing people over there. And then they probably planned to kill me as a witness. In an understatement, the drunkard's life case was directly placed on these unlucky killers. In this situation, a noble's words are naturally more trustworthy than those of a robber. So the knights escorted several robbers and planned to search for their accomplices. As the victim who was almost silenced, Leon naturally had to lead the way. But when they walked into the alley again and found the location of the body, everyone was shocked. There was only a small amount of blood on the ground. And the body was gone. In other words, the flesh and blood of the corpse was missing. Only a complete human skin was left at the scene. But there was no flesh and bones inside. Just like an empty cicada shed, apart from the holes in the seven orifices on the face and the wounds on the top of the head that had been split by a sword. There were no other damages on this skin. It is unlikely that this was the work of a human being, as no one could have peeled off such a complete human skin in such a short time. The fallen! The leading knight blurted out in shock. While everyone was staring at the empty human skin, the handsome boy seized the opportunity and fled into the dark alley. But no one, including Leon, had the intention to chase him. Small things like robbery were no longer worth mentioning at this time. No one believed that the pretty boy was related to the legendary devils, the devourer, and the fallen. And if there is really a relationship between this pretty boy and that piece of human skin, then chasing after him will probably result in his death. The knights quickly turned back to report with solemn expressions. Subsequently, the Lion Knights launched an investigation into the heretical demons as if facing a formidable enemy. And teams of knights were sent to various parts of the city. Leon was also politely sent away by a knight. He feels a little numb now. Is there really such a thing as the fallen in Pender? So, does the devil worship by heretics also exist? It is said that heretical worshippers have always planned to use human sacrifices to summon demons from otherworldly places. Looking at this situation, it seems that they succeeded? After all, he can be regarded as traveling from another world. It is possible for a demon to come from another world. It's a land full of dangers. If I encounter a demon, are my skills and proficiency enough to run away? It seems that you need to have some understanding of those heresies and mysterious beliefs. While thinking wildly along the way, he realized that he seemed to have reached a familiar place. When he looked up, he was back at the entrance of the adventurer tavern again. Leon, who was feeling a little scared, looked at the dark street, then at the brightly lit tavern, sighed and walked in. People's yearning for light is actually no different from that of moths. Light can indeed bring psychological security to people. It was late at night, and there were not many people in the store. The ground was also clean. And it seemed that no violence had ever occurred here. The tavern owner was cleaning up the bar. When he saw Leon leaving and returning, he grinned in surprise. Sir, are you lost? Leon smiled, honestly, and said, I want to stay in a hotel. The boss shook his head in disbelief. Are you sure the matter has been resolved? Leon took out two gold coins and threw them on the bar. I'm a professional at digging holes and burying people. Here's some hot food. The boss stared at the gold coins, then looked at Leon, and finally succumbed to the charm of the dinar, twirled the gold coins on the bar, and threw down a key. Okay, don't cause any more trouble. You go to room three upstairs, and I'll bring you food later. Leon really didn't want to get into any more trouble. There were enough accidents today. So he went directly upstairs and entered the hotel room. And just when he was about to close the door, the door to the room opposite opened. A burst of fragrance hit him. And then a graceful woman came out. After glancing at Leon, the woman smiled slightly and walked downstairs with an elegant posture. This is a very attractive woman with a curvy figure that makes people feel both thin and plump at the same time. The face is also very delicate. Even with Liang's eyes, 
He thinks it is very outstanding. And mainly it has an indescribable temperament. Just looking at each other for a second. This temperament directly reminded Leon of the most common furniture. The bed. This made Leon reluctant to close the door for a moment. With the same mentality as a normal man. He glanced twice from behind until the woman disappeared from sight. A charming voice came from downstairs. Boss, please do me a favor. For some reason, when Leong heard this voice, the image of a fox emerged in his heart. This is a fox-like woman. Such a woman usually means trouble. Leong closed the door, not intending to cause trouble. When the boss knocked on the door to deliver food to Leong, at least an hour had passed, and Leong had already taken off his chain armor and was lying on the bed. Sorry for the little delay. Here's the hot food you asked for. The boss was quite apologetic. After all, according to normal efficiency, ten minutes would be enough to prepare a meal. However, Leon was magnanimous and never urged him, which made him feel a little guilty. Panda's catering standards are quite rudimentary. In Liang's opinion, the ingredients are barely cooked, and there is no taste at all. Correspondingly, the cooking speed is usually quite fast. This short period of time lasts a long time for you. Leon complained, took the food and started eating. But before leaving, the boss seemed to see something. He stopped and looked at Liang's luggage on the bedside, as if he wanted to say something. Is there anything else? Liang planned to drive people away. You seem to be a pioneering knight? The boss stood aside and spoke awkwardly, his eyes always staring at the small emblem beside the pillow. Liang is a little depressed. You saw the emblem of the pioneering nobles and still asked. You obviously have something to ask for. Why are there so many bad things today? Did I really offend you, Nomia? The goddess of order? If you have anything to say, just tell me. I'm not in the mood to be polite right now. The boss smiled awkwardly. Sir, if you are a pioneer lord, I think you might be willing to negotiate a business deal. Chapter 16 Vixen The boss's delay and the business he mentioned were all related to that fox-like woman. The beautiful fox planned to find a team to take her out of Lion City and to Chunga Town. It is a common practice for her to find tavern owners to act as intermediaries. Taverns are rich sources of information, and each tavern owner usually knows many adventurers. The reason why the tavern owner is so active is that he obviously thinks this woman is a trouble, and he doesn't want this kind of trouble to stay in his shop for too long. And he couldn't kick her out. The woman was a noble. Of course, it cannot be ruled out that the boss also has some unrealistic ideas about the woman. Such a woman should be famous. Right. What's her name? Leon didn't want to cause trouble. But people are always curious. And a mentality common to men made him ask this question out of nowhere. She is indeed famous. Her name is Sarah. Vixen Sarah. A well-known traveling bard. Leon was stunned. She is Sarah. A traveling bard who was born into a noble family. Acted alone and was extremely beautiful, coupled with a nickname, Vixen. This is enough to explain Sarah's style and unique abilities. Having such people in the team can certainly bring unexpected help to territory development, especially when facing some things that cannot be solved by fighting alone. Leon planned to chat with the beautiful fox. So he wolfed down the food and went downstairs with the tavern owner. It wasn't because he couldn't wait. He was really hungry. Sarah sat in the corner of the tavern, gently playing a xylophone that looked like a pipa. There is a glass of ale on the table. I am Leon Griffin, a pioneer lord. I heard from the boss that you want to find a team to take you to Chunga Town. Leon didn't beat around the bush. He sat down opposite Sarah and got straight to the point. The boss thoughtfully brought a glass of ale and placed it in front of Leon. This cup is free. After saying that, he nodded to Sarah, who was a little confused, indicating that he had indeed found Leon, and then returned to his bar. Sarah smiled slightly and looked at Leong seriously. What a handsome young man. Mr. Leong, I seem to have seen you in the afternoon. It seemed that Sarah was also in the shop in the evening when the hapless drunkard was looking for trouble. Leong curled his lips. Let's get down to business. Miss Sarah, did you get into any trouble and want to leave Lion City? For a nobleman, this is a rude way of speaking. But the smile on Sarah's face didn't change at all. And she seemed completely unfazed by it. It's not really a big trouble. It's just that there's a clingy guy who wants to marry me. And he doesn't care if I want it or not. Sarah said it quite calmly. It seemed that this was not the first time this happened to her. Later, Sarah told Leon her story. As a traveling bard, she has been traveling in various cities on the mainland. And has now traveled to half of the continent. 
The funds that support her travels come from the services she provides to nobles from various places. She is an excellent singer, has a beautiful singing voice, and is very popular at various banquets. Of course, if the pay is sufficient, or if she likes her employer, she can also entertain in other ways. Her beauty is not just her singing voice, but this kind of life will always cause some customers to become entangled. Leon noticed the throwing knives and long swords on her waist and saw the calluses on her fingers that only skilled warriors would have. Apparently, she had to use force to escape some clingy clients on more than one occasion. But this time, she encounters a client who is pursuing her crazily and cannot use violence to leave the Duke's son. Maybe it was a coincidence. Maybe it was fate. That client happened to be Li Ang's client in the fog cage arena. The illegitimate son Foshe. Miss Sarah, Foshe had an accident on the west coast and he was lame. I don't think he will be able to return to Lion City for a while. There is no need for you to worry so much. After careful consideration, Leon planned to tell the truth to Sarah. Mr. Leon actually knows this. It's because I just received the news that he is lame. So I have to leave as soon as possible. I think you can think of the reason. Leon was stunned for a moment, shook his head and smiled bitterly. Okay, that's true. A dandy young master has nothing to do after being crippled. So he naturally has a lot of free time to do things like forcibly marry beautiful women. And his family background ensures his safety. When Fauché returns to Lion City, it may be really difficult for Sarah to leave. In that case, you can leave by yourself now. I think it shouldn't be difficult to go to Chunga Town by yourself with your skills. Right. Leon pointed to the sword on Sarah's body. Sarah took out her wallet straightforwardly, turned it over and shook it. Only a few silver coins fell out of the wallet. That's Duran. One dinar. Which can be exchanged for almost ten Durans. In fact, in Pendor, Duram is the most commonly used currency for ordinary people. One silver coin can buy about two kilograms of bread. The few silver coins in Sarah's hand were probably only enough for her to live in this hotel for one more day. Fauché's character is a bit bad. Ever since he got involved, no noble in Lion City has dared to do my business. In order to avoid his servants, I can only hide in this hotel and only dare to do so at night. Come out. The expression on Sarah's face finally changed, looking a little helpless. There was no one in the tavern at night, so the bard naturally had little income. It is indeed difficult for a beautiful woman with no money to go to Chang'e town alone. So, Miss Sarah, do you want to find an employer? Yes. You have probably seen that I can use a sword. And I can use it well. I can also compose some songs to sing the praises of your pioneering achievements in this continent. Of course. I can also provide other services if you need it. If so, Mr. Leon. Sarah's big watery eyes blinked and looked at Leon. Leon looked at this, Vixen, and naturally thought of the bed again. He sat up straight, took out a handful of gold coins from his pocket, and began to count them. Of course what I need is some more special services. Miss Sarah. Sarah also sat up straight, supported her chin with her hands, and smiled even more charmingly. I want you to be responsible for the social affairs of my team. I need the customs and customs you have seen and heard while traveling on the continent. I need your knowledge of various heresies and mysterious beliefs. I also need detailed information about the nobles from various places that you know, including what color their underwear is. Sarah was stunned with disbelief written all over her delicate face. She didn't come back to her senses until Leong finished counting the money. That's 100 dinars. Enough to hire you for a long time. I guess? Sarah accepted the money mechanically. Her expression still a little dazed. I haven't asked you your last name yet? Miss Sarah. I'm sorry. I can't say my last name. It will only bring shame to it. But I promise. This will be the only thing I hide from you. Lord Leon. Leon nodded seriously without any lust in his eyes. Sarah, the vixen has joined your team. Chapter 17 Jazz Raiders The next day, Leong and Sarah set off to Chang'e town together. Sarah had a fine horse, and even though she was in dire straits, she never thought of selling her horse. Moreover, Leong also discovered that Sarah had amazing riding skills, not even much worse than Leong himself. Probably even in the semi-nomadic and semi-settled tribal alliance of the Dexia Principality in the southern desert. Sarah would be among the top equestrians. It's like two experienced drivers traveling together by car. They are traveling very fast. Although Sarah kept silent about her surname. Leon could tell that Sarah was originally from Dexia. She probably does love traveling. 
but maybe she is running away from something. Except for her excellent riding skills and love for horses. There is nothing about Sarah that looks like a rough and uncultured Desha tribesman. Sarah is not only an excellent bard, but also a talkative scholar. She is well aware of the culture, customs and even the military system of various places, and is even more familiar with the historical secrets of the nobles of various countries. She is also very good at chatting and has extraordinary understanding. It is indeed a pleasure to travel with her. Sarah no longer tried to seduce Leon with her beauty. She showed a different respect for Leon than before. Probably because Leon did completely ignore gender, appearance or other factors, and treated her completely like a diplomat, which was indeed different from all the nobles she met. It also made her feel really relaxed and happy. Therefore, she quickly became accustomed to using the knowledge and information she possessed to provide services to Leon, rather than using her body. But perhaps, Leon still has a trace of regret in his heart. Therefore, there will still be beautiful singing sounds from time to time along the way. In just one day, the two of them traveled hundreds of miles and entered the jurisdiction of Chang'e Town. The name is Chang'e Town, which is actually a county. If we look at the area under its jurisdiction alone, Chang'e Town is the largest county in the mainland. Its jurisdiction occupies 20% of the land area of the Lion Kingdom. Most of the entire eastern province falls under the jurisdiction of Chang'e Town. When the Lion Kingdom was first established, Chang'e Town was just a fortress town on the border of the kingdom. But now it has become the heart of the kingdom and the center of the eastern province. This is because Chang'e Town has been the first choice for pioneering lords since more than a hundred years ago. Generation after generation of pioneers, one after another, built on the foundation of Chang'e Town, opened up territory to its periphery, and built settlements and fortresses one after another in the surrounding areas. Up to now, the kingdom's border has been developed over the past hundred years to the current border fortress hundreds of miles northeast of Chang'e Town, which is Count Odin's brave shield castle, precisely because this area used to be the border, unlike the surrounding areas of Lion City, which were almost all fields and farms. Most of the jurisdiction of Chang'e Town was deserted, except for those territories developed by generations of lords. Other places were either primeval forest or wild wilderness. Many places are no man's land and you can't even see human habitation for hundreds of miles. And Leong and Sarah were walking in a no-man's land, looking at the vast wilderness. Leong now understood why Sarah wanted to find someone to accompany her. It's not a matter of safety. A person walking alone in a place like this would probably go crazy. There are many rivers and hills in the distance, and the fog has been hazy, making the sky extremely gloomy. From time to time, you will hear the roars of various beasts, and occasionally there will be other strange sounds. It is difficult to tell whether it is caused by the wind passing through the valley, or whether it is caused by some incomprehensible unnatural species. There has always been a road, winding forward, but the road ahead that can be seen under the fog is only a few dozen meters, and from time to time, animal bones and occasionally human bones can be seen on the roadside. Although they had been traveling all day, neither of them had any intention of camping until the sun went down. Leong didn't bring a tent at all. Sarah did have camping tools. But I'm afraid no woman would be able to sleep in a place like this. The two simply drove straight to Chang'e Town overnight. There are no stars at all in this place at night. And various strange sounds in the distance mixed together, creating a terrifying silence. The desolate road is still uninhabited. The two of them rode slowly and slowly. It was not suitable to walk too fast at night when they couldn't see the road clearly. Sarah kept talking. Maybe this was the only way to alleviate the fear in her heart. She told Leon all the way about what she saw and heard on this continent. And Leon listened carefully. He needs to know more about Pender as soon as possible. And Sarah, a well-informed traveling poet, is undoubtedly the best teacher. Leon even secretly vowed that if he had the opportunity to return to the original world in the future, when he plays games again, he must fully understand the background and story of each game, instead of just playing and killing. It wasn't until the sky turned white that the two of them stopped talking because they heard the sound of horse hooves. At least hundreds of horses galloping together could make such an obvious noise, and even the ground shook slightly. The sound came from directly ahead, from the direction of Chang'e Town. Sir, we'd better stay away. Sarah, hide quickly. He might be a horse thief. The two gave the same suggestion at the same time, and then drove the two horses to hide in the forest on the roadside. Hiding behind the rocks in the forest, the two saw a group of cavalry flying past. There were at least a hundred cavalry, and they were obviously organized troops, wearing uniform armor and holding uniform lances. 
This is already a very strong combat power. Even equivalent to the entire arm strength of a mid to low level lord. However, this unit did not fly any flags. And the formation was somewhat scattered. They were shouting and yelling while marching and were undisciplined. The faces of these cavalrymen could not be seen clearly due to the mist. But just from their attire and casual manner when marching, it was clear that they were a nomadic army. This group of foreign cavalry seemed to have obtained a lot of trophies, or had just robbed a caravan or village. Each horse carried some civilian items that had nothing to do with the battle, such as fabrics, handicrafts, or everyday utensils such as pots and jars, and even women's dresses. Neither of them dared to say anything, so as not to alert the passing foreign troops. It wasn't until the troop completely disappeared from sight that the two spoke again. Nomads? Sarah, can you identify who those are? I don't know why, but after seeing a living person, even a group of terrifying horse thieves, Leon, who was originally a little worried, felt more at ease, and began to ask Sarah for advice again. This is the Jada people. How could there be such a large number of Jata raiders appearing in the hinterland of the Lion Realm? Could it be that Brave Shield Castle has been breached? Sarah's eyes were full of horror and her face was pale. His lips were trembling a little. Jada people? This place is at least 500 miles away from the grassland border. Sarah, are you sure you read it correctly? Leong realized the seriousness of the matter. A month ago, I saw two Jada riders at Fauché's place. Dressed like this, is Jatu invading? Sarah, we have to rush as soon as possible to inform the garrison in Chang'e Town about the news. Chapter 18 Chang'e Town This horse team is the Jata Raiders, a nomadic people entrenched in the grasslands of the eastern part of the continent. And they are also the most dangerous anarchic armed forces. They are the most notorious large-scale bandit group in the entire continent. They are skilled with bows and horses, brave and good at fighting, but are almost completely unable to communicate. They have built an almost completely closed society in the eastern grasslands rejecting any diplomatic or trade requests, and will attack any outsiders who try to enter Jata's territory. In fact, they are an alliance of tribal warlords who make a living by looting, going to the Lion Kingdom or the Northern Crow Kingdom to plunder caravans, steal women, and loot villages is their daily life. But since Earl Odin built Brave Shield Castle 30 years ago, Jatu has rarely raided in the direction of Chang'e Town. The small number of raiders will be blocked from the grassland borders by the Brave Shield Castle defenders, when a large number of Jata troops are dispatched, Brave Shield Castle will give a timely warning. This kind of thing where hundreds of Jata people looted the hinterland of Chang'e Town has not happened for a long time. The two of them rushed towards Chang'e Town without stopping, and finally arrived at Chang'e Town in the afternoon. Chang'e Town is a majestic city, not inferior to Lion City at all. This former border town is now the largest trading city in the eastern region. Chang'e Town is backed by a large river. Tontian River. Across the river in the north is a vast wilderness. To the west is a dense network of swamps. To the south is a barrier of mountains. And to the east is a vast long river forest. Just in Chang'e Town, you can experience various scenery of this continent. You can also see all kinds of people on this continent. Unlike all cities, Chang'e Town has its own unique culture. This is a city built by generations of adventurers and pioneer lords. In fact, the success rate of territory development is not high. Most of the pioneering nobles will die young in the constant fighting, especially around the Long River Forest and Jata Grassland. However, the opportunity to become a true ruling class can only be obtained on the battlefield. Therefore, even if they risk their lives, there are still countless adventurers who are eager to use the sword in their hands to earn themselves a bright future. If civilians want to stand up, the most likely way is to serve as a mercenary on the battlefield establish military exploits under a certain noble lord, and gain the favor of the lord. As the lord's territory expanded, civilians with outstanding military exploits might also be ennobled as knights and become members of the nobility. Of course, there will be more such opportunities under the command of the pioneer lord. Therefore, as long as they want to make achievements in the eastern province, whether they are civilian mercenaries or nobles and pioneer lords, they will go to Chung'e town first. The nobles want to recruit soldiers here, and the mercenaries also want to find their future here. Although there are only a few adventurers who can successfully fly into the sky, the merchants in Chang'e Town can make a lot of money from it. This makes the business in Chang'e Town, especially the arms business, extremely developed. Arms dealers, horse dealers, and various baggage and building materials dealers are everywhere, which are rare in other cities. 
the Archduke of Alma, and the Count of Odin both coveted this territory precisely because its developed business environment could bring in considerable tax revenue. The current lord of Chungha town is actually Duke Alfwan. But unfortunately, he has been lying on the bed for these years, and is said to be hemiplegic. Although the old Duke Alfin had many wives and concubines, he did not have any children, and he himself had no brothers or sisters. It seemed that he could not inherit the family bloodline. This naturally led to the Grand Duke Alma having such thoughts. Today, part of the administrative affairs of Chang'e Town are managed by Grand Duke Alma. The Earl of Odin, who had outstanding military exploits, gathered his troops from Chang'e Town and built Brave Shield Castle in the North step by step. With a very high public base and reputation in Chang'e Town, it is inevitable that he also has some thoughts about Chang'e Town. Now the garrison and defense of Chang'e Town are managed by Earl Odin. Therefore, these two families will naturally fight openly and covertly for the future ownership of Chang'e Town. After the exhausted two people arrived in Chang'e Town, they immediately found the Chang'e Town City Defense Army Station. In this station, the double lion coat of arms of Count Odin is hung openly. Count Odin does not hide his plot against Chang'e Town at all. Of course, the administrative hall opposite the city defense station was not very low-key. The lion's paw heraldic flag of Archduke Alma was hung there. Leon showed his noble emblem to the guards and walked into the city defense army station. The person who received him was a bearded officer, a very tough middle-aged man. Sir, I am Ralph, the knight commander under Count Odin. Are you sure you have seen a large number of Jata raiders nearby? Yes, ten hours ago on the road south of Chang'e town, in a no-man's land. After listening to Liang's report, the bearded officer obviously didn't believe it. This is impossible. Your Excellency, the Jata people have not been able to enter Chang'e town in 30 years. Probably because the two reporters were nobles. The bearded man did not drive them out directly. Looking at the map of Chang'e town hanging on the wall, Leon walked over and pointed. I swear on my surname. We saw a Jata cavalry of hundreds of people at this location. The foggy no man's land is in the hinterland of Chang'e town. More than 300 miles away from Chang'e town and more than 500 miles away from the border Fort Brave Shield. There is no doubt that a noble takes his surname as his oath. But the bearded officer is still a little unbelievable. But, Your Excellency, there has been no enemy information from Brave Shield Castle. It is impossible for the Jata people to conceal their entry into Brave Shield Castle. Otherwise that's treason. Leong and Sarah looked at each other. Sarah was obviously surprised. And then keenly realized that this socialite, who had always been among the nobility was very sensitive to politics. She immediately reminded Leon softly, My lord, maybe a month ago, it was Jean Fauché, Duke of Alma. Leon gave Sarah an approving look, and Sarah closed her mouth knowingly. Leon looked at the map carefully again, then took out a crumpled parchment from his pocket and handed it to the bearded officer. This may be related to the problem that Count Odin entrusted me to solve for him before. I think you can read this letter first. Auden did ask Leon to bring a letter and wrote it in front of him. This letter serves as a certificate for the establishment of a cooperative relationship between the two parties. Auden told his men in the letter that matters that were inconvenient for the Fletcher family to come forward could be left to Leon. At the same time, Leon can also ask for help from Odin's territory when he encounters danger. In the letter, there is this sentence. Try to cooperate with Mr. Leon. This is of course so that Leon can quickly deal with the bandits entrenched in his territory, but combined with the sudden collision of the Jata people, Sarah's side of the Jata riders in Fauché, and the fact that there was no situation at the Brave Shield Castle on the border, Leon could naturally realize that these Jata the person's appearance in the hinterland of the kingdom is most likely due to the territorial dispute between the Grand Duke of Alma and Count Odin, since it is not a large-scale invasion by the Jata people, but a political struggle. Leon will naturally find the right opportunity to gain some wool. After all, the saying, cooperate as much as possible, is not easy to quantify in detail. Chapter 19 Gathering Some Wool The bearded man quickly read the letter, but there was some confusion on his face. Your Excellency Leon, I understand the explanation given by the Earl, but does this have anything to do with a group of Jata plunderers? The bearded officer was probably a civilian, and he still seemed unaware of the current situation. There is a group of so-called gangsters in Fletcher Village. You should know that. Right. The bearded man nodded blankly. That's the nephew of the Duke of Alma. But they haven't done anything bad before. They seem to be developing territory. So although the people in the earldom don't get along with them, they won't take the initiative to provoke them. 
so as not to cause greater conflicts. Leon nodded. If you did not receive the information that Fletcher Village was robbed by the Jatta people, nor did you receive the news that Brave Shield Castle was captured, then this means that the so-called gangsters near Fletcher Village he colluded with the Jatta people and deliberately let the Jatta people enter the hinterland of Chang'e Town. In fact, Leon was just guessing. But this guess was almost accurate. Since the Brave Shield Castle was safe, and there was not even a special beacon warning, then the Jatta cavalry was able to penetrate deep into the hinterland of the kingdom. Most likely with the help of some insiders. The rise of Earl Odin was built on the corpses of the Jatta people. He and the Jatta people were mortal enemies and it was unlikely that he was let in by the defenders of his brave shield castle. Thinking again about the territorial conflict between the Duke of Alma and the Count of Odin, it is not too difficult to come to this conclusion. Count Odin specifically asked Leon to deal with the bandits in Fletcher Village, presumably considering the possibility of such a situation. However, Odin did not say that the so-called gangster was Alma's nephew. This old fox is playing tricks on me. It seems that neither side is a good bird, Leon thought. When the bearded man heard Liang's guess, his lips began to tremble, and he murmured, How dare they do this dot how dare? Liang sighed with a sincere expression. Of course they dare. You should know that hundreds of Jata cavalry have entered the hinterland of the kingdom. What this means to Earl Odin and you. Hundreds of Jata cavalry appeared in the hinterland of Chang'e Town. As a border fortress, Brave Shield Castle, and the Chang'e Town garrison were both to blame. At the very least, it was considered incompetence and dereliction of duty. Moreover, the Jatta people came from Fletcher Village, the territory of Earl Odin, and were even suspected of collaborating with the enemy. This situation is difficult to deal with. Even if the Jatta cavalry is eliminated immediately, it will be difficult to reverse the fact that they have plundered the inland villages. The Duke of Alma will definitely use this to attack Count Odin, not to mention whether it will rise to the level of collaboration with the enemy. But at least Odin's men failed to ensure the safety of Chang'e Town. They are not suitable for managing the garrison of Chang'e Town. Evaluation is definitely indispensable. Then, even the best outcome would lead to Odin's management authority of Chang'e Town being withdrawn, and he would withdraw from the competition for Chang'e Town. The group of gangsters entrenched in Fletcher Village have never done any other bad things before. So the real purpose is probably this. The bearded officer probably figured it out and panicked. Your Excellency Leon, do you have any good ideas? Hurry up and send a large force to destroy those Jatta people and try to capture them alive. If that doesn't work, bring back the Jatta people's horses and all their equipment intact. Leon started making arrangements without hesitation. As if he was the leader here, the bearded man nodded. Of course. But I'm afraid it won't solve the Earl's problem. What he cares about is the dereliction of duty. That has become a fait accompli. Of course not. But if you are fast enough and bring back all their horses and equipment, I have a way to completely solve the problem. Liang's face was full of confidence. While you are chasing Jatu, I will quickly deal with the so-called gangsters in Fletcher Village. I know it is not convenient for people in the earldom to take action. But I need some assistance. Seeing that Leon seemed to have a solution, the bearded Ralph seemed very happy. What do you need? I will try my best to help you. Leon looked at the map and started to make requests directly. I need a detailed map. The more detailed the better. In addition, I need supplies, including crossbows and arrows, as well as some carpenters and building materials. I will give you the specific quantity. I will write to you. The bearded man also looked at the map, with some confusion on his face. I can understand the map and the crossbow, but does the carpenter have anything to do with expelling the bandits? Leon answered matter-of-factly. You also know that the so-called gangsters are not gangsters, but a noble. To deal with such unconventional troubles, Naturally, you have to have unconventional methods. The bearded man became even more confused. Can you be more specific? If necessary, I can also send some fresh faces to join the battle. Of course. The problem that the Count and you are facing is that if Jata people enter Chang'e Town and plunder, you will definitely be held responsible. Or at least you will be considered as derelict or incompetent. Leong drew the famous map and began to describe his plan to the bearded veteran. The problems faced by Count Auden were troublesome but not without solutions. Liang's method of dealing with it was tit for tat. To the north of Fletcher Village, near the territory that the Duke of Alma's nephew is developing, build a Jatta nomadic camp. Then let Ralph send someone to pretend to be a Jatta man and run from the north to the territory of Lion Lake City, which is the territory of the Duke of Alma, for a tour, and even to rob someone. 
just like what Jada people usually do. They rob and then run away. Count Odin's men would be happy to do this job. In this way, the entry of Jata cavalry can be understood as Jata launched a large-scale attack and plundered everywhere. Since Jata plunderers appeared in everyone's territory, it is impossible to say who is responsible. Moreover, the appearance of a Jata camp in the territory of the Duke of Alma's nephew was much more serious than the appearance of a group of Jata cavalry. Count Odin might even be able to counterattack because of this. After talking about the plan, Leon asked Sarah to help write down the list of materials he requested and then patted Ralph on the shoulder. Ralph, you'd better write a letter to the Earl to inform the situation. This is no longer a simple matter. They were beaten and killed. Hearing the statement, write a letter to the Earl to inform the situation. The bearded Ralph no longer doubted, but respectfully saluted and accepted the order. Although I still don't quite understand your plan. Since the Earl told me to try my best to cooperate with you, I will obey the order. When will you leave for Fletcher? Leon looked at the sky and said, I'll probably set off the day after tomorrow. I'll recruit more people at the Adventurer's Tavern. Once you have your things ready, bring them to the tavern. Okay, your excellency. Sarah was silent at first, but she finally couldn't help but smile when she left the station. Only she saw Li Ang's true intention. You really took great pains to deceive those carpenters and building materials. Lord Leong. Leong raised his eyebrows with a righteous look on his face. What do you mean by lying? I'm solving a problem for them. But the list of materials you wrote to Ralph actually called for 20 craftsmen, 20 carts of wood, and enough tents to station hundreds of people. Probably less than one-tenth of the nomadic camp you called was used. Bar? Uh-huh. Sarah, don't worry about those little details. Dot besides, do you know how expensive those carpenters and building materials are? Chapter 20 Kind People Have Good Luck He asked Ralph for nearly enough carpenters and building materials to build a small castle. But what he planned to use in that plan was indeed only one-tenth of it. However, judging from Earl Odin's temperament, maybe he will accept this blackmail calmly. Because, compared with the military control of Chang'e Town, Li Ang's demand is completely acceptable. Chang'e Town is originally a pioneer base. As long as it is related to territory development, almost everything is sold here, including ordnance, food, building materials, various tools and supplies, and more. People, as one of the necessary conditions for a pioneer lord to pass the review. People are also a commodity here, especially craftsmen such as carpenters or stonemasons. However, the commissions of these craftsmen are very expensive. Very expensive. Much more expensive than those mercenaries who only know how to fight and kill. Leon couldn't afford to hire a few people with the little money he had. So of course, he had to find the right opportunity to pick up the wool of a big family. In addition to craftsmen, Mercenaries are also a commodity in Chung'e Town. After finishing the material preparation, Leong planned to find a tavern to recruit people. The thousand dinars he borrowed were originally used to buy building materials and luggage. But now that carpenters and building materials are sponsored, the money can be used to recruit troops. Having more manpower can give Leong more security. Moreover, it is still uncertain when those strong men from Mettenheim will arrive here. If they do not arrive in time, Leong cannot go to Fletcher Village for a duel. Moreover, if Ralph hadn't seen his men, the sponsorship would have gone bankrupt. He found that the largest tavern in Chung'e Town was still called the Adventurer Tavern. Every city had a tavern with this name. This was also the place where he and the group of Menheim's men agreed to meet. Fortunately, nothing unexpected happened when we entered the tavern this time. Hey! Are there any young guys here who want to find a future in the war? It is usually difficult to directly recruit reliable fighters in taverns in big cities but it is easier in remote villages. But Chung'e Town is different. The taverns in Chung'e Town are full of adventurers, most of whom are adventurers or mercenaries with dreams. And most of them are proficient in martial arts and have a certain foundation. After all, everyone knows that the Chang'e Forest is full of dangers, and they will not come here without some skills. Leon can even set certain thresholds and select only the people he wants. Of course, his threshold is not high, he only needs to be good at bows or crossbows. So he quickly recruited more than 20 mercenaries, all of whom claimed to be masters of crossbows. Sarah planned to act as a record keeper. But she was obviously not good at this kind of military logistics work. And the records were a mess. Leon simply told her to go and rest quickly. He could handle it by himself. He had a system. So he didn't actually need to record it. Sarah expressed her gratitude to Leon for his kindness. She was indeed very tired. 
They had been traveling non-stop for the past two days. And the two horses were almost exhausted. Leon was strong and energetic and felt fine. But Sarah couldn't bear it for a long time. Leon operated alone. Which made things simpler. He only needs to ask those mercenaries first if they are willing to join the team. Once he gets a positive answer, these mercenaries will be directly displayed in the team list. And you can see what kind of arms they are at a glance. Most of the people we just recruited are indeed mercenary crossbowmen. But two gangsters were also found among them, claiming to be crossbowmen. In fact, the team list showed that they were farmers. 23 hired crossbowmen and two farmers. Two special companions, Anson and Sarah, were different from these soldiers and were named separately in the list. Of course, this may be related to the fact that Leon gave them clear positions as doctors and foreign affairs officers. Leon planned to kick the two farmers out of the team directly, but suddenly found that there was no disband option in the team list, which he thought was quite functional. Forget it. The remuneration will be paid after a week anyway, and there is no need to pay for the interview. Moreover, these two farmers might be of some use. Leon carefully calculated the expenses. He had to control the size of the team to a certain number, which could not only ensure a certain combat effectiveness, but also ensure that the dinar in his hand was enough to last for a period of time. So recruiting quickly stopped. He has nearly 900 dinars in his hand, which is enough for an ordinary family to live a wealthy life. But for military expenditures, it was only enough to pay 40 soldiers a month's salary. This did not include food consumption. The people of Mettenheim were all first-class foodies, still poor, and just as he was anxiously calculating his expenses, he heard a familiar voice with a distinct southern accent. Sir, you arrived so quickly. Leon stood up in surprise. Why did you come so fast? That's Anson. Leon found it incredible. Except for a day's delay in the Lion City. He was galloping on horseback all the way, and basically never stopped except to let the horse rest. Close and the others were walking and carrying a lot of equipment. But they didn't expect to arrive only half a day later than him. From the west coast to Chang'e town. It is nearly 2,000 miles. It will take 10 or 8 days to walk. Right? Are all my subordinates scuds? Anson smiled calmly. Sir, just after you left that day, we met a caravan, which happened to be going to Chang'e town. Then we acted as the caravan's escort and came directly in the carriage. All the way. It never stopped. That caravan even planned to give us a commission for escorting. Leon was a little speechless and a little surprised. Look at this guy's luck. Is this the good fortune that Anson, a kind and honest doctor, has received? Sure enough, there is still use in doing good deeds and accumulating virtue like a true knight. You see, when you are short of money, money comes. But then, Anson continued to say calmly, but we didn't encounter any problems along the way. We didn't do much but cause trouble to others. In this case, collecting money is not in line with the knight's standards. So I did not accept the caravan. Money. The joy in Liang's heart collapsed instantly. No money confiscated? You didn't even accept the money? Have you read too many night novels? This nerd. Forget it. As long as everyone arrives safely. Why are you alone? Where are clothes and the others? Leon looked behind Anson and didn't see the group of big men. They went to help the caravan unload the goods. Because the money was confiscated. The owner of the caravan offered to treat them to a meal. I am also a noble after all. So I can't do hard work. I don't want to eat other people's things for free. So I came to the tavern to see what I actually do. I didn't expect you to have arrived. Leon rolled his eyes. These fools can trick you into doing hard work with just one meal. Shaking his head. Leon suddenly remembered that Anson's father seemed to have become a businessman after losing his territory. Anson. Can you settle accounts? I need someone to take charge of logistics support. I recruited more than 20 people. Anson looked troubled. Sir. I can do math but I know nothing about logistics. I have never even traded with anyone. My father never allowed me to touch this before. This is true. If he knew how to trade, he wouldn't take a group of tough men to act as escorts for others and still not charge for money. Forget it. Just pursue this promising career as a doctor. Take me to see that caravan. I need to buy some food. Doctoring is just a side job. I plan to become a shining knight. Sir. Chapter 21 Part-Time Quartermaster the market in Chang'e town. Even though it was already evening, the market was still bustling with activity. Unlike Fog City, the merchants here basically don't hawk to solicit business. Because the market in Chang'e town is very large, 
The stores are not like stalls along the street like other cities. Basically every shop here is a caravan camp. And the shops are all shopping malls surrounded by horse-drawn carriages. It's a bit like a supermarket and a bit like a wholesale market. The caravan that brought Anson and the others over was dealing in coconut wine and art. Yes, wine and art are two completely different commodities. Because this is a group of merchants traveling between Chang'e Town and Wulong City. In the market of Chang'e Town, sell coconut wine and buy handicrafts. In Wulong City, we sold handicrafts and purchased coconut wine. The mercenaries in Chang'e Town consume a lot of wine. And coconut wine from the west coast is very popular. The ocean-going merchant ships on the west coast like the exquisite crafts made by the Nolder Elves, which can only be obtained in the Long River Forest. This is the trade route that can earn the highest profits from both ends. But although the profits are huge, there are still not many caravans willing to do this. It is almost equivalent to crossing the entire continent. The journey is too long and too dangerous. Coconut wine is not easy to preserve in this era and will turn sour in a few days. Nolder crafts are also very difficult to receive. When Leon came to the caravan, a dozen of his big men were lying in the caravan camp, each holding a can of coconut wine. No wonder they are willing to escort people without any payment. Leong thought that these Medenheim mercenaries were inspired by Anson and began to break away from low-level tastes and have noble sentiments. But it turned out that they were doing it for drinking. The leaders of the caravan are a brother and sister, and they are from Buckley. This made the communication between Leong and them much smoother. At least they were fellow villagers with this skin. Although Leong himself had never seen what Barclay looked like. My sister's name is Leslie. She is a pretty businesswoman in the eyes of Europeans and Americans. She has some freckles on her face. She is cheerful and lively. She is very enthusiastic after knowing that Leong is the leader of this group of people. Your Excellency Leong, do you really not need a drink? Thanks to you. This coconut wine has not changed at all. Leong waved his hand. He drank a lot when he was in Miss Cloud City. The natural coconut wine he had just collected tasted good, but the packaged coconut wine with messy seasonings was completely unattractive to him. Thank you for your kindness. Miss Leslie, I just came over to see these bastards and bought some food by the way. Please don't punish them. They have helped me a lot. Procurement. But where is your quartermaster? Mr. Leong? Quartermaster? Isn't this because I haven't found the right person? Those people from Mendenheim were obviously not the type to be made. Anson and Sarah were both well-educated, but neither of them were good at logistics. Leon sighed. It seems that no one in the team can do logistics work except me, and I will leave to fight on the border the day after tomorrow, so I don't have time to find the right person. Leslie nodded sympathetically. Logistics and military supplies are a very tedious task. I didn't expect you to handle it yourself. But then, her eyes lit up again. Is your team planning to enter the Long River Forest? As you know, I am purchasing Nolder Handicrafts. Leon shook his head. Unfortunately, I went to suppress the bandits, not to find the Nolder Elves. However, if I encounter Nolder products, I will bring them to you. But now, my headache is with the Nolder Elves. Logistics support. Leon looked at the shy boy who had been silent next to Leslie, and his eyes returned to Leslie. Your caravan can come from Fog Cage City to Chunga Town within a week. This is a rare ability for me. I've never heard of a caravan or army making such a journey. I think I can probably learn something from you. Leslie looked at Leon with a smile. You are completely different from the high-ranking lords I have met. But you will leave the day after tomorrow. And you can't learn anything in such a short time. Mr. Leon. Leon himself also knew that many things required accumulation of experience. So he nodded and kicked clothes. Who was drunk and confused. With his toes. And planned to leave. But Leslie stopped him. Sir On, if you are willing, I can indeed help temporarily. For example, purchasing supplies, preparing military supplies, preparing food and daily necessities, vehicles and baggage, and handling trophies. Of course, I want to take a commission from it. That would be great. Miss Leslie, I will write you a list of the members of my team. Leon called up the team list and started copying. When he saw the lonely line of Mendenhain great swordsman, he planned to test his idea. So he kicked Close awake. Close, stand at attention. I now appoint you as the commando captain. Go and wake up all your people. Although Close was a little confused, he still subconsciously stood at attention. Yes, sir. Then, the list did change. Anson, doctor, Sarah, foreign service officer, Close, commando captain, mercenary crossbowman, 
22 23rds. Farmer. Two halves. Mettenheim Infantry. 1 12th. The number in front of the slash indicates the number of people currently fighting. And the number after it indicates the total number of people. The macho men were so drunk that they were almost completely wiped out. Leon remembered that when these tough men first joined the team, they were Mettenheim Adventurers, which was a polite name for the new recruits. After retrieving their equipment at the pirate camp, they became the Mettenheim Infantry. This means that the upgrade of soldiers must not only rely on their skills and experience accumulation, but also need to replace their equipment. This group of people were already skilled infantrymen, but during the time they were shirtless. They were counted as new recruits by the system because they had no equipment. The dinars that will be spent in the future will be lost in the sea. The road is long. To be honest, the logistics of a few dozen people aren't too complicated, but they are certainly tedious. Food supply, ordnance consumption, material transportation, welfare distribution, and spoils processing. All kinds of little things. Leslie will stay in Long River Town for a period of time to purchase Nolder crafts. During this period, she will become a part-time quartermaster and can help solve these matters. She can also help cash in the loot. And she can provide vehicle delivery. Even if Liang's team is stationed outside, she can ask the guys in the caravan to deliver goods to her door if necessary. According to Leslie, they are idle anyway. And they can earn as much as they can. What a qualified businessman. Although she charges a commission when buying and selling things. And there is an additional fee for door-to-door -door delivery. Such service is obviously of high quality. Especially when Leon lacks quartermasters. However, less than half of the gold coins in Leon's hand were gone. And Leslie took away 300 dinars for shopping. The money in hand can only last for 20 days. Fortunately, the next day, the bearded Ralph delivered the crossbows and building materials that Leon asked for without any compromise. And there were even 20 carpenters. But these carpenters were temporarily seconded. And according to Ralph, they had to be paid back when they were used up. It seems that Ralph is indeed loyal to Count Auden. Of course, it is also possible that he really cares about his position in Chungha Town. It is certainly not easy for a civilian to become the commander of the Chungha Town garrison. Everything was ready. And in the early morning of the third day, Leong led the team and set off for Fletcher Village. The border of the kingdom. Chapter 22, let's talk about it later. Fletcher Village. This is one of the most remote villages in the Lion Kingdom. There is no way. This village only has a history of 30 years. This is the place where Count Odin started from scratch. However, Earl Odin's home is no longer here. His castle is Fort Brave Shield, dozens of miles east of the village. The village is very quiet, and the scenery is very good. Since Earl Odin became famous, many people have moved here one after another. The scale is actually not too small. Of course, most of the families in this village are tenants of Count Odin. There is currently no lord in the village, but a militia patrol is left to maintain law and order. This is probably the village that Earl Odin said could be given to him as a knight's territory when he offered Leon a choice. In fact, this place is not bad as a territory. Leon felt a little aching in his heart. But he also knew that it was absolutely impossible for him to swear allegiance to a count. Otherwise, he would only be a double bonus stick at the mercy of others in his life. To the north of Fletcher Village is the Tontian River, which is the lower reaches of the big river that Chongha Town backs up. The bandit in Odin's mouth the nephew of the Duke of Alma, is now camping on the banks of the Tontian River. It is said that he is building a fortress and preparing to expand northward. Their camp can be seen from the village guard tower. But as soon as Leon and Sarah entered the village, they felt something was wrong. The village seemed a bit too peaceful. There were political enemies peeping next to the village. And Jata people were entering the country. Ralph, the commander of the Chongha town garrison, sent messages to all the villages and towns in the eastern province. There was a warning letter. But the village where the incident originated seemed like nothing happened. They first found the village chief and planned to understand the situation. The village chief was an old bald man. He was very excited when he saw Leon showing Count Odin's letter. He directly said that the militiamen in the Count had long wanted to drive away the bandits. But they had no chance. There is no reason why the other party has been working on real estate projects honestly and has not seen any other movement. As for the Jata people, I have never seen them. Leong stood on the sentry tower at the head of the village and observed for a while. There were about 40 or 50 people in the camp, and it seemed that they were indeed engaged in construction. But this is strange. The Jada people were crossing the border. 
Didn't the patrol team notice any movement? Those are hundreds of Jaffa cavalry. And the military discipline is so bad. There is no way they can move without being discovered. Right? That Jata cavalry flowed into the unsuspecting hinterland of the kingdom. If nothing else happened, it would definitely make the entire eastern province panic. But the head of Fletcher Village didn't know anything? Didn't the Jata people pass through here? However, even if the Jata people really never passed here, they would at least have received the warning from Chongha Town. Are you sure you didn't find any Jata people? The patrol didn't hear the large-scale sound of horse hooves? Didn't the Chang'e town garrison send a warning? Leong asked the village chief. He began to wonder in his heart. Could it be that those Jada people were led in by Brave Shield Castle itself? Did you make a mistake? Lord Leong, I swear, I don't know any Jada people. Chang'e town didn't send anyone here either. The village chief stared with dim eyes and was a little angry, as if he felt that Leong was doubting his character. After speaking, he was still worried that Leong would not believe it. So he called the captain of the village militia patrol team over. The patrol leader also swore that everything in the village was normal, and that no outsiders had noticed anything. Only the unscrupulous people by the river often came here to steal and steal. But in order not to cause conflicts, they tolerated such trivial matters according to Count Odin's instructions. Leon, who was in a state of confusion, was a little unsure whether he should cross the river directly and take action. Could it be that Odin deceived him? But it's not logical. There is no reason for Odin to bring in a group of Jata people to ruin his own situation in Chungha town. This village seems to be full of weirdness. But this village belongs to the earldom of Odin. And Leon can't say anything. Simply go directly to the people at the Riverside camp. After looking at the gentle water in the north of the village, Leon led his men and left the village. He asked the craftsmen to guard the baggage by the river. And he led the mercenaries directly to the camp on the opposite side. Several men with guns and shields in the camp immediately came out aggressively. What do you do? This is the knighthood of the Horton family. Get out of here immediately. We won't warn you a second time. Since they saw Li Ang's people doing carpentry work and a large amount of materials, these people didn't seem to be very vigilant. Leon, who was carrying a large amount of building materials, also looked like he was here to engage in real estate. Who is Holden? Leon asked Sarah secretly. Horton is the family name of the Duke of Alma. Wait. Sir, these people seem to be Fauché's men. They are members of the Red Brotherhood. Sarah originally answered casually, but was a little surprised mid-sentence. He spoke faster. Red Brotherhood? Then you don't have to worry about whether you are cheating or not. Let's talk after it's done. Who let the Red Brotherhood hunt him down? Solve your own problems first. And then think about the weirdness in the village. Leon rode on his horse and glanced at the fighting power in the camp. There were a dozen people wearing chain mail and carrying shields. A few people wearing leather armor and carrying bows. And a dozen people who looked like civilians. Several horses were tied up in the camp. Except for the few infantrymen who came out to ask questions. They were all fully armed. Everyone else seemed not to be ready for battle. They seemed to be preparing to eat. This was a good opportunity. Then I looked at the terrain of the camp. A riverside valley with rugged hills and slopes next to it, which was not good for the cavalry. It was a proper home ground for the Menenheimers. Well, the advantage is mine. Close. Come on. Use the hammer. The whole army charges. Leon didn't respond at all to the other side. Didn't waste any time. Didn't even lay out tactics. And announced the surprise attack very suddenly. Close was already prepared. After all, Leon said he was here to fight. After hearing the order, he rushed into the camp with his men. A dozen tough men wielding warhammers charged side by side. Seemingly in perfect harmony. But the more than twenty crossbowmen were a little stunned. They had never seen such a lord. Charging straight away without even saying age. Lo, wasn't this battle a bit sloppy? However, since the stormtroopers were already killing people in the front row, these crossbowmen spontaneously stood in a row and started shooting arrows. These mercenaries were all experienced and the macho men in the front row seemed quite reliable. So they followed behind and specifically targeted the opponent's archers and cavalry with weak armor. Anson consciously hid in the periphery and stayed with Sarah. But it seemed that it was Sarah, the woman, who was protecting him. Sarah rode a horse and stared at the battlefield with a sword, while Anson huddled behind her horse. The people from the Red Brotherhood opposite were indeed no match. And Liang's operation was not considered a surprise attack, but a sneak attack. Most of the opponent's warriors didn't even have time to prepare, and were rushed to pieces by a group of tough men on the chaotic battlefield. 
The terrain along the river is also an undulating mountainous area. The Mettenheimer's combat effectiveness in this environment appears to be very strong. But when encountering an organized military formation, big men without shields can easily be shot into hedgehogs. Leong charged directly because his gold medal fighter was good at mountain melee. Even Close, who was specially asked to use a hammer to capture prisoners can be sold for a lot of money. He is very poor now. This time, he himself did not charge like a wild boar, but rode a horse back and forth, intending to harvest those fish that escaped the net. Then, he seemed to see a familiar figure. That pretty boy with excellent physical skills impressed him deeply. Still wearing aristocratic robes, with a mouth full of gossip, he was riding a horse and planning to run away. Chapter 23 He is actually a tough guy. Sarah obviously also saw the pretty boy. She rode over and said to Leon, That's one, the leader of the Red Brotherhood. My lord, he is the rogue knight of the Horton family. Fauché sent him to keep an eye on him before. I, oh, what a coincidence. Rogue knight is not a title or a military type, but refers specifically to those textbook level old hooligans who do all kinds of evil under nobles. They are usually lower level knights, but they usually don't have fiefdoms. So they are considered the scum of the nobles. A knight with a fiefdom doesn't have much free time to be a rogue. I had underestimated this pretty boy before. But I didn't expect him to be a noble. Probably because his performance in running out of the pub screaming was really good. But in the Lion City before. Was one chasing the skin on the orders of the Red Brotherhood. Or on the orders of the Duke of Alma to attack him. Or maybe. Both. Sarah. The Red Brotherhood in Lion City are all members of the Duke of Alma. Sarah nodded then shook her head. Not the Duke. To be precise, they are all Fauché's people. Fauché is the sponsor behind the Red Brotherhood in Lion City and has been handling matters for the Duke of Alma. For those shady things, what is Fauché's right-hand man? It turns out that the illegitimate son is actually a gangster. In other words, it is the protective umbrella behind the underworld. No wonder the Duke of Alma was so fond of that illegitimate son. Leon was somewhat impressed by Fauché. The guy who looked so stupid in the arena probably had extraordinary abilities in dealing with some of the darkest aspects of society. Everyone can be of some use. Why is Leon Griffin being hunted by the Red Brotherhood on both continents? Leon thought about this question many times, but never had the chance to verify it. But now, looking at the advantageous battlefield, Leon felt that this was a good opportunity to ask for a clear answer. He always tried his best to solve this problem. It was not pleasant to be secretly spied on by a group of killers for a long time. Looking at the battlefield, I saw that my side already had the advantage. And Close and the others had begun to attack the opponent's few remaining infantry. It is estimated that the battle will be over soon. I have to have a good chat with this guy. Sarah, please pay attention to your own safety. I'll catch that one. Leon quickly put on his helmet while turning back to explain. Taking out a hammer from his saddlebag. Leon planned to rush over and knock out the pretty boy one directly, so as not to be run away by him again. In the Lion City, Leon still remembered the extraordinary movement skills of this guy when running away. The reason why he used a blunt instrument instead of a long sword was because Leon didn't want to accidentally chop him to death. Seeing Leon, Sarah rushed forward on horseback. She said, hey, but did not stop her. Then she gritted her teeth, drew out the flying knife from her waist, and followed Leon on horseback. Sarah probably thought that Leon was standing up for her, and her eyes when she looked at Leon were quite warm. After all, Leon was leading the troops in battle. But as soon as he heard that one was Fauché's man who was eyeing Sarah, he immediately charged heroically without hesitation. This seemed to be very chivalrous. One was looking around in panic, and soon saw Leon rushing towards him. He only glanced sideways, and then started to gallop with amazing reaction speed, knocking over the two people in front of him without any scruples causing several wails and curses from the mother-in-law. Kind. This actually added some obstacles to the chasing Leong, because it caused Close and the others to rush into the air, and the macho men wielding hammers blocked Leong. Leong made a circle to avoid his men, but Juan ran further away. Naturally, the camp had no walls. Juan quickly escaped outside the camp, and his escape direction was also very smart. He kept running along the gentle slope near the river to the nearby mountain. There are no roads in this place and most of it is barren mountains, which makes it difficult for Leong to display his excellent riding skills. In terms of running away, Wan is indeed very skilled, and Leong couldn't catch up for a while. Sarah, who was behind her, caught up. She weighed less, 
and the horse carried less weight, so it was much faster on the hillside. 20 or 30 meters away from one, Sarah threw two throwing knives while riding her horse. One of them hit one accurately on the hip, and the other one was inserted into the horse's butt. The horse was in pain and kicked off his horse, knocking one to the ground and running away. One lay on his back and howled in pain. He struggled to get up, but seemed unable to even turn over. Leon whistled in admiration and watched Sarah sincerely praise. What an incredible skill! Such knife-throwing skills are rare! Indeed, at a distance of nearly 30 meters, riding on a bumpy horse, facing the fleeing enemies, he could hit such an accurate double shot with just a casual throw. Moreover, both flying knives hit the most scientific places, so as not to cause too much damage and kill the person, but also to make the other party lose the ability to escape. Leon even wondered whether Sarah's ancestor was also named Lee. Sarah was a little embarrassed. Well, I aimed at his neck. Okay, that's the child of luck. Luck is also part of ability. Why are all his subordinates better off than him? Leon thinks this is unfair. But no matter what, Leon was in a good mood after being caught. Leon turned over and dismounted, walked to one who was howling continuously, and gestured in front of Juan's eyes with a mace in his hand. There was obvious fear in Juan's eyes and he gradually stopped howling in pain. You are from the Red Brotherhood. Right. If you don't want to suffer, just answer my questions properly. Leon didn't want to talk too much and said straight to the point. Juan's eyes rolled for a while, and then he saw Sarah walking next to him. Sarah! Dot Sarah is Master Fauché's fiancé. You actually kidnapped her? You also attacked the Holden family's territory. Have you considered the consequences? You will be caught and suffer all the consequences in the world horrible torture, and then being crushed like a bug. Yo-ho! How dare you scare people under such circumstances? Who would have thought that underneath this guy's fierce expression? He actually has the heart of a tough guy? Leon looked at Juan carefully in surprise, took his hand and put it on a stone, and then hit his little finger with a hammer. The fingers were visibly flattened, and the sounds of broken bones and sharp and painful cries were heard one after another, causing the birds in the mountains to fly out one after another. Sarah watched the play with interest and seemed to appreciate the scene. It's not certain whether I will suffer all the tortures in the world, but you will definitely enjoy it soon. Are you going to tell me? Leong raised the hammer again. Tears welled up in Juan's eyes. His whole body twitched and screamed miserably, shaking his head crazily. No! Don't! Huh? Really a pure man? Leon even admired him a little. There was no way. The interrogation had to continue. The hammer fell heavily again this time even harder than before. Juan's ring finger was also flattened, and there were even blood drops splattered between the nails. This is definitely not torture that ordinary people can endure. Juan's whitened face was covered with tears and sweat. He was so painful that he didn't make a sound for a long time, and his whole body was tense. Leon couldn't help but be stunned for a while. This kid can really resist. The gangsters of the Red Brotherhood are actually real men. This is unscientific. Just when Leon shook his head, and raised the hammer again. One finally collapsed, probably finally relieved, wailing and desperately protecting his hands. No! Don't do this! You want me? What did you say? Dot you asked. Um? Looking at Liang's confused eyes, Sarah praised from the side. Sir! Your interrogation method is very special! Leon scratched his head and grinned. It seems that I really didn't ask. Chapter 24 Madigan's Prophecy Tell me first why you are here, and who is the owner of this camp? One collapsed on the ground, his face covered with sweat from the pain, and he looked up at Leon blankly. You don't even know who owns this camp. So you attack? Leon hit his head with a hammer and made a pit on the ground next to Juan's head. What the H? I am I asking you or are you asking me? Juan was trembling and speaking very fast. I'm wanted by the Knights of the Lion. Come and hide. This camp belongs to Master Fauché. Don't hit me. Please. Fauché's? Didn't it say it was built by the nephew of the Duke of Alma? Oh, right. These days, illegitimate children usually refer to themselves as nephews. Leon patted his head, but he actually ignored this detail. Fauché sent people to build this camp next to his father's territory to make preparations, and at the same time ran to Miss Cage City to get the Pioneering Lord certificate. This was indeed a reasonable operation. Fauché is still on the West Coast. Right. Then who is the person in charge of this camp? Also, how much do you know about Fauché's collusion with the Jada people? Juan looked at Leon blankly. I am the current person in charge of the camp. 
But I just came here yesterday. The previous person in charge returned to Shurhu's city yesterday. Swallowing. And looking at the bloody hammer in fear. One continued to answer. Sir, I only know that Master Fauché said that he wanted to control the territory of Earl Odin. And I also know that he and the Jada people it has something to do with it. But I really don't know the specific situation at all. I'm just a small person. Well, that makes sense. For a thug like Juan, he probably doesn't know many details. What happened to Fletcher Village? Has Fletcher already taken control of this village? Leong thought of the strangeness in the village. The captain of the militia patrol in that village is one of ours. It's no wonder. The patrol team must know everything. And the old village chief is probably kept in the dark by the patrol team. Leong clarified the external situation and decided to ask himself what was going on. When you were in Lion City, whose order did you follow to hunt me down? Juan's forehead no longer sweated, but his face was still pale. No one gave the order. Sir, we are not targeting you. This is because the top management of the organization once issued a reward of 2,000 dinars for the arrest or arrest of kill a foreigner with black hair and black eyes. This reward has been issued for nearly a year and has not been withdrawn. Who issued the reward? I'm not the only one with black hair and black eyes. Right? Can I claim the reward just based on this characteristic? Leon was very confused. One now looked like he knew everything. The origin of the reward is not something that a small person like me can know. I don't know exactly which person I am chasing. But since there is this requirement above, as long as he meets the requirements of black hair and black hair, we will all try to tell me's image. After all, it is 2,000 dinars. If we can find the rightful owner, we won't have to worry about it for the rest of our lives. Sarah added next to her, even if they kill the wrong person, it doesn't matter to them. Anyway, robbing foreigners is their daily business. Juan gave a painfully ugly smile to please him and nodded vigorously. Don't lie to me. I met Fauché in Fog Cage City, and he didn't seem to have any intention of killing me. What is the real reason? Who are you talking about at the top? In the Fog Cage arena. Although Fauché had a bad attitude, he obviously had no intention of catching him to receive the reward. Otherwise, he would probably not be able to escape from Fog Cage City. Seeing that Leon looked unkind and raised the hammer again, Juan shrank in fear and quickly replied, I dare not lie to you. Master Fauché is just our financial backer. And he is not an insider of the Brotherhood. Dot is for the top management of the organization. The organization has always used secret messages to convey orders. And we have never seen the real top management. Really? I swear. It seems that the Red Brotherhood is very mysterious inside. This is also true. For an illegal organization that integrates killers, slave traders, robbers, drug dealers, and other evil activities, it is normal for the top figures to be unknown. But Leon was a little anxious. This kind of unreasonable reward was more troublesome than the pursuit caused by deep hatred. He didn't know how to solve it at all. Do you really have no idea why? He was in a bad mood and the eyes he stared at one naturally became more and more unkind. One hurriedly began to answer. We have guessed. We have guessed. It seems to be related to a legend. Madigan's prophecy. Oh, and it may also be related to the bloody plague. Leon looked at Sarah suspiciously. He had just heard Sarah talk about this famous prophecy on the road the day before yesterday. In fact, this is a story widely circulated in taverns across the mainland. It is said that more than a hundred years ago, a famous prophet named Madigan, also known as the God Stick, once predicted that a hero would unify the continent of Pender and rebuild a glorious ancient empire. In fact, in Liang's opinion, this is completely normal. This is basically the daily deception operation of the magicians. The general trend of the world will eventually converge sooner or later. Sooner or later, there will always be such a person. In Liang's previous life, a fortune teller said that he had the appearance of an emperor. The result is that he didn't become a dead otaku. But in this era, this magic stick quickly attracted the unanimous attention of various countries. Speech in this era is not very free. Madigan's prophecy is basically a curse that the current rulers of various countries will be exterminated sooner or later. So the consequences were severe and Madigan was executed for sticking to his prophecy. He died in the Lion City, right under the tallest building in the continent. The square of the Pender House of Lords is now King Ulrich's back garden. I don't know if it is haunted. Although he is a stickman, his attitude of willing to die to stick to his own ideas is at least worthy of respect. So this was originally a sad and serious thing. Then, as heroes claiming to be 
Sons of prophecy appeared one after another. Madigan's prophecy gradually became a joke. The first, hero, was an illegal knight. He occupied several villages with his powerful swordsmanship and said he would lead the people to rebuild Pinder. But within a few days, all the bad things he had done were exposed. They robbed caravans, raped women, plundered villagers, and sold drugs. He has done almost all the shady things. Finally, his body or rather his skin was found in Dexia territory, with no flesh, blood or internal organs, like a cicada shed. The second one was a slave trader, with his huge wealth. He led many mercenaries to run rampant in Pindor, burning, killing and looting along the way, and capturing civilians as slaves. But not long after, the group was inexplicably destroyed under the Misty Mountain. It is said that only his head was left of him and his men, who were neatly built into a hill on the ice field. But not a single body was seen. The third one is a wizard who claims to be the son of the prophecy by relying on his witchcraft. However, it turns out that he is the leader of a snake-worshipping cult. He brainwashes his followers all day long. And he also very creatively created the first plot in Pender's history. He promoted a mysterious drug that could cure all diseases during a live broadcast at an illegal gathering. It is said that he earned tens of thousands of dinars in one go. But probably because he made too much money. The anchor eventually led to the encirclement and suppression of the Bacchus Empire. And it is said that his corpse is also very strange. With green scales all over his body. And his eyes have vertical pupils like reptiles. Which is extremely ferocious. By now, the term, son of prophecy, has basically become a curse word in the pub. Almost all adventurers would joke that the other party was the crumbs of prophecy. And the image of the hero was long gone. Chapter 25. Inertial thinking kills people. However, no matter what the adventurers or mercenaries in the tavern thought, the kings and lords of various countries seemed to be very concerned about this prophecy. One also said that the Duke of Alma seemed to care about this prophecy, and even explicitly ordered that any information related to the son of prophecy need to be sent to him. Leon can understand the mentality of the existing ruling class. If the so-called prophecy is true, it means that this continent will be reshuffled and the current king and lords will not end well. And if the prophecy is false, then we need to pay close attention to prevent any more ambitious people from using the name of Son of Prophecy to cause trouble. For the ruling class, everything is about politics. So, within your organization, you think this bounty may be related to this prophecy? Leon probably understood the reason. Dot no. It's not just that dot it seems that the last princess of the ancient Pender kingdom more than a hundred years ago had black hair and black eyes. It is said that she fled the Pender continent when the kingdom fell. Of course, this is just our guess. One famously gesticulated and stammered in explanation. This guess is quite reliable. If it is related to the Gupan royal family and Madigan's prophecy, then this bounty hunt is understandable. These kingdoms in today's Pender continent are all built on the corpses of the ancient Pender kingdom, especially the kingdom of the lion. They will definitely spare no effort to strangle any possible Gupan royal bloodline. This kind of dangerous flag that may shake the foundation of rule can only kill the wrong ones without letting them go. Leon Griffin's parents, the knight who didn't want to mention the name of the knighthood, and the aristocratic woman who never told the past, might actually have something to do with Gupan's bloodline. But Leon actually doesn't care about this. No one in the celestial dynasty would care about this kind of thing. For Leon, talking about bloodline is quite boring. After all, if the people of the Celestial Dynasty intend to seriously trace their bloodline, basically everyone can trace their origins to a great emperor or a truly legendary hero. Any one of those ancestors is enough to stand shoulder to shoulder with the gods. Compared to the so-called prophecies and bloodlines, Leong actually cares more about those unnatural forces. It seems that all legends related to the children of prophecy will be accompanied by some weird things. For example, he had seen with his own eyes the human skin that looked like a cicada shed. You just said it might be related to the blood plague? Leon continued to ask. One nodded hesitantly. The kingdom of Pender collapsed because of the Red Death. The whole continent knows it. Some people say it was brought by the Nolder Elves. But the strange thing is that people with black hair and black eyes never you will be infected with the Red Death. So, but this is the conjecture of others in the organization. And I only listen to them. The Blood Plague is the official name of the Red Death. Which also has another name, the Blood Scourge. Leon estimated that this was a very violent infectious disease, probably similar to the plague. 
It is said that at least half of the people in Pinder died due to the Red Death 150 years ago. And there is still no cure for this disease. This terrible infectious disease was naturally given a mysterious color in this era and was related to alien species such as devils and Nolder elves in various legends. Sarah next to her also nodded. Compared to the cities in the center of the continent, the number of people in the Principality of Desha who contracted the Red Death was much less. I hadn't noticed it before. But now that he talks about it, it seems like this matter. Do people with black hair and black eyes have the blessing of gods? Leong finally put away the hammer in his hand. He understood why this body was being hunted. But my heart is a little heavy. This is almost impossible to solve. Different races have different resistance to certain diseases, coupled with different environments, sanitary conditions, and behavioral habits. It is possible that some people will not be infected with certain infectious diseases. In Liang's eyes, very normal. However, in this ignorant Middle Ages, in an era when most doctors were almost indistinguishable from butchers, people would only look at things based on some superficial characteristics and then give them special mysterious concepts, such as blood, destiny, or gods and demons. No matter which one, it is an inherent concept that cannot be solved. When he thought about the possibility of being hunted like this for the rest of his life, Leon lost interest in talking for a moment. He no longer paid attention to one who was looking at him eagerly on the ground and turned around and walked towards the battlefield that had quieted down. But before he had gone far, he was startled by the sounds of begging for mercy and screams coming from behind. Looking back, it was Sarah who ended Juan's life with a sword. Sarah wiped her sword expressionlessly while chasing after him. It seems that killing an unresisting person is not a sin in her eyes. Leong frowned deeply. Sarah, why did you kill him? Sarah did not put on her trademark smile this time, but said calmly and seriously, Sir, in your eyes, he is probably just a poor prisoner. But during my time in Lion City alone, here, as far as I know personally, he has raped at least a dozen girls. Such scum should not be left in the world. Moreover, Sir, the people of the Red Brotherhood will not show any mercy to you. Leon covered his face and took a deep breath. This ruthless vixen is the real Sarah. If she didn't have a ruthless heart, how could she have traveled alone in this dangerous continent until now? You're right, Sarah. But what I mean is, we could have sold him as a slave. This pretty boy is good-looking and a nobleman, so he should be quite valuable. Leon looked very sad and resentful. He didn't care whether this old gangster died or not. But now, he was a prisoner, and it was money. What a pity. Sarah looked at Leon in astonishment. Her eyes obviously looking at some creatures, whose IQ was lower than the average human level. Sir, you actually plan to sell the people of the Red Brotherhood to slave traders of the Red Brotherhood? Hiss. Yes. The vast majority of slave traders are members of the Red Brotherhood. This is very different from the game. In the game, any prisoner of war can be sold to the slave trader in the tavern. And the slave trader will accept anyone. But it's not that convenient in reality. Inertial thinking kills people. What is the small leader of the Red Brotherhood in Lion City? and he might be somewhat famous. If he were to be sold back to the slave traders of the Red Brotherhood, this would not be a coquettish operation, but a suicide attempt. Um, Sarah, I mean, what is the person in charge of this camp? I have a lot of brilliant strategies that I can use. Leon covered his forehead in embarrassment and found an excuse to cover up his mental retardation. But, sir, you have no intention of occupying this camp at all. I don't believe you will stay here to directly face the wrath of Archduke Alma. Or, in other words, do you plan to go to the grasslands to the north to challenge the Jada army? Sarah saw through this face-conscious lord at a glance. Chapter 26 Spoils of War Leon really had no intention of occupying this camp. In fact, after getting the map provided by Ralph, Leon knew that the land north of Tontian River was not suitable as the initial development territory. Fauché can do whatever he wants here. After all, he is the son of a duke, and his family is powerful enough to negotiate deals with the Jata warlord. But with my small arms and legs, I couldn't bear the Jata people's cavalry. Besides, if the Duke of Alma and the Earl of Odin were involved in a dispute of this level, even if they were slightly affected, it would most likely be a disaster. Moreover, both sides are very insidious. In the finals in Fog City, after Fauché was eliminated, the Duke of Alma requested that the finals be changed to the most lethal form of combat with equipment. The opponent in that final was Lehman. 
and the death of either Leon or Lehman in the arena might be good news for the Duke of Alma. Lehman is Auden's son-in-law and probably his best assistant. As a famous knight of the Wild Lion, Alma would not deal with him openly and would even maintain a good relationship on the surface. But it was inevitable that he would stab him secretly. Lehman surrendered so simply at that time and it seemed that he knew very well in his heart. So he would rather end his undefeated reputation than fight with Leon. Of course, he might not be able to fight in the situation at that time. On Odin's side, he asked himself to kill the bandits, but did not tell himself that this was the camp built by Fauché. This was because he was afraid that he would not have a head-on conflict with the Duke of Alma. The reason why he agreed to Odin's request was because he had no choice but to develop territory in the Long River Forest area. It was necessary to have a good relationship with Count Odin, who had the strongest military power. Besides, people sponsor it. Oh no! He borrowed a startup capital to himself. However, after the matter was settled, Leon was actually unwilling to get involved in the political struggle between these two nobles. You still have to strengthen yourself as soon as possible. Otherwise, you will only become a knife in the hands of others. To grow yourself, you need a lot of manpower and equipment. And to have people and equipment, you need a lot of dinars. Damn it! After much thought, it's still a question of money. Back at camp, the battle is over. Close is leading the mercenaries to search for loot. There seems to be a lot of loot. And there are also a lot of prisoners who have lost their combat effectiveness but are still alive. But Leon was not in a good mood. He had captured so many prisoners of war. But selling prisoners of war, Penn's most profitable traditional business, could not be done. Since the macho men used infantry warhammers and basically did not attack the enemy's head, most of the enemies were injured but not dead. Except for the archers and riders shot by the crossbowmen. The other enemies were basically still alive. Most of these enemies had some parts of their bodies broken off by hammers and were lying on the ground writhing and wailing in pain. Most people were still talking and using some less elegant words to greet the direct female relatives of the Mettenheimers. Well, there are also greetings to Leon, listening to the constant filthy words and thinking that they were all members of the Red Brotherhood and couldn't be sold. Leon felt a little regretful for not letting clothes use the sword they were better at. What's the use of being a prisoner like this? Additional food needs to be consumed. Close turned a deaf ear and commanded the mercenaries, stripping off the prisoners' equipment one by one, and then tied them up roughly. The newly appointed charge captain was very conscientious and kept an eye on the hired crossbowmen to prevent them from pocketing the loot. But the Mettenheim infantry had already started to eat. When they raided, the enemy was preparing to eat. And now they just got an advantage. Stormtroopers generally do not participate in cleaning up the battlefield. This is a common practice on the battlefield because they have already done the most dangerous work and should no longer do hard work and also because when cleaning the battlefield the stormtroopers may conflict with the prisoners due to fresh personal grudges. After all, those pregnant voices in the captive's mouths were aimed at them. Of course, the sound gradually decreased with the mercenaries' rough binding movements until the entire camp returned to calm. Anson was treating the wounded although he made no contribution at all on the battlefield. Anson was very proactive when it came to treating injuries and illnesses, and his medical skills were also very reliable. At least, he would not resort to bloodletting like many doctors of this era. Several stormtroopers suffered injuries of varying severity, but this did not affect their enjoyment of the meal at all. Anson was bandaging a guy whose arm was cut so deep that the bones were visible, and the guy was still holding a pig's trotter in his other hand and gnawing at it. There seems to be a calm magnanimity. However, the veins on his forehead and the dripping sweat still reveal the fact that he just blocked his mouth with pig's trotters to prevent himself from screaming in pain. This is the case with the people of Mittenham. They feel that a real man cannot be afraid of pain, and moaning in pain will be regarded as a coward by them, and we will never retreat on the battlefield. In Mittenham, people who are cut in the back will not receive treatment. This is also the biggest reason why Mettenheim was able to defeat Buckley's colonial army and gain independence with a barren and small mountainous peninsula. Everything seems to be going well, but I don't know how much loot there is. Leon looked at the messy camp with a little anxiety. Grown-ups, Close, who was cleaning the battlefield, suddenly ran in front of Leon. Leon discovered that Close had a full-coverage lightweight helmet on his hand that could cover his entire head and face, leaving only a slit for his eyes. This guy. He didn't let the mercenaries hide the loot, but he got some equipment first. However, Leon didn't care that Close came to see him directly with his helmet on, but it showed that this guy didn't hide anything else. Moreover, 
as soon as clothes arrived in front of Liang. He raised his helmet to signal. Do you like this helmet? It looks like it suits you very well. Keep it for yourself. Liang, who was in a bad mood, directly rewarded the spoils without waiting for clothes to speak. There is no way. Even though you are poor, you still have to be generous to the top thugs. Thank you. Sir. But sir, this helmet originally belonged to me. I find it strange why it appears here. Close turned the helmet over in his hand. Close's name, Close, was engraved on the inner edge of the helmet. Then he put on the helmet. Leon discovered that this helmet did match the Medenheim plate armor Close wore. It is exactly the same as the Medenheim great swordsman in the previous game. Leon also reacted immediately. Close was captured by pirates after he was unconscious in a shipwreck at sea. So the helmets should have been sold by the pirates. The helmets were different from their blouses and plate armor. The heads of the Medenheimers were no bigger than pans. How much older are Germans? The helmet that was sold on the west coast more than a month ago has now appeared in the most remote mountainous area of the eastern continent and has also fallen into the hands of Close himself. Is this a coincidence? Whose head was it on before? Leon thought this coincidence was a bit incredible. The probability was the same as winning the lottery. Chapter 27 Knowing Too Much Close brought Leon to a prisoner, who was supposed to be a heavy infantryman. He was a little bald, but looked very strong. The poor guy's face was pale, and one of his arms was hanging limply by his side. It was probably at least a comminuted fracture, maybe even in powder form. Where did you get this helmet? Leon poked the guy's wound, earning a cry of pain and a begging look. Dot it hurts, Dot, please don't torture me. My lord. This was sponsored by Master Fauché half a month ago, Dot, as are the chain armor and weapons. This slightly bald infantryman was recruited quite easily. Originally, there were not so many tough guys in the world. The Medenheim soldiers had to bite pig trotters to treat their injuries, let alone a gangster like the Red Brotherhood. But Fauché again? Are those pirates also sponsored by Fauché? No wonder those pirates are exploring everywhere instead of doing their job. The Red Brotherhood, the Jata Warlord, and the pirates. This bastard has a wide range of business. What on earth is this young master going to do? Is he trying to become a full-time villain? In other words, you just came here half a month ago? Leon started chatting and seemed very approachable. He also pulled the prisoner's collar and looked at the injury on his shoulder. Then he shook his head sympathetically. The arm was hopeless. Yes, sir. I am just a duty-bound person. Please let me go. I am willing to do things for you. Seeing that Leong seemed to pity his injury, the slightly bald guy's tone became respectful and humble. Hmm. When did you bring those Jada people to the village? Leong echoed his begging for mercy and still asked lightly, as if he was asking casually. About three or four days ago, the night master of the Horton family took them there. We couldn't understand what those Jada people said. Sir, can you let me go? Leong smiled kindly. Of course. I will take you back to Chunga town in a while. Anson! My doctor! Come here! Anson was treating the injuries of several injured Mendenheimers nearby, and ran over sweating profusely when he heard the shouts. Anson! Take good care of them, and don't let them die! Anson and the bald infantryman both looked in reverence, as if they didn't expect that Leon would be so kind and caring about the prisoners. The slightly bald prisoner even felt as if he might be free again. But then Leon started to tell clothes next to him. This guy is very valuable now. Keep an eye on him, and don't let him run away. If necessary, break his legs. Close nodded calmly and seriously. The hopeful look in the poor prisoner's eyes suddenly turned into despair. Anson shook his head and sighed, and continued his work. The goddess is indeed taking care of me. Brother Waybald, you know too much. Fortunately, Close and the others used the hammer. When he looked at the prisoners again, Leon already looked calm and calm but the eyes have clearly brightened into the shape of gold coins. I originally thought that these prisoners were of little value, but now it seems that they can find buyers. Originally, this group of Red Brotherhood people could not sell to slave traders and could only waste food. Even if it can be sold, the profit will not be very high. The strength and appearance of this group of people were not very good, and they were all disabled. They could not be sold to slave traders at a price. Medenheim's hands were heavy and almost every prisoner had a broken bone. But now, the captives presumably have a buyer willing to pay a high price. Count Odin. These prisoners knew about the Duke of Alma's collusion with the Jata people. If they fell into Odin's hands, the Count would be able to bite the Duke of Alma back. 
although these Red Brotherhood scum are not allowed to stand on the stage, and their testimony may not be accepted officially, it can at least allow Odin to explain clearly in front of the king, so that he will not be so passive all the time. Leong felt that he could collect wool again. Well, it's fair trade again. The prisoners were quickly cleared out, and there were quite a few of them, 18 in total, in the system, in the prisoners column of the team list. A line of words. Private Lion Realm Civilian Prisoners. 18 has appeared. Not surprisingly, only half of the functions of the prisoner column are the same as those of the teammates column. The prisoner column does not have any convenient function options. You have to do things according to practical logic, such as releasing or talking. Moreover, no matter what kind of arms they were originally, there is now only one collected name left, but they seem to be separated into regional cultures. This is reasonable. After all, these prisoners are now only in their underwear, and it is impossible to tell what kind of soldiers they once were. Clothes took off all their equipment. Leon guessed that if a noble from a certain kingdom, such as a knight or a knight's retinue, was captured, it would probably only be displayed as a prisoner of a noble from a certain realm. The mercenaries gradually cleared the battlefield, and after regrouping, Leon began to count the battle damage. The overall losses of the troops were very small. Medenheim's heavy armor had good defense. Although a few strong men were slightly injured during the charge, no one among the Medenheim infantry was killed. But the hired crossbowman, who shouldn't have been injured, was killed instead. Yes, there will always be casualties in battles. In this not fierce battle, one unlucky guy still died. The crossbowmen were always in the back row and were not dangerous originally. But this guy was unfortunately shot in the face by the opponent's archer. Die silently. This is indeed very unlucky. There are only a few archers on the opposite side, and they are still using very poor wooden hunting bows. They are just ordinary militiamen. Moreover, the opposite side was attacked suddenly, except for the few heavy infantry who blocked Li Ang's questioning at the beginning. The other enemies were not fully prepared for battle. But that's how it is on the battlefield. A sudden random arrow, or even a missed arrow that was originally aimed at another target, may actually kill you. The mercenary's job is to lick blood from the edge of a knife. They are used to seeing life and death, so naturally they will not feel sad when someone dies in battle. However, Leong warned a short moment of silence for the unfortunate crossbowman alone, and then asked the mercenaries to bury the unfortunate deceased properly. He planned to ask the carpenter to make a coffin and bury the deceased properly. He was somewhat blaming himself for not even noticing anyone was killed before, which as a commander was inexcusable. Of course, this was mainly because he ran off to chase one halfway. After a brief silence, Leong placed the crossbowman's relics alone and prepared to entrust Leslie's caravan to send them back to the deceased's hometown in a few days. Leong showed unprecedented generosity at this time. He said that in the future, his brothers who died in the war would be buried at his expense, and he would provide a considerable pension to the family of the deceased. If there is an incurable disability, he will also pay a guarantee so that those who have fought for him can maintain a basic life in the future. This kind of handling method, which seems to be taken for granted by modern people, was immediately appreciated by all his subordinates. Chapter 28 Adults Have Too Many Demands In Pender Continent, death compensation is a treatment that only a very small number of warriors can receive. Usually only the knights and knights retinues under the lord, or the warriors of the territory who swore allegiance to him and brought their own equipment to serve can get it. It depends on whether the lord is a generous and kind person. Clothes and the dozen Medenheimers were bought by Leong. They were originally slaves. Although the macho men swore allegiance to Leong to their iron god, which seemed to be a very formal warrior loyalty process. They were still essentially just Li Ang's personal servants. After all, they were not citizens of the kingdom until Li Ang's territory was established. Except for clothes, the official officer appointed by Li Ang as the charge captain. Everyone else can only be regarded as a kind of property at present. In this era, servants were private property. The same thing as Alice, the golden-maned horse, and probably not as valuable as Alice. It's just that Leong didn't treat them as servants. The crossbowmen hired by Leong were just professional mercenaries who were paid to do things and were not truly loyal to him. Mercenary combat is a transaction. Life and death on the battlefield are determined by fate and all consequences should be borne by both parties themselves. Therefore, whether he is a servant or a mercenary, Leong actually does not need to pay pensions. Most nobles would not waste their money on these outsiders. However, as a lord with higher pursuits and a member of the celestial dynasty, 
Liang is naturally different from the Pandey nobles. This is not because Liang is so noble that he has escaped from low taste. Nor is it because he does not intend to become a paladin who combines the eight virtues in order to make himself appear generous and kind. This is just for morale and safety. Only warriors who have no worries can unleash their full capabilities. For these mercenaries who are struggling to make a living on the battlefield. The biggest worry is how their families will live once they die in battle. This is also the reason why mercenaries can often only fight with favorable conditions. Besides, if Fauché can bribe the militia captain in the Earl of Odin's territory, then others can naturally bribe the people in Leon's team. Leon didn't want to be stabbed in the back. Even though you are deceived and tricked everywhere when you are poor, you must not be stingy when it comes to spending money. Besides, isn't it about making money right away? He just didn't know how much loot there would be. But Leon was looking forward to it. Soon, the loot was counted. In addition to prisoners, the spoils of this battle include a dozen sets of various chain mails and robes, a dozen sets of leather armor, as well as some spears and infantry swords. There are also five horses. Leon was not sure how much the scrap metal could be sold for, but the value of the five horses alone would never be less than a thousand dinars. The money comes in pretty quickly. The half-year match-fixing business in the arena was not worth the income from this trip. Sure enough, he has a gold belt for murder and arson. He will do more of this kind of bandit suppression business in the future. However, the things here are not finished yet. There is still one unfinished business. Auden's request was to eliminate the bandits, which has now been done. As for the patrol captain in Fletcher Village who betrayed Odin, Leong didn't want to pay attention to him. Things like cleaning the house were other people's chores, and he didn't want to meddle in them. Moreover, if there is a conflict with the militia of the earldom, who knows what will happen? The old village chief didn't seem to have a very bright mind. Therefore, it is more appropriate to go to Odin to do business with the information about this traitor. But Ralph, the commander of the garrison in Chongha town, still had a piece of business to complete. Build a nomadic camp and wait for Ralph to destroy the Jassa cavalry and help Ralph complete the frame-up. This is the deal he made with bearded Ralph. Although the profit of this transaction seems to be slightly higher, it is based on the premise of voluntary consent of both parties. Although the service provider Leong is not very friendly in terms of price, he will definitely complete the matter if he promises. After all, in Liang's view, no matter what time or place, credit should be the foundation of a man's life. As for the process before negotiating the price, cough, that's just necessary marketing. Considering that he would be waiting for Ralph's arrival here, Leong decided not to return to Chang'e town and would stay in this camp for two days. After all, there were wounded in the team, and most of the prisoners had lost their ability to move. He planned to send two uninjured men from Mettenheim back to Lunga Town, bring part of the loot to businesswoman Leslie and cash it in, and bring a message to Ralph along the way. But after thinking about it carefully, he called Sarah over. Sarah, you are probably the only one besides me who can deceive Dot well. The only one who can guide Ralph correctly. You take a few people back to Lunga Town and do another business with Ralph. Leon rubbed his chin and carefully considered his words. Sir, I just not. Just slaughtered. Ahem. I just got a large amount of building materials and so many carpenters. And you want to attack Ralph again? My lord, are your demands too frequent? Sarah covered her forehead and carefully considered her words. She, who had always been eloquent, actually stuttered a little at this moment. Close, who was next to him, passed by the two of them and probably heard the last sentence. He looked at Sarah and then at Leon with a strange expression, then quickly ran into the camp and made a picture of helping Anson deal with the wounded. Look, but the problem is, this guy knows nothing about medical care. Moreover, he looked at Leon and Sarah very sneakily from time to time. Leon looked at Sarah with a dark look, but found that Sarah was also looking at him with an embarrassed look. The face is still a little red. Well, this is not the place to talk about such secretive topics. So the two left the camp at the same time with a tacit understanding and rode horses for a slow walk nearby. Sarah, as you said before, I will not stay in this place directly facing the Jada people for a long time. Therefore, I want to sell this camp to Ralph. Leong turned back and pointed at the camp and then couldn't help gritting his teeth and shaking his fist in an intimidating gesture. Close and Anson, including several bandaged men, were hiding by the stables of the camp and watching from a distance. But the small stable pillars couldn't hide their huge size. Seeing Leon pumping his fist, these guys dispersed. Leave them alone. My lord. 
Sarah shook her head and tried to persuade her. It was just a misunderstanding caused by the wrong choice of words. Besides, she didn't care at all. But, sir, why did Ralph buy this camp? If it is to be transformed into a nomadic camp for the Jata people, as you said, that should also be your job. After all, the last transaction has not been completed yet. External relations affairs fall within the serious business scope of Sarah, a foreign affairs officer. So she appears to be very serious. It depends on who. Oh no. Guide. Ralph is probably a commoner in Lunga Town. I didn't see his flag at his garrison hall. Only Earl Odin's double lion shield was hung there. Leon said firmly. No way. Sir, doesn't he call himself Knight Commander? He wouldn't call himself a knight like that casually. Sarah did not agree with Liang's judgment. Chapter 29 The Horn Summons the Ranger Group Sarah, Ralph calls himself a knight captain under Earl Odin. Not a knight. This is the problem itself. Ordinary knights will never introduce themselves like this. Indeed, the average knight would state his or her name directly, or at most mention his hometown or territory, such as Knight of the Far Country Territory and Lord of Jialing Village. But he definitely wouldn't call himself a knight commander. Knights who were loyal to the great nobles did not have the professional title of knight commander, and at most, they had the title of chief knight. Titles like knight commander generally appear in local armed forces. That is, in various knights. It is a position within the knights, rather than representing a noble status. Moreover, as we all know, it is impossible for a nobleman not to fly the family flag, especially a leading knight who needs to lead an army and face life, death and suffering. The lower the aristocracy, the more knights will use their coat of arms everywhere. This is a testimony of a lifetime of honor. His descendants will enjoy the blessings he earned on the battlefield for generations to come, which is worth boasting about. If you really meet someone who doesn't have a banner, then at best it's just that they haven't had time to make it yet. Just like Leong now. Leong had only left the House of Nobles for a few days. He really didn't have time to think about making a flag. It's not that he didn't want to use it without a flag. The enemy lords would probably think that you are not a noble, but an illegal armed force. If you bumped into him on the battlefield, they would think of you. You're going to kill me. Flags can save lives in this day and age. The nobles may have in-laws with each other. And no one knows whether the temporarily hostile parties will become allies later. So there is a tacit understanding between the nobles. Unless they commit suicide or die accidentally. Otherwise they will surrender as long as they surrender in time. Can save life. It is almost unique for someone like Ralph who, as a garrison commander, does not fly his own flag, unless he is not a noble and does not have the right to use the flag. Sarah recalled it carefully, and then expressed her approval of Liang's observation and memory. Maybe he is indeed a civilian. But my lord, what does this have to do with letting him by this camp? The agreement was only for Liang's keen observation. Sarah didn't understand Liang's intentions, and her delicate face was full of confusion. How to negotiate this business? I'm afraid this lord's foreign affairs officer is not very easy to be. A civilian has become the commander of the Chungha town garrison. He can command thousands of people. What do you think is the greatest possibility? Moreover, he is also a so-called knight commander. Leong shook his neck and asked Sarah. It means that he is not an ordinary civilian. Nor is he a knight in the conventional sense. Wait, sir, you mean he is the knight captain of the Horn Call Rangers? Sarah understood somewhat. And this was the only explanation. Chungha Town has a unique armed force, which is a powerful force that patrols and protects the border. It is also the basic force for the rise of Earl Odin. This unit is called the Bugle Call Rangers. After Duke Alfred of the Lion usurped the country and established himself, most of the knights loyal to the old kingdom of Pender were forcibly banned, leaving only the Knights of the Lion, a national knighthood. The Lion Knights may indeed be powerful. But the Lion Kingdom once faced the invasion of the Bacchus Empire in the south, pirates in the west, and Jatta people in the east at the same time, making the only legal knights in the territory exhausted. Chungha Town was still a border at that time, and the northeast was the vast Jatta grassland. The Jatta people's cavalry often entered Chungha Town to burn, kill and loot. These prairie barbarians are extremely powerful in fighting, and their robbing methods are extremely terrifying. They will steal all women and property, including food and tools and any male taller than the wheel will be slaughtered, except for women whom they regard as property. Moreover, the Jada people, all of whom were cavalry, came and went like the wind. By the time the lords from various places came in a hurry with their armies, 
the Jata people had already returned with their loads. This kind of unscrupulous robbery finally made some local knights in Chungha town intolerable. They spontaneously formed the Horn Call Ranger Group to deal with the Jata people. These knights will patrol the border of Chungha town in small teams. Once the Jata cavalry is discovered, the patrol team will blow the horn they carry and launch a charge. The nearby knight squad will rush to support immediately after hearing the sound of the horn. This efficient mobile defense system successfully prevented the Jata people from plundering border villages. The Horn Call Rangers have since become famous. And these knights have become the patron saints of the local people. At the same time, it has also become the official default legal knighthood of the Lion Kingdom. As for Count Odin, it is said that he received the full support of this armed force. Odin is a native of Longa Town. He may have been a member of the Horn Call Rangers. And he may even be the Grand Leader. Over time, the Horn Call Rangers have gradually developed into a very distinctive group. They will wear the iconic green armor and green vests on their horses in the grasslands and forests. This protective color allows them to survive in scout battles and encounters. Take advantage of the battle. At the same time, with the victory after victory, the kingdom's territory or the jurisdiction of Chang'e town gradually entered the grassland border. They began to introduce a large number of various good horses for breeding and breed Chang'e town's unique geldings. This kind of war horse that is not in heat, not easily startled, and is extremely docile allows them to have an upper hand even in riding and shooting when facing the Jata people who are good at riding and shooting. This was probably the reason why after Ralph heard about the Jata Centurion, he thought it was natural to capture or kill the Jata cavalry. They do have the ability to quickly destroy those Jata raiders, although also known as the Knights. The Horn Call Rangers are significantly different from other Knights on the mainland. Their core members are not necessarily noble knights. As long as they are determined to protect their homeland and have sufficient skills, any citizen in Chungha town can start as a sentinel and gradually become a core member of the Horn Call Rangers. In contrast, this knighthood does not particularly care about status, which may have something to do with Count Odin. Of course, the Grand Leader can still only be a noble. Ralph, the knight commander, must be like this. He is not a noble knight in the general sense but the knight commander of the knights of the horn call rangers this is actually rare there are still a large number of nobles in the horn call rangers ralph must have an extremely outstanding record to become the leader of those nobles sarah do you think it would be hard for him as a commoner to face a power struggle between two high-ranking nobles in a place like long river town leon twisted his neck and said slowly sarah was stunned for a moment and then understood immediately sir it seems that ralph is not very good at being a bureaucrat Otherwise, he would not be beaten by you. He would not provide you with so many supplies. Leon smiled and nodded. That's right. He is a warrior. An outstanding warrior. I can see that his skills are probably better than clothes. His stage should be the border battlefield. Not intrigue among nobles. As he said that, he looked at Sarah. But there was no businessman's philistine in his eyes. But instead, he was a little worried. Sarah, I think you can convince him to buy this place that the Jada people must pass through to station his elite sentries. Here, He will probably become the second Earl of Odin. Sarah's eyes gradually opened wide, and the smart vixen had already thought of the meaning of Liang's words. Sir, do you think that the Jata people's army will launch a massive attack on the Lion Kingdom from here? Yes. So Leon could only tell Sarah these words. Before the defense of the camp was organized, he couldn't let the mercenaries hear it. Otherwise, most of them might run away. Chapter 30 The Son of Prophecy who can use prophecy. Of course Jatu will attack from here. Leon would naturally come to such a conclusion after careful consideration. It must have been the Duke of Alma's behest that Fauché would establish a stronghold at this place. This is the gentlest place in the entire lower reaches of the Tontian River. The Tontian River traverses the entire eastern province. The water flow in most sections of the river is extremely turbulent. Over millions of years, the river has gradually been cut into deep canyons. This causes the river to become deeper and deeper every year. And the river water becomes more and more rapid. Most of the time, it gushes violently in the canyon. Moreover, the river is very deep. Even during the dry season in summer, the water in the river is still strong and the waves are high. In this era, it is basically impossible for a wingless creature to cross such high gorges and deep ravines. Therefore, Tontian River was once a natural border line. Now, the upper reaches of this river are the dividing line between the eastern and northern provinces. And also the territorial dividing line between Chang'e town and Shirhu city. And downstream of the river is a natural chasm that blocks the Jata people's iron hoofs. 
in the middle reaches of the Tontian River, behind Chunghe Town. The river becomes flat and wide, forming a lake that is dozens of miles wide, like a natural reservoir. This is the reason why Chunghe Town was originally built here. Other river sections are natural barriers. So the purpose of building fortresses on gentle river sections is to prevent enemies from the north from crossing the border through gentle river sections. However, this gentle and wide river only has a small section of Chunghe Town, and the river downstream is still deep valleys and high cliffs. The topography of the natural reservoir near Chunghe Town also means that there is no dry season at all downstream, and it is roaring all year round. The gentle river near Fletcher Village has become the only place in the lower reaches of the Tontian River that can be passed by rafts or boats. This means that, except for the virgin forest near Brave Shield Castle or further east, if the Jada people want to enter Chungha Town, they can actually only cross the river here. Otherwise, they can only run a few hundred miles west to harass the territory of Shurhu City. Therefore, the camp next to Fletcher Village is actually a border area guarding the waterfront. A miniature Chungha Town. The people said by Foshe did a good thing in this place. They were building a wooden bridge on this relatively gentle stretch of the river. Therefore, as seen by the people in Yerldom, they were indeed engaged in civil engineering. But the intention is quite sinister. The north is full of wilderness. And this bridge is obviously not for the villagers of Fletcher Village. Of course, if you plan to continue going north and cross the Jata Grassland to the Northern Crow Kingdom, then you will indeed need this bridge. But who would cross the Jata people's territory when they are full? Delivery to your door? No one needs this bridge except the Jata people. If the bridge is repaired, it will be very convenient for the Jata people to burn, kill and loot in the area under the jurisdiction of Chang'e Town. To be honest, this is really a treasonous act. But building bridges and paving roads is a legitimate behavior anywhere, even doing good deeds. It was obvious that the Horton family of Duke Alma had made a deal with the Jata people. This deal will probably not only protect his Shurhu city territory from being invaded by the Jata people, but also facilitate him to attack his political opponents. If nothing goes wrong, he will gradually gain control of Chang'e town with the cooperation of the Jata people. The only problem is that the villages and merchants in the entire eastern province will face the iron hoofs and killings of the Jata people, especially the area under the jurisdiction of Chang'e town. These prairie barbarians are extremely powerful in fighting, and their robbing methods are extremely terrifying. They will steal all women and property, including food and tools, and with the exception of women, whom they regard as property. Any creature taller than a wheel will be slaughtered. But for a high-ranking noble like Alma, the life or death of the people in other people's territories has nothing to do with him. In the process of all power struggles, it is the common people who are harmed in the end. This has always been the case in any era. Sarah, don't you think the current Duke of Alma is very similar to the former thief Alfred? Leon looked at the shallow river next to him and said softly. The river water was crystal clear, and there was no serious expression on Liang's face. But Sarah was struck by lightning. Yes, they are all lords of Shurhu City. They are all powerful princes. They are all plotting to gain control of Chang'e Town. And even their methods of plotting Chang'e Town are exactly the same as trading with the Jata people and luring the Jata people into the heart of the kingdom. He is copying the path of the first generation of the Lion King Alfred to steal the country. You feel the same way. Right Dot I think Ralph feels the same way. Leon pointed his finger to the north which was the direction of the Jata grassland. Then, I will also make a prophecy. What this duke will do next is to sell the land of Chang'e Town to trade with the Jata people, introduce the Jata cavalry into the kingdom of the Fierce Lion, and use the hands of the Jata people to destroy the Fierce Lion, Lion Country, and then steal the country and become the king, just like what Duke Lion did 150 years ago. A ray of setting sun reflectively on from behind, shining the last golden light on the chain armor. Liang's finger pointing to the north disappeared into the horizon with the last light, as if the entire world had been cut through with a wave of his hand. Is this Doc Hood? Sarah had goosebumps all over her body and looked at Leon blankly. She could not see through this mysterious little lord more and more. This lord, who usually looks like a treacherous businessman, can actually infer such an amazing thing from such trivial matters. In other words, make such an astonishing prediction. Sarah did think that there was a high probability that his inference would become reality. But in comparison, this was not terrible. What frightened her was the prophecy behind Liang's words. This is like Madigan's prophecy. A terrible skill inherited from some ancient countries. In an ancient country, it was called Zong Hengshu. However, 
Madigan's prophecy was probably to awaken some consciousness among the people, while Leon's prophecy was aimed at Ralph's manipulation. In other words, it was for the horn summoning rangers. If the prophecy comes true and Alma does bring the Jata people into the country with the intention of overthrowing the Lion Kingdom, then the horn call rangers will most likely be destroyed as a result. They are the people of Earl Odin, centuries-old enemies of the Jata people, and the locals of Lungha town. People, no matter what the reason, will eventually become enemies of the Archduke Alma. Today's horn call rangers are just like the Griffin Knights back then. And if the prophecy is false, then to prevent someone from actually acting on it, we must take precautions and block all the gaps that can be blocked, such as the camp beside the Tontian River. Therefore, as the core member of the horn call rangers, Ralph should take precautions in advance to avoid being controlled by others no matter what. This is also a friendly reminder to the Horn Rangers of possible crisis and prevention methods. I understand. My lord. I will tell Ralph your reasoning. He will buy this place. And you will get the friendship of the Horn Call Rangers as you wish. I will do my best. Sarah's greatest strength is her excellent understanding. Since Leon deliberately told her to cheat. Well, to guide Ralph. The smart vixen can of course understand Liang's intentions. She is a foreign affairs officer. And her duty is to bring Li on the friendship of other forces. Sarah touched her chest and bowed, taking over the task seriously. Looking at Leon with deep awe, you can collect wool and earn the gratitude of the Horn Ranger. This lord, it is the son of prophecy. Those who can use the guiding art of prophecy are the children of prophecy. Ahem. Well, Sarah, the main thing is to sell it for a good price. We can talk about friendship later. The awe in Sarah's eyes instantly turned into a roll of her eyes. Okay, even if he is really the son of prophecy, he is still the same guy who just wants to make money, taking two strong men from Medenheim as bodyguards and taking part of the loot along with her. Sarah quickly set off for Changha town. As soon as he sent Sarah away, Leong heard a system prompt that he had never heard before. Your coach, skill level has been increased. Skill improvement? It's still a skill that can't be added to the team in this half-baked system. It turns out that these skills can only be improved after you have specific actions and effects. Just like those six months of continuous practice on the archery target to improve your proficiency. But why coaching skills? Could it be that he guided Sarah to think proactively? Or that he allowed Sarah to understand another meaning of prophecy? Which can be regarded as a kind of teaching. Chapter 31 The Farmer Who Comes in Handy For modern people, what Leon taught Sarah is indeed an effective marketing method. This camp is of little use to Leon, but it is very important to the horn summoning rangers. Selling the right thing to the right person is a waste of time. Forehead. It is the basic logic of resource integration. The next day, Leon began to inspect the construction site. That is the unfinished wooden bridge. Two rows of wooden piles have just been laid in the river, and the wooden piles are connected and reinforced with wood. The longitudinal beams connecting the wooden piles have also been erected. It's just that the bridge deck has not yet been laid with wooden planks. And it cannot be used normally unless it is crossed from the longitudinal beam like a balance beam. Leong stood by the bridge and thought for a long time. But did not order the bridge that was about to be completed to be demolished. Instead, he asked a dozen carpenters to work together to make some minor, technical adjustments to the bridge. After carefully explaining to the carpenters, Leong asked Close and his stormtroopers to stay in the camp to guard the prisoners and he continued westward with the crossbowmen and the remaining carpenters. Since this camp is going to be sold to Ralph, he will build another Jatta nomadic camp in the jurisdiction of Lion Lake City. That is to complete his last deal with Ralph. No matter how hard you try, what you promise to do must be done, and the customer must be satisfied. This is the principle. The tough men of Medenheim were useless when it came to construction, and half of them were injured. This is different from the game. The injured in the team will not heal automatically. They need medical treatment and rest. Probably the only advantage is that injuries will recover faster. This has been verified when Leong first crossed over. This may be the biggest benefit this half-baked system brings to the team. From the camp to the west, you can see the wilderness as far as the eye can see, similar to the no-man's land shrouded in heavy fog south of Changha town. This side is also a vast wilderness. But the altitude is higher, and there are more hills and gentle slopes. On the map provided by Ralph, this area was not originally a wilderness. There should have been many villages with many small circles drawn on the map. But Leon didn't see a single village. There were green grasslands and gentle hillsides along the way, with occasional jungles, 
which was very suitable for the survival of nomadic people. After walking for half a day, it was estimated that the convoy had entered the jurisdiction of Shirhu City, and Liang finally discovered an abandoned village, like Chongha Town. Shirhu City is also a large county. A few decades ago, it was the largest county in the continent. But the significant difference from Chongha Town is that Chongha Town has been expanding outwards in recent years, while the outer territory of Shirhu City has been encroached by the Jata people in the past few decades. Because Brave Shield Castle blocked the Jata people's footsteps, the Jata people could only continue to plunder towards Shirhu City in the past few decades. Shirhu City, a county that was originally located in the northern center of the Lion Kingdom, has now become almost a front line. There is no village left in the land a hundred miles away from the main city of Shirhu City, and it has become an uninhabited land. This abandoned village has only ruins left, and the ground is full of weeds. It seems that no one has lived in it for at least ten years. After comparing the rudimentary, detailed map, and confirming that this place belonged to the jurisdiction of Grand Duke Alma Shirhu City, Liang ordered the construction of a Jata nomadic camp in this abandoned village. These ruins were probably relics left behind by the Jata people. Just right for framing. Two mercenaries were sent to stand sentry on the top of a nearby hillside. Others began to unload the goods. And the team became busy. I'm sorry. Sir, what does the Jata people's nomadic camp you mentioned look like? I thought everything was going well. But I didn't expect that the carpenters who were the main force in building the camp were a little troubled. They had never seen the Jata nomads camp. In fact, very few people have seen it. To be precise, very few men have seen it. After all, there are basically no survivors among the Jata people. And most of the men who have seen the Jata camp are no longer alive. And those women who were kidnapped, they can see them. But they can't come back. After all, Leon came from the era of information explosion in the 21st century. And his way of thinking had not yet completely changed. At that time, he subconsciously believed that many people should be familiar with the appearance of the nomadic camp. But people in this era don't have the internet. So how can they know so much? Travelers like Sarah are already among the most knowledgeable and top intellectuals in the continent. The problem is, Sarah is not here. And she definitely doesn't know what the Jata camp looks like. As a woman, she would not dare to travel to the Jata territory. Otherwise it will definitely become a unit of measurement of value. For example, one Sarah is equal to ten horses or two iron pots. The mercenaries in Chang'e town also looked at each other. But they had seen most of the Jada people. After all, they were enemies who had been fighting around Brave Shield Castle for a long time. But asked about the campground. Everyone could only shake their heads. Just when everyone was at a loss what to do. Two timid figures stood in front of Liang. Sir, we have seen Jada's camp. Leon raised his head, and in front of him stood two men wearing leather hats and wrapped in some messy and inferior equipment, carrying a light crossbow on his back. This was the equipment that Ralph had previously sponsored. These are the two bastards who lied about being crossbowmen, the only two farmers in the team list, probably due to a life full of hardships. The skin of these two farmers is very rough, and it is basically impossible to tell their age. It is possible that they are in their thirties and they are probably in their fifties. Leon was a little surprised. Have you seen it? One of them nodded, pointed to the ruins beside Leon, and said in a very low voice, Sir, this village used to be our hometown. Sir, I still remember that more than ten years ago, the day before the village was robbed, the knights came to collect taxes. After we paid the taxes, we ran out of food, so we went into the mountains to hunt. Unexpectedly, the eyes of the two farmers were red, and their whole bodies were shaking when they talked about the past. This can never be faked. People with such acting skills are basically either Oscar winners or presidential level bosses. Leon spat and cursed. Whose territory was this village before? They collected taxes but didn't protect the village. What a damn thing! I learned from two farmers that this village, which has become a wasteland, was once called Holden, which means Grey Settlement. And it was once where the Horton family started hundreds of years ago. The Duke of Alma's surname actually comes from a ruined wall that has been completely destroyed and overgrown with weeds. These two farmers are considered the last villagers of Holden Village. More than ten years ago, this place was looted by the Jata army. The two villagers were hunting in the nearby mountains. The Jata people once temporarily camped nearby. It was because they discovered the Jata camp and hid far away in the mountains that they managed to escape. The families of the two farmers have long been buried in the earth. 
but their deep hatred makes them still remember everything about the Jada people. Liang felt that his fortune seemed to have turned around. And Yunomia, the goddess of order, was probably looking after him. Originally, he accepted these two bastards because he planned to put them to use when growing food in the territory in the future. After all, farming is an innate skill that all people in the celestial dynasty never forget. Farmers are not only good at farming, but they can also be regarded as two subjects. When the House of Lords reviews the territory, it needs a certain number of subjects and fields in the territory. And, you know, he distributed weapons to these two farmers. However, after these two people received the light crossbow and infantry sword, they were still listed as farmers in the team list. So Leon thinks that these two people are probably very talented in agriculture. So their combat effectiveness is too bad. Otherwise, if they are fully equipped, they have to be upgraded to a militia. Right? But I didn't expect that these two people would show their special value so quickly. It was only when the two of them unloaded their equipment, took off their hats and coats, and began to sweat profusely with the carpenters that they suddenly realized what they were doing. After these two people took off the objects they were wrapped in, they became refugees in the team list. Fine. The lower limit for counterfeit and shoddy goods these days is indeed beyond your imagination. Chapter 32 A Strongbacked Woman It's actually not difficult to pretend to be a Jada camp, as long as there are people who have seen it. Everything is very simple. The camps of the Jata people usually have few decorations, and they do not build walls or fences that would interfere with the movement of cavalry. Their daily utensils are no different from those of other countries on the mainland, because they are all stolen. The only thing that requires some effort is to use wood to support the dome tent and add wheels. The Jata people live in movable tents equipped with wheels, which is their most striking feature. It is not so much a tent as it is a cart with a tent. This is not unfamiliar to Leon. This is the way of living of the Huns in another time and space. When moving or encountering danger, these large vehicles can be towed directly by cattle and horses, which is very efficient when moving or running. Everything is going on in an orderly manner, and everyone is busy. The Lord, Leon, was at leisure. He went over to look at the carpenter who was making wheels, but was dismissed with disgust. After doing nothing, Leon lay down on a cart and took out a crumpled book from his pocket. This is the trophy Anson found in the camp last night. Fortunately, Anson is a literate man. This book was almost used as papyrus by clothes at that time. Before Leon set off, Anson solemnly handed it to Leon. According to Anson, this is a masterpiece that can enhance personal abilities. The book is called Memoirs of Officer Pinned. As an upright young man full of chivalry, Anson looked very stern when he handed the book to Leon, as if this wrinkled manuscript was a great treasure. Based on a hardcore player's understanding of horse and blade games, Leon thought that this was probably a skill book, and that it might be able to enhance his skill level after reading it. Judging from the title of the book, this is probably a textbook that can improve tactical skills? Open the first page of the book. The first hand-to-hand -hand fight took place in the Countess's bedroom. Um, it is indeed a treasure. Leon recalled Anson's expression when he handed the book into his hands. It seems that there is a trace of relief in the reluctance. And there is also some kindness in the relief? Do you really think that my lord has certain needs very frequently, and seeing that Sarah is not in the team? So I want to send you warm? Okay. Now that I understand it, I can go back and give doctors a salary increase. Leon held the book and read it with gusto. And soon, he was immersed in the mysterious academic research and couldn't extricate himself. My lord dot my lord. The two mercenaries shouted several times, but received no response. The lord? who was already fascinated, still kept his eyes on the book. It wasn't until a mercenary stretched out his hand and shook it several times that the Lord was brought back to reality from the ocean of knowledge. Ahem! Have you eaten? Leong swallowed and stuffed the codex into his pocket at lightning speed with his hand speed of over 500 proficiency. Sir! There is an enemy situation! Um! Can there be any enemy in this poor place? Leong stood up and looked around. Several short figures stood a hundred meters away, seemingly confronting several mercenaries. But, look at the weapons in the hands of those people. Either a pitchfork or a rake. Like a few farmers? Let them come over. A few farmers could not pose any threat to him. And Leon still had confidence in this. The mercenaries formed a circle and escorted several guys with trembling legs over. Only then did Leon see clearly that the leader was actually a woman. A strong woman. Short in stature and plain in appearance. But with a very unique figure. Generally speaking, she has a big body, 
a round waist, a tiger's back, and a bear's waist. Your Excellency, you seem to be a brave pioneering lord. Although she was obviously still a little nervous, the woman still spoke first, staring straight at Leon. This woman dressed as a commoner used an aristocratic accent, but Leon always felt unnatural. After looking at this woman, she was wearing a leather coat and an iron sword. She didn't look like a noble. Well, maybe it's a matter of appearance. Is something wrong? Leon didn't want to cause trouble at this juncture, and his intention to send people away was quite obvious. I am the daughter of an earl. We, I mean these people, and I are being chased by some cavalry. Rebels. Fortunately, we found your convoy. If possible, I hope to join you. Team. The Count's daughter? What noble lady would introduce herself like this? A group of civilians being chased by rebels? But there is wasteland all around. There are no villages within a hundred miles. Where did these farmers come from? Leong felt deeply wary. What are the benefits of taking you in? Leong still asked slowly. But his hand had already touched the hilt of the sword. My family was once famous in the arms trade. I am very familiar with the activities of bandits and bandits in this area. No matter where you want to go, we can serve as a guide. Moreover, I can also provide guidance for your team. Cooking. The dishes I cook can even make people swallow their tongue. Cook. This is indeed needed. No one wants to chew hard dry food. So maybe it has this effect. The woman seemed to become more confident as she spoke. And her words became more and more fluent. For a while. It did make it difficult for Leon to tell the truth from a lie. I'm Leon Griffin. I haven't asked for your name yet. Ma'am. If she was really a noble in trouble, Leon felt that he should be polite at least. My name is Reva. Reva Fletcher. Um, Fletcher. Could this be Auden's daughter? Leon was shocked and took a closer look at this woman. She was short in stature, with small eyes and a big nose. She looked very similar to Count Odin. There is no aristocratic temperament, which is also consistent. Odin climbed to a high position from a pioneer lord due to his military exploits and is not an established wealthy family. It is normal for his daughter to be somewhat lacking in etiquette and temperament. After thinking about her words carefully, she probably meant that she was being chased by some knights in Lion Lake City, the territory of the Duke of Alma. This was really possible. The daughter of this Eastern Territory boss has become like this? Moreover, he was picked up by me while he was still in this mess? He even felt that this sturdy woman looked much more pleasing to the eye now. The goddess is looking after me. For sure, Leon, who felt incredible, was a little excited for a moment, and even ignored the name Reba, which he should be familiar with. Now it was as if he had gone to the toilet and found a large pile of gold. He couldn't remember whether he peed or not. Madam, of course you can stay here. We will move towards Chang'e Town soon. Leon changed the name to Odin's daughter, who was Lord Lehman's mother-in-law, and should be called Madam. Great! I just want to go to Chang'e Town. Thank you for your help. Mr. Leong. Riva also looked very excited, looking at Leong as if she were seeing a relative. She even lifted her leather jacket and performed a lame squatting ceremony. Although it looks weird. Wait a minute. Madam, you said someone is chasing you. Where are the pursuers and how many are there? Leong did not forget the trouble this woman might cause. Riva tugged at the hem of her leather jacket and thought seriously. About a dozen. I'm not sure exactly where they are. Mr. Leong. This place is huge. Okay. How can you expect a noble woman to tell you clear military information? Those few submissive farmers are even less likely. Forget it. Being able to cook is enough. Leong sent out a few mercenaries to expand the scouting range. He still had to do things like deal with enemies himself. Chapter 33 What about smart people? In the evening, the sun has not yet set, and there are light clouds sweeping across the sky, giving off a purple glow from the setting sun. The breeze blows in the wilderness in early autumn, bringing with it a refreshing coolness. The alluring aroma of ham stewed with wild mushrooms wafted from the stew pot on the fire and quickly spread to the entire camp in the evening breeze, teasing the group of men who had been busy all day. That stout woman's cooking skills were unexpectedly good. Such a simple combination made her cook a luxurious meal. Leong held a piece of hard bread similar to a baguette in his hand, dipping it in the hot soup and enjoying his first hot meal in two days with satisfaction. The mellow and fragrant gravy covers up the rough texture of the bread. The soft bread covered in the juice is swallowed together with a hot stew. A perfect sense of satisfaction immediately takes over every part of the body. And the fatigue of the day is easily lifted. Of being expelled. 
Instead, there was a slight feeling of comfort and sleepiness. The food must not have been poisonous, because the woman was the first to eat it, and she ate a whole bowl. Most people exhaled contentedly after finishing the meal. And then, as the darkness fell, snoring sounded one after another. The scouts did not find any enemy signs in the surroundings throughout the afternoon, and no other accidents occurred in the camp. Even this disguised nomadic camp is almost ready. In the evening, everyone also had a delicious hot meal. Everything went incredibly smoothly. It was almost as if the goddess of order was covering them in a robe. Early the next morning. My lord! My lord! Wake up! Leon was roughly awakened by his men, rubbed his eyes, and crawled out of the tent. Then, in an instant, everyone became energetic. The camp was in chaos, as if it had been attacked by countless wild boars. Several mercenaries were rummaging around for clothes, and some were even rummaging through the hidden pockets on their underwear. Most of the mercenaries were still sleeping, but every tent had been opened. Leon rushed towards the place where he put his money bag in panic. There was no doubt that it was empty. Clean. Not a penny left. Fortunately, the noble emblem was always hanging close to his chest. Otherwise, it would probably have been stolen. The stocky woman who claimed to be a noble was gone, as were the farmers she had brought with her. However, the pitchforks and rakes remained in the camp, leaning against Liang's tent, seeming to be mocking the greedy and stupid lord. Blow the trumpet and wake everyone up! There was something wrong with the delicious mushroom soup last night. The food is indeed not poisonous, but it only makes people sleep deeper and more soundly. Those mushrooms are harmless to humans, but they have a soothing effect. Everyone was knocked down by such a meal. Someone entered the tent and robbed everyone of their gold and silver, but no one noticed at all. Liang's head was buzzing. He always thought he was smart, but he didn't expect to be deceived by a country woman. An unspeakable sense of shame surged into my heart until I was dizzy. After slapping myself hard twice, I regained my composure. My IQ came back online, and I began to reflect deeply. After feeling that the woman might be Odin's daughter, Leon's mind was completely filled with Dinar, and his mind was filled with how to negotiate the price with Count Odin. That woman's poor acting and speaking skills were actually able to pass easily in front of Leon. At first glance, I could tell that she was a commoner, just pretending to be a noble. I was used to Sarah's elegance and Anson's persistence. The woman's imitation of her hair was as incongruous as Odin's Mediterranean hairstyle. But, but, but with this greedy heart, he still got involved in this evil trick. Leong has always believed that with the accumulation of knowledge of a modern man, he could only deceive others, and he would never be able to trap others in an ignorant continent of Ponde. But reality slapped him hard so quickly. No matter how smart you are, no matter how much world you have seen, as long as you fall into greed, you will be deceived. Moreover, when Leon woke up, he already remembered who Riva was. She was a special character in the previous game who could become a teammate, a robber pretending to be a noble, perhaps in a code-based game. She could only stay in the tavern, waiting for players to strike up a conversation, and then become the player's helper, or be kicked out of the team by the player. But now, anyone can appear anywhere and do all sorts of unimaginable things. In addition, names like Riva are so common. There are girls with this name in every village. And the face in the game is not comparable to that of a real person. Sarah is much prettier than in the game. And Riva looks much stronger than in the game. The previous understanding of the game was unreliable when faced with living people and this vast and dangerous continent. What about time travelers? What about modern people? For Liang, this was a lucky warning. Yes, good luck. Because Riva only intended to make money. Not to kill anyone. But this warning was timely. It made Leong discover that he still regarded himself as the protagonist of this world subconsciously. Human beings think very strangely. Although Leong has indeed always had a sense of crisis when facing the world. In his subconscious, he always has a halo-like protagonist mentality. This kind of mentality hidden in the depths is probably something that every time traveler will have. But now, Leong understands that he has unintentionally made a conceptual mistake deep in his consciousness. This mistake is called arrogance. This kind of arrogance from a time traveler obscured his originally useful brain. The team had regrouped, and every mercenary's eyes exuded frustration and sadness. Everyone's wallets were gone. However, the carpenter said there was no loss. Most of them didn't bring any money, and the woman didn't seem to touch their bags. Fortunately, the weapons and equipment are basically still there, and the camp has not been set on fire. 
The woman even thoughtfully prepared a pot of fragrant oatmeal for them, which was slightly hot in the cold morning wind. But now, no one dares to drink it. This kind of behavior shows that this woman is probably a habitual criminal. And it also shows that she has absolute confidence that she will not be caught. At least she didn't lie in two sentences. She was really good at cooking. And she was also familiar with the bandits and bandits nearby. And she was also familiar with the environment here. In this wilderness. It is definitely hopeless to track down such a thief. Brothers. I'm sorry. Because of my hasty decision. Everyone suffered losses. I don't know how much your losses are. But I have to make it up to you. Leon stood on a carriage. Waved his arms and began to boost morale. Of course. I think you should know that I have also been robbed. So. From now on, after every battle, I will distribute the spoils to you. But for the sake of fairness, you must exchange for heads or prisoners. Brave people in my army will become rich. At the same time, after my territory is established, I will select people with outstanding military exploits from the team as training knights. No matter where you are from, no matter what you have done, I swear on my last name that I will never break my promise. So, you can start learning to read. This is a very simple conflict transfer strategy. Turning internal problems that have already occurred into external promises that have not yet been seen. It is a common approach for modern people. But the tradition of mercenaries is that mercenaries prepare their own weapons and work for money. There is never any distribution of trophies. It is quite common to hide the trophies privately. Unless they hire a mercenary group to fight independently. Although the mercenaries often clean the battlefield. They usually can only secretly hide some gadgets in their arms. Of course, the cash on the enemy's corpse will be left to the person who cleans the battlefield by default. The prisoner's money will also be left to the person who captured him. And no one will pursue it. This is a common practice. And Liang's decision means that this hired force almost has the treatment of a retinue. A pension guarantee. The right to distribute spoils of war. And even the possibility of becoming a noble. The mercenaries couldn't believe it for a moment. But then, a huge noise broke out. Swear to follow the Lord to the death. Leong didn't know which smart boy was the first to shout these words of patting the horse. Regardless, morale was restored and the men looked motivated again. Leong led his men on the road back to Fletcher village, holding his head high and showing no care on his face. But full of sadness, the control skills he thought would improve did not move. Moreover, he really did not expect to suffer such a huge loss in this uninhabited wilderness. The loss was so great that Leon was heartbroken. There were more than 600 dinars in the disappeared purse. But this was a small matter. The main loss was the relic of the original owner's father. The knight sword with a coat of arms on the hilt smooth. That sword is very handy. Although it is not a magical weapon. There has never been any other weapon that can replace it. Moreover, Leon could guess the original heraldic style of the sword. Griffin. Chapter 34 She brought a strange man with her. Chunha Garrison Station. Knight Commander Ralph. I think you can understand Lord Leon's kindness. Sarah sat upright with a sincere expression. Except for her fox-like charming eyes. She looked like a dignified lady in every aspect. But her beautiful big eyes were not obtrusive at all during this kind of formal conversation. Instead, they could increase her affinity and persuasiveness. This is an advantage that neither Leon nor any skilled negotiator has. In a one-on-one -on -one environment, it was easy for Sarah to get a man who is not good at words to be willing to listen carefully to her own voice, especially if she plans to make it a paying customer. However, this time, Sarah, as the sales director, negotiated business on behalf of her boss. After giving guidance based on the prophecy of a certain novice magician, she had easily dominated the topic just as Leong had imagined. Miss Sarah, as you said, I am indeed willing to buy an already built camp. If Lord Leon does not intend to manage that territory for a long time dot but. Ralph had obviously been convinced for a long time. But his expression seemed a little worried. Lord Leon's troops are not strong enough to defend a fortress. Moreover, Knight Commander Ralph. Just as you did not have the right to enter the Horton family's pioneering territory before. As long as it is still the pioneering lord's territory. Then the sentinels who can truly protect Chang'e town. There is no way to move in. Otherwise. It will be a violation of the laws of the kingdom. Sarah slightly laughed at the rigid rules of the Lion Kingdom. But she seemed more trustworthy. My lord also knows that you have been in a difficult situation. Therefore, for the safety of more people in Chang'e town, Lord Leon would rather go to Chang'e Forest to find a place to stay. 
Sarah felt that Ralph had been completely convinced by her. But she didn't know why. But she kept hesitating. Ralph stood up and put his hand on his chest. Please express my gratitude to Lord Leon for me. His wisdom and kindness will be rewarded by the Rangers. However, Miss Sarah, I, Dong Dong Dong, Knight Commander Ralph, there is a military emergency. Just as he said this, there was a rapid knock on the door, and a ranger in green ranger armor, regardless of etiquette, rushed into the room and interrupted Ralph's words. This is a letter sent back by the frontline ranger Pegasus. A beacon fire has been sent out from Fort Brave Shield. Three beacon fires. The Jazza army has assembled. Sorry, madam. The ranger first handed Ralph a blood-stained sheepskin and quickly finished the military situation. Finally, he apologized to Sarah. His expression was extremely nervous, and he obviously no longer cared about politeness and image. Ralph read the letter quickly, and the concern in his eyes instantly turned into determination, and the unfinished words turned into an unquestionable decision. Miss Sarah, I will buy that camp, but please reply to Lord Leong as quickly as possible and ask him to stick to the Tontian River. The horn summoning rangers will rush to reinforce as quickly as possible. But before that, I ask Lord Leong, don't let any Jada people cross the Tontian River. Please, take him with you to inform Lord Leon of my request. Ralph pointed his finger at the ranger who had reported the news. The ranger directly crossed his right fist across his chest and performed a military salute to Sarah. Sarah stood up. She wondered if such a request would bring disaster to her boss. But the flames in Ralph's eyes made her see Leon at the riverside, who covered the world with a wave of his hand. At the moment before the sunset, she saw almost the same look in Liang's eyes. Two different people, different personalities, different behavior methods and purposes. But they have the same determination and appeal that is irresistible. Lord, Lord, had he already thought of such a situation at that time? That's why he stayed in the camp and asked me to negotiate the deal. I will do my best. Knight Commander, I hope your reinforcements will arrive as soon as possible. Friends, come with me. Sarah hurriedly saluted with the fastest efficiency in her life, took the ranger out, mounted his horse, and galloped north. The speed was so fast that even the ranger could barely keep up with her. By the Tontian River, carpenters were resting their camp. They had built a low wall and were nailing baffles on it. Leon assigned Anson an assignment. He needs to teach Anson some swordsmanship. Otherwise it may be difficult for this boy to realize his dream. If you want to be a knight, how can you not even know which side the sword's edge is? You can't hide behind Sarah every time you fight. This is not what a knight should do. Moreover, as a medical staff and a glorious field doctor, if you don't have the ability to protect yourself, if you are hacked to death by the enemy, who will treat the wounded? The homework assigned by Leon was originally for Anson to find a way to stab close with his sword. Later, he realized that he might not be able to complete this assignment in his lifetime. So he changed it to just touching Close's body. But, it still seemed too difficult for Anson. Close was holding a wooden stick, grinning ferociously, and kept abusing Anson, who was already being whipped around. The mercenaries watching the show kept laughing, and some even placed bets on the odds. They bet in a fancy way. The bet was actually on who would be responsible for cleaning the battlefield in the next battle. This is probably because they are all now penniless. Although Close held a wooden stick and Anson held a long sword, the difference in combat power between the two was ten times greater than the difference in their size. Even though Anson had put in all his efforts, he still couldn't touch even a corner of Close's clothes. Anson was breathing heavily. If we only talk about Will, he is indeed a strong person. Even though he was beaten to the point where even Close couldn't bear it, he still didn't give up. As for timidity, this can be practiced slowly. No one is born with the courage to kill. But the problem is that some talent problems cannot be made up for no matter how hard you try. Anson clearly had no talent for using a sword at all. Even Close, who didn't like to comment on others casually, felt that it would be best for the child to switch to non-melee equipment that could be useful even if he was hiding behind it. Such as a light crossbow or a women's crossbow. He deliberately pointed out the type of crossbow because Close knew that if it was a heavy crossbow or the rough steel crossbow produced by Menheim, Anson would probably not be able to lift it flat. This is not sarcastic. Just telling the truth. But Anson felt that he had been humiliated and insisted on completing the homework assigned by Leon. As a result, the two of them fought for more than half an hour. Of course, it was a one-sided beating. At the end of daily training, the total experience points your soldiers gain from training, 420. Leon is not present. 
but the system prompts will not be absent. This is the additional experience that coaching skills bring to his men. But they still need to personally arrange training sessions or assign homework. Leon was reading a book on the wooden roof of the camp. The so-called Memoirs of an Officer is a very good popular novel. But it has less plot and most of the scenes are in the bedroom or bathroom. Penn's writers seem to lack some wild imagination. But this still cannot stop Liang's thirst for knowledge in books. Sir, there are two horses coming from the south. They look a bit like Sarah. Ah, it's Miss Sarah. But she brought a strange man with her. A man with a green hat. On the newly built lookout, a swordsman with good eyes woke up Leon. He was the unlucky guy who had his foot pierced in the pirate camp. Summer. He is also the only strong man in the stormtroopers who does not drink alcohol. So he became a sentinel. The benefit of good living habits is that the workload is greater. Of course, this is called respect. Leong immediately put away the book, jumped off the roof, and quickly headed towards the river. Are you so impatient? You won't start a fight. Right. Summer, who was on the lookout, grinned with a look that every man could understand, and laid down on the lookout to watch the show. Chapter 35 Let's Be Friends Sarah was very uneasy because after she informed Leon of Ralph's request, Leon just nodded calmly and said to the ranger, Okay, I will always stay here. Afterwards, Leon pulled the respectful ranger aside and whispered something. After the ranger made a military salute and left, Leon already had an extra bow on his body. It looked like a very good bow. It seems that Leon is really going to stay here. Otherwise, the ranger would never give his bow to Leon. Sir, do we really have to hold on to the Tontian River here? Sarah didn't want Leon to die here. This was the most different noble she had ever encountered. Sarah, since this is a transaction initiated by me, of course, I have to stay here until the transaction is completed. Leon no longer has the greed of the Philistine in his eyes, but looks more like a simple soldier. But he still talks about the principles of doing business. Sarah was even more confused. She was too scared to walk into the forest when she met the Jada Centurion a few days ago. How come this guy has become a hero now? Do you even dare to challenge the Jada army? It doesn't look like it. Two days ago, he was still scamming me. Stimulated? Sarah, this battle could be dangerous. Do you want to leave for a while? Liang's voice became gentle and low. No, sir. No need. Sarah refused without hesitation. But a strange feeling arose in her heart. She heard a different concern and worry from Liang's words than before. So, Sarah, we can be considered friends. Right. Liang's expression became more and more serious, and his heroic profile stared into the distance, seeming to be hesitating and making up his mind. Sarah's heart beat twice, almost arrhythmia. Of course. Sir, then, can you? Liang's eyes turned to Sarah's tight face, his eyes full of sincerity. Um, Sarah was sure that her heart was arrhythmic. Even that winter, when she killed a dozen men alone that night, she had never been so nervous. She didn't even notice that the fighting in the camp had stopped. A group of men stuck their heads out from behind the wall and lined up, holding their breath and secretly eavesdropping. Can you lend me some money? I'm penniless now. Leon opened his empty pocket. The sound of a long sword being unsheathed sounded. Sarah dot ah. Don't do it. Roll. On the observation deck, Summer, who had been watching the live version of the silent film from a distance, sighed and shook his head. I knew it dot how could you be so impatient to doubt a lady? But Leon, who was scurrying around, was looking at the skill panel with a smile on his face. Your domination, skill level has been increased. In the refreshing afternoon, the sky is clear and cloudless, and the blue sky and grassland tell the story of vitality and beauty. But there was a smell of gunpowder smoke in the air. A huge warning smoke rose over Fort Brave Shield. Even though we were dozens of miles away, we could clearly see the black smoke column rolling straight into the sky. The entire village of Fletcher next door has evacuated southward. The villagers have lived on the border for a long time. So they naturally know what to do when they see smoke. The wooden bridge has been renovated and looks complete. Leon took a few people from Mettenheim up to try it out. The wooden boards on the bridge deck seemed a bit thin, but they should be barely usable. It's just that the wooden piles and piers under the bridge that were originally connected with support would seem to be all separated now. Dozens of wooden piles became independent pillars, and the structure looked much simpler. One end of the bridge is, of course, on the other side of the river, and on the other end, right in the camp. Therefore, this camp is an authentic bridgehead. 
on the side of the camp facing the bridge. A wooden wall has been erected. It was haphazardly pieced together with wooden piles and planks removed from the original bridge piles. It looked quite crude. The wall is not high. Only more than two meters. Even if you include the wooden shield nailed diagonally to the wall. It's only about three meters. But the wall was thick enough for two people to walk side by side. It's more like a fortress than a wall. This fortress completely blocks the exit of the bridge. But from a distance, it looks like part of the bridge deck. As if the bridge deck extends to both sides of the camp. After all, the bridge deck and walls are all unpainted raw boards. So from a distance, they don't look much different. But the fortress blocked the bridge. Even if Leon and the others wanted to leave the bridge, they had to be pulled up by people on the wall. Seeing this visual effect, the soldiers present gained some confidence. Perhaps they could indeed hold the bridgehead until Ralph's reinforcements arrived. Later, Leon summoned all his men and began to assign tasks, including the carpenters. Everyone has their own tasks, except Anson, who is bruised and bruised, and Sarah, who is restless. After finishing the arrangement, looking at his men working separately, Leon felt that he seemed to have overlooked something. Sir, what should we do with those prisoners? Anson asked. By the way, those prisoners. He looked at the two people beside him. One was a kind-hearted weakling, and the other was a woman with an unkind expression. Forget it. Just do it yourself. Dot, it's too late to move them now. I have to make sure they are completely incapacitated to prevent them from causing any accidents. Leon took out the maze from his waist and planned to do the work himself. Anson opened his mouth. But in the end, he didn't say anything. The northeast was filled with smoke and a powerful enemy was approaching. No matter how soft-hearted he was, he still knew what to do. But Sarah grabbed the hammer and stared at Leon with a cold light in her eyes. He also weighed the hammer in his hand. Sarah, I was just joking last night. Everyone was deceived penniless the day before yesterday. And today they are about to face a strong enemy. Maybe there will be resentment. I have to show that I am so poor that I am borrowing money from everywhere. In their hearts, it will balance. This is for the sake of military morale. Don't mind. Give me the hammer. Leong explained with an apologetic smile that he had just figured out the reason for upgrading his command skills. Yeah, it's a joke. I don't mind Dot, but you are the Lord. You shouldn't do such dirty things with your own hands. Sarah's stern eyes did not change at all. She gritted her molars and uttered a few words, then picked up the hammer and entered the barracks where the prisoners were held. Then, bursts of shrill screams rang out in the barracks. I'm kidding. I'm telling you to be kidding. Friend. Humph. Don't run. Stretch out your legs. I'm telling you to be kidding. Sarah's voice was also mixed in with the screams, which seemed particularly harmonious. Leong and Anson looked at each other. Anson murmured, Terrible woman. Sir, didn't you study the book I gave you carefully? Shut up. Anson, dot wait. Is it shaking? Leang's feeling was correct. The bridge deck had indeed begun to shake. After a few seconds, the trembling sound could be clearly felt even on the ground. From light to heavy. From far to near. Summer on the lookout shouted, Enemy attack! North! The Jada people are coming! It was a cavalry of about 300 men, divided into three centurions. Horse hoods rumbled in, stopping suddenly on the north bank of the Tontian River. The collision of the quiver with the horse's body. The harsh sound of the saber being unsheathed. And the neighing of the horse were all intertwined. A chilling feeling came over me. The Jata cavalry on the opposite side began to send people to patrol along the river bank. And several cavalrymen holding spears quickly went back and forth along the river. The large army gathered across the river. At the other end of the bridge. Don't make a sound. Everyone prepares for battle. Chapter 36 Come Here Leon looked at the Jata people on the other side of the river. Then at the chain armor face covering helmet in his hand. Then raised his hand to look at the chain armor on his body and suddenly told his men to keep quiet. Then, he put on his face-covering helmet and stood on the fortress-like wall, exposing his upper body to the simple wooden baffle. In his hand is an eagle strike bow, which was borrowed from the horn summoning ranger. Anson called out worriedly, Sir! But as soon as the words left his mouth, Leon waved his hand from behind to stop him. He just stood quietly and waved to the other side of the river, seeing Leon waving. Someone from the Jata people's team on the other side of the river also came out. Probably a leader. Because he also wears a chainmail face-covering helmet of the same style as Leong. As the grassland people on horseback and natural robbers. 
The Jata people are neither good at nor capable of making high-tech equipment, such as plate armor. Their armor is mainly studded leather armor, or light chain mail. Of course, this is also because their fighting style is not suitable for plate armor. They pursue the mobility required for plundering, as well as the endurance and flexibility required for mounted shooting. Among the Jata warriors, those who are the most capable and brutal elite war riders, or the Jata warlords who control an army, all like to use this kind of chain armor helmet that can hide their face. Probably because he has done too many bad things and is afraid of being recognized. The Jata man coming in front of him should be a small warlord. Because unlike most of the Jata cavalry behind him, he wore thicker armor. And his horse was also covered in patchwork armor. This is obviously a person who does not need to consume horsepower frequently. So he deliberately pursues better survivability. That is, leadership treatment. Although the dusty equipment does not look gorgeous at all, and is inconspicuous among the Jata people. This is the true appearance of battlefield equipment. If you dress up too handsomely and conspicuously, you will be attacked by the enemy. Of the Jata warlord looked at Leon, who was also wearing a face-covered helmet, and seemed to hesitate. He stood at the bridge across the river and asked something. But across a river, I couldn't hear it clearly. Even if you can hear it clearly, you probably won't be able to understand it. Seeing this, Leon raised the bell in one hand and waved it and shouted something with the fingers of the other hand. Come here! The attitude was very relaxed and natural. Like greeting an old friend. This was originally just to boost morale. To show that the Lord was relaxed and free-spirited without fear of powerful enemies. And to let his brothers relax. Anyway, the person on the other side probably couldn't hear clearly what Leon shouted. But I didn't expect that the Jata warlord opposite actually came over. He only took two of his followers and stepped onto the wooden bridge. The three of them and three horses lined up and trotted onto the bridge. Those two followers should be Jata war riders with chain armor and visor helmets. Exactly the same as Liang's outfit. It wasn't until they reached the middle of the bridge that they suddenly reined in their horses. At this time, the three Jata men finally saw clearly the fortress in the camp blocking the other end of the bridge. Tightly blocked. And the moment they reined in their horses and stopped, Leon laughed loudly and said, Shoot the two in the back! This helmet which was originally just for hiding one's face, turned out to be a rough and improvised method. While he was speaking, the eagle bow in his hand shot an arrow at an incredible speed, almost without even aiming. Bispa! The Jata warlord shouted loudly and drove his horse in a panic to turn around and return, but was blocked by the followers behind him. And at the moment when the Jata warlord turned around, an arrow had drawn a slight parabola and accurately penetrated his calf. The arrow shot very deep into his calf which was only wearing leather riding boots. The arrow nailed the Jata warlord's leg directly to the horse's belly. The horse raised its hooves and roared horribly. And the violent movements caused blood mist to burst out from its abdomen. However, the horse still did not run around, but only paced around in place, shaking its head and tail, screaming in pain. This is truly a well-trained war horse. What a shame. Leon once again drew the bow in his hand. This arrow passed through the eye of the war horse and the quivering arrow feathers brought up a few drops of the horse's tears. The war horse stopped whining and fell silently to the bridge with its owner. The huge body pressed down on the Jatu warlord's nailed leg. One of the two followers behind him was pulling over to make way, while the other abandoned his horse and flew in front of the fallen Jatu warlord, apparently intending to block the arrow with his body. Several crossbow arrows were also fired from the shooting holes in the wall baffle at the same time. On the bridge with nowhere to hide, Two brave Jatu war riders were hit by arrows one after another. The one on the side fell off his horse and fell into the river. This small broken bridge had no guardrails. The one who blocked the arrow was shot into a hedgehog as he wished and fell in front of the Jatu warlord. This Jatu warlord was probably a very brave tribal leader. He struggled to hold on, looked back at Leon who was holding a bow, and desperately shouted an unintelligible Jatu dialect. Asa! Jatu! The effect of these short Jata words was probably similar to Ula's. The Jata cavalry on the other side of the river immediately began to swarm towards the bridge with manic roars. And the sound of Usha resounded through the sky. Close! Get ready! Leon shouted loudly, placing the arrow on his bow and pointing it at the Jata warlord. But he did not pull the string again. The Jata cavalry on the other side of the river was about to step onto the bridge. And the thunderous horse hooves caused violent vibrations. The Jata warlord who had been watching Leon calmly waiting for death seemed to realize something. He tried to stand up, but was pinned down by the horse and couldn't get away. 
he had to turn around and shouted to his subordinates. Bispa! And he crossed his hands in front of him, as if intending to wave to indicate that he wanted to make a movement to stop his progress. But before he could do anything, Leon shot him down again. This arrow shot through his arm and pinned his hand to the bridge. The unexpressed instructions from the Jata warlord's mouth turned into meaningless high-pitched screams. He struggled extremely violently and even tried to pull out the legs that were pressed under the horse's belly. The arrows on his legs were broken due to the struggle and blood flowed profusely. But the brave warlord still seemed to be struggling to stop his men from charging. But Liang's third arrow penetrated the crook of his other leg and completely locked him on the bridge. There was no way he could stand up again. These three accurate, but not fatal arrows made the little warlord howl violently. But the more they howled, the more they prompted the swarming Jata cavalry to rush onto the bridge and rush towards their leader. The Jata people are also human beings and have a strict hierarchy. They must rescue their leader. This hastily repaired bridge is very narrow and has no guardrails. Even if one has excellent riding skills, it can only accommodate two cavalrymen walking side by side. Moreover, horses will unconsciously slow down when riding on them. All living things have the instinct to avoid danger. The hastily laid wooden boards are thin and soft, and horses can sense it. Just as the fastest Jata cavalrymen stepped onto the bridge, a row of crossbow arrows were fired. Several cavalrymen screamed and fell off their horses. The injured horses spun on the bridge, blocking the enemies behind them. Afterwards, harsh buzzing sounds continued to sound, and the crossbowman, who was originally of average ability, exerted his maximum output ability in this target practice-like scene. On the bridge, many disabled people or corpses gradually piled up. The bridge was also stained red with blood. The Jatta riders were blocked by the casualties at the bridge and the horses without their owners. Some smart Jatta people have already dismounted and they have realized that the horses cannot run as fast as people on this bridge. Some of the Jatta took off their nomadic shields and crossed the corpses at the bridge. A foot charge began. If people stood side by side, three or four people could probably squeeze into this bridge. Dozens of Jatta people who were carrying shields were now crowded at the other end of the bridge. The horizontal crossbow arrows had little effect against the shields, and the crossbowmen slowed down the frequency of shooting. Only the bow and arrow in Liang's hand could still accurately avoid the shield, biting the Jada people's flesh one after another. But a bow and one person cannot actually stop the advance of dozens of shield-wielding warriors. The Jata people finally rushed to the center of the bridge and reached their leader's side. But at this moment, the piers under the wooden bridge began to make crisp cracking sounds. Close. Cut. Chapter 37 Idol in the Waves. Kala. The thin wooden bridge deck could barely bear the weight of dozens of Jata people. But under the bridge, two wooden piles had been severely deformed. Moreover, after the dong dong dong, sound of logging was heard under the bridge. The sound of cracking began to come one after another. The violent tearing sound even covered up the Jata people's shouts of killing. Clothes and a few brave carpenters were working as lumberjacks under the bridge. Swords and axes were flying up and down non-stop. The Jata soldier in the front row realized something was wrong but the crowd of people behind him made it impossible for him to retreat. He could only continue to move forward. He even put the shield over his head and tried his best to speed up. Ka ka ka. Long. Maybe the decision of the Jata man in the front row was correct. But as more cracking sounds were heard, the bridge deck finally collapsed. And dozens of Jata soldiers fell into the cold Tontian River along with the bridge deck. Behind them, several cavalrymen who were clearing obstacles also fell into the river from the bridge. The dozens of wooden piles in the middle of the river were all broken at this moment. All the wooden piles fell down due to the collapse of the bridge deck, then sank in the water for a while, then resurfaced and were washed away by the current. This is of course Liang's technical adjustment. The wooden piles in the middle of the river have not been cut by clothes and the others. But the cross sections are still neat and have been sawed long ago. And the connecting wood for reinforcement has been removed. The river water instantly became extremely turbid. Several horses that fell into the river surfaced screaming and were gradually swept downstream with the current. But most of the Jata people who fell into the river were submerged in a few breaths. Although the river here was not rushing, it was still not shallow. And it was more than enough to submerge the Jata people wearing armor. Only a few people emerged from the water, grabbed some broken boards and swam back desperately. But their lives were immediately taken away by crossbow arrows fired from the camp. It seems that this grassland people are not all landlubbers. However, anyone who comes out of the water is a living target. And these Jata people obviously don't know how to swim underwater. 
the Jazza warlord also fell into the river. In fact, his men did successfully rescue him, at least into the river. However, he was wearing heavy armor, and his arms and legs were penetrated by arrows. It would really be a miracle if this situation could still come to light. Watching helplessly as their leader flopped a few times and then disappeared into the water, some Jatta people began to search downstream along the river, and more Jatta cavalry became a little overwhelmed, and the queue was in a mess. But on Liang's side, the two shirtless mercenaries began to take off their pants while watching the enemies on the other side, who were briefly confused. One of them asked uncertainly, Sir, if we capture him, everything on him belongs to you. The two naked men were so excited that they jumped directly from the fortress into the river and disappeared after entering the water. Almost two minutes later, they emerged from the water dozens of meters downstream, still carrying the Jata warlord who had fallen into the river. The Nagata warlord seemed to have fainted, probably from suffocation in the water, and the arrow wounds on his body were not fatal. The two, white stripes in the waves, glanced at the Jata people on the other side who seemed to be holding their bows and arrows, and took a deep breath. Then the two naked men once again took the Jata warlord and dived into the water and disappeared. When they emerged again, they had already appeared on the river bank on the side of the camp. Then, they panted heavily and quickly dragged the unconscious Jata warlord to the edge of the river. Close rushed out from under the bridge to pick them up and drag them up from the steep slope of the river bank. Then, a few people rushed to the side of the camp, facing the river. This side was the fort, and they had to take a detour. A few howling shouts came from across the river, and the Jata people finally began to bend their bows and shoot arrows. But across dozens of meters of river, two shirtless men were carrying their leader and running very fast. Even the best archers would worry about accidental injury. Moreover, Close was protecting Close, who was heavily armored with only a slit for his eyes behind them. He was not afraid of long-range high-throw arrows fired from across the river. As a result, only a few Jata people who were extremely confident in their archery skills shot a few sparse arrows. The arrows should be very accurate, but none of them hit the target, and they were all blocked by Close's sword. Seeing two Changha town mercenaries carrying the Jata warlord into the camp, Leon let out a sigh of relief. This improvised trick worked. God is bless. Thanks to the mercenaries in Changha town. Most of them are very good at swimming. Boys who live by the lake all year round have grown up playing with water. The Jata warlord was quickly placed on the fort. He was tied to a wooden stake and erected in the middle of the wall. Like a statue. Anson even carefully stopped the bleeding from the arrow wound on his body. The warlord's equipment was still on him. And Leon couldn't communicate with the Jata people because of the language barrier. He was worried that after taking off his equipment, the Jada people opposite would not recognize their leader. In fact, Leon really didn't want to deal with the Jada people. After all, they didn't understand the language, and it would be difficult to lure them in no matter how cunning and clever they were. You can only rely on hard work, which is completely inconsistent with Liang's way of thinking. Sir, on him. Don't worry. After the battle is over, it will all be yours. A shirtless mercenary who was all wet shook his head. Sir, that's not what I meant. He had a sword on him, which looked very much like the sword you had before. But it sank in the water, and we didn't have time to fish it out. Leon was stunned for a moment. But then he smiled. It's just a sword. Let's talk about it after the battle. Thanks for the hard work. Brother. The mercenary smiled proudly, and seemed very proud of him. Thank you for your hard work, sir. I will fish it out for you tonight. Don't worry. I won't covet your sword. Seeing the warlord erected on the wall as a statue, the Jata people opposite became obviously more confused. The Jata people lost their unified command at this time. The leader was captured, and the Jata force, composed of three centurions, was clearly divided into three factions. A group of horses rode back and forth along the river bank, trying to find a place to cross. A group of people were watching across the river. Many people took off the bows on their backs and tried to shoot at the fort ridge where the crossbowmen were. But the existence of arrow shields made their efforts in vain. There was another team, which seemed to be playing tricks on themselves and retreated slowly, probably because they were unwilling to do so. Put! The hired crossbowmen were still firing crossbow bolts from the shooting holes to the opposite side. The safe shooting environment allowed them to aim slowly and carefully, and they could achieve good results even across the river. Several of the group of Jata cavalry who were watching across the river fell down in just a few breaths. Then, they left the bridge and began to swim along the river bank, seemingly looking for a way to cross the river. 
Liang did not want the Jata people to have the idea of forcibly crossing the river. He stood up, stood behind the Jata warlord and began to draw his bow and arrow. Fifteen degrees upward shot. Pull the string to your cheek. Exhale. And hold your breath. Let go. The bow body rebounded steadily, causing the bow string to make a gentle hum. The arrow drew a wonderful arc, then swooped down from the sky, like an eagle piercing the sky, and landed on the head of a Jata cavalryman who was swimming on the river bank in the farthest distance. The sharp cone pierced the nomadic helmet and penetrated deeply into the back of the cavalry's head. The cavalryman didn't even have time to say a word before he fell down softly. Sabia! Bispa! The Jata people beside the cavalry shouted in fear, scattered, left the river bank, and retreated farther away. Only his horse, still pacing where he had fallen, whined and sniffed its master's face. Chapter 38 Skills are uncontrollable. They are all good horses. Unfortunately, it is not available on the other side of the river. Leon gritted his teeth and pulled the bow. Another arrow landed on the head of another Jata cavalry wandering along the river bank. Sabia! Bispa! The Jata people on the other side once again let out messy exclamations. But no one raised their bows to respond. In front of Leon was their leader. Moreover, it is difficult for their nomadic bows to be so accurate at such a long distance. Anson flattered him in surprise. My lord, you've got a great shot. Leon shook his head. Anson, my shooting skills are not a perfect shot. This can only be regarded as an effective way to practice archery. Anson frowned in confusion and murmured. Then, what kind of thing would it be? A headshot with an arrow from 800 miles away. No, it's the kind that can hit any target at will without having to aim at all. Leon didn't speak anymore. He needed to concentrate on feeling the rhythm of each arrow. Bows and arrows will miss even if there is a problem with the breathing rate. Proficiency will bring about basic skills and techniques, allowing the body to coordinate and stabilize the shoulders and elbows. But as proficiency gradually improves, the requirements for people's character and goals become higher. If you want to become a true archery master, you have to rely on feeling. Target shooting can help you practice basic skills to the extreme, but that feeling can only be found in actual combat. There are few bow and arrow confrontations in the arena. So Li Ang's proficiency with bows and arrows is far lower than that of melee weapons. Although his favorite weapon is bows and arrows, Li Ang is actually not willing to charge from the front row. Maybe it looks brave, but it is too easy to die young. Only by being cowardly can you live longer, especially for a lord. Charge into battle, unless you have no choice. The lord doesn't want to be a boar rider. Looking at the Jata people who were still wandering by the river, Li Ang shot a few more arrows. Each arrow could take away a Jata cavalry speeding along the river bank. All of them were hit by arrows in the head. Leong is expressing his attitude. Don't even think about crossing the river. If you get close to the river bank, you will die. Yes, you will die if you get close to the river bank. After several cavalrymen fell by the river one after another, the Jata people realized this. There were more and more shouts of Zabia and Bispa. And no one from the Jata cavalry approached the river bank anymore. Afterwards, the three groups of Jata people finally seemed to reach an agreement. They seemed to have given up on rescuing the leader and retreated temporarily. But they did not retreat too far. They began to gather in the forest on the other side of the river, probably to cut down trees. Ah! Long live! Everyone in the camp stood up and cheered for this unharmed victory. But Leon didn't cheer. If there were still injuries after such thorough preparation, then he wouldn't have to mess around in the future. And this is just the beginning. The first defense of the bridgehead seemed successful, but it could not stop the Jata people for a long time. After all, Leon only had about 20 crossbowmen, and there was no place to replenish the crossbow arrows. Leon only had a dozen arrows left in his quiver. The Jata cavalry on the opposite side were cutting wood, naturally in order to cross the river. Once they cross the river, the wall facing the river will lose most of its effect, and perhaps tomorrow there will be a really tough offensive and defensive battle. Originally, Directly destroying the bridge could also stop the Jata people. Liang's temporary bridgehead was actually to see if he could increase the results of the battle and earn some extra capital. Now it seems that he has indeed achieved the result of defeating dozens of Jata people and delaying it for some more time. And thanks to his helmet, he managed to get a hostage. This little warlord was probably a pioneer officer. But I don't know if this hostage is useful. After all, Liang can't understand Jatu. The smoke above Brave Shield Castle has been flying which means that the Jata army is still within a hundred miles. These enemies in front of us are just the advanced team. 
After retreating to the camp, Leon began to review his system. There is a prompt in the system that I never bothered to read. Your teammates' skills have been improved. You can check the skills of your teammates. By the way, the battlefield function of this system is only half. There is no battlefield reminder, nor will it prompt the experience gained by shooting the Jata people. There is some improvement in proficiency in actual combat, but there will be no deliberate reminders. This tip about teammate skills appears for the first time, and it is not a level upgrade, just a skill upgrade. The wording, look up, is also quite unexpected. None of the soldiers under his command must have advanced. Although the crossbowman caused dozens of Jata cavalry casualties, it stands to reason that there should be people who can upgrade. But this cannot be reflected without changing their equipment. In the team list, only Anson's name lit up. Instead of the familiar plus sign, the name is highlighted which means it's just a lookup. Not an enhancement. This was also the first time that Leong saw the attribute panel of his teammates. There are also no basic attributes such as strength and intelligence. And experience and level are not clearly listed. In fact, Leong can't see experience and level in his own attributes. The skill points he once obtained in the arena were obtained through continuous training. After all, this is not playing a game. There is no so-called earning experience points by defeating monsters. There is only real practice and the accumulation of actual combat experience. The same is true for the advancement of arms. It depends on combat experience, proficiency, and improvements in various aspects of equipment to reflect the changes in the ranks of arms. For example, from Mettenheim adventurers, to Mettenheim infantry, to great swordsmen, and finally to the death squads. Different arms in different countries actually have similar ranks. This is the class of warriors, or a professional title. But there is no system for classifying the characters themselves into levels 1 and 2. In fact, the real advantage this system can bring to Leon is the rapid improvement of proficiency and some personal skills. This is not a complete system, and it is probably not even a so-called player system. Therefore, when the basic force sensitivity attribute cannot be seen, proficiency is the most reliable criterion for judging naked combat effectiveness. And Anson's proficiency. All 60. Oh! The one-handed weapon is 61. Probably because being beaten for half an hour last night had some effect. Generally speaking, he is better than a farmer or the like. After all, he is a nobleman and must have received some training at home. However, considering the weak strength he showed, if you're lucky, you might be able to tie with a carpenter? Unsurprisingly, personal skills such as iron bone strike are all zero. Riding and running skills are not bad. Both are level two. Being able to ride a horse is a basic quality for a noble child. Healing, four, speeds up recovery from injuries. Surgery, three, reduces trauma mortality and reduces disability. First aid, two, improves emergency treatment effect. Although his personal combat effectiveness is not worth mentioning. These medical skills are Anson's greatest role in the team. Although the effect is not exactly the same as the skills in the game, the functions are generally the same. And they are all medical-related skills. But, but, but the biggest problem is that Leong discovered that he could not add skill points to Anson, and there was not even a column for available skill points. The skill improvement of teammates is actually uncontrollable. Leong turned to look at Anson in surprise, only to find that Anson had been looking thoughtfully at the eagle strike bell on his back. Leong immediately checked it again and then discovered that Anson actually had a level 1 strong bow. Could Anson's skill improvement be due to the phrase Master Sharpshooting on the battlefield just now? But you are a doctor. Chapter 39 The enemy comes from behind. Probably it was Anson's own wish to improve the strong bow. He may know that he really has no talent for swordsmanship. Seeing Leong controlling the battlefield with one bow, he probably also came up with the idea of becoming a marksman just like the horn summoning the rangers, becoming a bound knight. My doctor, if you really want to be a knight, it would be better for you to be stronger than to have a strong bow. Leon sighed. He originally planned to quickly raise Anson to level 10 for healing, but he didn't expect it to be out of control. Leon has always valued medical care, which can directly save his life after all, but his own medical levels cannot be upgraded and have always been only level 1. Probably it comes from the medical common sense of a modern person. Therefore, Leong really wanted to train Anson to be a miracle doctor. In this way, maybe the wounded in the team could be resurrected with full health and full of energy after taking a nap. But the reality is not as simple as the game. It seems that I still have to guide myself. Ahem. 
Anson, it's time for you to start your homework for today. Oh no dot sir dot you can't do this. Then why don't you use those prisoners to practice your medical skills? Sword practice or wound healing? You choose one. It will be your homework today. Aye. I'm going to see those prisoners. I hope Miss Sarah didn't beat them to death. At night, it rained heavily. And the night in the wind and rain was as dark as ink. There were no stars in the sky. And you couldn't see your fingers. The mercenary who was good at swimming went down the river based on his memory. After fishing for a long time, he fished out a noble knight's sword. This is indeed the Ang's original one. The one stolen by Reba. But how did it appear in the hands of this Jatu warlord? It had only been two days since it was stolen the night before, and it was found again. That Reva unfortunately ran into the Jada army when she was running away. Or maybe this Jada troop happened to be under the jurisdiction of Shurhu city yesterday? Etc. Etc. Leong suddenly thought of what Reva said. My family used to be famous in the arms trade. Is there a possibility that this Reva sold the sword to the Jata people? If it is like this, an idea popped into Liang's mind that he found unbelievable. Could everything she said about Leva be true? If she could really trade with the Jada people, her surname would really be Fletcher. So is there a possibility that the current Reva is indeed the daughter of an earl as she said? But she is indeed not a noble, but an unrecognized one. After all, she really looks a lot like Count Odin. Although he couldn't understand it, he still had to thank the crossbowman for letting him find this family heirloom. So Leon gave this swimming expert the right to freely choose his trophies. He chose a war horse that he had previously captured from the Red Brotherhood. This turned the mercenary crossbowman into a less qualified mercenary rider. But nothing in the team list changed. This swimming expert claimed that his riding skills were good, but he could only ensure that he would not fall off while riding on the horse. Generally speaking, his riding skills were only slightly weaker than Fauché's. The next morning, the sky was gloomy, and there was still light rain in the sky. The smoke in the direction of Brave Shield Castle is no longer visible. On the wet grassland on the other side of the river, only mud holes left by the horse's hooves were left. The Jata people disappeared. None of the Jata cavalry could be seen on the other side of the river. There were only a few corpses left, naked and neatly placed on the grass by the river bank. The Jata people left very cleanly. They took away everything on the corpse, took away the ownerless horses, and also abandoned their yesterday's logging results. A small pile of logs that had been cleared of branches on the wooden wall of the camp. The Jata warlord woke up from his coma and muttered a few words that he couldn't understand, and then ignored Leong and Anson who planned to feed him. Leong took off his helmet and tried to talk to him, but the warlord remained silent and even stopped opening his eyes. The lord couldn't understand why the Jata people suddenly gave up their leader and evacuated when they already had the materials to make a raft. They were perfectly capable of making rafts to cross the river. Leon was already prepared to hold hostages and delay. However, just when Leon thought that the camp should be temporarily safe, Summer on the lookout shouted, Sir! There is a woman running over! She looks a bit like Miss Leslie! Is she alone? Yes! Sir! Is Leslie here to give away the proceeds from the loot? It shouldn't be. Just like Khan, and the others bring the cash money back and that's it. Leon was stunned for only a moment, and then quickly ran out of the camp to meet the businesswoman. His intuition told him that something had happened. Leslie was not riding a horse, holding a dagger in her hand, wearing a blue dress and galloping in the rain, and completely ignoring the mud and water splashing on her body. This way! Leslie! Leon shouted loudly that Leslie had not been to this camp, and she seemed to be preparing to run to Fletcher Village. Hearing Leon's voice, Leslie ran towards the camp entrance on both hands and feet, shouting loudly as she ran. Lord Leon, we have encountered Jada people, at least 200 of them. My brother and Khan are trying their best to stop them in the mountains behind. Hurry, sir, save them. They are not far to the south. Leslie's whole body was soaked by the rain. Her eyes were red and swollen. Her face was full of fear. And her face was covered with water and mud. As soon as she ran to Leon, she almost made the matter clear. I haven't even breathed yet. A strong woman. She didn't even cry. But the tightly clenched fists and the bloodshot eyes could still make people feel the fear and helplessness in her heart. Close obviously heard Leslie's shout and ran out of the camp, carrying a big sword on his back. He has not taken off any equipment since the battle started yesterday. My lord, I request departure. I must rescue my compatriots. Leong did not show any hesitation at this time and he could not show fear or hesitation at this time. 
He nodded and turned around and ran towards the camp, shouting as he ran. Gather your stormtroopers. Close was stunned for a moment, as if he didn't expect Leon to agree. Those are 200 Jata people. After taking a deep look at Leon, Close turned around and shouted. Assemble the stormtroopers. Summer on the observation deck was about to climb down to gather. But he seemed to notice something and turned back to look south. Everyone in the camp has already taken action. Hurriedly starting to get dressed and line up. But Leon, who ran to get the bow, sighed at the 200 Jata people who appeared behind him. This showed that the Centurion team that he and Sarah met were not the only ones who entered the hinterland of Changa town. Just as I was thinking about it, the team list changed, Mettenheim Infantry. October 10th. Oops. It's too late to rescue the caravan now. Two Mettenheimers dead. If Leslie can run over, then obviously the place where the caravan was attacked is very close to here. Most of the Cato troops came for this camp. Because the place he occupies is the only place for those Jata people who have entered the country to return to the grassland. They would attack Leslie's caravan in the south. Probably just because they met along the way. The Jata people are cavalry. They are probably already nearby. Now, I'm afraid we have to face the enemy head on. I had anticipated most of the situations. But I didn't expect that the prestigious Horn Call Ranger group would not be able to deal with the Jata people who had entered Changha town a few days ago. After so many days, Ralph, a good for nothing, could actually let the Jata people run away? No wonder Sarah said Ralph was hesitant. Chapter 40 No Choice This Time After mounting Alice and carrying a bow, Leon trotted to the entrance of the camp. Sarah, lead the crossbowmen to defend the camp. Stormtroopers, are you ready? But the stormtroopers had not yet finished gathering. Samur on the observation deck probably finally saw it clearly and shouted loudly. Enemy attack! South! Then he jumped down from the observation deck and ran towards the formation of stormtroopers. Jada people! They are coming! Close and Leong turned back suddenly. Leslie collapsed weakly at the entrance of the camp. Tears finally rolling down her face. Now that the Jada people have left the battlefield where they attacked the caravan and are here. Everyone including herself can realize the fate of her caravan and her brother. That shy young man will never come back. Those two Medenheimers can't come back either. Leon looked at Sarah. Only to find that Sarah turned back to look at him. Sarah hugged the sad Leslie. Gently rubbed her chest. Patted her back. And led her back to the camp. Then, the extremely smart vixen asked what Leon also wanted to ask. Leslie, you will leave Chungha Town. Has something happened in Chungha Town? Sarah was more approachable than ordinary people. And her soft voice calmed Leslie's grief somewhat. Leslie wiped it on her face randomly. But tears still burst out of her eyes. Yes. There was a battle in Chongha Town. So I brought the caravan here with Khan and the others. Lord Leon. Please give me a sword. Leon shook his head. You should rest. Leslie. It's not your turn to play before we fall. The words were very heroic. But Leon felt very sad. He knew what was going on. Except for the Tontian River to the west of Chang'e Town. There were probably Jata cavalry teams in all directions around Chang'e Town. Since he and Sarah could encounter Jata people 500 miles away from the border, there was probably more than just that 100-man team. The team entered Chang'e Town. Both Leon and Sarah realized this. So they rushed to report the news so urgently. The defense method of the Horn summoning rangers is dynamic. A chain-type defense that affects the whole body. This kind of defense system that uses the horn as a call and responds quickly to rescue is highly efficient and has few loopholes. Rangers and rangers have been very successful in quickly intercepting foreign enemies in dangerous border areas. But the problem is that once enemies appear in the hinterland of the kingdom, and multiple Jata guerrillas appear in all directions at the same time, the horn rangers will be involved in the surroundings of Chang'e town, tracking back and forth, and they will be exhausted because they have to save every village. And when there are horns blowing everywhere, the chain defense will focus on one thing and not the other. And troops must be assigned everywhere to carry out traditional regional defense. Therefore, Ralph must ask Leon to guard the Riverside camp. This is indeed the entrance for the Jata sentries to secretly enter the hinterland of Chang'e town. No more Jata people can be allowed in before the fugitive criminals in the hinterland are cleared out. At the same time, in order to prevent Liang's prophecy from coming true, this camp must fall into the hands of the Horn Call Rangers and become a ranger station. So that the people of Chang'e Town can feel at ease. The three beacons at Fort Brave Shield and the news of the Jats army gathering prompted Ralph to eliminate the internal enemies as quickly as possible so that the rangers stationed in various places could be freed to reinforce the border. 
so he first asked Sarah to ask Leon to hold on, instead of directly bringing the team to garrison. Because at that time, Ralph wanted to send all his men out to chase down the Jata people who were wandering in the hinterland in order to quickly annihilate them. According to Liang's original idea, the Horn Rangers, who have a large number of rangers and are familiar with the terrain, now that the entire army has been dispatched, should be able to quickly deal with several small Jata troops that are running around, and then come over to take over the defense of this camp. After all, there won't be too many Jata people sneaking into the hinterland to cause trouble. So he agreed readily. He thought it would be enough to guard the banks of the Tontian River for a day or two. He was still confident that he could hold off the enemy across the river for a while. Judging from Ralph's request, Ralph should have thought so at the time. But here's the thing. Neither Leon nor Ralph expected that an accident would happen inside Chungha Town. Leslie said that there was a battle in Lunga Town. There is only one explanation for this. While Ralph sent out all the troops and the Lunga Town garrison was empty, someone launched an attack from within and planned to seize Lunga Town. Who is it? Who the H? L else could it be? But this is braving the disdain of the world. This is blatant robbery. When the Jata army retreats, the horn summoning rangers will definitely tear apart those who capture Chang'e town to the last dregs. But the question is, what should I do now? Facing 200 Jata cavalry coming from behind. The camp is undefendable. How to fight? Leon drew out his sword. Bring the guy down to me. It seems that we still have to charge into battle and risk our lives. This time, I really had no choice. I may have underestimated the Jata people's tactical execution level and also underestimated the plans of these. Pander native nobles. Their calculations are much more complicated than in the game. Sir, are we going to break out? Close seemed ready to fight to the death. No, I can't let you get into a fight to the death. Leon did not act rashly, nor did he lead the stormtroopers to break out. Instead, he asked everyone to retreat to the camp. Almost all of his men were infantry now, and it was absolutely impossible to outrun the Jata people's horses. Quick! Everyone get in! Get to the wall! Leon waved his hand and told everyone to hide in the barracks or on the fort ridge. He even led the horses to the corner of the camp and tied them under the fort ridge. The wooden fortress is hollow underneath and can hide many people. However, seeing that Leon himself did not move, clothes did not move either. Sir, I am not afraid of death. Following a brave captain to charge is not a fatal battle. Close, obey the order and hide. The Jada people came quickly. Just two minutes later, these cavalrymen were trotting all the way and gradually surrounded this small camp. Just like what Leong and Sarah had seen before. These Jata people also carried all kinds of messy daily necessities on their horses. Leong even saw a few bottles of familiar coconut wine. The 200 or so men stood a 100 meters outside the camp and did not charge rashly. It has been raining in the sky. And the nomadic bows of the Jata people will get damp. And mounted archery will be greatly reduced in this weather. The ground was extremely muddy which was not conducive to the lancer's charge. The camp is located on the bank of a river, with uneven terrain and gentle slopes in the valley nearby. Horses are not flexible in this environment, so they didn't take action immediately. Of course, it may have something to do with Liang's current posture. Liang was standing in the middle of the camp posing, holding the Jata warlord in his hand as a shield. He was neither riding a horse nor using a gun, holding the warlord's neck with one hand and holding his sword with the other. There are no exterior walls on three sides of the camp, and the low fence is only used to enclose the land to prevent horses from running wild. This one meter high wooden fence cannot stop anyone. The furnishings inside can be seen at a glance. The empty camp is full of debris, and no other people can be seen. The Jata warlord was obviously a real tough guy. When he saw his people, he seemed to be planning to call out something, but he could no longer make any meaningful sounds, and could only whine and struggle to release some fuzzy noises like flies. Leon had blocked his mouth. Although he was still wearing equipment similar to that of a Jata war rider, he certainly couldn't fool the Jata people this time. And he didn't intend to fool them. Delaying time is the only result Leon wants to achieve now. The Jata cavalry outside looked at this strange scene and seemed to be frightened. They even sent two teams of about ten people to search around the area. Chapter 41 Fight Boy! This camp is obviously abnormal. The Jata people are very experienced in fighting. So they will not attack easily while scouts were sent out to investigate. Two centurion-looking war riders from the Jata team also came out, shouting a few words in incomprehensible Jata language from a distance. The meaning was unclear, but there was a word in it that Leon understood. That word is, Wan. 
Liang also understood the intentions of the two centurions. Without Liang, the bridge would have been repaired. They were probably asking Wan to come out and send them across the river. It seemed that Wan was not completely telling the truth after all. He actually knew the purpose of this camp and knew the Jata people. He was able to deceive Leon and Sarah with nine truths and one falsehood in the torture before. He indeed has excellent acting skills, enough to win an Oscar. However, since one is dead, he can no longer be used to deceive the two Jada people. Sarah's face, which was hidden under the fort, turned gloomy. She must have heard this word, and she probably felt a little guilty. The Jata warlord next to Leon began to struggle violently after hearing these two words, but his neck was pinched by Leon. His body was tied. His mouth was blocked. And the helmet on his head covered his entire expression. He can't convey any useful information. The two war riders carefully looked at the terrain around the camp. Then looked at the struggling warlord. And then retreated. They were divided into two centurions. One branch is at the foot of the gentle slope to the south of the camp. Facing the doorway of the camp. It is an opening without a fence. It is considered a doorway for the time being. But in fact there is no door. The other branch wandered on the relatively flat east side of the camp, and on the west side was a hillside, which was the direction one escaped from before. It was not very convenient to ride a horse. This is a posture of cautious siege. But Leon had no intention of breaking out, but was planning to delay. One more minute of delay would increase the chance of reinforcements arriving. The Jata people's caution was just in line with his expectations. Then, the Jata people surrounding the camp took off their bows and drew out their arrows. They all looked at Leon posing in the middle of the camp. But no one raised the bow to pull the string. It is raining in the sky. And the Jata people's hard bows and horned bows will be affected. And their accuracy will be much worse. They probably did not intend to accidentally kill the warlord in front of Leon. Leon was actually quite nervous. Fearing that the other side would fire a barrage of arrows. What if the Jata cavalry didn't intend to pay attention to the captured little warlord? He kept pinching the warlord. Actually planning to use him as a shield if necessary. But it seems that the Jada people need to pay attention. The status of this warlord is probably a little higher than the two centurions outside. It's normal. This guy led three centurions before. And his status must be higher than that of a centurion. The Jata people had prepared bows and arrows. Probably just to prevent themselves from breaking out. After more than ten minutes of confrontation between the two sides, the Jata people's scouts returned. There was no ambush around. As a result, the Jada people began to attack tentatively. They only sent out the team down the gentle slope. The team on the side was still staring at Leon with their bows. The Jata people who launched the attack did not use their good mounted shooting, but rushed toward the camp with lances. The cry of Uzza rang out again. Obviously, they didn't want to accidentally injure the captured Jata warlord, but they weren't too worried. They probably just didn't want to accidentally kill the warlord by shooting arrows with their own hands. But they didn't care at all whether Leon would kill him. Maybe they belonged to different tribes. The gentle slope in front was not too steep. But the ground was muddy and uneven. And the horse could not run too fast. Leon dragged the Jatu warlord back slowly. And retreated to the wooden fortress. Ahead, in the splashing muddy water, a dozen cavalrymen took the lead and poured into the camp. The one at the front was one of the two centurions. There are many obstacles in the camp, which are not a good place for riding horses. There are piles of wood, stone stoves, various messy wooden shells, and horse troughs. Everything is there. However, the leading war rider seemed to be very confident in his riding skills. He still did not dismount and rushed straight towards Leon with his lance. Close! Just when the lance was only a few meters away from Leon, Leon shouted, and then sent the Jata warlord forward to block in front of him. The war rider was really good at it. He pulled the horse in the wrong direction, and then made a cross stroke with a handsome gesture. The horse immediately stopped with its hooves raised and let out a crisp scream. But within half a second, the horse's neighing stopped abruptly. Clothes suddenly jumped out from the inconspicuous pile of grass next to him. And the big sword in his hand brought up grass clippings flying in the sky. The sword light swept across a huge half-moon shape, dividing the confident war rider into four parts, including man and horse. The blood sprayed all over him, dyeing his heavy armor a bright red ruby color. Stormtroopers! Ha! Huh. Half of the ten stormtroopers were holding big swords, and the other half were holding a one-handed infantry sword in each hand. They sprang out from all corners of the camp, and each pounced on the enemy closest to them. The enemy closest to Liang had dismounted and rushed towards Liang with a shield and a scimitar. This was probably an elite member of the centurion's men, 
and they were also wearing face-covering helmets. But Leon shook the human shield, and then chopped the Jasmine man to the ground with a sword with one hand. The speed of the sword was extremely fast, and there seemed to be no movement at all, and even the light of the sword could not be seen. This knight's long sword, which he is most familiar with and comfortable with, may be difficult to cut through high-quality plate armor. But when facing lightly armored enemies, it is like a magical weapon in Liang's hands. There was no rain of arrows above their heads, and the camp was deliberately piled up so that the enemy could not charge with lances. In this environment with many obstacles, the strong men of Mettenheim could fight against any enemy. Try to choose the battlefield by yourself and make the environment suitable for you. If you can ambush, you must ambush. If you can make a sneak attack, you must make a sneak attack. This is Liang's usual operational thinking. It is also all the things that can be arranged in the short minute before facing the enemy. In this kind of encounter, no ingenious strategy can be used. The tactics of war are nothing more than those of heaven and earth. The right time, right place, right people. Well, the number of people is indeed a bit small. There were no enemies around him, and the crossbowman had already started shooting arrows. Leong threw the Jatsu warlord back and rushed out with his sword. Sarah took the human shield from behind him and placed the sword in her hand across the warlord's neck. But no one noticed. Leslie ran out from Sarah, holding a short spear in her hand at some point, and bravely pierced a Jatsu man who had his back turned to her. The Jatsu man was struggling to resist Samur's surprise attack, but he didn't expect to be raped by a woman. Leslie's eyes were blood red at this time, and her face was extremely ferocious. She stepped on the dead Jatsu man, struggled to pull out the short spear, and a large amount of blood was spattered all over her body. The blue skirt was dyed an eye-catching purple-brown color. Then, like a man possessed, she turned around and started looking for other opponents. But a Jatsu man who had dismounted was rushing towards her from behind. Anson, who was also hiding next to Sarah, saw Leslie's behavior, suddenly pushed down the wooden board in front of him, gritted his teeth and rushed behind Leslie with a sword. I don't know whether Anson was lucky or the Jatsu man behind Leslie was too weak. This sword, which was almost a random slash, successfully hit the vital part of the Jatsu man and cut half of his neck open. The head was almost broken, and a large wave of blood spattered on Leslie's face again. Leslie turned around with blood-red eyes, and saw that it was Anson. Then she looked at the Jada man who fell at Anson's feet. The blood in her eyes seemed to be clearer. Anson dragged Leslie and ran under the fortress. Go back quickly! After throwing the brave businesswoman into his original hiding place under the Fort Rich, Anson turned around and stood guard in front of Leslie with his sword raised in both hands. His hands were trembling slightly, but his posture at this time was firm and without fear, like a true knight. Chapter 42 If You Are Afraid of Death just jump into the river. The rain gradually became heavier, and the cold wind coming from the north mixed with the increasingly dense raindrops made it almost difficult to keep one's eyes open. Probably after this north wind passes, winter will begin. Big raindrops were caught in the wind and hit the helmet with a crackling sound. The wet rainwater penetrated directly into the lining along the gaps in the chain armor, bringing the chill to every part of the body. But the violent wind and rain could not dilute the blood soaked in the soldiers. In the camp, the corpses of the Jata people were already spread all over the ground. Several other horses also fell to the ground. Most of them victims of two-handed swords. All the water on the ground has turned into thick blood mud. And the bright red liquid is flowing down the gentle slope. In the center of the camp, countless Jata people were lying upside down. And some were even stacked on top of each other. Basically, they only have one injury on their body. But it is always on the fatal vital point of the face. Neck. Heart or between the legs. These are all the results of Liang's battle. As long as he can kill his opponent quickly, he doesn't care where he stabs or kicks him. Liang was already covered in blood, and the blue-gray chain armor had completely turned into reddish-brown. The covered helmet had been soaked black with blood, and only two eyes of the bloody helmet were exposed, making him look like a demon. The chain armor on the left chest was torn, and rolled up to reveal scarlet flesh, which was a stab wound. In the melee, no matter how skilled you are. It is difficult to dodge the swords and guns from all directions. But the sword in his hand was swung again. And it was still like lightning. But there was no sword light. But this time, the sword blade tore through half of the opponent's chain armor neck guard with some difficulty. And made a gash at the opponent's throat. The opponent was not dead. But he covered his neck with blood gushing out and fell to the ground. After cutting down more than a dozen people, 
the sword seemed a bit blunt. Liang has also clearly felt his physical fatigue. He is not the kind of madman with infinite endurance. In fact, he is better at one-on-one -on -one combat. He picked up a nomadic shield that belonged to the enemy with his toes and took a breath. A few meters away from Liang was Close, whose whole body was already glowing red. The shiny plate armor became extremely eye-catching after drinking blood, and his tall and burly figure made him more like a demon than Liang. The corpses around him looked miserable. They were basically described as chunks. It was almost impossible to find a whole corpse. The only one who was relatively complete was the cavalryman he cut down at the end. The crude sword in his hand had been completely deformed, but it was still terrifying and heavy. With the roar of the wind, the sword slashed across the waist of a cavalryman. The sword became an S shape, and the Jada cavalry became a B shape. The great sword has been blunted into a block of iron. Behind the two men, there were stormtroopers standing in a row, but there were only eight of them left, and all of them were dripping with blood. The enemies, or one's own. Behind the stormtroopers was the wooden fort ridge, with a row of crossbowmen squatting on the ridge doing their best. At the bottom of the fort, Anson had put down his sword and was giving battlefield first aid to two seriously injured Mettenheim infantrymen. There were no standing enemies left in the camp at this time. Bispa! Bispa! After suffering at least 50 casualties, the enemy shouted and retreated, and did not continue to charge. The camp was already full of corpses and debris, and the Jada cavalry could only fight on foot. As for Bujan, all the big guys in the camp in front of him seemed to be very strong. In the era of cold weapons, a quarter of casualties was enough to collapse the morale of most troops. But these Jada people did not. They even maintained good obedience and calmness. This is the real reason why the Jata cavalry is terrifying. They marched without any discipline or strategy. And they charged with no formation at all. They looked like a rabble. But they were never afraid of death. They have their own social form and honor system. And fearlessness of life and death is the basic concept in their honor system. Moreover, there was a reason why they had to attack this camp. They crossed the river from here. And this camp was the way back to the grassland. After all the Jata people in the front retreated dozens of meters away, another centurion, who was patrolling on the side, led his team to the front of the formation and shouted something loudly. Then he drew his saber, cut himself in the face, and smeared the blood on his forehead. This self-mutilating behavior seemed to be contagious. His men all took out their sabers and cut themselves on the face. Everyone's forehead was covered with bright red finger marks. The Jata warlord, who was gagged in the camp, saw the scene and made a ka 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 sound with his throat, as if he was laughing. And then, he tried to put his neck to Sarah's sword blade. But Sarah put the sword away quickly, causing the warlord to attempt suicide. Down the gentle slope, after the collective self-mutilation and plastic surgery of all members, a cry of, Asa! Jatu! restarted the battlefield. Asa! Jatu! All the Jatu men took off their bows and began to fire volleys despite the wind and rain. Their self-mutilation seemed to be a ritual and the result of the ritual was that they no longer cared about the captured warlord. Stand back. Raise your shield. A wet bow will reduce its elasticity, resulting in low arrow power, and even worse accuracy in wind and rain. But more than a hundred archers firing arrows at the same time do not need to be very precise. No one can hold back the random arrows. The arrows fell like locusts caught in the raindrops. Leong raised his nomadic buckler and retreated to the edge of the fortress. The crossbowmen were trying their best to fight back but it was difficult for their crossbows to be accurate in the wind and rain. The shortcomings of the Medenheimer's inability to use shields were clearly revealed at this time. Close of steel armor jingled, and the thick plate armor blocked several arrows. But a cone-headed arrow still pierced the seam of his shoulder. He rolled around and found a large wooden board to barely cover his body. The other Medenheim infantrymen were almost in dire straits. Without shields, they were forced to hide in the nearby barracks. The tents and wooden roofs could barely hold on for a while. The crossbowmen were also baptized by the rain of arrows. Most of them had shields, but they had nowhere to hide on the fortress. And the arrows flying in the wind and rain still caused a lot of casualties. Half of them held shields for cover, and the other half used crossbows to fight back. But the obvious gap in numbers and rate of fire made it difficult for them to raise their heads. Fortunately, most of them were from Chongha town and they did not run away when faced with the Jada people. After several rounds of arrows, the three hired crossbowmen fell down the ridge of the fort, splashing huge waves in the river on the other side. The Jada people once again sent more than 50 people to dismount and charge. The big men who were good at foot combat were suppressed by the rain of arrows. 
No one in the camp showed up. When they rushed into the camp, the rain of arrows from the Jata people on the outside did not stop. This is an indiscriminate coverage shot. Leon picked up Anson's sword and faced the enemy, shouting loudly, If you are afraid of death, you can jump into the river to escape. No one will blame you. This is for the crossbowman. The cunning lord actually has a secret behind his words. Maybe some people are indeed afraid of death and want to run away. But who would admit it at this time? So this sentence attracted a lot of ridicule. Afraid of genitals. Whoever runs away is the chicken. This is the voice of the swimming expert. After a burst of laughter, the real hard fight began. The Jada people charged without fear of life and death. And the front of the camp was quickly filled with people. This was indeed the melee that Leon wanted. But it was definitely not the scene he wanted to see. Clothes and the stormtroopers fought furiously. And every strongman already had bright red wounds on his body. The crossbowmen had also jumped off the fort ridge, pulled out their infantry swords, and stood in front of Anson and Sarah. They entered a state of hand-to-hand -hand combat, and they had no crossbow bolts. And just after Leon paid the price of having arrows inserted into his thighs and shoulders, and struggled to pierce a war rider, he heard a deep and clear sound coming from the distance. Woo da woo da woo. This is the sound of a trumpet. Accompanying the sound of the horn is the duller sound of horse hooves, which is loud and powerful, from far to near. Chapter 43, The Conspirator The horn summons the rangers. They are finally here. The centurion of Jatu on the periphery also shouted, Bispa! The voice was high and rapid. The Jatu people receded like a tide and regrouped on the flat land under the gentle slope. With their backs to the river bank, the Jatu centurion looked back in despair at the battlefield camp where corpses were piled up. Those devils covered in blood were still standing in the pool of blood. A few hundred meters away, countless rangers in green smocks were galloping around, gradually surrounding them in a skirmish line. The sound of horses' hooves stepping into the standing water resounded. Then, the centurion led more than a hundred Jata cavalry, who had just assembled and launched a charge towards the south. Uzzah! Jatu! This is the right choice. We can only fight on foot in the camp. Even if we kill all the people in the camp, they will only be trapped in the camp. Only in the south is there flat land suitable for cavalry to break through. And is there a road to survival? As long as they can break through the encirclement of the horn rangers. Yee you. The sound of the horn became more urgent. And hundreds of rangers in green armor rushed towards the front of the Jata people. Behind the rangers, there were more troops. In the wind and rain. I couldn't count how many there were. I just felt that the ground was full of green galloping horses and it seemed that the ground was connected to the sky. Leon sat down on the blood-soaked mud, panting heavily and watching the battle down the gentle slope. Ralph, you came just in time. Just give it to me. The Jada troops rushed left and right, but they could not avoid the back and forth of the rangers. Then, they began to charge into the formation one by one with their rifles raised. A team of ten people in the front row charged with lances, and after a distance of more than ten meters, another team of ten people charged forward. This is the form of chisel formation. They want to use constant chisels to open a gap and break through the siege of the rangers. But this is also the most casualty way of rushing into battle. With violent collisions and various howls, several ten-man teams were submerged in the green sea of people. The Jada people behind them rushed together again and almost broke through the siege of the rangers. But in the end, they still failed to break through the last wall. That was Ralph, wielding a long war spear, with a green cape flying behind him and no enemy in front of him. The Jata people wearing gray chain armor finally fell down and disappeared into the battlefield. No one surrendered. Their final desperate charge resulted in at least dozens of ranger casualties. Close walked up to Leon and said, The Jata people are all qualified warriors. Although their military discipline is poor, they obey military orders and are brave and fearless. Such a charge reminds me of the death squadron. Leon looked back at the corpses all over the camp. Then he looked at all his injured men. Close. You can also train the stormtroopers into death squads. Anyway, I will never fight such bad wars in the future. Leon gritted his teeth, stretched out his hand and gestured twice, but still didn't dare to pull out the arrow stuck in his body. I looked at Anson and saw that he was dealing with the seriously injured. But Leon didn't call him. Close also looked at Anson, turned his head, and was silent for a while. Sir, you are the nobleman who most resembles Count Medenheim that I have ever seen. You have a high. What a piece of shit. Sir, the last thing I want to do is charge into battle. Leon interrupted directly and sneered at Close's poor flattery. 
he wanted to live for two more years. The Count was said to have died on the way to the charge. Don't you just want me to teach them how to practice swordsmanship? Closed? Closed? I didn't expect that you, a thick-browed and big-eyed man, would flatter you. Sir, you are so considerate. Okay, this flattery is even worse. Ralph had already climbed up the gentle slope, with a ranger without a bow and arrow beside him. He dismounted and stood next to Leon. Did anything happen to Mr. Leon? They didn't recognize that the monster covered in blood was Leon. Leon pulled on his helmet, and the thick blood seemed to stick the chain armor to his head, gritting his teeth. He pulled off the helmet and brought out a large string of blood beads, which fell on his body in a steady stream. My lord is not dead yet. His. Lord Leon. You? Ralph was obviously shocked, with a look of disbelief on his face. Knight Commander Ralph. Unfortunately, there is no clean place. Please feel free to sit down. Leon didn't stand up. He looked up at the two green helmeted knights with arrows stuck in their thighs. He didn't want to move now. The two cuckled knights frowned and looked at the corpses and broken limbs on the ground. There seemed to be nowhere to put his feet. And the entire camp was a pool of blood. I'm sorry. Lord Leong. I didn't expect them to escape. I've never seen a noble like you. Ralph was a little at a loss. Seeming to want to help Leon up. But also seemed worried about touching his injury. Okay. Ralph. Don't say it's useless. The Jata army in Fort Brave Shield is a cover. Take your people back to Chana Town quickly. Your home has been attacked. Leon twisted his sore neck. No. Sir. I know what happened in Chunga Town. But? There was obvious anger on Ralph's face. But that was done by a group of so-called traitors. And just after they captured Longa Town, the Duke of Alma led his family knights to eliminate them. Sir. You you should understand what I mean. Leon was stunned. Then, he stretched out his hand to signal Ralph to help him and stood up. Duke Alfwan. Was he killed by the so-called traitor? Then Alma took over Alfan in the name of the Avenger. One family. Ralph carefully supported Leon inside. Most of Duke Alfan's family were killed. The traitors claimed that this was due to the hatred of their wives and daughters who had been robbed. Hua. Has Alfan really done such a thing? Perhaps. But my lord. The problem is that they killed the unworthy women in the Duke's family. The so-called wives and daughters who were robbed. But left Alfwin's wife. Lady Bella. Behind. There's nothing wrong with him. Only by leaving his wife can he fully take over the inheritance. Maybe half a year later. The old woman will give birth to a posthumous son. Leon looked at Ralph. And saw that Ralph's eyes became dull. And he looked at Leon as if he was looking at a manifested god. Lord Leon. Do you really know the prophecy technique? The ranger next to him had adoration written all over his face. What do you mean? Oh. Your bow. No. 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 Sir. Archduke Alma did declare that Duke Alfwin's wife, Lady Bella, is pregnant. As a good friend, he wants to raise Alfwin's child. I'll go dot how old is that lady? About 50 years old. This is really a bitch and a shame. Alma's shameless and shameless operation makes even Leon feel inferior. Sure enough, cunning and shamelessness are both virtues. Look at how successful other people's plans are. Chapter 44 Horse Lovers So, Ralph, you are no longer the commander of the city defense army? Lona Town nominally belongs to the so-called child in Mrs. Bella's belly. But in fact it completely belongs to the Duke of Alma. It is estimated that most of the people in Odin will not be able to stay. Yes, sir. I was not a knight of the kingdom to begin with. I was only entrusted by the Earl to take charge of defense deployment. Now all the rangers serving in Long River Town have been dismissed by Lady Bella. And the garrison has been replaced by the Duke of Alma. The people who brought it... Ralph was obviously unwilling. But he had no choice but to say, Sir, even though we all know that this is the Duke of Alma's plan, all his actions are legally and morally defensible. Even if we have any dissatisfaction, we can't let the rangers attack their hometown. Indeed, it is quite tenable. Let the bastards and the Red Brotherhood contact the Jatu. Use the Jatu to lure the Horn Rangers from Long River Town to put out the fire. And then the Jatu army assembles at Fort Brave Shield, causing all of Ralph's troops to leave the station. Then a group of so-called traitors were used to capture Chang'e Town. If nothing unexpected happened, these rebels were either pirates or the Red Brotherhood. In the end, the great Archduke Alma personally led the army to wipe out the rebels in Chang'e Town. And timely saved Lady Bella's life.
Then, as a benefactor and close friend, he raised Lady Bella and the so-called posthumous son, whom he got from nowhere. I don't know how cruel a 50-year-old woman must be to be able to conceive a child with a paraplegic old man. Anyway, all the bad things were done by the thugs of the Red Brotherhood. Archduke Alma quickly put an end to the chaos and even gained the gratitude of the people of Chang'e Town who didn't know the truth. If it hadn't been for Leon's prophecy in advance, Ralph would have been kept in the dark. But now, no one can do anything about Archduke Alma. And he has almost no clues left, except for those few prisoners of the Red Brotherhood. Well, Ralph, I suggest you develop your business on the border first. Let's talk about our deal. I still have a few prisoners here who may be of some use to Count Odin. In fact, there was nothing to deal with. Ralph happily gave Leon a good price for 20 sets of horn-calling ranger equipment, as well as enough food to sustain 50 people throughout the winter. Yes, there was no dinar. After all, Ralph himself was not a rich man and had just lost his job. Although there are no gold coins, these cuckold equipment are valuable. This camp alone is not worth so much money. Ralph includes the prisoners in it. As Count Odin's most trusted subordinate, he knew the role of these prisoners to Odin in the current situation. Ralph will build this place into a ranger's garrison. As long as he is willing, Count Odin can grant him a knighthood at any time, and then use this place as his knightly territory. He did think the same as Leong. He didn't like the intrigues among the nobles, but he was willing to make meritorious deeds on the border. Later, the ranger Raphael, who lent his bow to Leon, took a hundred people and put on the jaw to people's equipment. He wanted to go shopping near Lion Lake City according to Leon and Ralph's original plan. Before, I just planned to frame him. But now I am framed and retaliated. I hope Odin can seize the opportunity and be shameless. The ground was littered with Jata corpses and horses. And the ranger soon dressed up as a hundred or so Jata raiders. You should wear this. Leon handed his bloody helmet to Raphael. Ah. Yes, this is the helmet of the Jata Warlord. Sir, is this a gift from us to each other? I hope you like my bow. Ranger Raphael seemed very happy and did not dislike the old, blood-soaked visor at all. Well, then I seem to have taken advantage. The performance of that eagle bow was quite good, and it was obviously worth much more than the helmet. Leong felt a little embarrassed now. When he could take advantage, he always thought about taking advantage of it. When others really didn't care, he was worried that he couldn't stand up in terms of face. No. Sir. This helmet is a testament to your bravery and wisdom. How many enemies must you have killed with your own hands to become like this? I took advantage of it. Raphael seemed to truly feel that it was a great honor to get this helmet. And he didn't even want to wipe the blood on the helmet. The eyes are clean and pure. As long as you like it. By the way. Do any of you speak Jatu? Leon asked the right person this time. Ralph and Raphael both knew a little bit about Jatu in the hometown of their father and son, at the junction of Chang'e Forest and Jata Grassland. Jata people were often encountered. Sir, why are you studying the Jata dialect? I captured a Jata warlord. Raphael's eyes now seemed to be looking at the god himself. Dot god dot no one has ever been able to capture Jata's top brass. Aren't they all going to fight to the death? Leon was the last person to receive treatment from Anson. The stab wound on his chest was a superficial wound. Not serious. The legs and arms were both penetrating wounds. And there was no possibility of excessive blood loss, as long as the arrows were not pulled out. This style is respected by his men, and the collective respect of the Horn Call Rangers. It's just that Leon doesn't really want this kind of respect. It hurts too much. It's actually very uncomfortable to pretend to be a tough guy. After a short rest, Raphael said goodbye to Leon and crossed the river to go to Shuru City to fool around. While Ralph stayed in the camp to help Leon interrogate the warlord. Leon wanted to know how the warlord got his sword. He felt that with the Jata people's ability to adapt to the mountains, they probably wouldn't be able to catch up or kill Leva, a bandit who was familiar with the terrain. If Reva could really trade with the Jata people, then he would really like to find this woman. Not for revenge. Just to be a profiteer. Of course, if possible, it would be fine to take revenge. The lord is very small-minded. But this warlord who had always kept silent seemed to have no desire after all 200 Jata cavalry died in battle, and seemed to only want to die. There is no point in using torture like this. Moreover, he had suffered several injuries, and was extremely weak. Ralph had no choice but to try to threaten and cross-examine. But most of them had no response. It wasn't until Ralph looked at the dozens of Jata horses remaining outside, and said something that the warlord finally opened his eyes. You can't do this! 
That's just a horse. Ma Dan! It turns out you can speak human language. Although he just jumped out word by word. The meaning was clearly expressed. The warlord did not want those horses to be harmed. Ralph smiled and said, Sure enough. Every Jataman loves horses. Dot the same goes for the Desha people. Dot the horse is their brother and god. More important than their wife and daughter. Sarah leaned over and said softly beside her. Since I can speak human language, I only have one question. Where did you get this sword? Leon showed the sword to the warlord and then added, Answer my question. I will give it to you. Heal your wounds and save your life. The warlord turned his head to look at Leon and shook his head. I will die. Horses. You can't eat. Okay. I didn't expect Ralph to eat horse meat to get him to open his mouth. Sure enough, the cultural core of every nation is eating. The most reliable way to distinguish between nations and beliefs is to see what can and cannot be eaten. Okay. I promise to raise them fat and strong. My question shouldn't embarrass you. But if you don't answer this kind of question, we will have to eat horse meat soup pot. And I promise, you will also will eat a lot. Leong motioned to the Jata warlord to look at the deflated cauldron in the middle of the camp. There were two horse legs hanging diagonally on the edge of the pot. After being cut in half by Close's sword, half of the horse crushed the iron pot. Chapter 45 I will keep my word. Sword. Woman. Sell it to me. Thief. Border. Smuggling. The warlord did not dwell on this simple question. The origin of the sword had no impact on his tribe. Ralph explained next to him. It seems that a thief sold it to him. This is actually very common in Chunga town. Sir, if the thieves get weapons, they will definitely find a way to sell them to Jatu as long as there is a way. People, because they won't be tracked and can be sold at the best price. The Jata people don't engage in smelting. Although they are considered enemies, the Duke of Alma does this as well. Leon smiled strangely, as if he was joking. Did Count Odin do it too? Ralph looked around and saw that others were busy cleaning the battlefield. So he whispered, Occasionally, there will be scrap equipment that has been eliminated. Anyway, everyone will sell it. Brothers have to make some money. And also used in exchange for horses from the Jata people for breeding. Leon really didn't expect this to happen. It turns out that the strength of the Jata people was also cultivated by everyone. No one of this warlord group, which does not engage in production, but only plunders, has been isolated in the grassland for hundreds of years, but has not turned into a savage. The so-called never trade with any force turns out to be just never official trade. Fortunately, I thought it was so mysterious. Can you find the woman? Leon poked the warlord who was in a daze. No, thief. I can't find him in the mountains. Okay, you are gathering the army this time just to cover the Duke of Alma? How much did you charge him? Leon also wanted to satisfy his curiosity. But when faced with this kind of problem, the Jata warlord stopped talking. Kill me! What a pity to kill! Leon thought of this warlord's outstanding horse. The war horse that was injured by an arrow and still didn't run around. I said I won't kill you, Dot, okay? I won't ask you anything about your tribe and army. But other small talk should be okay. Right? What's your name? The Jata warlord looked at Leon suspiciously. Drash? Those horses outside are my trophies. I need someone to feed them. Otherwise their only end will be to become hotpots. Drash looked at Leon with hateful eyes. Don't look at me like that. I can't help it. All my men are infantry. No one knows how to raise horses. Drash looked at the mercenaries cleaning the battlefield outside. Sighed. And his eyes dimmed. You? Don't tell me. Credit. Don't talk nonsense. I'm spitting on you. Um? Don't you understand? I'm true to my word. Forget it. Let me tell you straight. I plan to let you take care of these horses. Otherwise my subordinates will definitely I'll eat them. Leon pointed at the iron pot. And then waved his finger at the big and muscular men. Close. Who was in the distance? Saw Leon waving to him and ran over in a hurry. Sir. Shall we eat horse meat for lunch? Leon just wanted to give him a hundred likes. But this guy didn't hear anything. He could cooperate so well just by relying on his foodie instincts. Drash finally collapsed. You? You can't. Eat the horse. As a result, there was an extra line in Liang's team list. Drash? The groom? The friendliness is definitely not high. But it doesn't matter. This guy really loves horses and can take good care of them. Anyway, as long as you can make it into the team list, there will definitely be no problems. Although this system is not perfect, 
it can at least identify whether someone is joining sincerely. After re-preparing for a day, Leon planned to lead the team to leave. He wanted to find another place to establish a territory and send the relics of the mercenaries who died in the battle to their hometowns. This kind of promise regarding his subordinates. The Lord really does what he says. Leslie's caravan escort and the two Mendenheimers who died in the battle have also been found in the valley not far away and were recovered by the rangers. The Jata people who were eager to return to the grassland only destroyed the caravan without looting their equipment. As before, the Mettenheimer's relics were given to clothes for safekeeping. Mettenheim Infantry February 10th Four of the mercenary crossbowmen were killed and one was disabled. The current team list is Mercenary Crossbowmen June 18th The two refugees were fine, but everyone else, including Leong, was injured, except for the carpenter who had not officially joined the team. There were no more than 10 people in the entire team who could still maintain combat effectiveness. It was a sad loss. But this was the battlefield, and the damage would have been much greater had not the bugle calls for the rangers arrived in time. Leong did not give any morale-boosting speech this time. He just silently fulfilled his promise. Fulfilling a promise without compromise is far more effective than any incentive. The trophies have been distributed according to the gains. But without exception, everyone asks for bonuses to be paid to everyone after they are cashed out. It's not because the subordinates suddenly became noble and felt sorry for the Lord's poverty and were willing to let him work as a middleman to make a profit, but because no one wanted to increase the number of people with a lot of chain armor, nomadic shields, scimitars and the like. Own weight. All of them were injured. Can't carry it. But this makes the Lord quite troubled. This lot of junk is not easy to deal with. If you operate it randomly, you may have to pay for it. Not to mention making a difference in price. After looking at Leslie, who had generally recovered her emotions, Leon moved closer. Leslie, um, do you want to rebuild your caravan? The Lord was a little cautious. He didn't want to irritate the poor girl. No, sir, thank you for your kindness. I can't rebuild the caravan. Everything I have is gone. Leslie's eyes were dim, and she was playing with a dagger in her hand, which looked like it might be a relic of her brother. But I think you don't want to live on the streets. Leslie, your brother fought so hard for you to escape. Not so that you have to have a job to support yourself while you are living in a foreign land. Leon didn't speak politely, but his voice was very soft, full of the magnetism that a good person should have. Anson couldn't bear it. Sir, we should take Leslie with us on the road. Sarah, who was next to her, dragged Anson away. Come on, help me look at my hand. Recently, it always wants to hit people involuntarily. Sarah is so smart. She has long seen the familiar look in Leon's eyes when he looked at Leslie, which is roughly the same as the look in the eyes of capitalists and employees when they sign the contract of sale. In the tavern, Leon looked at Sarah with the same look. Sarah swore that she would never forget it in her life. She had never met such a nobleman. Faced with her obvious provocation and beauty, this guy only wanted her to do odd jobs for him. Leslie, you know, I lack a quartermaster in the team whose salary is quite high. Lord Leon, if you really want to comfort me, why not drink two drinks with me? Ahem. That's okay. Two hours later, the Lord was spinning like a top and fell onto the carriage. Disheveled and flushed. One more drink. The ale in his hand was scattered all over the floor. Lord Leon, I will be a good quartermaster. Leslie clinked the wine glass in her hand with the empty glass left by Leon and said calmly, Leslie has joined your team. By the time Leon, who was half drunk, woke up again, Leslie had even sorted all the things. Leon, who was still dizzy, reluctantly hit his aching head. He felt that he was just careless. How could he be drunk by Leslie? You didn't do anything stupid. Right. Only Close looked at Leon sympathetically. Sir, none of the dozen of us were her opponents that day. But, who is the little girl number 88 you are talking about? Anson brought a bowl of hangover soup from the side. Um, sir, Miss Sarah is beating those prisoners again. Mr. Ralph can't even persuade her. It's quite miserable. With a group of scarred subordinates, Leon embarked on the road south. Ralph, a local snake, told him about a good place, an ownerless village that had just been plundered by the Jata people. There, it might be a good place for a pioneer lord to develop smoothly. Chapter 46 The Mysterious Female Voice The sky after the rain is very clean, with a refreshing coolness. After staying in the bloody battlefield for several days, I could feel the fragrance of the earth again, 
and see the dew on the nearby trees. The atmosphere in the team became much more relaxed. The team moved very slowly because everyone was injured and most of them were sitting on the carriage. And they also hauled a lot of stuff, including food, trophies, equipment, horse feed, etc. All heavy goods. These carriages were pieced together by carpenters and some of the parts came from the battlefield where Leslie's caravan was attacked. More than a dozen carriages formed a long convoy and finally took away all the Lord's people and goods. This is all thanks to Leslie's reasonable overall arrangements. Of course, it was also due to Leanne Shameless taking away half of the carpenters. Ralph didn't care about this matter. In fact, judging from Ralph's appearance, he had no intention of returning the carpenter he borrowed from Changa Town. Maybe when people ask for it, he might even say that they were all abducted by Leong. The person who can temporarily take over the command of the city defense army will naturally not be an honest person. This can probably be regarded as one person sharing half of the spoils. Of course, the carpenters didn't matter. They worked under Leon and Ralph, and their wages were much higher than those in the town. In fact, the dozen or so carpenters who followed Leon were all very happy. The Lord even asked them to participate in the distribution of spoils saying that they also contributed to the battle. And they felt that the Lord was a fair man. So these carpenters also officially became a line in the team list. Carpenters. October 11. One of them had been injured by an arrow before. Since the carriages were all made up of rags that had been patched together and temporarily repaired. Even with Leslie, a logistical quartermaster who was good at moving quickly, taking care of things, the team still couldn't move quickly. But fortunately, no one wants to rush now. In fact, they enjoyed the rare leisure time along the way. The Lord was a good boss who kept his word. The only problem was that he never gave his employees holidays and occasionally had to work overtime. There were migratory birds flying constantly in the sky. And occasionally there were birds that were not afraid of death and hovered over the convoy. And from time to time, they would tease the convoy by sticking their butts out. Fortunately, Leon, who was lying drowsily in the carriage, was not hit by the bird droppings. Anson was running around energetically on his horse, holding up his bow and planning to shoot down a bird. This was a practice assignment that Leong casually assigned to him. Anson was probably really interested in bows and arrows, but he never shot a single bird along the way. He kept riding around to retrieve the missed arrows, so he probably gained a lot of riding experience. In order to commend Anson for his outstanding performance in the last battle and to ensure the safety of the team doctor, Leon gave him a set of cuckled equipment, which was one of the 20 sets of Horn Ranger equipment that Ralph gave him. Except for the bow. Of course. It's not that he can't bear it. The main thing is that with Anson's current arm strength, he simply can't draw the Ranger's eagle bows. So, he now uses a short wooden bow, which was given to him by a crossbowman who had been a hunter. The kind-hearted doctor is very popular among the team. Everyone likes this polite young man and he can also treat everyone's injuries. And the courage he showed in the last battle also impressed everyone. Even Close no longer laughed at his weak strength, but seriously taught him some tips on muscle training. After another futile effort, Anson picked up the arrow and ran to Liang's carriage with a sigh. Sir, I still can't seem to find the feeling you mentioned. Leon was still hungover, and Leslie's drunkenness was extremely strong. Most of the day had passed, and he was still a little confused. Have you fired your bow a hundred times? Do you feel any pain in your shoulders? Yes. Sir, I can't even lift my hands now. My whole body hurts. That's right. Anson's eyes were filled with anticipation and confusion. Could pain be the secret? This shows that you have reached the limit of breakthrough. Go and treat your arm. Then keep practicing like this, and you will soon feel that mysterious feeling. Ah. Okay. Sir. The innocent Anson retreated honestly. If you draw the bow a hundred times in half a day, even if you don't practice archery, you can at least develop your arm strength. He has a strained muscle, but he can still practice medicine, even if he is still hungover. The training method arranged by the Lord is still very scientific and logical. Only works on Anson though. Leon laid down on the straw pile on the carriage again, biting a straw stem and looking at the sky boredly. He has finished reading the officer's memoirs, and Leslie has arranged the team so he has nothing to do now. Walking at the front of the team was the crossbowman, who was good at swimming. Since the Lord was still hung over, the crossbowman held Alice in front. His name is Eric, which is a very common name in the Lion Kingdom. It is basically similar to names 
like Gosheng and Xuanju. Gosheng's current attire is basically the same as Liang's a few days ago, including a chainmail face covering helmet, light chain mail, cotton and linen lining, and high top riding boots. After seeing Liang's archery and martial arts, Eric probably admires Liang now and never forgets to imitate him, except for the most valuable and heaviest armor and the smelly nomadic boots. He didn't want them. All the other equipment on the Jatu Warlord Drash was now on him. This was the promise Liang had given them before. Zajia gave another lonely Baikyu John a name that was almost of the Gooden type. As for Drash, Liang was kind enough to leave him a nomadic robe. He is now dressed as a pure nomadic vagabond and is shown as Jatu Wandering Rider in the team list. However, Drash, who had no desires or demands, was very honest now. He stayed with dozens of Jatta horses and looked very gentle, like a kind middle-aged herdsman. After this harmonious team marched south for most of a day, Eric, who was exploring the road at the front, asked the team to stop by a small forest and then trotted to find Liang. Eric is now one of the few men in the team who has maintained full combat effectiveness. He only has a few scratches on his face. According to him, he was scratched by several arrows in the face. But none of them were hit. Probably there are benefits to having a chief name. Sir, shall we camp here today? If we go further, it will be a forest. It is not safe to camp in the forest. Okay, you guys can figure it out. You are more familiar with the terrain around here than I am. The Lord turned over lazily and continued to doze off. But then, he jumped up as if he had been hit by an arrow. Boo! Who is talking? Leon looked around. But there was no one beside him except Eric. Most of his teammates were on the carriage behind. Eric looked at Leon blankly. Sir, are you still drunk? Is Miss Leslie's drink so strong? Leon covered his head and shook it. No. Go Shung. I really heard a woman talking. Sir. Well, this is another woman I dreamed of. Forget it. I'll go find Miss Leslie to arrange the camp. Eric shook his head, muttered, turned around, and walked toward the back of the line. Leon was still covering his forehead in confusion and kept looking around. Dot, watch your back. Kid. The voice became clearer and clearer. A gentle and plain female voice. But Leon did not see anyone. And the voice seemed to appear directly in his mind. Chapter 47 Hidden Arrows and First Aid. Dot, watch your back. Kid. The faint voice came again ethereal and mysterious. But Leon heard it clearly this time. And he even felt that the voice was inexplicably familiar. A familiarity that penetrated deep into his soul. Who are you? Who are you? Come out! Leon got off the carriage, went to Alice next to him and took off the sword, and asked warily towards the nearby woods. No one responded. There are only the chirping of birds and the lively chirping of insects in the woods. Leon put the scabbard belt on his body and kept looking around. There was really no one around and everything looked normal. But then, a sudden change occurred. Suddenly a shadow shot out of the woods. The shadow was extremely fast and flashed past Liang. With Liang's eyesight, he could only see a faint light passing by silently at an incredible speed. Like a silver lightning. Unless you are prepared in advance, you will never have time to intercept. And it will definitely be impossible to avoid it. Liang turned around and shouted loudly, Be careful! Then he drew the sword as quickly as possible. But it was too late to remind him at this time. At the same time as he spoke, the silver light had penetrated into Eric's back and penetrated directly from his chest. Eric only had time to say, uh, before he fell softly from his horse and fell to the ground. And that silver light, after penetrating Eric, still had enough power to nail the carriage in front of him. The arrow body trembled slightly. It was a silver arrow with strange green feathers. It was so fast that it passed through the chest without even leaving any traces of blood. Leslie on the carriage screamed in surprise. Then immediately realized the danger. Hid inside the carriage. And shouted. Enemy attack! Anson! Help! Leon shouted as he immediately rolled forward and threw himself into the woods. Starting to look for hidden enemies. Someone seemed to say, Hey, in the woods. Then, a vague figure sprang up like a wild deer and galloped through the woods. The man seemed to be integrated with the forest. He was probably wearing protective armor, making his figure looming in the woods. Stop! Don't run! Leon rushed over quickly, shouting while chasing. This shout is definitely ineffective against the enemy. But Leon must shout not to stop the enemy, but to convey his location to his men. The killer's bow and arrows were very terrifying. 
and Liang felt that he might not be able to dodge them. He was not willing to fight such a powerful killer in the terrain chosen by the opponent. Fortunately, the arrow was not aimed at me, but the killer was moving very fast through the woods. Leon tried his best to do parkour by jumping and rolling, but he still couldn't keep up with him. Gradually, the man disappeared deep into the woods. Leon lost track of his opponent, stopped and backed away slowly. Close ran into the woods with his big sword at this time, breaking countless messy branches and vines like a wild boar, and finally ran behind Leon out of breath, watching the surroundings vigilantly. Sir, you shouldn't chase me in alone. I know. Stay back. Be careful. But the killer never showed up again. Leon only saw the blurry back of the killer as he pursued him. He seemed to be wearing a green hood, brown and green armor, and holding a silver bow in his hand. Back in the convoy, Anson was doing his best to provide first aid. The arrow that passed through Eric's body made a small hole from his vest to the middle of his chest. The wound was not big, but he was bleeding. Eric was still conscious, but already very angry. The men who were still able to move were all on guard around the convoy. But there should be no enemies coming. Leon pulled out the arrow from the carriage and then frowned deeply. The arrow was very heavy. The arrowhead and the arrow body were actually one piece. The whole body was made of some kind of alloy-like metal. And it was a modern bow and arrow. That little cone shape, but a bit sharper. The arrow is also engraved with mysterious inscriptions that cannot be identified. Like an exquisite handicraft. These inscriptions are connected together and seem to draw spiral lines on the arrow body. No wonder it came out so quickly and almost silently. These are Nolder arrows. They are Nolder elves. A crossbowman beside him whispered. A little panicked. Nolder elves. But no matter how much the Nolder elves hate humans, they won't go out alone to attack a convoy on the road. Right? The convoy hasn't entered the forest yet. Looking at Eric on the ground, Leon figured out why Eric would be attacked. Two reasons. First, he dresses too much like a Jatu. The Jata grassland is just north of the Nolder forest. It is said that the Jata people often go out in large numbers to capture the Nolder elves. The two sides have been fighting for hundreds of years, and the hatred is as deep as the sea. Second, this arrow might have been aimed at himself. Moreover, the second possibility is much greater. Eric rode ahead, dressed like himself, and bustling around as he planned to set up camp. He might have been regarded as the real owner by this killer. And he, the wounded man lying on the carriage with bandages and doing nothing, really didn't look like a noble lord. Leslie, make arrangements to set up camp on the spot. I think he will come again at night. Sir, this, don't worry. Just do it. Close. Let the brothers work overtime. After arranging his men, Leon looked at Anson, who was still busy. Hold on for a while, Dot, hold on. You'll get better, Dot, don't close your eyes. Anson was applying pressure quickly to stop the bleeding and kept encouraging Eric. However, for an injury like this that penetrated the chest, there was little hope in this era. A few minutes later, Anson stopped. His bloody hand reached under the tip of Eric's nose, and then he shook his head with a sad expression. Sir, I can't save him. Leon took a deep breath and looked at the team list. Mercenary crossbowman. May 18th. The number of people has not decreased. He's not dead yet. Anson, continue. After speaking, Leon touched the main artery of Eric's neck and felt the subtle pulse. Then he sat down on the ground, lifted Eric's upper body on his legs, and began to perform artificial respiration. Leon still had common sense about trauma. Eric's chest was penetrated, and his stopping of breathing was probably caused by hemorrhage in the chest. This was poor breathing caused by traumatic asphyxia. My chest was penetrated and I couldn't perform lung compressions so I had to try simple artificial respiration. If he didn't die for a while, Anson might be able to save him with his medical and recovery skills. The surrounding mercenaries gradually gathered around and stood a little further away without disturbing him. They all silently prayed to the gods they worshipped. Perhaps the nickname Eric the Dog Son did play a role. Or maybe it was due to Anson's skills in reducing mortality and accelerating recovery. After more than a minute of artificial respiration, Eric choked twice and then started panting heavily. He regained the ability to breathe on his own. He is resurrected. This is simply a miracle. The surrounding mercenaries no longer chanted about gods, but looked in reverence at Leon, who was also breathing heavily, and fell to his knees one by one, with excitement shining in everyone's eyes. Sir, he can survive. He can definitely do it. The bleeding has stopped. Anson's joyful voice startled the birds in the woods. 
Your teammate skills have been improved. You can check your teammate skills. Without looking up this time, Leon could guess what Anson had improved. A little further away, Sarah stared at Leon intently, seeming to be muttering some unknown verse. Dot the kiss of the goddess dot drives away death dot the hope of life. Chapter 48 I really stabbed you casually. In fact, it was more perfect than Leon imagined. Anson surgery and first aid skills were upgraded at the same time. Surgery 4. First aid 3. The team's safety has been improved by another point. But Liang's own safety has been cast a shadow. Who sent such a powerful killer? Who is that calm, gentle but ethereal and mysterious woman's voice? Was she specifically reminding me? That voice always felt familiar, yet strange at the same time. It was a quiet night, with stars in the sky and the chirping of insects outside the camp adding to the tranquility. Leon was outside the camp, sitting on the ground with his back against a big stone, fiddling with a bonfire. Behind that rock is the woods. He is keeping vigil. This is not because the Lord loves his soldiers as much as his sons and wants to protect them personally, but mainly because he slept for most of the day and couldn't sleep at all. Besides, there aren't many people available. There is one more wounded person in the team. The Lord is also humane and cannot let his subordinates stand guard with injuries. The tent behind Leon was lit with bright candles, and a figure was illuminated on the tent, seeming to be sitting on the side of the tent against the tarpaulin. It was a quite large one-person tent, and you could tell at a glance that it was for the exclusive use of the Lord. The beautiful golden maned horse Alice is tied to a horse post outside the tent. Leong took out a piece of bacon from his leather pocket, stuck it on a branch, and roasted it slowly on the fire, turning it over in your hands from time to time. The bacon gradually exudes an attractive burnt aroma. He took it under his nose and smelled it. He seemed a little dissatisfied. He picked up the jar next to him, found some grease and spices, rubbed it on it, and then continued to bake. The fat was roasted until it sizzled, and the rich aroma made Alice snort, pacing on the spot and calling out, Yo-Yo twice. Leon rummaged through the leather pocket on his side again, found a piece of bean cake, walked over and fed it to Alice's mouth. The sound of the horse chewing bean cake sounded very pleasant. Leon stroked Alice's golden mane, and gradually moved his hand along the mane to Alice's back. Dang dot boom! Two short and continuous sounds came. Base! Leon pulled out the long sword hanging on his saddle bag, turned around and rolled on the spot, rolled behind the big stone picked up the wood in the fire with his sword, and carried the barbecue rack to his side. Then, he jumped out from another direction and rushed directly into the woods next to him. A dark figure happened to be in the direction where he jumped out. He was raising a bow and stringing his bow at the edge of the woods. He seemed to be shaken by the barbecue and the wooden frame, and shot an arrow towards the location where the barbecue flew away. The arrow accurately penetrated the barbecue and then stuck on the ground. After shooting this arrow, the black figure realized something was wrong, and reacted very quickly to the side, and prepared to run away. But Leong had already pounced just a few steps away from him. Watch out! Leong threw the long sword at his hand directly. With a ding sound, bright sparks burst out in the dark woods. The black shadow turned around and blocked the flying sword with his weapon, then turned around and ran deep into the woods. But as soon as he took two steps, the black shadow fell to the ground and disappeared under the ground making a dull sound of falling to the ground. Close! Leon yelled, then picked up a few wooden stakes with branches from the ground, and kept throwing them towards the place where the black shadow fell. The assassin fell into a deep pit. The assassin seemed to have twisted his foot, but he was still agile. He was about to rush out in a panic, but was completely blocked by the wood and branches thrown by Leon. Then, a huge tarpaulin instantly rose up, directly covering the black figure from the bottom of the pit upwards and hung up together with the wood, like a huge package hanging on the tree. Close's body is now completely black, with only the inner edges of his eyes white. The huge figure looked like a large black shadow at this time. He pulled the rope and trotted away, and then tied two thick ropes into a knot on the tree next to him. A few seconds later, two other dark hunks who were guarding elsewhere also ran over and looked up at the huge package. The assassin in the package was still twisting violently but it was difficult for a person to live in such a cloth bag, and the thick tent cloth was not easy to open. This is a trap. This is the result of the brothers working overtime. There are three big pits in total. No matter where you run, you will always encounter one. In order to help the enemy plan their route, even wooden stakes were prepared in advance to block the road. As for the figure in the tent, it was clothes as armor, the empty armor, 
It was probably pierced by an arrow now. Well, I also wasted three tenths to make pockets. So the killer has to pay for it. Go get a torch. But be careful not to set the forest on fire. Leon ordered his men. Then searched around on the ground to find his sword. And gently poked the big package on his head with the tip of the sword. Don't move. Or I'll stab you to death. The tip of the sword penetrated half an inch. And I don't know where it hit. Anyway, after letting out a cry of, Woo! The package stopped twisting. Several mercenaries ran over holding torches. In fact, anyone in the team who is capable of fighting is still awake. Everyone wants to catch this guy. But no one expected that the Lord said that the killer might come again tonight. And it happened. Clothes and the others were wearing rather ill-fitting dark green smocks. Which were ranger armor smocks. They looked like tight-fitting t-shirts on these big men. Their faces were smeared with black ash. And the cats remained motionless in the forest. The execution was perfect. However, the macho men were very dissatisfied with the overtime work. They were bitten by mosquitoes and had numerous pimples all over their bodies. Several macho men were scratching their heads and ears. Fortunately, Leon was very considerate and gave them a chance to vent their anger. This guy is very skilled. To be on the safe side, let's beat him up first and then put him down. The Lord retracted his sword, took the torch, and kicked out a few large branches with his toes. So, after a burst of crackling sticks and pitiful howls, it was determined that the guy in the package was definitely half dead. And a group of tough men put the package down and dragged it to the campfire. Leon did the work of unpacking it himself. He was very curious about what this ghostly killer with excellent archery skills looked like. Huddled inside the package was an older elf. Judging from the clothes on his body, he should be a man. His long pointed ears are very eye-catching. His skin is as white as snow and his face is handsome and delicate. Although he knew that every elf was good-looking, even Leong felt that this elf was a bit too handsome. However, this handsome guy seemed to have tears on his face, and his eyes were quite resentful. Ahem, are you a man? Why are you looking at me like that? The handsome elf boy's eyes became even more resentful, and he didn't say anything, but he just covered his hands tighter. By the light of the bonfire, Leong could see clearly that what this guy was covering was his buttocks. The middle? There seemed to be some blood oozing out from between the fingers. The dark faces of clothes and the others next to them were already distorted. And it looked like they were almost twitching to hold back their laughter. I'm dot I just stabbed you casually in the dark. Really? Leong suddenly felt a little sympathetic to the killer. Hey, you should be able to speak human language. Right. Who sent you here? Finish talking and finish the work early. Otherwise, I will let clothes stab you again. Chapter 49 The Cunning Risa Dillon the Nolder Elves looked at a few dark, burly men, and there seemed to be a flash of contempt in their eyes. But they turned to Leong in an instant, showing a fearful expression. I told you that you would let me go! Leong tilted his head and said nothing, staring at the Nolder Elf until his insincere fearful expression gradually disappeared. I feel that people who can ask questions like this are not very good at telling the truth. Forget it. Who the H? Elf wants to kill me. Close. Cripple him and then go to sleep after get off work. The Lord suddenly seemed not to ask anymore. Yawned and turned around to leave. Okay. Sir. Close looked very happy. He didn't expect to get off work so soon. He thought he would be busy all night. Don't kill him. I'll find a noble to sell him tomorrow. These pointed ears are quite valuable. He's so beautiful. He must be suitable for both men and women. Leon was deliberately bluffing. He felt that this elf might not be able to tell the truth easily and a bluff might cause him to make a mistake. So the Lord yawned and turned around and left. Several tough men gathered around him with grinning faces, and began to twist their arms and legs in a rather rough manner. No, 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 I said. I said dot it's the Red Brotherhood. I took the business at the tavern. The elf killer resisted desperately and looked like he was going crazy. Leong didn't believe this nonsense and turned around slowly. If you say this, it means you didn't say it. I don't know the employer. In this kind of business. The employer won't name me. Don't touch me. The Lord Lord sighed. Turned around and started to leave again. It seems he is just a little guy. Then there is no need to ask questions. Don't. Don't be like this. What do you want to know? What do you want? I am the top assassin. I can get information and help you solve all your troubles. Seeing that Leon was really going to leave. And it seemed that he really didn't intend to waste time on him. The killer called out. TCH, you can't even handle me. And you're so boastful. The Lord sneered at such bragging. 
He had already walked to Alice. But he turned around after all. The Nolder Elf nodded, looking a lot more sincere. I just recognized the wrong person this afternoon. Otherwise you would have been. Leon looked unkind. Huh? What I mean is, Dog, you are probably blessed by the gods, Dot, I swear. I will never do anything to you again. This Nolder Elf's words changed quickly. Leon took out the silver arrow from his saddlebag. His expression still gloomy. What's your name? Risa Dillon. Leon nodded and shook the arrow. Okay, Teddy. You should know the consequences of your arrow. It is only natural to kill people to pay debts and pay back money. Lisa Dillon was stunned, but did not care about Liang's title. Indeed. I shot one of your men to death. There is a treasure in my water bag that can be used to make amends. And I can work for you until the debt of my life is paid off. There are always disputes between human lords and lords. And I think you will need my ability. This time, the attitude seemed quite sincere, even using an honorific. But the mention of human life was still quite understated. And he was obviously very confident, probably thinking that the person hit by his arrow would definitely die. Leong frowned and motioned to a few tough men to tie up Risa Dillon first to prevent him from playing tricks. After tying her saddle in tightly, Close reached out and took off his water bag, unscrewed the leather water bag, and poured it directly to the ground. A gem-like thing fell out along the water flow. It seemed to be an irregular blue and purple gemstone, glowing faintly under the reflection of the bonfire. It looked crystal clear, but it seemed strange and inexplicable. What's this? Several people's eyes were attracted to this gem. Dragon Tears! Dragon Tears! This is a treasure that a real dragon produces when he feels overwhelming sadness. Lisa Dillon's voice still sounded sincere, and her eyes were fixed on the gem. Dragon Tears? But I heard that dragons don't feel sad. It is said that it is because they have no emotions that they become extinct. The one who spoke was Anson. He couldn't sleep at all. After hearing the noise outside, he walked out with his clothes on. Risa Dillon seemed to curl up his lips. It is precisely because of this that dragon tears are even more precious. It was obviously the first time for several big men to see this kind of treasure. They passed it around and played with it, marveling at it. Dot Chi. At this moment, Alice, the golden-maned horse, suddenly snorted violently, even raised her hoofs, and cried out, Yo, yo, as if she had been frightened. Alice? Leon glanced at the horse and the horse's nostrils twitched and screamed. Leon reacted immediately, covered his mouth and nose, and reached out to stop Anson, who was about to walk over. Don't go! It's poisonous! Then, he turned around suddenly, just in time to see a cunning look in Risa Dillon's eyes. I also happened to see a few strong men around the Nolder Elves, who were watching the baby suddenly become weak and fall down as if they were possessed by some evil spirit. Risa Dillon, who originally seemed to be tied up and unable to resist, suddenly stood up and threw a curved knife only as long as a finger towards Anson, and quickly picked it up from beside him. A sword. I don't know where he hid the knife, but he actually cut the rope that bound him silently in such a short period of time. This elf was really skilled and cunning. He saw that Anson had no fighting ability, so he deliberately threw the knife at the weakest one among all the people present. However, the elf who soared into the air almost fell down as soon as he landed. He even dropped his sword and reached out to cover the backyard again. His handsome face twisted into a bitter gourd shape in pain. Then he immediately turned around, no longer caring about the sword on the ground, and ran away towards the woods with his hands on his hips and his feet. But even so, he is still very agile and fast. But his posture now looks more like a wild deer. As for Leong, he had to save Anson first and did not have time to pursue immediately. By the time Leong swung his sword to help Anson block the dagger, and then chased after Risa Dillon. It seemed that it was too late, and he was pulled down for more than ten meters. After such a delay, Lisa Dillon was almost running into the woods, although he was running with his legs crossed. After he ran towards the woods, his armor quickly merged with the trees. His equipment had a very good protective effect in the woods. After chasing him to the edge of the woods, Leong didn't dare to rush in anymore. He had completely lost sight of Lisa Dillon. This elf is like a ghost in the forest. It is indeed not comparable to humans. I don't know how this guy with his legs can run so fast. Moreover, just a few steps after chasing him, Leon was a little dazed. Although he covered his nose with his hands, he couldn't stop breathing. He was also slightly poisoned. No one thought that being so cautious could actually allow Rissa Dillon to escape. This guy is indeed a top assassin. Everyone was already careful. 
Close even poured the gym on the ground. But he didn't expect it to still have an effect. Anson had covered his mouth and nose with his clothes and carefully picked up the gym. Leong turned around and stretched out his hand to signal Anson to put the gym back into the water bag. Just after the gym was thrown into the water bag and the cork was tightened, the golden mane horse Alice snorted with a snort, then neighed softly, stamped her hooves, and scratched, digging the ground. The neck is also tugging on the reins, apparently signaling the owner to let it go. Chapter 50 Reliable Alice Leon felt a little dizzy and his feet felt weak, but he still covered his mouth and nose with one hand and went over to untie the horse. As soon as Alice was let go, she trotted all the way to the nearby grassland, lowering her horse's head and sniffing on the grass. Then, the beautiful little mare seemed to have found something and began to nibble the grass on the ground. While chewing, he also snorted. Puff! 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 Leon also ran over, pulled out a few unknown grass from Alice's mouth, stuffed it into his mouth, and started chewing the grass that the horse was specifically looking for. It must be useful. I don't know what that grass was. The juice was so bitter that Leon rolled his eyes, and the smell made him cough desperately. But the effect is very obvious. After coughing, my head is no longer dizzy immediately. Leon hugged Alice's neck and kissed her hard, then picked up two handfuls of grass and ran back to Anson. Anson is now covering his face with clothes and rolling clothes his eyelids. Anson! How are they? This grass seems to be able to detoxify. They seem to have just fallen asleep. Ah! This is Artemisia Crucifer! So that's it. Sir! Those are not dragon tears! Taking the grass from Liang's hand, Anson stuffed it into his mouth and chewed it. His face was also filled with tears. After chewing everything into pieces, he stuffed the grass foam into the nostrils of clothes and others. Not long after, everyone woke up and sat down by the fire with gritted teeth, each holding a piece of meat and roasting it. What happened to us just now? Close asked in a low voice. He felt a little embarrassed. He fainted so unclearly. It was simply a shame for a soldier. Now only food can ease the pain in his heart. You were stunned or fell asleep. That stone is not dragon tears. It should be snake heart stone. Anson replied casually. What is snake heart stone? Leon asked while playing with the small knife left by Lisa Dillon. The knife is thin and sharp. With an inner arc. The blade is less than a centimeter wide and about the same length as an index finger. It can be easily hidden in most places on the body. Leon is now very interested in the stone that can stun people. In his opinion, it is indeed a treasure. This is also the first time I have seen the real thing. I have read in an old medical book in the seminary before that snake heart stone is a rare crystal stone. It is not actually poisonous. But it can make people dizzy and drowsy as long as it is close to it. Of course, if left unattended, it might just fall into a coma and turn into a corpse. Since it has the same shape as a snake's heart, the book named it the snake heart stone. Anson explained by drawing a shape with his finger. How could something so terrifying not be poison? Close had some lingering fears. He felt that something like this that made him fall asleep for no apparent reason was terrifying. Because this kind of lethargy can be easily lifted. Crosswort is a very common herbal medicine with a strong smell. The pungent smell can wake people up quickly. Moreover, the book says that there was once a continent where doctors could use snake heart stone. Make the patient sleepy. Then use a knife to cut off the diseased limbs or internal organs while he is sleeping and replace them with intact organs, so that the seriously ill patient can be cured. Anson made famous gestures on clothes and explained patiently. Close shuddered. Nonsense. This is impossible. How can you still survive if you cut out the internal organs? Anson shrugged. I also read it in a book. If it's true, then it's good news for everyone. It even means that any injury can be cured. Close shook his head like a swing. No. 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 This is impossible. The big guy is used to cutting other people's bodies into pieces and is used to enemy parts flying all over the sky. But it is still hard for him to imagine that human internal organs can be replaced. Close even felt that the barbecue on the fire was no longer fragrant. Leong nodded. Only he could understand Anson's persistence in saving lives and healing the wounded. It is because of people like Anson that humankind's technological level will develop step by step. Then, where can I get this snake heart stone? The Lord held his chin and asked as he looked at the water bag containing the snake heart stone. Although it's rare, people seem to find it often. Some people have found it in my hometown Ashkaman, and there are more found in the Bacchus Empire. It's just... Anson frowned and pondered for a moment. How? 
Sir, they were all found at the altar of the snake cult. Leon raised his eyebrows. I heard that people who worship the snake cult will confuse people and then trick them into joining the religion? Anson nodded and agreed with Liang's judgment. It is very likely that the snake cult uses snake heart stones to make people comatose and then trick them into becoming believers. The Bacchus Empire has been encircled and suppressed many times and has obtained many snake heart stones. But none with one exception. This thing will gradually disappear on its own within a few days. Disappear? Leon picked up the leather water bag and shook it. He understood the reason why Lisa Dillon packed the snake heart stone in the water bag. This kind of thing is probably a highly volatile mineral. What causes people to become comatose is probably inhaling the volatilized gas. In this era, it is actually difficult to find an effective way to preserve such highly volatile things. Putting it in water is already the most suitable storage method. Leon carefully put away the water bag and wrapped it in a few more layers of tent cloth to make sure it was safe. He planned to let Leslie store it in a sealed clay pot. He thought this thing should be very useful. Sir Dot my heavy armor was also shot through by an arrow. Who do you think sent this assassin? This arrow is too powerful. Close took out his armor from the tent and pointed to the small hole pierced through the thickest part of the chest clip. I'm also thinking about who can use a sharp archer like Rissa Dillon. He really thinks highly of me. Leon has always felt something strange. He initially thought that the Duke of Alma or Fauché paid the killer to buy Rissa Dillon. But when he thought about it carefully, it was not the case. Since Risa Dillon would shoot the wrong person, it obviously meant that Risa Dillon had not been following the convoy. In the afternoon, he chased him into the woods. When Risa Dillon saw his face, he said, Hey! And he came again in the evening and shot through the armor in his tent, indicating that his employer recognized him and described Risa Dillon in detail. He talks about his appearance and maybe even mentions his golden maned horse. Risa Dillon did not follow the convoy, but was able to find himself within a day which meant that Risa Dillon's employer should know his general location. After all, he had just come out of the border camp, and he had been marching and moving all day. The Red Brotherhood guys definitely don't know where they are. Archduke Alma, who had just captured Chang'e town, probably didn't know his current position. The only ones who might know their path are the Horncall Rangers. It was Ralph who gave him the advice to go to the uninhabited village after being attacked by Jatu. But the problem is, Ralph has no reason to assassinate him. If he really wants to kill himself, he can just send people to swarm him at the camp. He brought hundreds of rangers with him at the time. So what's going on? Leon thought of that weird female voice again. Same words twice. Dot watch your back. Kid. Who is reminding myself? Does this sentence refer to arrows shot from behind? Or is it something else? When he was in the Lion City, after he saw the statue of Eunomia, the goddess of order, he met the heretical degenerate. But now, after hearing that voice, I met a top-level killer like Rissa Dillon. No way. Leong feels that life is so difficult. Why are so many unknown enemies trying to harm me? Mommy, we need to quickly set up a station to defend ourselves. And we need to catch this dangerous element like Lisa Dillon. There is another sentence that the Lord did not say. We must find a suitable person to be responsible for defending against hidden arrows. Leong was no longer in the mood to eat barbecue. He picked up the sword dropped by Lisa Dillon and sat next to Alice, leaning against the horse post. Only Alice is the most reliable, always helping, and never having any trouble. The little mare arched her head on Liang's back and swung her tail back and forth, seemingly dissatisfied with the lord occupying her position. But Liang didn't plan to leave. He felt safer next to Alice. Fortunately, horses sleep standing up and can sleep anywhere. Alice has a good temper. Seeing that Liang refused to leave, she gently rubbed her head against Liang's face and took a step back, which was regarded as allowing the Lord to occupy her seat. Chapter 51 The Forest of the Nolder Early the next morning, the Lord asked Leslie to seal the snake heart stone and let the convoy continue to move forward. Sarah suggested that Liang ask the convoy to turn directly to the west and go to Chang'e town first. Sir, since the enemy in the dark knows your route, you definitely shouldn't do what he wants. But Liang refused. The enemy will probably think so too. Continue south. We will go through the forest to the village. Sarah was puzzled. The only one who knows your route is Ralph. Do you still want to go to the place he said? Sarah, this was not done by Ralph. He shouldn't be able to afford a killer like Lisa Dillon. It's not just Ralph who knows my route. There are others. Leon said thoughtfully. Sarah shook her head in confusion. Others? Rangers? They can't even afford them. Sarah. 
If you were the injured elf assassin dog, where would you hide? In the forest. Of course. That's right. I'm going to catch him. Sarah didn't say anything more. She just put on a set of ranger armor silently and stayed by Liang's side. Since the Lord has made a decision, as a subordinate, you should solve the problem for him instead of creating it. Although Sarah never liked wearing heavy armor, the convoy continued its slow advance. But Anson stopped shooting birds. He is taking care of the wounded more carefully now. Probably because he wants his brothers to recover faster and be able to help as soon as possible. Leon no longer relied on the carriage. He rode Alice again and was fully equipped. He even installed a breastplate for the first time and the lining was lined with satin. This was considered a simple body armor made by himself. The bow and arrows were also carried on his back. In his hand, he was still carrying the slightly curved Noldor sword that Rasadalin had thrown down. There was no scabbard. So he had to carry it. Clothes was still on the carriage. Not that he was lazy. He was sharpening his sword. He occupied a carriage alone. And on the carriage were a bunch of various swords. It is more efficient to polish the equipment while walking. Most people in the team did not expect that Close was an excellent blacksmith before he became a soldier. Most of the men in Mendenheim are actually good at blacksmithing. Their volcanic hometown is full of fine iron ore. And the god they worship is also the god of steel. The muscles and strength were probably acquired through blacksmithing. But this also caused the people of Mendenheim to consume a lot of food. One person was enough for three people. It is difficult for Mendenheim, a city with little arable land, to feed these big and hungry people. And there are frequent famines. So Mendenheim became the mercenary wholesale department. Close is very satisfied with his current boss. Because in his many years of mercenary career, he has only encountered Leon, who is willing to let the people of Mendenheim eat freely. Although the Lord has never been willing to eat with them, everyone was on guard. But no one seemed to complain. In fact, no one noticed that this Lord, who is always a bit out of place, seemed to have put this small team together in just ten days. In different ways, the convoy gradually entered the forest. And the road in the forest gradually became no longer smooth. But nothing happened on this road that everyone was on guard against. They didn't meet anyone along the way. Except for the occasional wild deer or rabbit that came out of the nearby forest. Which added a lot of food reserves to the team. There are so many wild animals here. Why doesn't anyone come to hunt? Leon asked John. Another expert swimmer wearing Jaja next to him. Sir, this area is already a place frequented by the Nolder Elves. Hunters dare not come here. In fact, no one dares to come here alone. Only convoys with a large number of people dare to pass here. Or it's those slave-catching teams. John looked around nervously as he answered. There are very few people passing by, but it can still maintain such a wide road. Although the road on the ground is a bit bumpy and overgrown, it is still spacious and the carriage can move without any problems. Probably the slave-catching team has been maintaining the road. Nolder Elf girls have always been the most valuable slaves and the slave-catching team has to transport them in prison cars. I participated in an auction with someone else in single. At that time, the three and elf girl was auctioned for a sky-high price of 100,000 dinars. But it was Sarah who spoke, and it seemed that there was someone she didn't want to mention in her words. She glanced at Leon worriedly, and continued, not intending to give anyone a chance to ask questions. In fact, Leon heard it, but he didn't ask further questions. Respect the privacy of each partner so that your partners can respect you. The Nolder Elves are not native to this continent. It is said that they only came to Pender nearly a thousand years ago, and they seem to have a very high level of technology. However, no one knows how the Nolder came to Pender. They occupy the depths of the Long River Forest as if they suddenly appeared out of thin air, and do not interact with any humans. They may think that humans are lower animals. In their eyes, humans are probably about the same as or even worse than, wild animals in the forest. At least the Nolder will not kill wild animals. But they will kill humans who dare to enter the long river forest. And they also have this ability. The deeper into the river forest, the more aggressive the Nolder elves become. It is said that there is a beautiful sapphire-like lake in the hinterland of the Changha forest. But no one has ever reached it alive. Of course, there is no such thing as unreasonable hatred in this world. There is certainly a reason why Nolder actively attacks humans. The Nolder once had a high-level civilization that had been passed down for thousands of years. They originally just hid in the forest and lived in peace with the world, unwilling to conflict with humans. But the initial tragedy comes from their beauty. Elves may be the darlings of the god of creation, 
Each elf has a beautiful appearance and a long lifespan. Their snow-white skin is born with an indifferent temperament. They are like works of art in themselves, except for their long pointed ears. These beautiful creatures have the same physical structure as humans, but have ten times the lifespan and a hundred times the beauty. This kind of beauty has an irresistible attraction for some people. After many attempts, some human rulers concluded that the Nolder Elves did not know any magic, but were very skilled and had amazing craftsmanship. However, the total population of the Nolder Elves is not large. It seems that there are only a few thousand people. Perhaps the Creator God is looking for balance. The reproductive ability of the Elves is very poor. Of course, this may have something to do with their long lives and indifferent personalities. They are beautiful, rare, powerful, proud, and contemptuous of humans. Each one is giving birth to the desires of human powerful people. And all kinds of different desires are focused on the same goal. Sex, possession, wealth, conquest, or something else. These desires combined formed an irresistible thirst for the possession of the Noldor by every powerful human being. And as long as it does not involve unknown areas such as magic, then human rulers can use their lives to achieve whatever they want. So, a tragedy began. This is the disaster of the Noldor and the carnival of the human nobles. Some relatively friendly Noldor elves were maliciously captured without warning, and have since become the most dazzling playthings and property in the nobles' back houses. Then a crazy competition was ignited. Everyone with power and wealth wants to have a beautiful elf. The king is no exception. As a result, elf slaves have become expensive goods with no market price. Especially elf girls, whose worth is almost equivalent to the annual tax of a large county. Moreover, nobles have different tastes. And there is a huge market for male elves. Therefore, there were countless slave-catching teams near Changha Forest. But most of them left their lives in the forest forever. Chapter 52 What is that hobby? The Noldor are not that easy to capture. Although they do not know magic. Most of their archery and martial arts have been honed to extremely terrifying levels over thousands of years of life. Almost every Noldor elf is a top warrior. Even those Nodul girls, who look like girls, are all forest rangers with extraordinary skills. Most of them may be a hundred years old. But they will maintain their youthful appearance, like girls, for hundreds of years. In the plains, Perhaps humans could easily overwhelm the small number of Noldor elves with massive cavalry. But in the vast primeval forest, cavalry is of no use. And almost no one can resist the powerful archery and ghostly movement of the Noldor elves. The slave-catching teams died in piles in the forest, becoming fertilizer for the long river forest, making the forest's flora and fauna more and more prosperous, and making the Noldor elves hide deeper. After that, the human kingdom formed a large army several times to try to sweep away the Changha forest. But in the end they were all wiped out. With no corpses left. The attitude of the Noldor elves towards humans has since become extremely fierce. They began to actively attack any humans who appeared in the Changha forest. Anyone who dares to enter the Long River forest and encounters a Noldor elf will almost without exception be shot and killed silently. After leaving countless human lives behind. This forest which is vaster than the area under the jurisdiction of Changha Town, has become a forbidden land for humans. No one dares to pass through here unless they have a certain size of armed force. Therefore, the Long River Forest is now also called the Nolder Forest. This name actually represents a kind of compromise and concession by humans, which is a recognition that the Nolder occupies this vast forest. But some human desires cannot be changed. Until now, elven slaves are still expensive goods with a price but no market and wealthy nobles from various countries have always been asking for them at sky-high prices. Where there is demand, there will be suppliers. And there are still many slave-catching teams targeting elves today. It's just that few people succeed. If calculated on average, capturing an elf girl often requires the lives of hundreds of people, or even more. My lord, please don't take advantage of the Nolder elves. This is more dangerous than directly declaring war on all countries. Leon shook his head. I'm not that stupid. If the Nolder Elves have the skills of Rosatalin, then such forces must be allies rather than enemies. Leong didn't dare to take advantage of Noldo. And he didn't have the ability now. Those Nolder warriors have hundreds of years of life. No matter how much the Elves admire art and don't like to practice martial arts, their proficiency will probably not be lower than theirs over the years. As for Lisa Dillon, Leong said that his bow and arrow skills were not as good as others shooting at the barbecue. He really didn't aim well. If he hadn't accidentally injured an inconvenient part of his body, he might not have been able to beat him. Sir, we are leaving the forest soon. If we don't delay, 
We should reach our destination tonight. Logistics officer Leslie came over to report that it seemed that the village was not far away, passing through the outskirts of the forest. It was a safe journey, and everyone let out a sigh of relief. But at this moment, there was movement in front. Summer, who had been acting as a scout at the front, ran back. There is a sound of fighting ahead. Close reacted quickly. He stopped polishing the swords, jumped off the carriage, and handed over Leon's sword. Then weapons began to be distributed to everyone. I'll go take a look first. Sarah stopped Leon who was about to drive the horse forward and rode ahead to check the situation. So positive? Has your temper changed? Leon felt that Sarah seemed a little different from before. However, it is a good thing to be active in work. The Lord likes employees who take the initiative to do their work best. There are a dozen people in front of us. They seem to be the elite of the Ebony Gauntlet Knights. Sarah returned quickly and gave advice very efficiently. The Ebony Gauntlets are a regular order of knights and have always hated the Nolder Elves. Sir, we have too many wounded people now, so it is best not to cause any conflicts. Leon nodded and walked forward for a while, pushing aside the branches that blocked his view. On the road ahead, the sound of fighting still did not stop. Several knights with fist emblems on their breastplates were besieging a Nolder Elf. There were also many people holding heavy crossbows surrounding them. Several knights did not use swords, but hammers and their attacks were very measured. It seemed that they wanted to capture them alive. The elf had good skills, but he seemed to be injured and had no sword in his hand. He could only use his bow to block high and low, and had no power to fight back. That's Lisa Dillon. But the current appearance looks a bit miserable. His right hand was probably hit by a hammer, and it seems that he can't exert any strength. There was also a crossbow arrow stuck in his leg, plus his ass. No wonder he couldn't run away. It seemed that he couldn't run far last night. After all, he would definitely be affected by the snake heart stone. Looking at the current scene, it is estimated that Rasadalin will soon become a prisoner of the Ebony Gauntlet Knights. No, I still have to rely on this guy to find out the mastermind. You have to get him into your hands. Leon thought for a while, then drove his horse out. Fellow knights, why are you attacking my slave? Several Ebony Knights all looked over. Two heavy crossbows also aimed at Leon. One of the knights with a cloak on his armor even dropped his hammer and drew his sword. Your slave? What do you mean? The knight in the black cape was probably the leader of this team. He looked Leon up and down. Who is your excellency? Leon Griffin. Local lord. You should not attack my property at will. If you don't want to be thrown into prison by me, then let go of my slaves and get out of here. Leon took out the noble emblem with an arrogant look on his face. Looking like a playboy from a noble family. I haven't heard of any lords around here. Are you saying that the Nolder is your slave? The knight leader looked back at Rasadalin, then turned to look at Leon and the long motorcade behind him, and no longer pointed his sword at Leon. Leon waved the Nolder sword in his hand. What? Are you doubting a noble? Are you planning to duel with me? Close? Ha! Huh. Several tough men moved forward with big swords and stood in a row behind Leon. A dozen crossbowmen knelt behind them and took aim. Having gone through two battles together, these people have already cooperated very well. Don't! 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 The knight put his sword back into the scabbard and stretched out his hands to show that he didn't want to do anything. I'm not doubting you. Sir! We are the Ebony Gauntlet Knights. We are just maintaining roads nearby. And we accidentally met got this Nolder. Obviously there are a lot of people on Liang's side. So it's hard to tell the outcome of the fight. Moreover, it is difficult to end a conflict with a noble lord. And this ebony knight has no intention of taking action. Leon raised the Nolder sword in his hand to signal. And continued to cheat. You have recognized the wrong person. He is my slave. Return him to me. And then get out. I can treat it as a misunderstanding. The ebony knight looked at the curved sword in Liang's hand. Then looked back at Lisa Dillon. Seemingly hesitant. Lord Leon. Help me. Risa Dillon was undoubtedly a smart guy. When he saw Leong setting up the steps for him, he immediately screamed and even cried a little. With a very sincere expression, the ebony knight looked at Rasadalin again, and his eyes gradually moved to the elf's legs and buttocks that were still clamped. And then he suddenly realized. He sighed and waved his hand, signaling for his men to get out of the way. The ebony knight grinned and looked at Leong, and advised sincerely. Noldo is not trustworthy. My lord, I have no objection to your having such a hobby. But even if you continue to pamper him, you should not let him go freely. Anson quietly asked Sarah in confusion. What hobby is he talking about? 
Why didn't I understand a word? I hem dot don't ask if you shouldn't ask. Sarah curled her lips helplessly. Chapter 53 Hey. You know, the men of the Ebony Gauntlet Knights put away their weapons and stood on the roadside. Leong nodded to the leading knight. I accidentally let this slave run out. I can't keep him tied up. And it would be boring if he was disabled. Hee <laughs> hee. You know. The leading knight nodded understandingly. Smiled. And winked obscenely. That's true. But my lord. It's best to tie it up until it's tamed. The knight took the people away. Before leaving. He expressed his welcome to Liang to visit Xiaoyan Bay. He said that Xiaoyan Bay was a good place. And many nobles with the same interests would often share their experiences there. Leon waved and said that he must go and see it if he had the opportunity, and then continued to move forward with the convoy. Close lifted Lisa Dillon into the car and tied the guy with a rope. The big five-flowered kind. Teddy! What a pity! You fell into my hands again! After leaving the forest, Leon patted Lisa Dillon's face with the blade of his sword, grinning evilly. My name is not Teddy. Lord Leon! Anyway, I must thank you for saving my life, and I will repay you. Lisa Dillon didn't play any tricks this time and turned a blind eye to Liang's bad intentions. Instead, she thanked him first. Hey Dot, you are my slave now. You can call me whatever I say Dot, but aren't you afraid that I really have some kind of hobby? Liang was somewhat unwilling to see that his little trick didn't work. Sir, with such an outstanding beauty by your side, it won't happen. Lisa Dillon was unmoved and hugged Sarah without any trace. Okay, Teddy, let's get down to business. Where did you receive the mission to assassinate me? In the tavern in Chungha Town. But I really don't know who the employer is. The person who contacted me was a bard. He told me that you would march south from Fletcher Village. So I waited directly at the edge of Chongha Forest. Ambush. Lisa Dillon was indeed very smart. He continued to tell what he knew without waiting for anyone to ask. Probably because he wanted to gain as much chance of survival as possible for himself. The bard was wearing a hood. And all I could see was that his face was very pale and abnormal. Like. Lisa Dillon paused and considered what to use as an analogy. It's like the face of a dead corpse. Leon was stunned. Sure enough. He really wanted his own life. I am afraid. I'm afraid it's not human. He gritted his teeth and frowned for a second confirmation. You actually accept this kind of abnormal employer commission? With your skills, you should be very famous in the assassin circle. The price of assassinating me is probably not high. Right? How could it attract a master like you? Lisa Dillon sighed. I also want to make a living. I am being hunted down. So I can't take any good business. I originally thought this was just a casual job. The price he gave actually exceeded my expectations. Lisa Dillon is actually a very unlucky guy. Nolder society also has strict classes. And Rasaderin was lucky enough to be a Nolder noble. Like most aristocratic young men. He was brave. Arrogant and aggressive. He liked dueling with others. And quickly grew into a top warrior. By the way. For the Noldor. Anyone under 300 years old is called a youth. But unfortunately. In a duel. The Noldor lord. Who is also the favorite nephew of the supreme ruler Thrandall. Was seriously injured and killed by Rasaderin although it was caused by a fair duel. Who made him do it was not serious. So he was exiled. And Islandil did not want to see him again. From then on, he could only wear a hood to hide his pointed ears, blending into human society and becoming an assassin in the shadows. He once traveled to many cities on this continent to make a living by solving troubles for people, relying on his excellent archery skills, extraordinary skills, and excellent poisoning skills. He can always complete the job perfectly. As Leon said, he is indeed famous in the killer circle. But, just like Leon didn't want to be famous because he was being hunted before, it is actually not a good thing for a killer to become famous. Not long ago, in the Siyuan city of the Bacchus Empire in the south, Risa Dillon failed to get his due reward after completing another task perfectly. His employer planned to use Snake Heart Stone to charm him to avoid paying a fee. Large final payment. Of course, the employer may have other ideas. The violent elf killer gave this dishonest employer a bloody lesson. He killed the noble lord, took the snake hard stone and ran away. As a result, he was hunted on a large scale in human society. Moreover, it was difficult for a nolder elf to blend in with the crowd. And his life as a fugitive was difficult. Although his skills allowed him to escape successfully every time, Rasadalin, who was forced to hide, could no longer take on the job as calmly as usual. Therefore, 
he originally planned to return to the edge of the Long River Forest and stay for a while. He could not go back to the Nolder territory deep in the forest. But he could avoid the limelight at the edge of the forest. Although his people exiled him, they would never sit back and watch him be destroyed. Humans kill. The day before yesterday, in Changhe Town, he accidentally received a commission that came along the way. Killing an unknown little lord can actually get you 500 dinars in reward. And you're on the way. This is a perfect job for Lisa Dyron. But unexpectedly, he killed the wrong person the first time. But when he attacked again, he was seriously injured. What was even more unlucky was that just after escaping with the help of the snake Hardstone, he met the knights of the ebony gauntlets. This knightly group established in Cliff Bay has been hunting Nolder. It is said that it is out of the racism of human supremacy. And they it has been claimed that the Nolder was the cause of the Red Death. But judging from the fact that each member of the Ebony Knights is equipped with a hammer and has been wandering near the Long River Forest for a long time, Leong estimated that the bigger reason was probably that there was a relatively large demand for Nolder elves in some good places in Cliff Bay. Lord Leong, you know everything about me. You saved my life. I swear on my last name that I will not tell you any lies. Risa Dillon looked at Leong sincerely. I know that I have caused losses to your team. And I hope you are willing to give me a chance to make up for it. This time, he showed no contempt for humans. Leong thought for a while. Then turned around and called Anson over. How is Eric doing now? It's no longer life-threatening. But I'm still a little weak and need to rest. Eric is now lying in a carriage. Able to move. And in good spirits. Leong asked Close to carry Lisa Dillon to Eric. I caught the guy who shot you. What are you going to do with him? Eric looked at the elf. Stunned for a moment. Then grinned. Being able to survive the Nolder elf arrows is worthy of bragging. Anyway, I'm not dead. And there's no point in taking revenge on him. Sir, you have to make him pay. Pay a lot of money. This guy's way of thinking has always been different. When he took the initiative to fish out the sword in the camp, it can be seen that this guy has a lot of money. Maybe he will become an excellent politician in the future. Chapter 5400 Days Soul Destroying Pill Lisa Dillon looked at Eric in disbelief. You are still alive. Fortunately, you are still alive. No. Thank you for your generosity. Yes, it's a good thing Eric is alive. Otherwise you would definitely die. You should really thank him. The Lord Lord stared at Risa Dillon from the side. Lord Leong, I don't have much money to pay now. But I can work for you and use my ability to pay off the debt. The elf spoke sincerely. But Leon still stared at the elf's eyes suspiciously. Risa Dillon, you should know that I don't trust you. This time, I didn't call him Teddy. Rasadalin hesitated for a moment and nodded. This is what it should be. I hope you can give me a chance to prove my sincerity. Sincerity? Leon looked at Lisa Dillon and then at the team list. No team members were added to the list. There is no prompt from the system. This doesn't seem very sincere. Leon shook his head, rode his horse to the back of the team and walked around in a circle along the team. When he came back, he had a small black pill in his hand. I don't trust you. And I don't think you trust me very much. So you ate it so that we could both feel more at ease. Leon put the pill to Lisa Dillon's mouth. The pills looked very poor. They were dark green with a bit of burnt yellow in the middle. And had a sour smell. It was not a good thing at first glance. This? What is this? Lisa Dillon was really panicked now, and didn't dare to speak. The poison is the legendary 100 days soul breaking pill. My unique secret recipe. After taking it, you must take another pill every three months. Otherwise you will suffer from intestinal piercing, belly rot, itching all over your body and death. In the 10 days before you die, you will feel like countless ants are eating your internal organs. I guarantee that it is the most cruel torture in the world. Leon had no expression on his face. Half smiling but not smiling. Waiting for Lisa Dillon to make a decision. If you don't eat it, you will obviously be killed. And if you eat it, you may be controlled for the rest of your life. This is a way to prove your sincerity. Risa Dillon was silent for a while, sighed resignedly, and swallowed the poison. My lord, I swear allegiance to you, Dot. I think you should be relieved now, Dot, but... Elves have a long life and serve people for a period of time. Even a human life is only a short period of time for the elves. For Lisa Dillon, swearing allegiance was not an awkward decision. What made the elf killer hesitate and find it difficult to say was another thing. But, Sir, can you please ask a doctor to treat me first? My wound has been bleeding. The system prompt also came at this time. Risa Dillon has joined your team. 
Maybe the function of this system is not powerful. But at least it can accurately judge whether you are really willing to join the team. From Anson to the Carpenters. Everyone has proved this. After hearing the prompt, Leong nodded with a smile. Don't forget to ask me for medicine in three months. Anson, treat his injuries. Of course, the black meatballs were not some hundred days soul-destroying pill, but were made from Alice's horse manure mixed with some messy things like bird droppings. Well, to a certain extent, it is indeed extremely poisonous. In fact, Leon knew that a cunning person like Lisa Dillon might not really believe in the existence of such a poison that would renew his life every three months. But as a person who knows how to use poison and how terrible the antidote is, Risa Dillon would never dare to take a gamble. The more cunning a person is, the less likely he is to risk his life. What if the poison is real? Lisa Dillon finally let out a sigh of relief and pursed her lips sadly. Sir, what do you need me to do now? Li Ang's expression became serious and cautious. First of all, before your wound heals, I want you to learn to respect everyone in the team. Start by taking care of Eric's injury. After all, he spared your life. After you recover from your injury, go find the person who hired you and bring him to me. Can you do that? Of course. I mean the first thing is to respect everyone. Can you do that? Rasadalan was silent for a few seconds. I will do it. Sir, but if someone captures my people as slaves, I cannot turn a blind eye. Leon nodded. Of course. You are also a member of my team now. If something like this happens, I will help you. I am even willing to help you return to your tribe. But? Leong moved closer to Lisa Dillon's eyes and stared closely into his blue pupils. But you have to understand that I am a selfish person and I will only help my own people. The handsome Nolder Elf looked deeply into Liang's eyes and nodded. Late at night, the convoy arrived at the village of Elideg. This is the ownerless village that Ralph talks about. This village originally had a lord. It was once a knighthood under the deceased Duke Alvan. The lord was Lord Rainier. In fact, in terms of geography, the village of Elideg should originally be affiliated with White Deer Castle, just like the village of Fletcher is affiliated with Fort Brave Shield. However, due to the continuous invasion of the Bacchus Empire in the south, Elideg was located in a dangerous area on the eastern border. So Duke Alphon, who was in charge of the eastern region at that time, took it into a knightly territory under direct jurisdiction in order to defend the Bacchus Empire. However, since Alphon became hemiplegic, this knighthood has been in a semi-autonomous state. Lord Rainier was quite free in his territory. After all, Alphen couldn't control him while he was paralyzed on the bed. And Whiteheart Castle couldn't control him. Lord Rainier is actually the nephew of Duke Alphen. And his father, Baron Eldred, is Alphen's distant cousin. This lord himself actually has no title and is called a lord just because he is the heir to the Baron. But until his father burps, he can only be considered a knight. Of course. It's also called Jazz, just like Auden's son-in-law Lord Lehman, in the process of Alma's Grand Duke plotting Long River Town. Lord Rainier gradually turned to Alma. His father, Baron Eldred, was actually Alma's distant cousin. There were frequent intermarriages between these old nobles. Quite complex. Eldred is the Lord of Chicha Fortress. This place is the central fortress of the entire continent and the gateway to Lion City. Its geographical location is very important. The father and son wisely chose to side with Archduke Alma. This is normal. It is easy to enjoy the shade with a big tree behind them. But Alma actually cheated Rainier. After Grand Duke Alma led the Jata people into the hinterland of Chang'e town, several teams of hundreds of Jata people have been going back and forth to plunder various villages. The village of Elideg and Rainier was the first group of villages to be affected. Facing the invasion of the Jata people, Rainier, the young lord, did not lead his troops to protect his territory, but ran away immediately. This is nothing unusual, and can even be called a normal and wise decision. Not every lord has the courage and strength to fight with dozens of people against 200 Jatu. In fact, if it weren't for the fact that he couldn't run away, Leon wouldn't be willing to fight hard. But the problem is that before Rainier gave up his territory and ran away, the first thing he did was to burn down the village. Burn your own village. He emptied all the valuable property in his territory and robbed his own people before the Jatu people. Then he set fire to the village, leaving the weeping villagers to the Jatu. It has to be said that people who can do this kind of operation often have a bright future. It's understandable that I would rather rob it myself than let the Jatu people take advantage. But the Jatu people won't do it. The terms of this transaction must have been negotiated with Archduke Alma. As a result, 
the Jata people entered the burned down Eladeg village and robbed it twice, but did not get much benefit. So the Jata people turned around and caught up with Rainier, who was not running fast with a large convoy, and then quickly and conveniently made a wholesale. The valuable things were packed, and even the cars were installed. It was better to rob Rainier's convoy than to rob him. The village is much more efficient. It was Ralph and his rangers who saved Rainier's life. Chapter 55 The Development Plan of the Lord When Ralph mentioned this, he was quite angry and regretted that he had saved the scumbag. However, it was only after he saved Rainier that he found out about the bastard's plan to burn down the village in advance. Therefore, he told Leon about Elideg village. Now Elideg was burned to ruins. The original lord had abandoned the place. The superior lord Alphon was also dead and was also killed by Jatu. There was a wave of excitement. According to the laws of the kingdom, this is already considered an unclaimed land. And pioneer lords can establish territories here. In this case, if a new village can be built nearby, it is actually better than opening up territory in an uninhabited land. At least the surviving refugees nearby can be accepted as territorial citizens. Ralph would suggest this. And of course he hopes that Leon can give those refugees a way to survive. To Ralph, these refugees were neighbors. When Leon led the team to the village of Elidae, there was no one in the village. Everything was charred, except for part of the stone wall that was still standing. All that could be seen were black embers and messy waste everywhere. Rainier and the Jada people have done a great job here. There are still wheat roots left in the fields around the village. They must have been harvested not long ago and have not had time to plant autumn and winter crops. As expected, Elideg was plundered and burned by his own lord just after the harvest. Leon greeted Leslie, settled the convoy, and then began to explain the task to Leslie. What? Sir, are you going to open a market here? Don't be so excited. Leslie, isn't this what you are good at? Leon looked at Leslie with a strange expression calmly. But sir, there is no one here now. If you build a market in this ruins, who will the goods be sold to? Leslie felt that the Lord must have lost his mind. She regretted drinking so much wine from Leon the day before yesterday. Leslie, you need to think more broadly. Leon touched the stubble on his chin spread out the map, and began to preach his business plan. The location of Elidig village was actually very good. To the west of the village is the El River, a tributary of the Tontian River, and Elidig is the end point of this tributary. The source of this tributary is the reservoir-like lake behind Chang'e Town. The water flow is relatively gentle, and you can directly paddle upstream to Chang'e Town. To the north is the outskirts of the Chang'e Forest, and to the south is the Towering Mountain, Dinger Mountains, that stretches for hundreds of miles. The monsoons from both the north and the south will be slowed down in this vicinity. This makes the climate of Elideg village very pleasant. A good place with warm winters and cool summers. It is also a place where mountains and rivers gather, with beautiful scenery and rich products. About 70 or 80 miles east of the village is the eastern border fortress White Deer Castle. This is the closest castle to the Nolder Forest, and can even be said to be surrounded by the Nolder Forest. To the north is the Chamna Forest, and behind the Dinger Mountains to the south is the Bacchus Empire. The roads on both ends are quite dangerous. So except for Chang'e Town and White Deer Castle, few business travelers from the north and south come here. Leslie, don't keep staring at Elidig. Look at White Deer Castle. Without the village of Elidig, there will be no way out for a county as big as White Deer Castle. They have almost become the lonely city. Leon covered Elidigor on the map with his hand and motioned for Leslie to look at it. Yes, Elideg itself may be just an ordinary village with a pleasant scenery and climate, but for the eastern fortress White Deer Castle, it is the only way to connect to the hinterland of the kingdom. After losing Elideger, White Heart Keep became a lonely enclave. To the east and north of White Deer Keep is the Nolder Forest. To the south is the territory of the Bacchus Empire, and to the west is the village of Elideger. Except for Elideger in the west, the people of White Deer Keep need to pass through the territory of the Nolder or Bacchus Empire in any direction. This is nothing to a lord or an army. But to an ordinary business traveler, it can be life-threatening. They could only go to Elideg first. And then go elsewhere. So, build a market here. And we will specialize in White Deer Castle business. Leon pointed at the loaded carts. I understand. Sir, our loot contains a lot of goods that White Deer Castle needs. As for the rest, I will take people to Chang'e Town to exchange for them. Leslie also understood. She was a qualified businessman and quickly understood the logic of the Lord's plan to control this trade route. That's right. Leslie, in addition, 
White Deer Keep should be the easiest place to receive Nolder crafts. In the future, you may be able to rebuild your caravan. Leong smiled and helped his quartermaster reestablish an ideal. The so-called effective management is actually to give your subordinates a hope that matches their own dreams, so that they can voluntarily bind their future to your chariot. This is true for Lisa Deland. And so is Leslie. Dot Lord Leon dot thank you. Although Leslie said she would not consider rebuilding the caravan. How could she let go in her heart? The next day, Leon held the startup's first all-employee meeting. But don't get me wrong. Leon does not intend to engage in democracy in this era. He just wants to inform his subordinates of the territory's development plan. This is of course very important for a pioneering lord who has just found a suitable place. So Leon hopes that employees can fully understand the boss's intentions and give reasonable suggestions or take initiative to take action. As a boss, you can't do everything yourself. Giving your subordinates a clear direction and letting them create value is what a leader should do. Of course, this is mainly because the Lord wants to reduce the burden on himself, which is called laziness. For the first formal meeting, the venue was a little shabby. This is the largest stone house in the village and was probably once a winery warehouse. The roof is gone. The stone walls are burnt black. And the windows are just a few stone holes. When the wind blows, you can even hear the remaining charred wood residue on the window edges falling. Fortunately, the climate in this place is good. And the wind leaks everywhere, and I don't feel cold. However, the ground has been covered with a layer of straw. And a wooden board has been hung on one wall. The carpenters also quickly nailed two broken wooden steps too. Everyone was very enthusiastic. Everyone, including the wounded, came to the scene. The originally spacious room was packed to the brim, and the air was filled with the smell of rotting wheat husks and golden sore medicine. Ah uh hum. Well, our first general meeting of my shungling begins now. Leong stood on the steps with a charcoal pen in his hand, cleared his throat, and then changed the awkward place name of Elideg in one sentence. The group of people below looked at each other, and then looked out the window in unison. The fields outside the village were completely bare. There was basically nothing except the excrement produced last night. There was neither wheat nor fragrance. Why was it called Makes Angling? First of all, I need to confirm the overall plan of Makes Angling. The Lord swung the charcoal pencil and drew two huge circles on the wooden board behind him. Then, he drew a curved grilled sausage on top of the two circles. Oh! There was a commotion in the audience. Chapter 56 Start Farming for Makes Angling Look at this territory plan! I plan to divide the territory into three areas, residential area, commercial area, and agricultural area. The Lord rapped on the wooden board and raised his voice. The migrant workers in the audience looked confused. They couldn't figure out why these two eggs and a sausage were the territory planning map. A residential area will be built here, and the team will be stationed here. Leon pointed to one of the circles. Oh, the subordinates said they understood. This is a business district. I want to build a comprehensive market here and open a winery. Leon pointed to another circle. Oh, the large area behind is an agricultural area where a large amount of wheat will be grown. The climate here is very suitable for the production of ale. The Lord pointed to the simple lines like sausages with a serious face. After looking at it, he thought it didn't look like it, and added a few strokes on it to represent wheat. Wheatfield Farm will divide the territory into pieces, and then it will be the real wheat. Fragrant Village. Oh, oh, oh. All the men seemed to understand. Only Anson covered his forehead and exhaled a long breath. As if he was relieved, but also seemed to have given up. Okay, can anyone give me some suggestions regarding the development of the territory? Leon looked at his men expectantly. Sarah was the first to speak. Sir, it seems you should confirm your flag and coat of arms first. And register them with the county first. Leon slapped his thigh. Yeah, I never cared about it. What do you think is appropriate? Sarah shook her head. Sir, this should be your family matter. You can make your own decision. Close raised his arm. Sir, when I was polishing your sword yesterday, I found that your sword seemed to have two layers. And there were some patterns on the sword. Is that a sword inherited from your family? I think you should use the crest engraved on the blade of the sword. Leong didn't pay attention. He didn't look at the sword again after it was handed over to him. Just pull out the sword. This sword does seem to be two layers. Probably the outside of the original blade was replated with a layer of silver. No wonder it's easy to dull. After being repolished by clothes, a lot of the outer layer of the sword body was worn away. The part of the sword blade close to the hilt revealed some black inner layer, 
and a small part of the inscription marks. Like a wing. Leon could guess what kind of coat of arms it was, but he had never seen the specific style. Now that you can find family crests, you definitely don't have to design them yourself. He handed the sword to close. Remove the outer layer and have a look. If it fits, then use it. The part-time blacksmith nodded. Okay, now the heraldry problem is solved. Let's continue. How to build this place specifically? Please give us some suggestions. Leon continued to chair the meeting. This time, Anson gave his opinion very directly. Sir, I think the residential area must at least have some houses and fortifications. Well, I am personally responsible for the civil engineering construction inside Makes Angling. Anson, after you take care of the wounded, you can leave the carpenters to repair the available rooms first. The first task is for yourself. This is Liang's principle. However, it is a workplace rule that whoever makes the suggestion is responsible for the specific implementation. But Anson was an honest kid, and he seemed happy to be able to help. Sir, we have to build the road to the Air River to facilitate the movement of the caravan. Leslie put forward her own opinion. Very good. It's about building roads. Eric. John. You are familiar with the terrain. I appointed you as acting administrators. Your first task is to build roads. Go west and build roads all the way to air. The river needs to be built a little further east. At least to make the road to White Deer Castle look spacious. Leon named two unexpected names. Oh. The mercenaries looked at each other. And Eric. Who was still injured was a little confused. Sir, do you want us to become administrative officials? What? Not satisfied? I said that everyone has a chance and may even become an apprentice knight. By the way, can you write? Yes, dot someone. The two semi-literate people were a little excited, never expecting that such a good thing would happen to them. Since the Lord made the appointment publicly, it was natural that it was not just talk. So the two lucky men completed their magnificent transformation from mercenaries to village committee directors. Lord administrators in Pendor are not the same as civil servants in the modern sense. Except for the taxation within the territory, which is the exclusive responsibility of the tax officer. The administrator can coordinate any other matters in the territory, and most specific matters will be related to them. At the same time, they also have a very important administrative law enforcement power. They can control all inappropriate things that appear on the territory and are responsible for the safety of roads and business travel, which is roughly equivalent to a combination of the Urban Management Department and the Traffic Control Department. This is of course a very important position and is usually held by the Lord Steward or close servants. Don't underestimate this seemingly inconspicuous official. Once the territory develops, there will be a lot of money. Administrators and tax collectors in wealthy territories may have a better life than ordinary minor nobles. Eric now feels that the arrow wounds on his body no longer hurt. Although Liang's territory has not even built a village now, Go Sheng has no doubt that the Lord will lead them on the road to wealth. Of course Liang made this appointment deliberately. For Liang, the abilities of his subordinates can be discussed later. But subordinates who have proven their loyalty must be promoted first. Although there is nothing at the moment. As a boss, what I have to do is to encourage employees to be more proactive in creating value. Sir, the biggest problem now is, there is no manpower. We should find the former villagers of Eladeg village. Sure enough, the audience's suggestions were more proactive. This time, the two refugees from Holden village were the ones speaking. But now, the two people who had received some spoils no longer looked that poor. They were now wearing nomadic leather clothes and were in much better spirits than before. That's right. By the way, I will give you a farm. And you have to grow wheat. Otherwise it won't be called Mix Yingling. As soon as he finished speaking, Leon felt that there seemed to be a change in the team interface. I subconsciously glanced at the team list. These two refugees are already displayed as residents in the team list. This is a name that Leon has never seen before. And he has never seen it in a game in his previous life. Moreover, the familiar plus sign plus appears after the line of leader this means they can be upgraded. I see. Leon realized that this was a remarkable transformation. Leading the people. Just looking at the literal meaning. It can be seen that these are the people who truly identify with him. Granting land to refugees will of course gain their greatest recognition. So they become their own subjects. And this system can only upgrade its own citizens. In this case, let more refugees become your own subjects. After all, in the final analysis, 
Farmers and fields are the real fundamentals of a territory that can develop in the long term. The matter of retrieving the villagers will also be left to you. As my representative, you will be responsible for finding and bringing the surrounding villagers. Tell them that I will allocate the fields to them, and there is no need to pay money. For taxes, you only need to pay 30% of the grain during harvest. Samur, take a few locals to patrol the surrounding areas to protect the safety of the villagers and escort them back here. Close. I leave the security and defense of the territory to you. As tasks were assigned one by one, this grassroots team gradually began to move closer to a real territory. Chapter 57 Unusual Sword In the afternoon, Close came over to present Liang's sword and looked very excited. Sir, I have repolished this sword. This is an amazing sword. The actual blade inside is almost indestructible. This sword is probably made of a very rare meteorite iron. It is the best sword I have ever seen. After handing the sword to Liang, Close was still sighing. It seemed that as a blacksmith. He loved high-quality weapons very much. The sword looked even more ancient after the surface coating was completely worn away. The blade of the sword is very smooth, but it looks dull and inconspicuous. It feels like a wooden product rather than metal. But when you touch it with your hands, it has the coolness of metal. There is a line of incomprehensible runes in the middle of the sword blade. On both sides, the runes look like they have penetrated into the blade, which is very strange. And near the sword, there is a griffin engraved on it. Leon weighed the sword and it felt more comfortable. A leaf fell from the tree nearby and landed on the black wood-like sword blade which did not look sharp. The sword did not move. But the leaf was still divided into two halves directly by the blade. Such a unique and sharp sword should have been a treasure known all over the world. But it was deliberately covered up with a layer of ordinary silver plating. Even sacrificing its original sharp effect for this purpose. This must be a helpless choice. The griffin emblem printed on the sword's hilt was worn away and the emblem engraved on the blade was also covered and hidden. It is easy to guess what this sword means. It is probably a token of loyalty presented by the Griffin Knights to the Pender Royal Family. Just like the Dragon Fong, presented to the King of Raven Kingdom by the Dragon Knights. Then, the origin of this body will be easier to guess. Shaking his head and sighing, Leon called Sarah and asked her to make patterns and flags according to the Griffin emblem on the sword. Then, he and Sarah would take the coat of arms to the county seat. That is, to White Deer Castle for registration. Leon definitely doesn't plan to go to Chunga Town. Although Eladeg was previously designated as the direct knight territory of Duke Alf I. Now Eladeg is gone and Chunga Town can't control it. Chunga Town is now the territory of Grand Duke Alma. This Grand Duke certainly doesn't have a good impression of him. And Leon doesn't want to commit suicide. Now this village is his newly built territory, Mai Xiang Village. Geographically speaking, this village falls under the jurisdiction of Bailu Fort. The registration of coats of arms and pioneering collars is a necessary process. I went to the noble house of Lion City to register and approve, obtain the status of a pioneer lord, and confirm the general direction of the territory to be developed. The registration at that time was Chang'e Forest. After you start building a territory, you need to go to the superior unit near the territory. That is, Go to the county to register your flag and coat of arms to prevent other nearby lords from thinking you are a bandit. The county will temporarily retain the coat of arms of the pioneering lord. And wait for the pioneering lord to apply for verification after he establishes the territory. The verification is also done by the county based on the principle of proximity. After all, it is too far to send people from the kingdom's house of lords. And there is no high-speed rail in this era. After passing the inspection and acceptance of the territory. The county will report it to the kingdom's house of nobles along with the registered coat of arms. Until the house of lords receives the verification results from the county. The lord's coat of arms will be officially sealed. A formal title will be issued. And a notice will be issued to the nobles across the country indicating that a new member of the ruling class has been added. For those who fail the review of the pioneering lord. If they have a good relationship with the lords in the county. They may have a chance to make amends. Otherwise they may have their noble emblems taken back and lose their qualifications as pioneering lords. Sarah's duties as a foreign affairs officer also included these social affairs. Early the next morning, Leong and Sarah set out for White Deer Castle. The road to White Deer Castle was not easy to walk. It took Leong and Sarah a full half a day to complete the 80-mile mountain road. The road conditions were so bad that the horses could not run at all. It's no wonder that White Deer Castle failed to rescue Aledegor in time when he was attacked by the Jada people. White Deer Castle is a castle located on the eastern border of the kingdom. 
It is a mountain fortress guarding the eastern passage. Unlike Fort Brave Shield on the northeastern border, White Deer Fort has been established for many years. A hundred years ago, this place was just an ordinary pioneer territory, just like the village of Elideg. However, as more and more territory was developed to the southeast of Chang'e Town, the distance from Chang'e Town became further and further away. So Bailu Fort was used as the county seat and a separate county was established. The same is actually true at Brave Shield Castle. In recent decades, after the Bacchus Empire in the south gradually pushed its territory northward and built the Shield Wind Fortress in the southern part of the Dinger Mountains, White Deer Fort, as the first front line, has faced repeated attacks. A war. White Deer Castle guards the eastern passage of the kingdom. Without taking White Deer Fort, the Bacchus Empire will not be able to enter the hinterland of the kingdom. In this regard, it is similar to Brave Shield Fort. Baron Godric, the lord of White Deer Castle, rose to fame through defensive battles. But unlike Earl Odin, a famous general who is good at opening up territories, Baron Godric is an excellent defender. He never took the initiative to attack the Bacchus Empire, but he was able to repel the enemy in every defensive battle, and then continued to expand and strengthen White Heart Castle. In the past few decades, White Deer Castle, a border castle, has been expanded at least eight times. Each expansion added city defenses to the original ones. White Deer Castle is built on the top of a mountain, with a dangerous terrain and excellent defensive position. It is a dangerous place that is easy to defend but difficult to attack. Thanks to Baron Godric's tireless city defense construction, White Deer Castle has now become a towering fortress, and the Bacchus Empire has not made any plans to invade the eastern part of the kingdom for several years. The first time he saw White Deer Castle, Leon felt a trace of envy and hatred because this is an extremely beautiful castle, and it must be a first-class five-star scenic spot in modern times. The entire castle stands on a high mountain, or the entire mountain is a castle. The high walls erected on the mountainside increase the gap between the outermost wall of the castle and the valley at the foot of the mountain to tens of meters, which looks extremely spectacular. The stone walls are mottled, and the roof is covered with red tiles. There are no gorgeous decorations, but against the backdrop of the forest behind the mountain, it reveals a rough and simple beauty. There are also independent lookouts and military stations arranged on the hills on both sides of the castle. Above the city gate hangs the flag of the three lions with a red background, which is the flag of Baron Godric. The defenders in front of the gate looked very energetic, and most of them were armored archers. After all, this is a border fortress, and these archers are probably the most serious and responsible guards Liang has ever encountered. Even after seeing Liang's newly made black and white griffin flag, they still carefully checked the noble emblems and sent someone to escort the two men. People go inside the castle. The attitude was very polite, but it looked a bit like an escort. Lord Godric is in the main building at the top. Your horse can be temporarily placed in the stables below the city. We will take good care of it. After handing over, Liang to the two attendants in the castle and politely bidding farewell to Liang. Several archers returned to their posts. The two attendants were more polite and enthusiastic but more vigilant. They asked Leon and Sarah to take off their swords. Your Excellency Leon, I'm sorry, except for the Baron himself. Everyone needs to be disarmed to enter the main building of the castle. I will follow you with your sword, so you don't have to worry about losing it. Sarah and Leon looked at each other, both of them a little surprised. Even in the House of Lords of Lion City, there is no such requirement. The sword is not only a weapon for the nobles, but also a symbol of dominance. You know, the symbol of elite armed forces such as the Dragon Knights or the Griffin Knights swearing allegiance to their respective kings is the sword. Chapter 58 May He Live a Long Life Sarah didn't care about this, but Leon was obviously not happy that the sword he was wearing was the Griffin Knight sword that had already revealed its prototype. This sword would be so tightly covered, which naturally meant that it could not be easily handed over to others. Just when Leon was a little confused, a middle-aged man came down the steps of the main building. The man is quite burly, a little taller than Leon, and looks to be in his fifties, but his hair and beard are still as black as ink, and he does not look as old as other nobles. Even at his current age, he is quite attractive, and it is obvious that he must have been a handsome man when he was young. Sir, this is Lord Leon Griffin and his foreign affairs officer, Miss Sarah, coming to you to report on the development of the territory. An attendant came up to explain. Baron Godric looked at the black and white griffin flag held by Sarah, and seemed to be stunned, and then looked at Leon carefully, looked at it very carefully, 
Leon Dot Young Man. Please come with me. Sir. Your Excellency Liang's weapon. The attendant was quite conscientious and asked hesitantly. It doesn't matter. You go down. Tell the others that if Lord Leon comes to visit in the future, there is no need to untie the sword or ask. Just send him to see me directly. Godric turned around and gave instructions, beckoning Leon to go upstairs with him. I haven't seen the griffin flag for a long time. Please take a seat. The Baron took the two people to his reception room, waved the guards in front of the door to leave, and then sighed. Lord Godric, is there anything wrong with my flag? Leon vaguely felt that he might not activate this coat of arms directly. No, it's okay to use this flag. It may even be beneficial as long as you don't use the black griffin on a gold background. Godric smiled meaningfully. The griffin emblem itself is nothing. In fact, there are many nobles who use griffins as their designs. Baron Leofric used the griffin emblem. But the black griffin on gold is the only knighthood. You know, it is an illegal knighthood now. As he spoke, Godric glanced at Liang's sword. And his eyes fell on the hilt with its coat of arms worn away. Leon followed his gaze and looked at his sword, feeling suddenly nervous. Are you surprised that I have a disarming rule here? Godric looked at Leon and smiled self-deprecatingly. Leon and Sarah nodded together. The Baron pointed to his own flag on the wall. I was once a count. Leon didn't quite understand. Sarah looked at the flag, but showed a sweet smile and saluted again. Royal Guard. Lord Godric. I'm sorry. We are rude. The flag that Godric hung in his room was different from the one at the city gate. In addition to the three lions emblem, there were also three golden fleur-de-lis and an inverted triangle, which was the symbol of the royal family or the royal guard. Godric nodded, with a slight smile on his face. Miss Sarah is really knowledgeable. Years ago, a knight with strong swordsmanship entered the castle I was responsible for guarding, and single-handedly killed my guards and snatched a girl from the castle. Since then, I have lost the ability to protect the royal family, qualifications, and was demoted and sent to the frontier. So, from then on, I will no longer let anyone bring weapons into the inner fort. Godric stared at Leon closely and told the past events. The content was amazing, but his tone was bland. But Leon still heard his kindness. A strange but believable kindness, like a wanderer returning home meeting a strange elder. That night is probably your friend. Does it sound like a romantic elopement? Lord Godric is a hero with deep loyalty, which is admirable. Sarah showed her iconic smile, her face full of admiration and compliments, like a lady who saw her idol. This was her usual communication method, a sales business form. Godric curled his lips and retorted, Bullshit friend, do I look like the kind of person who would make friends with a wanted criminal? Leong sighed and stretched out his hand to signal Sarah to stop talking. Lord Godric, the girl who was taken away by the knight may one day tell her children that the knight once rescued her from a group of kidnappers. Leon also spoke in a calm tone and stared at Godric closely, watching his face change from seriousness to smile, and then burst into laughter. That's right. Kid! She will definitely say that. Ha ha ha. Sarah watched the two of them playing riddles, and finally put away her business attitude, her face becoming dignified and reserved. Just as he said this, a girl appeared outside the door and leaned sideways into the room. Father! You are here, Dada! Sorry! I didn't know there was a guest! The girl covered her mouth, stood timidly at the door, and bowed to Leong and Sarah to apologize. Sarah returned the gift and smiled. Baron! Is this your daughter? So beautiful! That was a girl of 18 or 19. Her eyes are as clear as water. Her lips are as pink as early spring petals. Her face is like jade and her appearance is absolutely beautiful. Lu Hai seemed to be brushed away casually, with a bun on the back of her head and no other decorations. She was wearing a swordsman's casual clothes and looked full of youthful vitality. If the sight of Sarah reminds one of vixens and beds, then the sight of this girl reminds one of the dewdrops of early spring. Refreshing and clean. As soon as Godric saw his daughter, a fatherly smile appeared on his face and he said, Amy, I'm sorry I have a guest. Then, he looked at the long sword on Sarah's waist. Miss Sarah seems to be good at swordsmanship. Would you like to accompany my daughter to practice swordsmanship for a while? I was supposed to accompany her today. But now it seems that I'll have to be busy for a while. Sarah stood up. Of course. It is my pleasure. My lord. The girl pouted silently to Godric. Then bowed slightly and nodded to Leon. Then stretched out her hand 
and let Sarah take her arm. And they walked upstairs together. A very polite and lively girl. Leon watched the two beauties disappear from sight. Then stood up and closed the door. Godric looked at Liang's movements and seemed a little pleased. Can I see the sword on your body? Leon hesitated and handed over the sword. Godric drew his sword and flicked the black sword lightly, making a ding sound. However, he did not say any words of praise. He looked at the sword as if he were looking at an old friend. Perhaps I should call you Uncle Godric? Godric glared. Don't talk nonsense. I don't want to have anything to do with your stupid young father. You see? I now have a family and a daughter. Leon curled his lips. Okay. Lord Baron, what do you think of King Ulrich? Godric spoke righteously. Uh-huh. May he live a long life. May your parents live a long life too. Leon spread his hands with a serious expression. They are dead dot, that's why I came here. The Baron was silent. There was silence for a long time. The kingdom was not actually hunting them down. King Ulrich had just ascended the throne at that time and didn't know the specifics. Godric said suddenly, I can probably guess this. I mean, what should I do now? Leon nodded. And he also felt that the Lion Kingdom did not seem to be chasing him. Godric was silent again. Just do whatever you have to do. Dot, give me your flag. And I'll help you find some manpower to build your territory. Dot, you can find a way to increase the strength of your troops. I feel like we'll be going to war soon. After a long silence, Godric gave Leon an unexpected and reasonable answer. Thank you. Uncle Godric. Go away. Don't call me uncle. Guard your shabby village. If you dare to be like that, Rainier, I will kill you with my own hands. Chapter 59 Mondesi Company LTD Leon actually didn't expect that he would have such luck. The largest lord in the county was actually an old friend of his, parents. But after thinking about it, I feel that it is reasonable to not just bear the disaster of this body, but not enjoy the benefits it brings. Right? It's just that Godric obviously didn't want to get involved too deeply. At most, he just gave him some care, which couldn't help much. After all, he himself was sent to the frontier. He had guarded the border at White Deer Castle for more than 20 years. He had made great military achievements, but had never been promoted to a noble rank. He was not popular after all. Moreover, White Deer Castle itself is not likely to be wealthy. It is surrounded by mountain forests. The cultivated land is small. And commerce is not developed. There are only a few thousand residents. This population is more than enough to support Liang's business plan. But for a castle as big as White Deer Castle, with nearly a thousand defenders in the city, it consumes a lot of money, and the city defenses are constantly being expanded. It will definitely not be easy for Godric to maintain it in a small border town. So this baron actually lived a very simple life, which can be seen from the furnishings in his house. After completing the heraldry registration, Godric took Leon to a simple barracks outside the castle. These people all fled from Elideg. But there is no extra place in White Deer Castle to house them. You can take them back and rebuild their homes. In the barracks, there was a large group of refugees. At least a hundred people. It seems that most of the surviving refugees in Elideg have already rushed to the nearest White Deer Castle. This indeed solved Liang's urgent need. What he lacked was people. But, Baron Godric, I'm afraid I don't have enough food. Leon almost subconsciously began to cry about poverty. I don't have enough food. So you have to figure it out yourself. No. I mean, my dinar is not enough. That, otherwise. Leon rubbed his fingers and made an internationally accepted gesture for counting gold coins. Oh, I've given you manpower to help you build your territory. And you still want me to pay to feed them? I don't have any money either. Godric was shocked. He looked at Liang's face carefully, probably to confirm whether he had recognized the wrong person. Baron. Don't get me wrong. I want to say that you don't look rich either. How about we set up a company together? When Leon saw that Godric didn't seem to be easy to trick, he started to have other ideas. Company? Do you mean civil gangs like Buckley? It seems that this old school aristocrat is quite well informed and has even heard of Buckley's emerging business practices. No. 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 They call it profiteers. What I mean is that if you set up a joint stock company and take the lead in subscribing for shares, it should be easy to make money. Leon stopped rubbing his fingers and started rubbing his chin instead. What? What kind of limited company do you own? Please explain. Who can have too much of a good thing like Dinar? Hearing that it was easy to make money, Godric also became interested. The so-called joint stock company is to divide assets into equal shares 
and raise funds through public issuance of shares. Shareholders bear limited liability to the company based on the shares they subscribe for. Profits After deducting provident funds and public welfare funds are distributed according to the shares held by shareholders. One share of stock corresponds to one dividend. Can you understand? Godric was obviously dizzy. I don't understand. Leon sighed. Then I have to put it bluntly. It's just a money scam. First, find one of your subordinates to set up a company as a legal person and make up nonsense about a project, such as the discovery of a gold mine in the mountains nearby Lou Fort. Find a reliable celebrity to lead the investment, such as you, Baron Godric. Then find a few scammers to defraud money, such as those big nobles, and tell them to invest 100 dinars, and I will pay you back 1,000 dinars next year. Let them pay for the shares. In the end, you declared bankruptcy on the grounds that you were affected by the war. Once you get the money, everything will be fine. You can also claim to be a victim. Godric suddenly realized. You would have understood if you had said this earlier. But? What? Leon thinks this routine should work in this era. Why is the Baron so troubled? How did you know there were gold mines in the mountains? Aw? Uh? Liang's jaw almost dropped to the floor. Is it really true? There is indeed a gold mine in a nearby mountain. In fact, that place is closer to Liang's, my Xiangling, and has been discovered for decades. It is said that the purity is not low. But the only problem is that this gold mine has no gold at all. Unable to mine. Because this gold mine is located on the main peak of the Dinger Mountains. 200 miles away in the southwest. Where the altitude is high. The temperature is low. And it is covered with ice and snow all year round. It is easy to burp for various reasons when panning for gold in such snowy mountains. If that's all it is, then that's fine. There are still people who are not afraid of death after all. But to get there, you need to be able to fly. The mountain collapsed a few decades ago. And now the gold mine is surrounded by cliffs on all sides. In fact, the person who discovered the gold mine was the lucky one who survived the massive mountain collapse. He did bring back a large piece of nugget gold with high purity. Hey, if that's the case, Dot, that's even better. The best project is the one that no one can verify. Sir, let's get started. Someone under me happens to have a caravan. Leon became more confident after hearing what Godric said. It was already evening when they left White Deer Castle. Godric reluctantly took Leon to the gate of the castle, and his daughter Amy also reluctantly pulled Sarah along. Chairman Leon, this project must be started quickly. Executive Director Godric, you have to try your best to deceive as much as possible. Well, attract more wealthy people to invest. The two of them had changed their names and were as close as comrades who had been comrades for many years. Sarah and Amy were stunned by the look of their friendship. Sister Sarah, what do they mean? Amy, I think you'd better not talk to your father these days. The two beauties whispered to each other like best friends. On the way back to make the angling, there were already about a hundred refugees behind Leong, each carrying a bag of food. Godric finally gave him a sponsorship. There was a project that was going to make a lot of money, and the partners had to survive. Moreover, the Baron, who is now the executive director of a leather bag company, used this grain to subscribe for shares. Sir, how did you cheat these things? Sarah thought this ability to deceive people wherever they went was outrageous. She wants to learn too. Sarah, pay attention to your wording. I said, I am always solving problems for others. Oh, by the way, from now on, you are already the marketing director of Mondesi Company. Limited remember to help Godry more Baron Graham. I'm worried that his sales ability is not good. Leon shook his head and said, and after thinking about it, he added, Baron Godric will go to Chang'e to suppress Hulu tomorrow. Well, to raise funds through a public offering of stocks. You and Leslie will go with you and inquire about Chang'e by the way. The situation in the town. Sarah's mind was a little buzzing. Mondesi Company. LTD Marketing Director. Chapter 60 Good Projects with High Returns. Close thought he might be hallucinating. He originally thought that before the end of winter, this place would only look like ruins facing various dangers at any time. So he took a manpower rotation to patrol. But as the Lord returned from White Deer Castle, so many people appeared in this dilapidated and deserted village overnight. And there were also warehouses full of food. This made him find it incredible that the Lord could not have robbed another village single-handedly. Right. That's too fierce. If Anson hadn't led the carpenters to clear out many abandoned houses during the day, these people wouldn't even be able to be accommodated. And after the Lord returned to make the angling overnight, 
He didn't even take a moment's rest and took Sarah and Leslie directly into his tent. I didn't come out for four whole hours and the tent was still lit with candles. It was not until daybreak when Close finished his patrol work and was about to rest that he saw the Lord stretching out with dark circles under his eyes. That satisfied and proud look as if he had just solved a big problem. When Sarah and Leslie came out from behind him, they both looked happy, but their faces were full of exhaustion. Sarah didn't even eat breakfast before going to catch up on her sleep. As soon as Leslie left the tent, she started writing furiously. She didn't know what she was writing. She giggled from time to time while writing and occasionally looked up at the Lord. Her eyes like that of a fangirl worshiping an idol. The Lord is really awesome. Clothes felt from the bottom of his heart. But the sensible clothes immediately gave the patrol men a silence order. You didn't see anything. Do you understand? Oh, oh. The Lord seemed to hear the sound and turned away to close. Sarah and Leslie are going to Chang'e town in the afternoon. You can bring a few people with them to protect them and follow their arrangements. Oh, oh. Close glanced at Leslie, who was still giggling while writing, and expressed his sincere admiration for the Lord's ability to squeeze employees to work overtime day and night but the employees were still satisfied. In the afternoon, the Baron of White Deer Castle passed by Mixi Angling with dozens of attendants. The Lord greeted him very casually. He didn't even organize people to line up. He just chatted casually. It feels like saying H, low to a relative you meet on the street. This kind of neither humble nor arrogant behavior made the members of Mixi Angling think highly of the Lord. Moreover, everyone in Mixi Angling heard it. Not only did the Baron not get angry, he also kindly called the Lord, Chairman, and kindly called Leslie, General Manager. Close has never heard of these high-profile names. But with the words, Long, and, General, attached to them. They must be very valuable words. Right? Close suddenly felt that it was time for him to learn to write. The business plan written by Leslie is quite reliable. Although it was a document that only took half a day to work on. Just looking at the name of the project can attract many people who are stupid and have a lot of money. The name of the project is Open Pit Gold Mine, Investment of 100, Return of 1,000 Inch. There is also an eye-catching, Annualized Return of 1,000%, and Only Accepting the First 100 Investors, By As Soon As Possible, is marked next to it. The sheepskin plan has text and pictures, and is well made with neat handwriting. It can be called a classic version of PPT, very modern leather bag company style. In fact, the name Open Pit Gold Mine is not a lie. The gold mine is indeed open air, and the exposure is very close to the sky. It is said that the altitude there is at least 5,000 meters, an annualized income. If it can be mined successfully, the rate of return is actually not a lie. This is a real gold mine. As for the fact that it is difficult to go up to the cliff for on-the-spot inspection, it is nonsense. If it were easy to go up, it would have been mined by others long ago. Is it your turn to invest? So it's definitely a good project. Looking at it, even Baron Godric, who has always been upright, is very optimistic and even subscribed for a large amount of shares first. After the partners of Mondesi Company finished talking to each other, Leon watched the executives of his company go to Chang'e Town. He didn't go with him. He wouldn't be able to help with fundraising. Old nobles like Godric were more convincing. The legal representative of Mondesi Company limited his clothes. But the major shareholder is McShanling International Investment Company. Limited, which currently holds 85% of the shares, 15% of which has been subscribed by Godric. There are 40% shares open for fundraising, a total of 40,000 shares. As for the price per share, it is definitely opaque. It will be discussed on a first come, first serve basis. The price may increase. The legal person and general manager of Makes the Angling International Investment Company is Leslie, but the actual largest beneficiary, Leon hold 70% of the shares. Moreover, the headquarters of both companies are in Maishiong. How much business tax they collect depends entirely on the moods of Leon and Godric. Well, they are all routine operations in modern companies. Baron Godric also owns 10% of the shares in McLean International. He is considered an angel investor. Although he did not give a single dinar, he is considered an influence investor. From Sarah to Anson, to the Mendenheim infantrymen and crossbowmen, all of them had shares. When the payday came for all employees, Leon didn't have dinars in his hand. So he directly used the shares to pay off the account. Since the Lord has always kept his word, his subordinates still trust him. And they are also full of interest in the 
Open pit gold mine project. That stock seems to be very valuable. Their wages were not that much originally. No one would mind having too much money. In fact, Leon has long wanted to use this more modern operation method to make money. It's not because the Lord is so greedy. In the final analysis, it is to protect your own life. There are two types of people in this world who are relatively safe. One is the rich and powerful. The other type is a big loser who doesn't pay back the money he owes. If you are rich and powerful, you can have many followers and guards. If you have more subordinates and more territory, you will have more room for operation. So your security will naturally be higher. If you don't pay back the money you owe, as long as you owe enough and the creditor is strong enough, you will definitely not die. After all, your creditors need you to repay the money alive, and it will be their loss if you die. For example, Count Odin, as long as he did not pay back the thousand dinars, Leon felt that he would not harm his life. Leon has never been able to do this before, mainly because of the lack of a relatively reliable big shot who can take the lead in investment as a partner. Any project always needs someone's endorsement. The celebrity endorsing the project must know the true logic of the project. Otherwise, it will easily collapse midway. People who help you raise funds cannot be deceived. And Baron Godric happens to be a suitable leader. He is famous, has status, and has a good reputation among the nobles. Moreover, he himself is short of money and has shown kindness to Leon. He can reveal the past by himself. Obviously with the knight who snatched a girl from the castle. Very close friendship. Although he kept saying, wanted criminal. Chapter 61 Busy My Xiangling My Xiangling is a great place. Here you can enjoy the warm sunshine in winter and see the magnificent clouds in the sky. The air river to the west is crystal clear and there are fish swimming in the sparkling river. The mountains and forests in the distance bring a verdant scenery. And the snow-capped mountains further away are also faintly visible. The smoke and clouds sweeping over the snow-capped mountains smear the blue sky into a charming picture. Everyone in the village now has something to do. And the small village seems full of hope and vitality. Everything seemed wonderful. The only pity is that this is the continent of Pendor. A dangerous Middle Ages. Therefore, no one can slow down to appreciate the beauty of nature. In fact, the sense of crisis has never diminished. And everyone is very busy. Leon is studying how to upgrade his men. The team has suffered battle losses. And the number of people and combat effectiveness have not increased for a long time. In fact, if you calculate the time carefully, it is only about 10 days. But the Lord still has a sense of crisis. The subordinates have arranged some training every day. And their proficiency and experience have been increasing. In addition, after experiencing the hard battle with the Jata people before, there must be many people who have the ability to upgrade. But the equipment that can be found now is not enough to support their level improvement. So the team list remains unchanged. The only thing that changed was the original two refugees from Holden Village. After they became territorial citizens, Leon upgraded them to Pander Militia. This can be actively operated. And it is also the only troop upgrade that can be actively operated. After completing this operation, the plus sign disappeared. Probably because the other newly arrived residents did not have any combat experience or received enough training to be called militiamen. This is a lack of experience. The original team was just the opposite. Many of the crossbowmen should be able to be promoted to armor crossbowmen or even higher. They should not lack combat experience now. But the problem is that although they seized a lot of chain armor and neck protecting chain mail helmets from the Jata people, they were lacking in heavy crossbow weapons. The same goes for those Medenheim infantrymen. They even have extra armor. But they don't have a qualified sword in their hands. So they can't be upgraded to great swordsmen. The crude swords brought out from the arena were all turned into iron when used against the Jata people. Therefore, Leon originally planned to arrange a job for clothes that would definitely satisfy him and open a blacksmith shop. This was Close's dream when he was young. He once wanted to open a sword workshop to provide the best weapons for those brave warriors. But the cruel life forced him to become a brave warrior. Close and his tough men are very experienced in blacksmithing. But building a smelting site requires craftsmen to run it, which takes a lot of time. Therefore, it is estimated that it will take a long time before we can produce finished products. Whether it is making a heavy crossbow or a large sword, the training of the citizens also takes time. And it is difficult for the militia to be of much use. They must at least be trained as archers or infantry before they can enter the real battlefield. I want to recruit more people, or buy suitable equipment directly. But I have no money. Leong is now extremely looking forward to the fundraising team, returning as soon as possible. 
but the executives of Mondesi Company Limited also need time to do things. There's no point in rushing. Always take your time. Most of his core staff have gone out to work. Sarah and Leslie took clothes and the others to Long River Town with Baring Godric. Anson and his craftsmen were repairing the house. Samar and his patrol searched for survivors. John led some of the people from the territory to build a road to the wheat field. Eric, who had not recovered from his injuries, but was already able to move, diligently took on the task of allocating the fields to the people. Leon found that he seemed to have nothing to do again. He had wanted to go around a bit earlier, but most of the employees had expressed disapproval. Anson said directly and politely, Sir, please go and rest. We don't need help. The craftsman kept saying, Sir, please give me a break, and walked around with a wooden pole swinging around, completely treating him as an obstacle. John and a dozen or so local residents were shouting slogans while picking up soil and paving the road. And they didn't even bother to pay attention to him. As for Summer's patrol, they immediately changed directions after seeing the Lord's golden maned horse from a distance. It felt like hide and seek. Only Eric was more sensible. He gave up his seat to the Lord, then covered his chest and went to another table to greet the people and continued to record the field accounts. Then the people directly changed places to line up. And there was only one person in front of the Lord. There was an empty table left. Even Drash, who was feeding the horses, felt that Liang's wandering around the stable was intrusive. Although he didn't move his mouth due to the difficulty in speaking, he had already bumped into Liang twice with a haystack when feeding the horses. Maybe there is some personal grudge. Everyone's intention is obvious. Boss, if you have nothing else to do, go to bed. Read and play in the mud. And don't delay our work by wandering around here. Leon had no choice but to find Rasadalin, the only one who had no work to do, and returned an older sword to him. Risa Dillon, it's time for you to go out and work. An unscrupulous boss won't let others take sick leave. Sir, you should give me a token that represents your identity, so that I can gain the trust of that employer more easily. I think you are planning to let me bring that person back alive. Lisa Dillon did not dislike his boss. He seemed to have been thinking about how to complete the tasks assigned by Leong. In fact, he has been taking good care of Eric these two days, and he has indeed shown equality and respect to everyone. He wore a black hood and a black cloak, and was so polite that the people didn't even realize he was an older elf. This is rare for an older elf who always despises humans, especially since he is an elf noble. Maybe he was a little afraid of the 100 day soul breaking pill, or maybe he was looking forward to returning to the tribe. Anyway, he has always been conscientious and proactive. Leon also felt that what Risa Dillon said made sense. No matter who the dead face was, it was more appropriate for Risa Dillon to go and claim the reward in the form of completed the assassination mission. Although it was probably easy to kill the dead face with the skills of an elf assassin, it didn't make sense to him to kill a minion who was responsible for contacting him. He really wanted to capture someone alive. After thinking about it, Leon took out his pioneering noble emblem, which had his name, Leon Griffin, engraved on it. I think this is the best thing that can prove my identity. Remember to bring back the balance. Now that the flag and coat of arms have been registered, there is no need to use the emblem all the time. Lisa Dillon nodded and took the emblem. I will bring that person back to you. If possible, I will also test who the real employer is behind him. Chapter 62 Praying is Useful October The second day of the full moon night. This is the traditional festival of the Pender continent. The goddess's blessing day. Also called the Winter Advent Festival. People in Pender believe that this day is the beginning of winter. When winter comes, people will pray for the goddess's blessing so that they can successfully survive the cold winter and usher in the warmth of spring in the new year. Cold winter in this continent often means disaster and death. In the past thousands of years, every winter, the mountain people and savages of the Misty Mountains would go out in large numbers. In winter, the entire north of the continent would be covered with ice and snow and the intersection of the cold air from the north and the ocean monsoon from the west would cause widespread ice storm. The mountain people of the Misty Mountain tribe who live in the ice and snow all year round will not be affected by this severe cold environment. But the warriors in the center of the continent are different. The combination of biting cold wind and ice and snow will make it impossible for most of the kingdom's warriors to use their hands and feet, whether they are men or horses. Their combat effectiveness will be much lower than usual in this environment and the effectiveness of scouts and watchtowers will also be greater. Discount. All advantages and disadvantages come from horizontal comparison. In other seasons, 
the Misty Mountain tribe with inferior equipment and poor tactics would be far from being a match for the kingdom's warriors or Jazza cavalry. But in winter like this, they will become extremely terrifying enemies. In a sense, they are even more terrifying than the Jada people. The Jada grassland is just one place. And their roots and goals can be traced. It is not a long river anyway. The town is Shurhu City. Or else it is Xiaolu City in the Raven Kingdom in the north. But the Misty Mountains semi-encircled the entire northern part of the continent from north to east. No one knew where they would descend from. And no one knew where they would attack. The only thing that can be known is that they go down the mountain to rob every year because the mountain people in the Misty Mountains also need to store food for the winter. Similarly, if the Jata people are harassed by the Misty Mountain people, then they will also find a way to plunder the kingdom. And they also need food. The pirates in the west also need to store food for the winter. The northwest coast of the mainland may be frozen. And they will also face no income for several months. Therefore, the winter in Pender is often a time of constant war. It's not because of hatred. Everyone just wants to survive. Therefore, when winter comes, people will pray for the blessing of the goddess so that they can successfully survive the cold winter and usher in the warmth of spring in the new year. In fact, due to the geographical location of Mexiangling, the village did not feel the cold winter. But everyone gathered in the small square that had just been leveled out in the center of the village. Because Liang erected a statue of Eunomia, the goddess of order, in the center of the village and led the people to pray for good luck. This is just a wooden statue that is as tall as one person. It is rough and simple, but it still looks quite charming. The carpenter responsible for carving it has obviously put a lot of effort into it. Moreover, this Eunomia has a sun and moon pendant on her chest, not a lion's head. Perhaps to modern people, spending manpower making sculptures of gods in the early stages of territorial development feels like a waste of resources. But in this era, this important matter related to the beliefs and customs of the people cannot be taken lightly. The major affairs of the country are only sacrifice and military affairs. This, sacrifice, refers to controlling people's hearts through this seemingly useless ritual. Except for Anson, Sarah, and the Menenheimers. All the people in the territory are believers of the goddess of order. The ceremony was brief, but also very formal. Facing the gods, the Lord showed respect that was different from before. You have traveled through time. And if you insist on being an atheist, it will be a joke. Even if you don't believe it, you still have to respect customs. I don't know if it was an illusion. But when he saluted the goddess as a knight, Liang felt that the wooden statue seemed to smile. But when you look carefully, nothing has changed. Probably because of dazzling eyesight. Just after Liang completed the blessing ceremony, he heard the sound of good luck coming. My lord! My lord! Sarah and Miss Leslie are back! Anson, who believes in the god of creation, did not participate in this event. He ran back from the entrance to the West Village with excitement on his face. They brought back a convoy and many merchants. Sir! Countless merchants! Leon grinned and sincerely saluted the goddess again. It seems that building a statue really works. The Lord actually got rich that day. During the period when the territory was booming, Sarah took clothes and the others to several places. Ermond, Rivertown, Kerwin, Serenmes. They were all relatively large aristocratic territories in the eastern region. Only Triburin she did not go to. Because that place was relatively close to the Dinger Mountains. And it would be troublesome if someone insisted on conducting an on-site inspection. Everywhere she went. Sarah would promote this good project to the local nobles. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to make a fortune. A gold mine that has never been mined. Think about it. This means a mint. Make your own gold coins. As long as there are enough funds to start the project. The profit. The nobles drooled almost to their necks. But they soon woke up. If you can do such a good thing yourself, why do you have to attract others to invest? Sarah will explain with a charming smile. Think about it. If you discovered a gold mine, would you dare to take it all by yourself? What would you do if it was robbed by bandits or some other army? My lord is not a fool. Let more lords invest and participate. And then everyone will work together to protect their own industry. What do you think? So the nobles, fully understood the intention of this joint stock company. After all, the entire kingdom is like a joint stock company, and people who want to monopolize the benefits will definitely be besieged from ancient times to the present. This is common sense, but some nobles still have such doubts. This project of Monsi Company Limited sounds good, but we have never heard of that kind of weak collar. It can't be fake, right? 
So Sarah will take out Lord Godric's subscription letter. Come on. Everyone. If your eyesight is still good, you should be able to recognize whose seal this is. Right? Lord Godric. The famous contemporary general, who has lived in White Deer Castle for a long time, is the executive director of our company. Do you think Lord Godric is a fool? If you are still worried about anything, you can go to Lord Godric and ask for details. He is in Lonha Town now. Relying on this rhetoric, Sarah persuaded the surrounding nobles to willingly spend money to invest and subscribe for shares. Of course, it is not ruled out that some nobles were so fascinated by Sarah's appearance that they gave her money in exchange for a piece of parchment called stock. In fact, some were still worried and insisted on rushing to Chang'e town in person. But in the end, they were all satisfied and handed the dinar into Godric's hands. By the way, Godric even scolded him. You don't even recognize my seal? You look down on me. Right? I won't make you rich next time. In this way, Mondesi's executives successfully completed their listing process. Sarah's persuasiveness was quite reliable. Chapter 63 Make Money Make Money The shares planned to be issued by Mondesi Company Limited were all subscribed within a week and the stock price increased from the initial 1 dinar per share to 10 dinars per share. But after the subscription ended, there were still nobles waiting. Purchasing wallet. If Leong had not told him long ago that he would close the deal as soon as the subscription was completed, perhaps the executives, who were immersed in the pleasure of counting money, would not be able to help but make another fortune. The merchants in Chang'e town were even more enthusiastic. They even followed Leslie all the way to make Xiangling, crying and shouting that they insisted on learning advanced experience. They don't want to join the gold mining project, but they want to have a deep understanding of this company's fundraising system. These businessmen know that gold mines are something that ordinary people cannot get involved in. The businessmen in Chung'e Town are indeed more sensitive to new corporate behaviors. They are more aware than the nobles of what the subscription operation of this joint stock company means. They want to learn. But Baron Godric and the others couldn't talk to them. The old nobles generally wouldn't talk to civilian businessmen. So all the businessmen gathered around Leslie. After all, Leslie used to do business in Chang'e Town and was considered an acquaintance of them. Now Leslie has turned into the general manager of a listed company and is handling high-end projects such as gold mines. Businessmen are naturally envious and jealous. They have been inquiring about the operation method, but they can't get rid of it. Leslie was very tired from being harassed. These businessmen refused to leave, and this scam could not be exposed easily. Besides, she only had four hours of private lessons in the Lord's tent. Even if she could be exposed, she actually didn't have the ability to teach these businessmen. And she was too busy counting money to have time. So Leslie said very politely, I'm just a professional manager who obeys the boss's orders. I don't know anything else. The legal person of our company is close. Why don't you ask close? Bar? Leslie is a person who doesn't tell lies. The general manager of the company usually doesn't tell lies outside. But those businessmen didn't dare to deal with clothes, who had a face as strong as an ox. The guy had a bad temper when he saw it, and his arms were thicker than his waist. So if he got angry, businessmen are really keen. Based on their understanding of Leslie, it is indeed unlikely that this coconut wine businessman can figure this out. Since this listed company is based in makes angling, the businessmen decided to settle for the next best thing. Miss Leslie, we know that we can't get involved in things like gold mines. We just want to meet the Lord behind you. Maybe we can cooperate in other business areas. Can you make an introduction? Or take us with you. You can also go to make Xiangling to visit and learn. Leslie was of course noncommittal. And the Lord did not specifically explain how to deal with the merchants who came to his door. But as a qualified businessman, Leslie naturally knew that a large number of caravans going to make Xiangling would definitely be beneficial to the territory. At least all the trophies could be sold. So Leslie said happily, we all used to work together in Chang'e Town. So naturally, we should support each other. Although I, Leslie, am a low-key person, I am willing to do my best to introduce you to everyone. But the Lord is very busy. I'm not sure you can get satisfactory results either. For businessmen, that's enough. So a large number of businessmen followed Leslie to make the angling. Businessmen are always like this. Once a lot of big businessmen go to a certain place to inspect and study together, other businessmen will follow suit. This is true no matter what era or where. As a result, most of the merchants in Chang'e town followed, and the vast inspection team looked like an army. 
What prompted Godric to end the fundraising and rush back to make angling was not just that the shares had been subscribed, but also another news. Leon, His Majesty the King has declared war on the Bacchus Empire. Be prepared for war. Although he returned home with a full load, there was still some caution on Godric's smile. Declare war? War with the Bacchus Empire. Ha! Huh. This is a good thing. Lord Godric, this is simply an explanation that comes to your doorstep. Leon couldn't help but look at the wooden statue again. Godric also saw the statue of Eunomia. And of course, he understood what this explanation meant. It seems that the goddess is protecting you. But you also have to go to war. The marshal this time is his majesty the king himself. There's going to be a war. This is no surprise. After all, Godric mentioned it before at White Deer Castle. Perhaps Baron White Deer Castle's judgment relied on experience. But Leon could also logically understand the reason why King Ulrich declared war. The Lion Kingdom has just formed an alliance with Fields Way. So the West is safe for the time being. The Jada people have just withdrawn their troops. And it is estimated that they will not come to the Lion Kingdom again this year. And the Northeast is probably still safe. The Raven Kingdom has to fully deal with the possible invasion of the Misty Mountain Savages in the winter. And the North is safe even if there is no spare time. In other words, the kingdom's rear is basically stable. In addition, the autumn harvest had just begun, and the lords had just collected taxes. So there was no shortage of money and sufficient military rations. This is of course the most suitable time to attack south. The winter in the southern continent is not too cold, but the summer is unbearably hot. Therefore, go south in winter and north in summer. This is the correct way to attack the Lion Kingdom located in the center of the continent. As an aspiring pioneering baron, Leon naturally wanted to join His Majesty the King's army. But before preparing for war, the Lord needs to reasonably distribute the results of this financing, which is referred to as sharing the spoils. The executive's trip to Chang'e Town was very impressive. The listing of Monsi's shares brought the Lord 120,000 dinars. It took Leslie 10 large boxes to load them all, and they were divided into two carriages to pull them. Otherwise, they would easily overturn. According to the shares agreed in advance, plus a 10%, Financing Commission. Leon handed two of the boxes to Baron Godric. However, after sending the partner away with satisfaction, the Lord felt that something was wrong. He hugged the box again to confirm that the weight of the box seemed not enough. Logically speaking, such a box with 12,000 gold coins should weigh almost 100 pounds. But he always felt that it was less than 80 pounds. So all the golden coins were poured out and spread all over Liang's bedroom. The Lord decided to test the quality. After the ground was covered with gold, the Lord saw the difference. The gold coins are indeed gold coins, and the sizes look the same, but the thick ones are thicker, the thin ones are thin, and the thinnest ones are almost the same as razors. I worry about scratching my fingers even if I fiddle with them. It seems that there are many sculptors who dig out gold from gold coins and pinder. Chapter 64 Ponday's New Business Order This practice of digging out gold from gold coins can be regarded as a traditional art. After all, no matter whether the gold coin is thick or thin, it is still one dinar, and there is no difference in its use value as currency. In fact, this is also the reason why Buckley's dinar was changed from gold coins to silver coins. There were too many engraving artists. The original dinar was a small gold coin weighing approximately 3.25 grams, equivalent to one ounce Troy system, approximately 31 grams of pure silver. But I don't know since when. Many people began to dig gold from gold coins thinning the gold coins layer by layer. After digging it out, I found that the weight of a gold coin was less than 2 grams. It was so thin that it cut my hands. Businessmen and dignitaries had to wear leather gloves before they dared to count gold coins. This is why the gold and silver of the Celestial Dynasty have been used by Wang for a long time. The ancestors of the Celestial Dynasty have experience. Only copper coins are issued by the private sector, and gold and silver are only circulated during large-scale transactions. And the purity and weight are always assessed. In fact, even copper coins have their pros and cons. But at this time, the logic of the silver standard will reflect that the ratio of copper coins of different qualities to silver is different. So a few decades ago, starting around the year 300 of Pindor, the Barclay Empire no longer issued gold coins, and instead used one ounce silver coins of equivalent value, note, similar to silver dollars. This kind of silver coin is also equivalent to one dinar, and is not pure silver so it has a relatively high hardness and is difficult to pick out. Moreover, the large silver coin weighing 30 grams can be easily seen if it is thinned. 
This led to a large reduction in Buckley's carving artists. After all, it took a lot of effort to dig out some impure silver, which was not cost effective. Large and heavy silver coins were inconvenient to carry, and large transactions were difficult to operate. This seemed like a step backwards in the monetary system, but it actually promoted Buckley's economic development. It was precisely because there were no more convenient small gold coins that the Buckley Empire took the lead in developing banks and established the original credit transaction system business alliance. This is what Godric calls civilian gangs. The banking and credit system gave rise to relatively advanced financial services. So the business of Buckley's empire gradually developed. As for Penn Continent, there probably aren't too many master sculptors yet. So gold coins are still in circulation. Leong felt that he seemed to have seen business opportunities again. Moreover, King Ulrich has declared war on the Bacchus Empire at this time. Which is a great opportunity. Well, this isn't a good time to announce the company's demise. In fact, after seeing the businessmen who followed Leslie to make Xiangling, Leon already thought that it was not appropriate for him to directly declare the company's bankruptcy. How could he make a one-time deal? What a bad impact that would have. Gotta run it well. Maybe I can pick it up a few more times. Of course, if you want to collect more money, you must first give investors some real explanation or let them see some hope of profit. Businessmen are no more deceptive than nobles. No, it takes industry to guide them to participate in cooperation. The kind of physical industry that is tangible and tangible. Because they will really follow the whole process to confirm the facts. We can't rely on our subordinates to handle this matter. The Lord has to do it himself. Therefore, on the afternoon of the traditional festival of Blessing Day, Maishiang International Investment Company, Limited, was officially upgraded to Maishiang International Real Economic Industry Group. Makes Yangling also issued a formal regulation. All Makes Yangling residents are automatically entitled to one share. And special talents are entitled to more shares based on their contribution. Military members are entitled to two shares. Corps commanders are entitled to five shares. And captains are entitled to ten shares. By analogy, at the end of the year, shares are used to participate in profit distribution. This was dictated by the Lord. And Anson was asked to record it as the Articles of Association of the Head Office. Later, the Lord held a briefing meeting with a group of businessmen who had followed from Chang'e town. Mr. Leon said impassionedly, in order to adapt to the vast international market, embrace the ever-changing complex environment, proactively adapt to changes in the market economy, meet the market segmentation requirements, enhance our ability to resist risks, technological innovation capabilities and profitability, rationalization of industrial layout, scientific asset structure, omit 500 words here. Anyway, every company's investment promotion presentation is similar. Therefore, we must embark on the path of diversified operations. Therefore, we must promote the internationalization and platform development of Makes Angling's industry. Together with everyone here, we will jointly establish a new business order for Ponday. The businessmen were filled with admiration. Even if they learned nothing about so many lofty terms, at least they would be able to show off after returning home. Besides, this preaching itself is worth learning. It can be seen that this Lord is indeed a business model worth learning from. So the businessmen repeatedly praised the Lord for his excellent business acumen, farsighted foresight, and advanced awareness of innovation and development. They hoped that the Lord would lead them to make a fortune together. Sarah felt dizzy after hearing this, and asked Leong secretly, Sir, what did you mean by what you just said? The Lord hurriedly avoided the flattering businessmen in the audience. I mean, one scam is not enough. We have to get a few of these big money. If I don't seize this opportunity, I won't be able to sleep. Then, with a kind smile on his face, the Lord turned back to greet the merchants and began to explain his investment plan. I didn't even use a PPT. My proficiency was completely lost. Liang's state has been completely aroused. After all, the group of strangers in the audience were all quietly exuding the aura of wealth. Dot we will establish an international full industry platform. The torrent of business development across the ages cannot be stopped. You will all be the pioneers and witnesses of this unprecedented platform process. Dot my Xiangling will jointly invest with everyone, share interests, and work together to build the strongest economy in the continent. We will be one step ahead of others in any industry. Dot we will protect your financial security and business interests, and provide ultra-low interest loans so that you can expand your business scale as soon as possible. The interest is as low as one cent per week, and it can be repaid in installments. Dot my army 
as well as the armies of Baron Godric and Earl Odin, and even the Horncall Rangers, will provide you with security, as long as it is a caravan that hangs the flag of the Maishyong International Group. This all this protection is free. Free. Dot you will become the pioneers of international platform operations and expand your business to the entire continent. We will make it easy to do business on this continent. The audience burst into applause. And the businessmen cheered with tears in their eyes, praising that the goddess appeared and gave them a business development leader on this blessing day. In the face of businessmen, Leon actually did not make false claims. Every point mentioned the aspects that businessmen were most concerned about. Fund security. Capital turnover. Personal safety. And caravan safety. In a sense, this is no longer a scam. Chapter 65 A Good Opportunity to Make a Fortune So, on the Day of Blessing, a large number of companies were established. Griffin Cereals Oils and Food Company Limited Terra Cosmetics Company Limited Leslie Trading Company Limited Anson's Hat Agricultural Development Company Limited Close Military Development Company Limited Alice Trust Development Investment Bank There are also Wanderer Animal Husbandry Technology Talalia's Secret Clothing Trade, Big Lord Capital Management, and Mons Ladeo's Small Loan Finance. Waiting for countless companies. Even the Lord himself couldn't count how many there were at the moment. Anyway, it covers almost all industry types. When Max Angling came out of the street stall market, the company's signboard was nailed to all the door panels. Eventually, there was really no room to nail it. So they nailed the Lame How Food World, signed to the stable door, and Teddy's. Signed to the stable door. Omo Perfume Industry. Was nailed next to the toilet. These are all jointly funded and established by businessmen and My Xiong Industry Group. And they are all subsidiaries of the group company. The reason for this is because the Lord announced to the merchants. All subordinate companies of My Xiong Industrial Group do not need to pay business tax and makes the angling. Not even a penny. Of course, if someone wants to rent a shop to set up an office or something, they still have to pay. The Lord specially planned such a large area of market space for rent. Sarah became the legal person, chairman, executive director, and general manager of 12 companies overnight. And Leslie has even more names. A total of 18 companies. Cultural man Anson also has 9 companies under his name. Most of the well-known workers in the territory have now become senior cadres above the general manager level. And all of them feel proud of their ancestors. Even Drash, who feeds the horses, has an animal husbandry company under his name. Of course, the actual manager of the company is Leong himself. And horses are very valuable. The only person who doesn't have a company in his name is Leong himself. And scrupulous bosses are very risk-averse. The Lord uses sealed contracts to jointly invest and jointly start a business. With businessmen, he has a share in each company, which is not much, ranging from 51% to 80%. Moreover, when collecting the joint capital. Payments actually paid by the merchants. He displayed the room full of gold coins, indicating that he had too many gold coins. In order to avoid inconvenience in turnover, he asked the merchants to all contribute in silver coins. Merchants are actually happy to use silver coins. They actually have more durands in their hands. After all, their usual customers use silver coins durand more often. The reason why businessmen are so enthusiastically involved is because the Lord has preached to the businessmen a truth. War means wealth. This is what Leon said. The kingdom is at war with the Bacchus Empire. This is a good opportunity to make a fortune. Think about it. The kingdom has been hostile to the Bacchus Empire for many years. And the north-south trade routes have been cut off for decades. There are so many silks, spices, medicines, and handicrafts from the south that cannot be sold to the kingdom. And the horses, furs, and weapons and daily necessities cannot be sold either. Think about it. If you can be the first batch to trade with the Bacchus Empire on a large scale, the profit will be. The merchants naturally knew this reality, since the two countries had been hostile for decades. In the past, as long as their caravans entered the territory of the Bacchus Empire, they would most likely be robbed by the lords of the Bacchus Empire or bandits such as the Snake Cult. Occasionally, those who successfully return will not make much profit. Small-scale caravans often lose their bargaining rights in hostile countries so they will not and dare not go to hostile countries to do business unless they have no choice. If it were the first batch to enter the Bacchus Empire on a large scale, there would certainly be huge profits. But the question is, is it feasible? So the businessmen quickly raised questions. 
If the two countries go to war, there will be no peace everywhere. Not to mention the Bacchus Empire. There are as many bandits as wool in the kingdom's territory. If there is no army to protect the border crossing, then there will be no peace. Are you just organizing a group to deliver food? Leon laughed boldly. Look at these fierce men of Menheim. Look at these horns summoning the rangers. These are all powerful soldiers that are resounding throughout the continent. Plus dozens of elite cavalry. And so many are the elite archers not enough to protect your caravan. There are more than 40 jats of horses in the stable. And they are indeed all excellent war horses. 20 of them are indeed wearing the horse armor provided by Ralph. The crossbowmen are standing nearby wearing ranger equipment. But they are all pretending. These guys don't know how to ride a horse at all. The best riding skills are barely Eric, who can make sure the horse doesn't fall off while cantering. But it certainly looks like a bugle ranger. And the sheer size of the Mendenham hunks is convincing. Coupled with the citizens who came out to join in the numbers, wearing chain armor and carrying nomadic bows. It seemed that the military strength of this small village exceeded a hundred people. And it seemed that they were all elite soldiers. But some businessmen still expressed uneasiness. But your leadership ability. I'm sorry. Sir, I'm not doubting you. Leon started to get angry. Humph. I am the one who defeated the Jats army. Look at the Jats warlord over there. That is my prisoner. Now they are all my grooms. Besides, could you always know Mr. Derek? Right? Why do you think a famous general like him would call me chairman? He will also be on the same journey as us. The merchants whispered among themselves. It goes without saying that Lord Godric's combat prowess is great. But he seems to only defend and never attack. I guess his level of conquering cities and territories may not be that high. At this time, Leon took out Count Odin's letter. Open your dog eyes and take a good look. Even the famous general in the world, Count Odin, asked me to help him suppress bandits. What else do you have to worry about? The name of Earl Odin is still very popular in Chungha town, as the lord who is best at opening up territories in the kingdom in the past few decades. The businessmen were immediately convinced after seeing the letter and the double lion shield coat of arms on it. So, starting from the day after the merchants returned to Chungha town, one caravan after another headed for the small makes angling, waiting for this. Good opportunity to make a fortune. Just a few days later, there was another warehouse of silver coins in the territory. The businessmen kept pulling them over with carriages. Leon said that he fully trusts his partners and did not count the money mainly because he couldn't count it. Those silver coins were enough to bury all of Liang's men. Godric, who had previously been unwilling to talk to businessmen, heard about Liang's full industry platform the next day and immediately sent Pegasus to deliver the message. The letter was full of concern. Your Excellency, Baron Leong, does your territory need to be inspected before the war? Things are difficult on the eastern border of the kingdom. I hope you will take care of your health and bring long-term benefits to the people of your territory. Leon wrote back. Don't make trouble. 10%. As promised. Godric wrote back. I will help you become a regular official and allow you to mobilize my garrison to protect the caravan. Leon wrote back. 12%. If you don't do it, ask for it. Godric wrote back. Deal. Chapter 66 The War Begins On the last day of October, envoys from the kingdom's house of nobles came to make Xiangling. This is to issue an edict. Liang's pioneering caller verification report was handed over to Godric in advance. Godric reviewed it very sloppily. It was a black box operation. He didn't even come over to take a look. Moreover, he did send a group of archers to assist my Xiangling in protecting the caravan. But Leon always felt that this was because the Baron was afraid that he would run away with the money. And the leading archer sent to keep an eye on him seemed to be the same one who escorted him when he went to White Deer Castle last time. Of course, the Lord has no intention of running away. Moreover, Makes Yangling is actually developing well. And it can pass the review even if it insists on it. Witnessed by a large number of businessmen and a small group of citizens. Leon is about to become a real Baron. The reason why it is said, soon, is because he must go to the king to swear allegiance before the knighthood can be officially established. The face-to-face -face ceremony of allegiance is a necessary process. His Excellency Leon Griffin has contributed greatly to the expansion of the kingdom's territory and has made great contributions in protecting the country and its people. I intend to confer upon your Excellency Leon Griffin the title of Baron of Malfoy. Please present this edict to meet with his majesty the king immediately. After the envoy from the kingdom's house of nobles read these words. He handed the scroll in his hand to Leon. The seal of the scroll is stamped by the kingdom's house of nobles. And the coat of arms on the cover is an iris's pressed with silver foil. 
which does not look gorgeous at all. Seeing Leon put away the scroll casually, the envoy smiled kindly at him. Only then did Leon recognize that this was the retinue of Count Odin, whom he had seen when he went to the House of Lords. How are you, Lord Count? Leon asked casually. The retinue looked around and whispered. Your Majesty, the Earl, just resigned from his job in the House of Lords not long ago and returned to Brave Shield Castle to lead the troops and prepare for war. As he spoke, he approached Leong and his voice became softer. Lord Leong, Lord Count asked me to tell you that you'd better stay with him in this war. Leong nodded, held the servant's hand and shook it. Please thank the Earl for me. Thank you for your hard work. In his hand was a handful of gold coins. Leong's hand held by the retinue tightened, and he smiled sincerely. My lord is young and promising, and will surely become the pillar of the kingdom. My personal suggestion, Lord, it is best not to let your troops go to the front line this time. Thank you, my friend. Please write and keep in touch. Leong smiled and nodded, watching his followers leave. Not long after the servants of the House of Lords left, a knight brought a summons from the king. This is a lion knight, from King Ulrich's command. He did not speak but held the golden lion flag and handed the summoning order into Liang's hands, and then continued to rush to White Deer Castle without stopping. Please see the lords of the kingdom who have seen this order and lead their troops to assemble at Chicha Fortress. Order from the Marshal of the Lion Kingdom. The coat of arms above is a golden lion. This is the king's summons. It looks much more advanced than the imperial seal. It even uses gold foil to suppress the coat of arms. Leon almost wants to pick off the gold foil. The king has officially summoned the lords to prepare for the war. So it seems that the oath and sealing ceremony can be completed smoothly. In fact, even without Count Odin's reminder, Leon had no intention of charging into the battle to grab the credit. Because he hasn't had time to turn all the dinars, he got into immediate combat power. He hasn't had time to recruit troops yet. And he still only has a few people under his command. Just because there were many merchants coming. He bought a batch of heavy two-handed broadswords and heavy crossbows from those merchants, as well as several full-coverage lightweight helmets. Originally, I had ordered more standard equipment and planned to arm the people. However, it would take time to build the equipment, and the summoning order had already arrived. Fortunately, as Leong imagined, the Mettenheim warriors immediately upgraded to Mettenheim great swordsmen. After receiving the new two-handed swords and lightweight helmets, their proficiency was already sufficient. The crossbowmen were all replaced by heavy crossbows and upgraded to armor crossbowmen. The word employment disappeared. From the moment they received the shares, they all swore allegiance and became the army of my Xiangling. Mettenheim Great Swordsman. October 10th. Armored crossbowmen. 17 17th. Pender recruit. 30 30th. Leon summoned 30 subjects, all of whom were pure recruits, but they were not used for fighting. The Lord asked these subjects to use all the Jata horses in their hands to pull away more than 20 carts of goods. Each of these new recruits now has a new and prestigious title of manager of such and such company. Because my Xiong group's large-scale commercial activities are about to be officially launched. Everyone, the great opportunity to make a fortune has now arrived. When the team from White Deer Castle passed through my Xiongling, the Lord led a troop of about 60 people and a caravan of more than 800 people. And together with Godric's team, they began to move toward Chicha Fortress. The lords who saw this army along the way were dumbfounded. Who the H, L is this? The military looks stronger than the king. Look at the back of the army. There are hundreds of baggage trucks, alone. What kind of strength does it take to dispatch such a large force? In order to keep enough white deer castle defenders, Godric actually only brought 300 people. But combined with the nearly 1,000 people behind Leong and hundreds of large vehicles, it looked like a main force. So the small lords or knights along the way approached this main force to seek a sense of security and were then called over by Godric to move forward together. After arriving near Chicha Fortress, the size of this troop actually exceeded 2,000 people. Seeing this, other lords who had already camped and waited near the fortress joined this army one after another. They thought this was the king's army. After all, a team of this size is indeed not something that an ordinary lord can create. So, Lord Leon took the opportunity to start selling. Everyone, is it boring during the expedition? Are you used to the days without good wine? Is the dry military ration hard to swallow? Do you feel that the days of the expedition are boring? Come on. Welcome to the Mai Xiang group. It is certainly quite hard for the lords to lead their troops on an expedition. 
especially the boring wait before the marshal arrives. Many lords have been waiting here for a while. They are all lords relatively close to Lion City or Chicha Fortress. And the summoning order was first passed to them. But they could only keep feeding mosquitoes in the wilderness because King Ulrich, the marshal who sent troops this time, had not arrived yet. King, it's not a matter of distance. The boss is always the last to arrive. The lords and soldiers who came early can only wait in the military camp. The food and clothing are not very good. The Chicha Fortress is not a city, but a pure military fortress. In addition to the thousands of masters stationed inside, there is nothing but them. There is no place to buy towels nearby. So the various subsidiaries of My Xiang International Group brought them food, wine, daily necessities, and even entertainment venues. Of course, the price is a little bit higher. But since it has been shipped thousands of miles away, it's not too much to charge more for shipping. Right? If you are not satisfied, you can go to the Lion City more than 300 miles away to spend money. Of course, you deserve to be recorded as a deserter if you leave the military camp without permission. Chapter 67 Two-Headed Snake In fact, the military pay for being a soldier is pretty good. Moreover, according to the common practice in mainland China, troops are usually paid once before going on an expedition, both to boost morale and for the sake of fairness. After all, if the money is paid to the survivors after the war is over, it would be equivalent to receiving money only if they survive. Then all soldiers in future wars will just try their best to escape. The soldiers had money and nowhere to spend money in this shabby place. And the business of Maishan Group became prosperous easily. Exclusive operation. Even if you think about it, it won't work. So word spread. And soon all the Lord's troops knew about the Maishan Group under the black and white griffin, which had the best food, the mellowest wine, and the most complete goods in the continent. The most fun card game. And occasionally you can see the most beautiful beauties. There was such a rush of visitors that some caravans were forced to spend a lot of money to rent horses from Leon within a few days. They had not yet entered the Bacchus Empire, and they were sold out directly in the military camp. They had to rush back to replace them. Goods. Yes, the Lord has also opened a horse leasing business. Those Jata horses are well raised and have strong legs. Master Leon did not lie. Indeed, war is the best opportunity to make a fortune. The merchants were very happy, and the other lords were also quite satisfied. The diversified business of Maishan Group basically covers all the needs of the soldiers. They can consume food, clothing, housing and transportation, and even supplies can be delivered to their doorsteps. This really makes all the lords feel very reliable, although the price is not very affordable. The service is very considerate, and the attitude is excellent. Besides, it is an exclusive operation. As a result, as the lords of the kingdom continued to gather here, the wilderness near Chicha Fortress seemed to suddenly become the most prosperous outdoor trading market in the country. It feels a bit more lively than Lion City. Of course, there are also needs that Maishan Group cannot satisfy. For example, a few knights secretly grabbed the lord and asked, Well, is there that? Little girl who lost her footing or something like that. Leon had no choice but to reply regretfully. I'm sorry. Our company has not yet launched business in this area. Seeing the disappointed looks in the eyes of several knights, Leon sighed and said sympathetically. Actually, it's not that there is nothing we can do. Then, he sold his copy of Memoirs of Officer Penned for a huge price. However, with the arrival of the Earl of Odin, the Duke of Alma and the King's direct troops, this wilderness market temporarily ceased because the gathering of the army group was finally completed and the army began to advance towards the Bacchus Empire. Leon was not in a hurry to meet the king. Military affairs came first at this time and the wilderness was not suitable for completing the allegiance ceremony. He could not ignore priorities. King Ulrich divided the entire army into three parts. The first part is the main army led by the Duke of Alma attacking Karen Castle. The king asked the Duke of Alma to capture Karen Castle. The other part was a flanking force, led by Count Odin, which attacked the Sava Fort. It is considered a partial division and can be fought in any way, but no enemy troops can be allowed to pass through the bridge of Chicha Fortress. That is to say, it must at least be able to prevent the enemy from making a surprise attack from behind. There is a bridge next to Chicha Fortress, which is the only place on the lower reaches of the Sava River where one can cross the river except by boat. The last part is the central army led by His Majesty the King himself. It consists of a large number of Lion Realm cavalry and Lion Knights. And is very mobile. 
obviously. This means that if there is progress on either side of the two offenses, the Chinese army will focus on that side and can change the direction of the main attack at any time. King Ulrich only placed a few big nobles under Alma and Odin respectively, leaving the other small lords to their own discretion. This is also a commonly used method. There are a lot of small lords, and their allegiance is not necessarily to the king, so it is impossible to assign them one by one. Ulrich's tactic is actually famous. It's called Two-Headed Snake. In fact, this is a relatively reasonable arrangement, with clear priorities, rear defense, and backup mobile troops. The enemy Bacchus Empire is not easy to deal with. If they gather together for a decisive battle, they may not be able to quickly defeat any of them. Ulrich's central army is near the Chicha Fortress, and they are all very mobile. The cavalry was strong, and both sides had time to rescue them. And if the Bacchus Empire divided its troops for garrison, it would be difficult to determine how to deploy the defense. After all, both sides could become the main direction of attack, and either end of the two-headed snake could attack the city with all its strength. The only problem with this arrangement is that after the division of troops, Liang's business is not so easy. Leon naturally wanted to join Count Odin's side, because Godric was placed under Odin by the king. However, just after he led the team to follow Odin, most of the small lords made the same choice. They followed the black and white griffin flag because there was food, drink and fun under that flag. Contrary to what many people imagine, when the kingdom initiates a war, the small lords do not have high thoughts of making contributions. Because if the kingdom's attack on the Bacchus Empire succeeds, the king and everyone will most likely not be granted the newly conquered castles and territories to these small characters. Only the king himself and the big nobles can benefit. After all, the dozens of people in the hands of the small lords are unlikely to achieve particularly great feats. However, once the war fails, they may lose everything. They only have a few troops in total, and the ability of small lords to resist risks is not as good as that of big nobles such as dukes. There would be little benefit if they succeeded, but they would suffer if they failed. Naturally, it would be difficult for the small lords to risk their lives to attack. This was also the reason why Emperor Marius of the Bacchus Empire sought institutional reform. In this offensive battle, the troops brought by the small lords were generally not large. Often a knight lord would only send a dozen troops, and the barons with weaker territories only brought 30 or 50 men. A real battle with Liang's men almost the same strength, but the defensive battle is different. If the defensive battle fails, everyone will be unlucky, and even the territory may be taken away by the enemy. Therefore, they can draw water in the offensive battle, but usually go all out in the defensive battle. Therefore, the little lords are more concerned about getting through this errand smoothly. This means that they will follow Maishang International, wherever there is food and drink. As a result, Earl Odin's partial division actually gathered a force of nearly 4,000 people. The main force led by the Duke of Alma only had 4,000 people. King Ulrich's central army, including the Lion Knights, only had three to 4,000 men. For a while, it was impossible to tell who was the main player and who was the flanker. There was a large caravan of Count Odin mixed in, and the team seemed to be even larger. Earl Odin was very deft when he led his troops to fight. As the commander-in-chief of the Sava Fort Theater, he led an army of more than 3,000 people to directly besiege the Sava Fort and at the same time separated small groups of troops to monitor the surrounding areas. It seems that they are preparing to attack the city directly. Leon felt that this style of play was not worthwhile, because this side was not the main direction of attack, and there was no need to fight against the city wall. Moreover, it is all a group of small lords, so I am afraid not many are willing to contribute in the siege. Besides, the original customer base of more than 10,000 people is now only one-third left. Of course, the Lord will not be satisfied. Chapter 68 Pan does double 11. Seeing that the troops besieging the city had begun to build ladders, Leon quickly found Odin. My Lord, do you plan to attack the city? Of course, I have to give an explanation to His Majesty the King. Moreover, I don't want the King's army to support Alma. I think you can understand what I mean. Odin spoke very directly and did not seem to intend to hide his allies. So, his Majesty the King intends to weaken the Duke of Alma in this battle? Combining the previous reminders given to him by Odin's retinue, Leon found the key point very keenly. Odin smiled. Cutting boy! Now that you understand His Majesty the King's intentions, you should understand why I want to attack with all my strength. Of course, I understand that this is Odin providing an excuse to King Ulrich. 
if the Saba River fort is likely to be captured, or if any results are achieved, then the king will bring the Chinese army here for reinforcements. In this way, no matter how fierce the fighting on Alma's side was, King Ulrich would not have to come to his aid. The Kullandir castle that Alma must capture is a famous fortified city in the entire continent. The lord of Karandir castle is General Cleon, a famous general of the Bacchus Empire. He has experienced hundreds of battles and is extremely difficult to deal with. This was the feast the king had arranged for Alma. Alma's power has almost doubled after taking control of Chang'e town. He holds two of the four major counties in the kingdom. And his ambition is obvious. King Ulrich seems to be aware of this huge threat. But Chang'e town is nominally in the hands of Lady Bella and the child in her belly. And the king cannot deprive an orthodox duke heir of his rights. Therefore, Ulrich naturally had no choice but to find ways to weaken Alma's military strength. This is for checks and balances. Regardless of whether Alma can capture Cullen Deer Castle, the king's goal can be achieved anyway. My lord count, I understand your intention. So I suggest that you lay siege to the city for reinforcements, which will be more effective and cause less damage. I think you also know that even if you capture the Sava River Fort, you will not get. After all, this time, the marshal is his majesty the king himself. Leon gave his own suggestions. The king leads the team. And the territory captured will naturally be distributed by the king. To whom will it be distributed? To Odin. Who controls the horn summoning rangers. Impossible. Odin's military strength is already very strong. No matter how great his contribution is. The king will not grant him any more territory. Otherwise Ulrich will not be able to sleep. Moreover. Most of the king's central army is cavalry. They may not be active in attacking the city. But if it is a field battle. They are probably quite active. Therefore. It is indeed more appropriate to besiege the city and call for reinforcements. As long as the enemy's reinforcements can be caught in the field, it is estimated that the king's central army will come over immediately. Count Odin thought carefully, asked the troops under the city to retreat, and began to build obstacle fortifications around the Sava River fort. So the siege began. Leon would suggest this. Of course, not just to provide better options for his allies. You know, the main combatants under him are all infantry, or the kind with relatively strong individual combat capabilities. In the event of a siege, those big and tough men would probably be sent to climb the city wall first. He didn't want his family's wealth to be used as cannon fodder. And Odin's followers also reminded him. Besides, this trip was mainly for business. Everyone around the city consumes each other's food. How wonderful it is to be harmonious and make money. Yes, what's more important is that it consumes food and time. His caravan can supply all kinds of delicacies. Lihau Food World and Griffin Cereals Oils and Food Company Limited have been the two most popular subsidiaries from the beginning. During the boring time during the siege, Alice Entertainment World met the soldiers' leisure and entertainment needs. Moreover, just earning money from the troops could not satisfy the Lord. He sent his men to various villages in the Bacchus Empire to carry out propaganda. On November 11th, my Xiang group will hold an international product exhibition on the hilltop 11 miles north of Sava Fort. Double 11 special offer. Big discounts on special products. They are all products unique to the Lion Kingdom. And you will earn money if you buy them. As the propaganda of the Double 11 event spread, the entire northwest region of the Bacchus Empire was alarmed. Thousands of residents of the Bacchus Empire came from surrounding villages and towns to participate in this unprecedented international trade fair. Indeed, as Leong expected. Due to the years of hostility between the Lion Kingdom and the Bacchus Empire, the private transactions between the two countries were basically interrupted. Various special products produced by the kingdom sold very well in the Bacchus Empire. Basically, they were sold in large quantities in a panic-buying manner, and the occasion was unprecedented. The merchants were so happy that their backlog of goods was quickly sold out. Leong even asked Close to lead a team to protect the merchants and go back in batches to restock the goods. The Lord's Food World and Alice Entertainment are like two black holes. As long as you dare to go in, your wallet will be empty when you come out. Countless dinars poured into the Lord's pocket like a flood. He now sleeps on the bed made of dinars and feels that he sleeps very soundly. Finally, Count Odin, the commander of the Sava River Theater, finally couldn't help but intervene. Many soldiers under his command were asking him to borrow money. When he asked, he found out that their military salaries had been transferred to Alice Entertainment World. Overnight, I lost everything. The Earl was extremely angry. 
he rushed to the door and shouted angrily, with strong and powerful words. Now the two countries are at war. The war is fierce and dangerous. And the situation is complicated and confusing. The soldiers on the front line are sacrificing their lives and fighting bloody battles. Odin looked back at his men who were safely building a fence and digging a trench a mile away from the castle. You are building fortifications at the expense of your own life. You actually ignored the overall situation. Attacked your colleagues behind the scenes. And used strategic materials to collaborate with the enemy. If you don't repent... Be careful of my turning against you and being ruthless. Leon was counting the money with an expressionless face. I'll give you 5% of the shares. Odin was furious. You shameless person. You are hopeless. How could I? Odin Fletcher, the noble earl and lord of a county. Be tempted by your petty prophet. As he spoke, he looked around and saw no one around him. So he continued to curse. It's in vain that I tried to persuade you nicely. But you tried to bribe me with a mere 5%. Your behavior is an insult to my character. Leon didn't even raise his head. 8%. You can't send my troops to the front line. If you don't do it, I'm begging. Odin showed a kind smile. And his face was extremely kind. Deal. I have sent people to protect that entertainment world. There were people who lost money making trouble over there just now. You have to ensure the supply of the whole army. Ah. The siege consumes a lot of food. As a result, the business of Maishan Group became more and more prosperous, and even began to send personnel to surrounding villages to open offices, with Count Odin protecting him. Leon no longer guarded the Sava River Fort, but led his team to spread his business to the entire western part of the Bacchus Empire, especially for Alice Entertainment World. The Lord plans to first spread the special art form composed of playing cards and dice to the entire Pender continent. The Lord selected some businessmen as authorized agents, and after withholding a large deposit, led them to open entertainment venues in various villages in the western part of the Bacchus Empire. Chapter 69 Golden Castle The siege lasted for nearly two months. In the middle, there were two groups of reinforcements from the Bacchus Empire. As expected, King Ulrich's Chinese cavalry troops arrived at the Sava River Fort after Count Odin defeated the enemy's first supporting army. In the past two months, the treatment of the troops under the Black and White Griffin was extremely enviable while other troops were fighting bravely to besiege the reinforcements. Liang's team sat on the top of the hill, playing skewers and watching a show. Other lords were gnawing dry bread and drinking cold water. But even the soldiers in Liang's team ate steak and drank fine wine every day. Other troops' equipment became worse and worse with the war. But Liang's troops' equipment became better and better. Other troops have gradually become thinner in the past two months. But Liang's troops are all rosy and radiant. There was no other way. Hundreds of supply trucks had been following Liang's banner. Attracted by profits, the businessmen also had their own relatives and friends. More and more businessmen participated in this fortune-making activity. Often when a businessman goes back to replenish goods, he can bring two or three fleets again. Of course, there are occasional losses. A few days ago, in the south of Sava River Fort, a group of thieves from the snake cult robbed the fleet of Leslie Trading Company. Limited. Leong ran directly to Godric's military camp. This time the bonus is gone. The additional losses are too great. The company is facing losses. There is no way. Godric was furious. What a bully. Afterwards, Baron Godric led his troops to pursue the snake cult team for hundreds of miles, even chasing them into the heart of the Bacchus Empire. After a fierce battle, Godric killed his opponent's corpses everywhere and took back most of the goods. The non-government armed forces in Bacchus have now seen something powerful. But the matter is not over yet. Hearing that the dividends had been reduced, Count Odin sent his elite rangers deep into the heart of the Bacchus Empire, less than a hundred miles away from the city of knowledge. They burned down the nest of the snake cultists. Ash. Then a large number of cavalry troops were dispersed and patrolled back and forth on the caravan's replenishment route, working extremely diligently. As a result, the bandits in the kingdom and the Bacchus Empire all understood that the Maishan Company could not be offended. But the good days are always short-lived. After Emperor Marius of the Bacchus Empire gathered a large army and arrived near the Sava River Fort, the battle came to an end. The Duke of Alma failed to advance at Cullendir Castle and lost many troops. But he successfully attracted the main force of the Bacchus Empire. Emperor Marius personally led the army and defeated the Duke of Alma's army at the gates of Karen Castle. Although Count Odin did not capture the Sava River Fort, he defeated two waves of enemy reinforcements. 
captured three great lords of the Bacchus Empire, and successfully occupied the south bank of the Sava River and regained part of his homeland. Large-scale fortifications were even built to the north of the Sava River Fort, which is the site of the Double Eleven International Exhibition Supermarket, which gave the kingdom the right to dominate the war. This can be regarded as achieving King Ulrich's strategic purpose. It seems that King Ulrich did not intend to have a head-on all-out decisive battle with Emperor Marius. It is estimated that Emperor Marius did not have such plans either. After a day of confrontation, the two sides retreated dozens of miles with a tacit understanding. So, on January 1st, 355 in the Pender calendar, just as the new year had just begun, King Ulrich announced his withdrawal. The war is over. The Lord's troops did not fight a single battle and did not fire a single shot. But they returned with a full load. But the Lord Lord cannot return to make Siangling for the time being. There is still one big thing that has not been completed, the knighthood. He asked Leslie to sort out the accounts and lead the caravan back to make Siangling. He also asked Anson to vigorously build various facilities and fortifications. He also asked Sarah to go to Chang'e town to purchase equipment. There is a saying for everyone. Don't save. Spend hard. Use up all the gold coins. But I also gave an important reminder. Remember to keep the replacement silver coins you took back. Remember. Try not to spend the silver coins. Leon has no idea how much money he has in his hands. Anyway. All the core members of Meg's Angling are rich. Lord Lord did not fool them. It is the end of the year. And he has indeed distributed dividends according to his shares. The soldiers also all gained weight several times. The way everyone looked at Leon was no different from looking at their biological father. Everyone deeply understands that war is wealth. Leon came to Lion City again. This time, he is no longer alone. The strong men of Mettenheim are waiting for him in the Conics Ali. Lion City still looks clean and tidy, but a little deserted. It's probably because many merchants are out of stock, and many shops on the street are closed. The palace of the Lion Kingdom looks quite grand. It is a huge castle that is said to have shining light all over the land, and its presence makes people look at it with awe. The castle has eight floors and is considered majestic and towering. It is located on the south side of the Lion City, with the Sava River outside the city wall. It is probably only a few meters shorter than the former Noble House Tower in the center of Lion City. However, in Liang's view, this is just a larger castle, and there is nothing surprising in nature. The only difference is that this big castle is full of gold. There are golden lion emblems on the outer wall. Gold lion flags with red backgrounds hanging everywhere. And golden winter camellias planted everywhere. Which may be used to replace iris flowers in winter. As for the palace. There must be flowers blooming all year round. Inside the castle. There are golden domes. Golden chandeliers. And various golden utensils. Even the door handles are gold. If it weren't for the need to identify the position of the door handle. I'm afraid the entire door panel would have been made gold and there would already be a golden lion on the door. I don't know why King Ulrich likes gold so much. Even his armor is gold, and he is not afraid of being shot by the enemy's concentrated fire on the battlefield. The corridors of the palace are very grand, and even the red carpet under your feet has gold edges. After Leon entered the throne room with the imperial decree, he almost tripped over the long carpet. The carpet in the corridor was made of velvet, but it was very thick, and the soles of his feet could sink into it quite a bit. But in the throne room, there was no carpet. There were very few people in the throne room. Probably His Majesty the King didn't like to face too many people at the same time. Unlike the gold that is everywhere in other places. The throne room looks quite plain. The high dome is engraved with various sculptures of gods. Most of which are stories related to Eunomia. They are just ordinary stone sculptures without gorgeous decorations. There are two huge pillars in the hall. Standing on both sides of the throne. The pillars are just like the stone itself but the carving is very exquisite. The legend of the late King Kabbala is carved on the pillars, which looks quite lifelike. The throne in the middle looks to be made of silver, and the backrest is designed into a sword and the two wings of a sword. King Ulrich was sitting on the throne, and from a distance, it looked like a pair of silver wings sprouted from his side. Leon stepped forward. Your Majesty, I have an audience with Leon Griffin. Chapter 70 Confusing Right and Wrong It was Count Odin who introduced Leon to the throne room as the person in charge of signing the pioneering certificate for Leon. Although Auden has resigned from the House of Lords, he still has to attend the knighthood as the introducer and witness for the newly promoted baron. Also serving as a witness is the Duke of Alma, the acting administrator of the eastern region of the kingdom. He is now 
helping the posthumous son of a friend to take charge of regional government affairs. This is because Liang's territory is located in the eastern region. There was originally supposed to be a witness, the lord responsible for verification in the county where the territory was located, Baron Godric. But he had something to do and couldn't come. It was said that his wife was ill. Godric's wife was now living in Yaju village, which was also Godric's hometown and was now his son's territory. White Deer Castle was constantly at war, and it was indeed not suitable for patients to live there. There were two or three other people in the hall, but Leon didn't recognize them. Leon Griffin, I heard from Count Odin that you contributed a lot to logistic support in this war. It's really hard work. Probably because the war had achieved its goal. King Ulrich seemed to be in a good mood, but Leon seemed to hear a hint of ridicule in his voice. Your Majesty, this is my duty as the Lord of the Kingdom. Leon smiled and spoke very modestly. Ulrich stood up, stepped off the throne, and stood in front of Leon. I heard that your territory is called Mix Engling. What did Godric say when he praised your territory so much? What did it mean? Ulrich turned to ask the middle-aged man next to him. It is said that your excellency Leon has good governance and has developed the territory full of vitality in just a few days. The middle-aged man was wearing a bachelor's robe and was probably the king's personal advisor. He was thin and had a withered face as if he could be blown over by a gust of wind. He looked weak and had only two bright eyes. Ulrich nodded. Yes, just a few days. Huh, this is really rare. The sarcasm in the king's words became even stronger. Leon said nothing and turned around to look at the thin middle-aged man carefully. Even his hair seemed to be withered. Your Excellency Leon probably doesn't know me. I am Igor. I am just a servant who rides for his majesty. He is entrusted by his majesty to temporarily handle the affairs of the house of nobles. The middle-aged man touched his chest and saluted, smiled, and seemed quite kind. Leong felt a little strange that no noble would call himself a servant. They were all partners. It was impossible for them to call themselves servants of the king. Grandmaster Igor must be a knowledgeable master, and the younger generation is willing to listen to your teachings. Leong returned the salute and said something cliché. Don't dare. I just want to praise His Excellency Liang's governance skills. After all, there are very few young people who can successfully develop territories in these years. Igor smiled gently, as if he was sincerely complimenting him. Humph! It's a miracle that a territory can be built in a few days. It seems that Earl Odin spent several years building Fletcher Village. The speaker was Archduke Alma. His words were sinister, but his demeanor and tone showed no hostility at all. Before Earl Odin could speak, the young man with evil eyes came out and said loudly, That is a shameful occupation. That village is Elideg. It is my territory. I changed the name of the village just to get away with it. That's what it means. Apparently this is Rainier. This fire cross emblem goes well with his behavior as the village burning knight. At that time, after I heard about this guy burning down the village and running away, I felt that this guy had a great future. And now it seems that it is indeed the case. There are not many young people with such thick faces and dark hearts. However, questioning the legality of expanding the Lord's territory on such occasions is tantamount to declaring war. And it's the kind that never stops. That's the enemy. However, since Rainier jumped out at this time, he must have been prepared. Leong didn't want to follow the opponent's rhythm. So he didn't speak. On the other hand, Earl Odin came out with a frown on his face. Lord Rainier, Eletigor has been destroyed by you. Now that's the Wheatland. I know your shameful act of burning down Elidegger village. Could it be that I know about it? Are you going to confuse right and wrong? Alma's weirdness came back again. Count Odin. Rainier's tactic of clearing the country to lure away the Jata Raiders was very reasonable at the time. He lured away the Jata Raiders alone. And then fought against the enemy in the wild. It can even be said that it is a heroic feat. But taking advantage of the enemy's invasion to occupy the territory of other nobles. This is the most shameful behavior. Oops. The duke is worthy of being a duke. Burning the village and running away can be said to be. Clearing the country. And being chased and robbed by the Jada people can be said to be. Fighting against the enemy. The lord even admires him a little. Leon smiled. And he understood that their method was nothing more than to mess up the matter of his knighthood on the grounds that. The legality of the territory is difficult to distinguish. And then kill him in private and get back the well-restored Maishyong. Collar probably because they knew that they had made money and makes the angling was developing again. It seemed that they regarded themselves as a fat and weak weakling. But, do you really know the role of money? Seeing that Odin seemed to be planning to refute. Leon stepped forward and ignored the uncle and nephew. 
Instead, he said to King Ulrich, Your Majesty, you led the knights under your command to fight bravely a few days ago, and their momentum was like running. Thunder is so majestic and fascinating. King Ulrich was confused and looked puzzled. Why was he suddenly flattering? Your Majesty left the battlefield after defeating the enemy, which can be described as heroic. But Your Majesty left in a hurry. When I was ordered by Count Odin to clean the battlefield, I picked up the trophies His Majesty left there on the battlefield. A box full of dinars. Ulrich's eyes gradually widened, and he seemed to be interested. The Duke of Alma's eyes were full of gloom, but he could not speak. Leon deliberately mentioned this war, just to make Alma's thoughts difficult to interrupt. After all, the Duke is also a smart man. He must have understood the king's intentions at the beginning of the war, in order to show that he had no objections. He also tried his best to hold back the main force of Emperor Marius. And he lost a lot of troops for this. Now, Leon or Odin can mention things related to the war. But Alma can't mention that everything is wrong. Even a slight interruption can easily be considered by the king as reluctant or resentful. That box is very gorgeous, very noble, and extremely heavy. It must contain at least tens of thousands of dinars. I think it must be your majesty's personal belongings that you accidentally lost. Leon said and smiled at Count Odin. Earl Odin understood. Yes, yes. Leon came to ask me once, and I also felt that it must be something that His Majesty accidentally left behind. Ulrich's puzzled expression disappeared, replaced by a relieved smile. Oh, marching and fighting are complicated, and it is possible that something was lost. Baron Leon is indeed an upright nobleman. Leon grinned. Sure enough, Ulrich liked golden things so much. How could he not like dinars? A king who is willing to accept money is a good king. Being willing to make money means that Rainier and Alma's confusion of truth and obstruction of the Lord's title change has nothing to do with the king. At the same time, it also means that King Ulrich only cares about actual interests and does not care about anything else. That would be very easy to handle. Pay some protection money to the king. That's right. The Lord is rich anyway. Chapter 71 Let's Fight Everyone present was stunned. No one expected that Leon would bribe the king in public. But? This kind of behavior of returning personal belongings is blameless. It is a virtue no matter where you leave money. Alma and Rainier's rhythm of confusing right and wrong was disrupted. But the matter was not over yet. Rainier began to shout loudly again, Eladeg. But as soon as he spoke, he was directly interrupted by Leon. His voice high-pitched and passionate. You were questioning the honor of a lord just now. Sissy, I want to duel with you. As soon as he finished speaking, he threw his gloves directly into Rainier's face. King Ulrich looked at Leon in surprise and challenged him to a duel in the throne room. This was very rare. Throwing a glove to the other party represented a challenge to a duel between nobles. This was a common code of conduct in the Middle Ages. Picking up the glove or drawing a sword represented acceptance of the duel. As for throwing it in someone's face, this is a challenge that is obviously insulting. Alma was startled and was about to speak. But Leon said first, Your Majesty, Please allow me to have an honorary duel in the presence of the late king. Okay. Now everyone's mouths are blocked. And no one can stop the duel. The Lord doesn't want to argue with others. The other party must have good ideas and cooperation. If you follow other people's rhythm, you will suffer a loss. So first of all, I used a large amount of dinars to bribe King Ulrich unexpectedly. This means that your majesty should remain neutral. They will not give you money if they get the weak collar. But I can. I can give you a lot. But if you don't treat me fairly, these tens of thousands of dinars may be lost, again. And the king obviously understood. The response given by King Ulrich also made it clear that I remain neutral, and you can solve it yourself. But in a reasonable, upright noble way, kings are human beings too. And kings also need dinars. Then, Leon stopped talking nonsense. There would definitely be a conflict anyway. And the other party obviously planned to kill him. Otherwise, he would not interfere with his decree of baron at this juncture. If that's the case, then just turn the conflict into a duel right from the start. Anyway, there are many reasons for dueling, and Liang's reason for the duel was quite upright. In order to maintain honor, this was an example of chivalry. The Kingdom of Lions is a place where chivalry is practiced, and duels represent fairness and honor. Therefore, many unreasonable behaviors can be linked to honor and status through the traditional ritual of dueling. In order to prevent the spread of duels, the kingdom promulgated the Duel Code a few years ago, which stipulated which disputes could be resolved by duels 
and also stipulated that only nobles could apply the dueling rules. According to the code, any duel involving honor is protected by law, and not even the king can stop it. Leon was the first to characterize this matter as an honorary duel, which must be done according to the rules of knights. The parties can only choose whether to accept it or not. But? Who would challenge someone to duel in the throne room in the palace? Alma and Rainier really didn't expect that this guy Leon didn't play according to the routine. Shouldn't the throne room be reasonable and wait for the king's ruling? Rainier was already stunned and had nothing to say yet. Is this a duel? He didn't react for a while and said hesitantly. Duel? Aye. As a result, before he could say, no, Leon interrupted him again. Don't you dare to duel? Did some man bite off that thing on your crotch? Yes. I'm just humiliating you. Draw your sword. Sissy. Rainier's claws were numb now. Just now, it was just out of questioning the Lord's honor. So it doesn't matter if he doesn't accept the challenge. Just admit that he made a mistake. Say that he will no longer question it. And apologize. But as a knight, it is impossible for a knight to endure this kind of public humiliation. Otherwise, he will be regarded as a coward for the rest of his life. If you don't accept the duel to clear your reputation, you will really be laughed at for the rest of your life. Rainier had no idea that Leon would do something so weird. He originally thought that Leon would accuse him of burning down villages and robbing. And he wouldn't care. Elideg was once Rainier's own territory. In this era, how could he cause trouble? No one else can take care of your own territory. But he didn't expect that Leon didn't mention any of these real crimes. And instead directly viciously humiliated him. In fact, when encountering this kind of situation, any knight in the Lion Kingdom would draw his sword directly. However, Lord Rainier did not dare. How that guy Leon got the Pioneering Lord Certificate is known to everyone present. Rainier thinks that he is not as good as Sir Lehman. He is still very young, and he does not want to be hacked to death. And now, he doesn't even know how to refute that Liang's intention is to force him to a duel. No matter what he says, Leon will continue to challenge him. He will only be continued to be humiliated. And all the previous preparations will be useless. Maybe Rainier's family is powerful and has many connections. But so what? The current situation is whether he accepts a one-on-one -on -one challenge. Moreover, Rainier himself is just a knight. So he can't let others fight for him. Rainier looked back at the Duke of Alma. Then looked at the gloves that fell in front of him. Hesitating, the young knight who burned the village was obviously dragged into the misunderstanding of the knight's rules. Seeing Alma frowning and planning to say something else, Liang showed disdain and prodded further. You coward! Cut that thing off and sell yourself! You can probably become a famous prostitute! Come on! Come here! Duel! The winner can enjoy the weak collar! Liang once again added a price tag to the duel. This is further disrupting the opponent's rhythm. Don't you want my weak collar? I've made an offer. But can you afford it? Moreover, Leon spoke very rudely. And usually no noble could accept such an insult. Odin grinned, with an approving look in his eyes. With these continuous interruptions, for a moment, the only voice in the throne room was Leon, while the king watched with interest, as if expecting the situation to turn into a duel. Rainier's face had turned purple. His anger was visible to the naked eye, and his hands were shaking violently but he still refrained from taking the glove or drawing the sword. He stared at Leong and said fiercely, Asshole! Let's see! After saying that, he took a step back and seemed to want to leave. Can you tolerate this situation? Leong found it unbelievable. This guy really had no sense of honor as a knight. Even King Ulrich started shaking his head. However, Rainier's reaction made Leong deeply wary. The humiliation just now was enough to make any nobleman a mortal enemy. It would be terrible if he refused to accept the duel. This kind of person is thick-faced and has no sense of honor. If he cannot be killed, he will definitely take revenge on himself endlessly in the future. Knight Rainier, are you really not going to accept the duel? Odin also found it unbelievable. He thought that Rainier would probably die in the duel. But even though Rainier's face was blue, he still calmed down and turned around and left without saying a word before Leong spoke again. His eyes before leaving were full of hatred. Alma took a deep look at Leon and left. Leon felt a little heavy in his heart. But there was nothing he could do about it. Anyway, it was a victory that the enemy did not disturb the knighting ceremony. The current situation is much better than following the enemy's rhythm. At least, he knows who the enemy is, and will soon have the ability to proactively attack. Chapter 72 The Baron finally became a regular official. There is one less witness. But it doesn't matter. Alma is just in charge of Changa Town. Anyway, 
No one is in the way. King Ulrich seemed a little unwilling to be able to see the duel, but still signaled that the knighting ceremony would proceed as normal. Archmaster Igor reminded with a smile. Your Excellency Leon, it's time for you to swear allegiance. Leon knelt on one knee, facing the stone pillar carved with the late king, and recited the oath. I, who are as good as you, swear to you, who are no better than me, to recognize you as my king and supreme lord, so long as you follow our status, traditions, and laws fairly. If you do not do so, the above oath shall be invalid. After reciting the oath, Leon covered his chest, saluted to the goddess on the dome, and then lowered his head. King Ulrich pulled out his sword and placed it on Leon's shoulder. At this moment, I, Ulrich, in the presence of the gods and the late kings, grant the title of baron to the young man who has sworn allegiance, and recognize that you legally own the land. Wealth and supreme honor. May you use the sword in your hand protect the honor of the late king and our dignity. As soon as King Ulrich finished speaking, a voice suddenly sounded in Liang's mind. Dot very good dot ha ha ha. Leon heard it clearly. It was a male voice. An old man? But it sounded crazy. Just like the last time. The woman's voice felt like it touched the soul directly. The sound only appeared once. But after the last experience, Leong was able to accept it calmly. And he did not show any abnormality. It's just a hallucination. King Ulrich took back his sword after reciting the oath. And then waved to the attendant next to him. One of the attendants tied a gold lion flag with a red background to Leong as a cloak. After looking at Leon, Ulrich went to the weapons rack on the side of the hall and took down a lance. Baron Leon, this is for you to thank you for helping me find my lost personal belongings. I wish you gained more glory on the battlefield. With a smile on his face, King Ulrich motioned for Leon to take the lance, seemingly reminding Leon not to forget to pay the protection fee. As you wish, your majesty, I will take my leave now. Leon also smiled and picked up his lance, nodded to the king and Igor, and then left with Count Odin. This lance is not too bad. It is the standard equipment of knights in the Lion Realm. An ordinary extended lance is worth about 50 dinars. It's just that the profit of this product, which is delivered first and paid later, is very high, and Leon has to spend at least 10,000 dinars to buy it. Of course I feel distressed, but this protection fee must be paid. Of course, you have to give money, but you can't give it too quickly. You have to delay it for a few days. You know, you are a valued customer. When you don't give money, but you may not be able to give it after you give money. The king gave a lance as a gift, which actually told Leong that this was a deal and not a long-term one. Because the lance would often break after a battle. The deal bought King Ulrich temporary justice. In other words, King Ulrich will remain neutral when he conflicts with established nobles in a short period of time. This is not bad. After all, most of the old nobles and royal family members are related to each other. I just don't know how long Ulrich's fairness will last. But I hope it lasts longer than the lance. After leaving the palace, Odin patted Leon on the shoulder. Boy, it's a good idea for you to provoke a duel. But it's a pity that the guy held back. Leon shook his head and sighed. Lord Earl, I'm afraid I'm going to face a lot of assassinations and conspiracies. I need help. In fact, Leon didn't have much fear in his heart. After being assassinated by Rissa Dillon once, he had already realized that there would always be enemies who would kill him anyway and it would be useless to escape no matter how hard he tried. The fundamental thing was that he was strong enough. He had previously tried every means to make money in order to quickly grow in strength. Odin shook his head. Don't worry so much. Alma has suffered a lot. He doesn't have many men left. So I will keep an eye on him. Just be careful with Rainier. My lord Earl, what I mean is, can you help me get a group of warriors dot such as mercenaries or rangers, dinars or whatever? Leon now has a huge amount of money in his hands. And he wants to increase his strength in the fastest way. With Odin's appeal in Chang'e town, he can naturally help a lot. Of course, I also hope that my allies will be stronger. But forget about the money. There is no need to mention the money you borrowed before. I also have something to ask you for help. Odin seemed hesitant to speak. We are partners. And you are the major shareholder of my company. Don't be so polite. If you have any needs, just ask. I won't hide it from you. I have an illegitimate son. Actually, you have met him. After bidding farewell to Odin, Leon returned to the familiar king's road. Close was waiting for him next to the stables. Sir, I should call you Baron now. Do you want to go to the tavern to celebrate? 
Clothes looked much happier than Leon himself. No. I have to rush back to make Xiangling quickly. Close. We still have a lot to do. Rainier must be thinking about his own life. And there are countless people who are thinking about their money. Lion City is not safe. And Li Ang's current state is like a child entering the bustling city with gold in his pocket. When I had no money, I was still being hunted. Now that I have money, I am not just being chased. So we can't celebrate at this time. We have to go back to recruit troops and buy horses. Isn't it just to increase our strength to get so much money? Just like when he left Miss Cage City. The Lord quickly left Lion City without stopping at all. But this time, the tough men under his command hit cars. Leon was very generous and equipped all his infantry with carriages. After all, they had all worked part-time as business managers or security guards before. So one day later, they caught up with Leslie's convoy with the merchants. And the convoy was relatively slow. These businessmen still haven't left Leslie's team because they plan to set up an office and make Xiangling so that they can participate more quickly the next time they encounter an opportunity like Double Eleven. After all, in the past two months of international import and export trade, they all made a lot of money. And basically all the backlog of inventory was sold to Bacchus. All the merchants are asking this newly minted baron. The war is over and our goods are sold out. Is there any good business before the next war? So Leong immediately gave the merchants a good deal. My territory is vast and sparsely populated. And I am short of manpower. You can bring some immigrants to make angling. I will pay 50 dinars for each young man. The businessman's eyes shone with surprise. Lord Baron, are immigrants from other countries also allowed? Anyone from any country is fine. As long as they are young and strong enough to speak human language. It's all at this price. The merchants were overjoyed and immediately dispersed. Looking for sources of goods. For businessmen. This is really a good deal. And Liang's price is not low. There are refugees who have lost their homes everywhere on this continent. And the welfare benefits for the residents of Mexiangling are very good. Those refugees must be happy to go here and just pick up money on the ground. The merchants immediately disperse to replenish goods without the encumbrance of the merchants. Their movement speed immediately doubled. And in less than three days, they return to Mexiangling. The oaths of allegiance and acceptance of allegiance in this chapter are real oaths taken in medieval Europe. Not fabrications. Allegiance in the European Middle Ages was a cooperative contract that bound both parties, rather than unilateral loyalty. As mentioned in the previous article, the dinar gold coins were thinned out so that a large number of silver coins were issued. This is also true history from the 13th to the 15th centuries. Although this is just a so-called game novel. Also, do you know who the prototype of the duel that took place in the throne room was? Chapter 73 Do you think the war is over? Construction is still going on in the territory in full swing. The guards in the village were the troops left behind by Godric, flying the three lions flag. Godric seemed to be very contractual. During the two months when Liang's entire army was dispatched, there were still many troops in White Deer Castle guarding Makes Yangling. This was indeed quite good, and Leon was even a little moved. But after entering the village, Leon always felt that there seemed to be more than a few dozen troops flying the three lions flag around him. He felt as if he saw several groups of Godric's people along the way, seeing a group of archers forming a team in the village. Leon went up and asked, Has anything happened recently? I see there are quite a few of you. The leading archer said calmly, Lord Leon, a group of bandits came here a month ago, led by a few knights. It seems that there are many people who have their own ideas. Do you know who it is? Leon asked. They didn't enter the village. They were seen by another team of guys who had changed defense before. They said they were all kinds of people. Like a group of bandits. Leon was indeed grateful to Godric sincerely. Fortunately, he left his troops here. Otherwise, who knows what those gangsters might do. Lord Godric and you are not here. So we reported this matter to Miss Amy. In order to prevent your territory from being attacked. Miss Amy sent 200 more people to patrol several times. Then those bandits he left and never came near again. Leon exhaled. Miss Amy is a good person. He felt that he should be thanked. Moreover, judging from what the archer meant, when Godric was away, Amy actually had the final say in White Deer Castle, so he sincerely planned to invite the archers to have a drink and understand the situation. But his invitation was righteously rejected. The leading archer said, Since you have come back, my lord, our mission has been completed. Miss Amy asked us to return to White Deer Castle immediately after seeing you. There can be no delay. Sorry, sir. After that, 
he was ready to say goodbye. Leon had no choice but to stuff him with ale and send him away. What a good ally. Leon sighed. But as soon as the group of archers left, Leslie, who was in charge of logistics, found Leon with a puzzled face. Sir, we have a lot less food. The warehouses are empty. We must quickly replenish food. But this season is not good. Buy it. Only then did Leon react. Amy is a cunning little girl. It turns out it wasn't out of good intentions. She wanted my Sion to provide food to help Byla Castle raise troops. Hundreds of people came here to eat for more than a month. And you have to let them eat freely. Maybe you can even eat and take them. They are here to protect the territory. You have to thank people sincerely. Godric's early investment was taken back with interest in one fell swoop. Unexpectedly, the girl who looks cute, cute and polite is actually more calculating than Godric. Sure enough, all the noble families are full of human spirits. Leslie was extremely anxious. Sir, it is early January, the coldest time of winter. It is difficult to purchase large-scale food during this time. What should we do? The Lord Lord sighed. Leslie, don't worry. The food seller will probably be here soon. Leon was very calm. He felt that Godric's daughter probably had some backup plans. Sure enough, just one day later, Leon received a letter with beautiful handwriting. Your Excellency Baron Leon, White Deer Castle would like to remind you that your territory is at least four months away from the next grain harvest. Although White Deer Castle is not rich either. Due to the close alliance between the two parties, White Deer Castle is still willing to try your best to help. The lower part of the letter is a list of unit prices for various foods, which looks similar to the menu in Liang's food world. It looks like they copied the same style. Even the quotation method and operation mode are copied. And the prices have doubled. Door door delivery and cash on delivery are also marked. The letter was signed. Amy, general manager of Bilubo Grain and Oil Company. Awesome dot amazing dot I learned it so quickly. The Lord Lord looked at it and shook his head. Once a capitalist's methods are seen through, others will naturally imitate them. But Leon really didn't expect that the first one to imitate would be the innocent and harmless looking girl Amy. Moreover, when the routine is used so well, all the surrounding villages will stock up on food for the winter and generally will not sell it. If you go shopping in places like Chang'e Town, not to mention whether you can buy it or not, even if you buy it, only half of it will be sent back to be eaten by others. After all, there will definitely be losses on the road, and a large number of soldiers will be sent to escort them to prevent looting. Amy made full use of the right time, place, and people, forcing herself to go to her place to buy food at a high price. In fact, Leon didn't feel aggrieved. He now has the mental capacity to bear it. This is just a normal phenomenon after getting rich suddenly. White Deer Castle just wants to calculate some dinars, and they have indeed provided protection for their territory. This protection fee is cost-effective, much more cost-effective than the king's lance, and doubling the price is not outrageous in the cold winter. To be honest, if it were Leong himself, he could double the price five times. Besides, dinars are something that is earned only to be spent, so you can earn more only by spending them. You can't let go of it if you keep it in your hands. Compared to buying food at high prices, Leon cared more about the gangsters. According to the archer, the bandits were led by a few knights. So they were obviously not serious bandits. Leon is more worried about the kind of knights who have no lower limit. Such as Rainier. The ways in which these people act are often opaque. And no one knows what they will do next. In comparison, the actions of Archduke Alma or King Ulrich will be relatively easy to judge. It's nothing more than ambition-driven and profit-driven. A little reverse thinking can make sense. But some animals behave logically. Naturally. People cannot substitute. So Leon wrote a letter to confirm the situation. Dear General Manager Amy, please send someone to deliver the food. I have the money ready. Also, do you have the whereabouts of those gangsters? One day later, more than a dozen carts of grain were pulled over, along with a reply from Amy. They retreated a month ago, and I don't know where they are now. Please be careful. Then it would be difficult to determine whether the gangsters were hiding somewhere and peeping. There are currently few troops in the village, which is quite worrying. Leon had no choice but to start from the territory itself. Strengthen armaments and increase defenses. He asked the crossbowmen who were familiar with the mercenary trade to recruit mercenaries separately. This was the most expensive but also the fastest way to increase the number of troops in the short term. Anyway, he had money now. Within the territory, 
The Lord also began to vigorously train all the people in the territory to replenish their military strength, relying on the money and the fact that he could buy food to survive when the number of people was small. Leon directly recruited all troops. All the young people between the ages of 15 and 35 among the people in the territory were recruited, regardless of men and women. The vast majority of the people in the territory were young people. Most of the old and weak people were killed when Rainier burned the village. The Lord plans to conduct a large-scale military training. But accidents always come sooner than expected. Before the crossbowmen came back and the new recruits started training, trouble came first. Lisa Dillon is back. The Nolder elf was covered in injuries and ran back extremely exhausted. He brought back a comatose man in black. It seemed that he had finally completed the task assigned by Leon. But his first words when he saw Leon were terrible news. Lord Leon, a large army is coming here. At least a thousand people. What? Chapter 74 Fortunately, he is a human being. Everyone prepares for war. Samur, take people to find out the enemy's situation. Report the enemy's traces at any time. Light the beacon. Three beacons. Ask for help from White Deer Castle. Leon directly gave the order first. And then asked Risa Dillon while putting on his equipment. What's going on? Where did the army come from? It's probably this dead man's face that brought it. Looking at the unconscious employer, Leon pulled off his hood. A bald head that was as white as blue was exposed. There was no hair on the whole head. And the lips were blue. He really looked like a dead person. But fortunately, he is breathing and has a heartbeat. So he is not inhuman. That's okay. Leon temporarily gave up the idea of running away immediately. He took a bowl of water and poured it on the dead man's face. But the man was still unconscious and unresponsive. Risa Dillon, tell me the specific situation in detail. Don't miss any details. Leon needs more information now. Resaderin began to speak quickly and in detail about his experiences. More than two months ago, Lisa Dillon left Makesy Angling and went to Chang'e Town. His mission is to find and bring back the employer who hired him to assassinate Leon. Perhaps the vast majority of assassins will not plot against their employer in turn. But that is because the consequences of a failed assassination are usually death. So even if they want to rebel, they have no chance. However, in a situation like Rosatalin's, where the assassination attempt failed and was controlled with drugs, there was no other way. After all, assassins are human beings and want to live. Risa Dillon really does not dare to bet on the authenticity of the 100-day soul-breaking pill. He must bring his employer alive to Leon within three months. Originally, Lisa Dillon thought that this employer should be easy to find. After all, employers should always wait for the results. But he didn't expect that after he went to Chang'e Town and left a secret note saying, Mission accomplished, as agreed before. No one would contact him after waiting for several days. Lisa Dillon searched almost every corner of Chang'e Town, but still could not find this person. Subsequently, the kingdom launched a war and the garrisons in various places would step up their defenses during the war. And Chang'e Town also imposed martial law. Lisa Dillon had no choice but to sneak out of the city in the middle of the night, planning to return to make the angling first. But halfway through, on the banks of the Air River, which was more than a hundred miles away from Makes Angling, he encountered a strange combination. It was a makeshift camp with dozens of people inside. There were a few well-armed knights, a ragtag group of bandits in various armors, a hooded bard, and some masked men in black. Lisa Dillon was a top assassin, and he could easily tell that the men in black were his former colleagues and that they were killers. Moreover, the hooded bard was dressed exactly like the employer he met in Chang'e Town, so Rosatalin sneaked closer to the camp. Then, Lisa Dillon heard these few conversations. Dot, that's not an empty village. There are a lot of troops there. We don't have enough manpower. You bastard. Then wait until the war is over. The moment just after the war is the best opportunity. The Empire will send a large army to support you. As long as you succeed, you will become the governor of the Empire. But he will come back after the war is over. Don't worry. I will lead him to Yaju village. Seize the opportunity to bring more people. Don't you still want to get that little girl? In this conversation, the voice of one of the people was none other than Lisa Dillon's employer. The other voice probably came from a young knight. Without hearing the previous words, Rosatalin was not quite sure of their intentions. But at least, he had determined his goal. So he left a mark of mission completion in a conspicuous place in the camp. The employer did come out at night. But after seeing Li Ang's noble emblem, he quickly retreated and directly ordered everyone in the camp to besiege Lisa Dillon. 
Only then did the poor elf killer realize that this employer was also dishonest. Rasatalan tried his best to escape, and then turned around and followed the group quietly. This bard's behavior reminded the grumpy elf of his last employer. Even without Liang's order, Risa Dillon would not let him go. Because there were so many people on the other side, Lisa Dillon never found a good opportunity to kidnap and kill him. It was actually easier for the elf to shoot the employer with one arrow. But it was difficult to take him away alive. These people would stop in various villages all the way to the west, walking very slowly in twists and turns. The knights quickly dispersed with their men. But the men in black never left the bard's side. They are all killers and are very vigilant. Lisa Dillon was almost discovered by them several times. He had no choice but to keep following this group of people to look for opportunities. He followed them for half a month until they reached the vicinity of Caneburg. This is already the western part of the Lion Kingdom. Finally, all the killers in black were dispatched. Rasatalan finally found a chance to capture the bard. But the strange thing is that the bard, whose face was as pale as a dead man, seemed to have become a fool from the moment he was captured by Rasatalan. Yes, it's like his brain is completely broken. No matter what Rasatalan says, that dead face will only repeat one sentence. You will regret it. You know, not long ago, he was convincing the knight with eloquent words. And the most troublesome thing is, he doesn't move at all. Like a real fool. No matter how hard Rasatalan tortured him, he never moved, refused, resisted, or cooperated. Except that he still needs a little food and drink and can say a few words. He really doesn't look like a living person at all. Rasatalan went to great lengths to take him away from the vicinity of Caneborg. For an elf who had to hide. It was really a huge hardship to travel thousands of miles with such a big stupid thing. The Nolder elves kidnapping humans must not be discovered. As this will definitely lead to siege. Well, even if humans kidnap humans, they will still be besieged. But he couldn't kill this fool. He had to bring the person back alive no matter what. Otherwise, he wouldn't be able to explain to Liang. So he went to a nearby village to steal a carriage, and then put the man's money bag in the carriage owner's house. Although the proud elf had been an assassin, he was unwilling to steal. This time he had no choice but to take it without telling him. So he left enough money to buy the carriage. Even though there was a carriage, it was still extremely troublesome. Listening to the words, You will regret it. Every day, Risa Dillon really regretted it. If it weren't for the thought of the poison in his stomach, Risa Dillon would want to give up every day. It took him a full month before he brought the people to the vicinity of Trubrin, a village about a hundred miles west of Makes Angling. At this moment, the fool suddenly seemed to wake up, and then broke the rope with unimaginable strength and ran away. Risa Dillon was caught off guard and almost ran into the village by the man. Fortunately, the employer was not running very fast. The elf reacted quickly and caught up with him in time, knocking him unconscious at the entrance of the village. But then, a large group of gangsters with various equipment poured out of the village of Trubrin, making it a dark place. Chapter 75 The war has just begun. The dark crowd looked like it could never be less than a thousand people. Lisa Dillon didn't even dare to ask for the carriage. So he picked up the dead man's face and ran away, fighting and fleeing along the way, and suffered many injuries. And the bandit army has been chasing him relentlessly. It was difficult to get rid of the pursuit while carrying a person. But Rasatalan couldn't abandon this dead face. Besides, this situation obviously meant that this dead face was an important role. So he gritted his teeth and held on to the wounds all over his body. Relying on he barely escaped by using his excellent body skills to continuously shuttle through the woods. Then, he led the people back to make Xiangling as quickly as possible. Trubrin is very close to make Xiangling. Only a hundred miles away. And Lisa Dillon only rushed back for a short while. Since the enemy has been chasing them, they should arrive soon. Risa Dillon did not miss any details. He was a smart man and knew that the more detailed the information at this time, the better it would be for Leon's judgment. Leon was not too panicked at this time. According to Risa Dillon, these people should be related to the gangster seen by the archers of White Deer Castle. As long as it's not non-human, there is a beacon warning and reinforcements should arrive from White Deer Castle soon. As long as it can be delayed for a few days, the bugle call rangers or other reinforcements will also come. Leong did not blame Risa Dillon for attracting the enemy and bringing back the dead face. The task was given by Leong Risa Dillon had done his best not to leave the dead face and run away. Of course, the main reason Risa Dillon worked so hard was because it had been more than two months since he last took the 100-day soul-breaking pill, and he had to bring that dead face back to. 
extend his life. Sighing, Liang threw a horse dung egg that he had prepared to the older elf. Go and rest. Aye. But before he finished speaking, Risa Dillon's movement of raising his head to swallow the medicine suddenly stopped. He stared straight at the sky, and the pill seemed to be stuck in his throat. Ahem. Sir. Look. Over there at White Deer Castle. Leon looked up to the east and saw huge black smoke rising over White Deer Castle. White Deer Ford was also attacked at the same time. This is trouble. Seeing the beacon fire at White Deer Castle, Leong realized that the real war might have just begun. Based on what Rasadalin experienced, this matter was obviously caused by the Bacchus Empire. But we don't know who the collaborator was. More than a month ago, while the war was going on, the enemy was already plotting against my Xiongling. But its ultimate goal should be to blockade and capture the western city of White Deer Castle. It's just that when the enemy planned to take advantage of my Xiong's army to seize the empty village more than a month ago, they probably didn't expect that there would be soldiers from White Deer Castle stationed there. After discovering the enemy's traces, Amy happened to send a large number of people over. Eat and drink. Judging from the camp Rasadalin encountered, the enemy may not have enough manpower at the time. So they did not take action but changed their plans. Their new plan should be to seize the time to recruit people and then cooperate with the main force of the Bacchus Empire to seize White Deer Castle in the days just after the war, when most of the kingdom lords are returning to their respective territories. This happens to be an empty period of time, which is better than the opportunity during the ongoing war. All the lords are on their way back to their territories, and it is difficult for White Deer Castle and my Xiongling to ask for help from outside. At the same time, this is also the time when the overall vigilance of the kingdom is at its lowest. Just after the war, Everyone will have a misconception that after both sides retreat, all the lords will disband. The lords of the Lion Kingdom were indeed disbanded. But the Bacchus Empire had a different military system. If they turned to attack White Deer Castle at this time, they would catch the Lion Kingdom by surprise. In order to prevent Godric, an experienced veteran, from returning with his troops, those people also lured Godric to the Crow Village. They must have succeeded. Godric didn't even attend the knighting ceremony. His wife's illness must have been caused by these people. So, the current situation is that Bailu Ford and Makes Angling are attacked by the army at the same time. And it is very likely that reinforcements will not be found for a while. Sir! A large number of bandits were found by the river ten miles to the west. They seem to be resting by the river. There are no flags. There should be thousands of them. It was Summer who responded, not even breathing. Leon waved his hand and asked him to return to the team. As a scout, Samur is indeed better than most people in this era. At least, he can bring back the enemy's location and approximate number of people. But his value is still limited. Basically, what kind of troops the enemy has, what powerful troops it has, and what special features it has. Cannot say it clearly. Sir, I will go to Ralph's camp immediately to ask for help. Sarah reacted quickly. After understanding the situation, she immediately jumped on her horse and headed north. The other lords and their troops are nowhere to be found. And Ralph's rangers are probably the only reinforcements with fast mobility that can be found. Sarah is already taking the initiative to think and solve problems. This is her job as a foreign affairs officer. And it is also the self-motivation brought by profit sharing. The positive effects brought by Liang's business methods are gradually being reflected. The horn has sounded several times. And everyone is getting ready for battle. The swords were unsheathed. The armors were ready and the chaotic and heavy footsteps were heard. This beautiful village gradually became filled with a chilling atmosphere. All the combatants are already in place, and the new recruits are all dressed up and waiting for orders. Their equipment is actually pretty good. Everyone wears neat heraldic chainmail robes and light helmets. All kinds of weapons are also standard weapons of the regular army. Liang had customized 200 sets before and defrauded the first issuance of shares. The 100,000 dinars that arrived were all spent. Although their proficiency is not as good as Anson's, at least they look like a neat army on the surface. There were about a hundred people, most of them new recruits. The recruits were inevitably a little panicked, but they seemed very determined. Even the citizens who had not been selected to join the army had already taken up arms, and no one ran away. Of course they have reasons not to escape. This is the real role of my Xiong group shares. The Lord, before, worked hard to make money and allocated shares to all members. It was at this time that it took effect. Leslie allocated half of the previous profits of Maishiong International and distributed dividends according to the number of shares held by everyone. Just yesterday, 
The golden dinar had been distributed to every citizen. Each citizen had a share. And the soldiers had at least two shares. Even if you only hold one share, this dividend is higher than the income of the residents in the past few years. This is only the first year in dividend. Starting from this year, it will be distributed once at the end of every month. At the end of the year, there will also be a contribution reward for those businessmen who have paid large deposits to establish entertainment clubs and offices in various places. Provide income for Myxiang International. With such benefits, who is willing to give up his status as a citizen? There will be no problem with the morale. Morale and loyalty of the troops. The problem now is just that the gap in strength is too large. The crossbowmen went to recruit mercenaries and did not come back. There are only a hundred people in hand. Medenham great swordsmen. Ten out of ten. There are only a few that can be called elite. Pender's heavy armed archers. Thirty out of thirty. These are the group of new recruits who were brought to the Sava River battlefield before. Although they have never fought, they can be considered to have gained experience in a few months. Coupled with a well-equipped equipment, he was upgraded to a heavy-armed archer. Pender Militia. 62 of 62, in fact. These are new recruits recruited yesterday and have not been trained for a day. They can be called militia by the system entirely because they are equipped with the equipment of elite armed infantry. And they are all equipped with hybrid swords and light crossbows. I originally planned to use a compound bow. But I didn't have time to train. So I had to use a crossbow first. How can a hundred or so people, most of whom are new recruits, fight against an army of thousands of people? Chapter 76 Attack and Meet the Enemy After looking at the map, Leon began to arrange defense. Anson, take all the militiamen to the entrance of the village to set up defenses. You should be familiar with the battle formations in the past few months. Make good use of all the buildings. You led the people to repair them. You know how to use them. Yes. My lord. Anson is no longer the weakling who only hid behind Salama. Although his martial arts still had little improvement, he had experienced bloody battles in the border camps and witnessed the great battles at the Sava River Fort. He was no longer unfamiliar with the battlefield. Leslie, pull all the carriages to the entrance of the village and set up a carriage formation. Set up three carriage formations. Okay. My lord. But what is our strategy? Leslie asked. Every caravan that encounters gangsters will use car formations to resist. And arranging car formations is indeed something Leslie is good at. But she doesn't know how Leong plans for her and Anson to resist the enemy. You guys' tactic is to guard the entrance of the village and fire arrows when you see the enemy. When the enemy gets close, burn the carriages and retreat. Then retreat to a line of carriages behind and continue firing arrows. That's all? That's all! Leslie sighed. This tactic is indeed simple and easy to understand. But isn't it too simple? Of course. Leon deliberately simplified the tactics. He did not have a reliable commander. And making the explanation too complicated would affect his performance. Besides, it's not certain whether this tactic will be useful or not. Close. The charge captain. Is experienced. But he can only charge into battle. And his mind is all about muscles. Close. Bring the stormtroopers and follow me. Leon put the map in his pocket. My lord, what is our plan? Close was a little worried. The gap in numbers was really too big. The two of us will lead the others to take the initiative. Kill dozens of enemies first and see what happens next. Leon put a horse armor on Alice and said lightly while tying the belt. Ah? Close was a little confused. The others were 40 people? Close still knows how to do this. 40 people take the initiative to attack thousands of people? Has the Lord become a little inflated after getting rich? Brothers, follow me. The Lord put on his helmet. And his face was covered by a ferocious giant helmet. This was a newly purchased helmet. The original helmet was given to Raphael. The body is no longer chain armor. But a set of half-body armor focusing on vital protection. Which is a light plate armor. Next to him are the Mettenheim stormtroopers. Behind him were 30 heavily armed archers. Of course. Leong had to take the initiative to attack those gangsters. Since they had chased Lisa Dillon all the way, they must be equally exhausted now. And they were probably even out of touch. It's a pity that there are no cavalry in hand. If there was a cavalry team of dozens of people, Leong would even bring out all the troops to attack. With Summer leading the way, less than half an hour after leaving the village, they saw the group of gangsters from a distance. It looked like there were eight or nine hundred people, which was less than Rasadalan said. It was probably that some people were left behind. As Leong expected, these enemies chased them for dozens of miles. 
They were obviously very tired and were probably preparing to take a rest by the river. Most of the gangsters were sitting on the ground by the river. But they did not set up camp. They were obviously taking a temporary rest, probably waiting for stragglers, and would soon start acting again. This group of gangsters cannot be called an army at all. They have all kinds of equipment, ranging from cloth and leather to iron, and they are sitting there in a noisy manner. Maybe it was because they were too tired. They didn't even send any scouts, and there was no warning around them at all. Or maybe they were self-preserving that there were so many people that they didn't feel the need to be alert. A rabble has nothing but numbers. Leon lay down in the nearby woods, peered carefully, and made an evaluation. Close nodded beside him. When he saw these gangsters, he understood the reason why the Lord wanted to take the initiative. These gangsters didn't seem to know how to arrange their physical strength reasonably. In fact, there are still elites on the enemy side, including seven or eight horsemen. They look like knights and are fairly well equipped. They should be the ones who let the gangsters stop here to rest. They were riding around to greet the gangsters, and their curses could be heard from a distance. It seemed that this rabble was not easy to control. In addition, there were about a hundred neat-looking infantrymen sitting alone on one side. These should be elite soldiers, and were not with a large group of gangsters. Close! You stay here in ambush and don't move! I'm going to seduce you! And then you take action when they come after them! Leon gave an explanation and quietly led the archers out of the woods and moved closer to the river. Let go! Leon led the archers to secretly gather near the group of bandits. He raised his arms high and threw a wave of arrows into the group of bandits causing a miserable howl. Then, the Lord Lord turned around and ran away with 30 archers. The archers' archery skills were not very good, but without any precautions. A dozen of the gangsters, who were resting by the river were still knocked down. Several knights yelled and cursed loudly and began to give orders. The group of elite infantrymen were the first to react. When they spotted Liang's dozens of men, they immediately stood up and began to approach with their shields raised. The gangsters were very unrestrained. They howled and rushed over. Leon looked back and saw two knights chasing after him. So he raised his eagle strike bow and turned around with an arrow. Reflexive riding and shooting. The fighting method of the grassland peoples. The distance of this arrow was more than 100 meters. But the arrow still accurately hit the head of a knight. The knight turned over and fell off his horse with a clang. The lord grinned. This was all due to luck. His level of mounted archery had not yet reached the level of rapid shooting. He didn't expect to hit the head. Being able to hit the knight was already considered a superb performance. But the other knight was obviously frightened by this terrifying long-distance arrow headshot. He slowed down and turned around to say H, low. So a group of dark gangsters rushed up and started to chase. The messy arrows also started to shoot towards Leong emission. Too far away. Leong and his men kept running back. The wooden bows in the hands of the gangsters could hardly cause any harm to the well-armored heavy-armed archers. Thirty archers ran into the woods in a hurry. although. Don't enter in the forest, is a rule of thumb that should be followed most of the time. The gangsters are so numerous that they naturally don't care about a small forest at the moment. And a group of people will soon follow them. Shouting loudly. Rushed in. Leong himself did not enter the woods. He rode a horse in circles around the woods. Shooting an arrow from time to time to lure the heavy infantry single-handedly. Seeing this situation. The knight wisely restrained the infantry not to pursue Leong. But to guard outside the woods. This is what an army should look like. It cannot be disrupted even if it is harassed. This knight seems to be an experienced warrior. Leon shot an arrow at him. But the knight blocked it with his shield. And then several crossbow arrows from the infantry lineup shot at Leon. This kind of shooting was not cost effective. So the lord had no choice but to ride Alice around the woods and disappear in front of these people. However, although the leading knight was very clever, the gangster suffered a loss and seemed to be difficult to restrain. A large group of people rushed into the woods with random shouts, indicating that they would kill the corpses with cold arrows. However, not long after they entered the woods, a group of strong men suddenly jumped out from behind the big trees, followed by a large area of neat sword light. The dappled sunlight in the woods made a dozen strong figures appear dark, and the swords in their hands flickered, making it difficult to resist the powerful and heavy attack. After several rounds of sword rays, no less than 20 gangsters turned into more than 40 and fell in the woods. With screams and screams. Walk! Chapter 77 Deterrence Outside the grove, Liang's voice came. Short and clear. He had been watching the enemy's situation outside. No one among the great swordsmen of Medenheim spoke. They silently waved their swords to kill the enemies around them. 
and then disappeared silently into the woods. They followed clothes, breaking apart branches and vines, and artificially created a dark passage in the woods, as if a giant bear had passed by. The gangsters made so much noise that it was difficult for them to identify Close's location in the woods with poor visibility. So, the gangsters who rushed in first left the woods after leaving more than 20 corpses. Although they were a mob, they were not fools and knew they could not pursue blindly like this. So they retreated and planned to encircle them. Therefore, Leong asked Close and the others to leave quickly. The harassed enemies surrounded the woods for a while, but found no one. They quickly regrouped under the urging of the knights. But they did not rest on the river bank, but began to march towards Mai Xiang leader. The leader of this unit obviously had battle experience. He did not dwell on the harassment of a small unit. Instead, he directly let the ragtag group attack Xiangling from the main road, and let the well-trained infantry attack them. Perimeter alert. One part of the infantry was at the rear, and the other part was at the front, guarding against possible ambush in the woods on both sides. They walked slower and seemed more cautious. Leon looked up and saw the smoke over White Deer Fort. No wonder these people continued to march even if they knew there was an ambush. They had to cooperate with the offensive at White Deer Fort. It's a pity that there are no horse archers in hand. The gangster's long-range attack capabilities are not strong. And their defense is also very poor. If he has a team of mounted archers, Leong feels that he can probably fly their kites to death. When this battle is over, the entire cavalry force will have to come out to survive or die. The Lord Lord was lying in the woods, frowning and thinking. Most of the enemies were a mob, and the only ones who were difficult to deal with were the knight leader and the infantry. Many of the infantry had heavy crossbows in their hands. Moreover, the knights were all dressed the same, so it was difficult to tell who was the real leader. Leon patted Alice's butt and asked the horse to run into the woods to hide. And then he also entered the woods on the side of the road. Close! You guys go to the front and wait for my instructions. Prepare to charge into battle. Although the enemy is now very careful, Leon still found some opportunities. Marching will always lengthen the formation. After the enemy entered the road from the open river bank, the team obviously stretched into a long column. The road has not been completed yet. Although it can accommodate carriages, it can only accommodate three people. Meters wide, the few knights walked in the middle of the team, but there were no reliable elites around them. The infantry were placed at the head and tail. Leon touched his quiver and pulled out a silver arrow. These are Lisa Dillon's arrows. There are only two of them. A souvenir of the failed assassination attempt. In fact, ordinary people are really not used to using such heavy, full metal arrows. The equipment and martial arts of the Nolder Elves are of their own kind. And it is not easy for humans to adapt. So Leon has no idea about Lisa Dillon's equipment. However, this arrow can still be used in Liang's hands. But it is not as accurate as ordinary feather arrows when shooting at moving targets. Put! Leon once again let the archers fire a volley. But he moved forward quickly. The heavily armored archers still fired arrows at the bandits in the middle of the team this time. And then retreated into the woods again without looking at the results. This time no one came to chase. Only sparse arrows and crossbow bolts responded. In fact, the results of this wave of arrows were not good enough for the enemy to be prepared. They only shot down two bandits, who were not fully armored. But this wave of harassment caused the enemies to stop. They held up various shields to defend themselves and carefully searched for traces of the sneak attackers. And just as they stopped, a silver arrow penetrated a knight's head. Leong asked the archers to shoot a wave of feather arrows, just to stop the enemy so that he could face the stationary target. The Nolder! These are the arrows of the Nolder! Why is there a Nolder here? All defense! The effect of this Nolder arrow was far greater than that of a volley fired by 30 people. All the enemies raised their shields and formed a circle. Those knights were obviously a little panicked. If it was just a few dozen people harassing them, they didn't care. They just set aside some people to defend themselves. And the large force could speed up and attack my Xiangling. In fact, a small number of harassing troops will not achieve much results. After all, there are so many of these gangsters. But Nolder's arrows are different. And just when they all raise their shields to defend themselves, another silver arrow pierced the shield in another knight's hand and penetrated deeply into his neck. Leong has seen the armor-breaking ability of Nolder arrows before, and the eagle strike bow in his hand also has enough kinetic energy to achieve the armor-breaking effect. Although in his hands, he couldn't achieve the level of Lisa Dillon's ability to penetrate armor and the human body and penetrate deeply into the carriage. He could still penetrate an ordinary kite-shaped shield. 
Liang didn't shoot any more arrows. Ordinary arrows could not penetrate the shield. And the enemy would probably find him if he fired again. Two Nolder arrows can already have a good effect. If the first Nolder arrow only brought commotion. Then the second arrow that broke the shield and took people's lives brought panic. All the knights understood that the Noldor was obviously killing the leading knight. No one is safe from Noldor's armor-piercing arrows. The only five remaining knights were obviously panicked. They obviously knew how terrifying the Noldor's bows and arrows were in this environment with woods around them. The knights immediately dismounted, hid behind the horses, and covered their bodies with their shields. Moreover, several completely different commands sounded at the same time. Push forward! Back off! Defend in place and don't move! Perhaps each order is reasonable. But issuing these different orders at the same time will cause trouble for this ragtag group. They have lost unified command at this moment. Just two Nolder arrows still brought a deterrent effect to a large army. The gangsters, who were not easy to restrain, began to get into chaos. Some were moving forward. Some were retreating. And more were squatting on the spot. Those knights were not idiots. They were just confused by the two Nolder arrows. When they saw the scene, they immediately reacted. The leading knight shouted loudly, Everyone is heading towards. Stop them! But before he could say the order, he was forced to change his words because at that moment, more than a dozen tough men suddenly rushed out of the woods, shouting loudly and rushed towards the knights. These huge two-handed swordsmen brought up grass clippings and leaves all over the sky. They formed a small team like arrows, and the sword light was swayed out like a sparring match. The gangsters holding shields to cover their vision could not stop the shining swords. The weak defense of only a dozen people was broken through by the Menenheimers almost instantly. The leading knight dismounted and had no time to dodge. After cutting down an infantryman, Close had already rushed in front of him. The big sword slashed down diagonally with the sound of breaking wind. The knight was very skilled and held up his shield to block the blow. But the shield in his hand was chopped into half. Close's strong strength caused him to stumble back several steps. But this astute knight made the most correct choice. He threw down his shield, turned around and ran towards the front of the army, leaving Close to kill the chaotic gangsters behind him. Close didn't pursue him. The guy ran so fast that he couldn't catch up, taking advantage of the brief confusion among the enemy. The Medenheim stormtroopers waved their swords and cleared a small area of flesh and blood. Several knights died under the swords, and another knight ran behind. The gangsters on both sides finally became truly disconnected. Chapter 78 The Entire Army Retreats on a road with woods on both sides. The enemy's ranks were thin. The gangsters were in chaos. And the large group was cut off at the waist. But the group in the middle had relatively low combat effectiveness. The elite infantry on the periphery will not be able to get through for a while. And the ragtag group in the middle has no command. The numerical advantage is meaningless at this time. Covering shot! Leon once again appeared with archers in the woods on both sides. Constantly shooting arrows. Now these bandits were a little confused and few of them could fight back. It was a good opportunity to harvest a lot. Close led the stormtroopers on a rampage on the road without even encountering any decent resistance. The great swordsmen of Medenheim suffered almost no losses, and only two of them suffered minor injuries. The fighting will of these gangsters in the face of emergencies is completely different from that of the Jata people. Leon led 30 archers at full output, facing dense enemies. The archers could cause a lot of damage, no matter how low their proficiency was. There are also enemies charging at the archers. But Leong has been checking for leaks and filling in the gaps. His hand has been replaced by the black but extremely sharp sword. Almost every time the sword falls, an enemy will fall. There are already ten swords around the archers. There were several corpses. Assemble! Charge forward! Disperse into the woods! Surround them! Two orders came from the front and rear of the enemy team. The leading knight has probably run to the front of the team and started charging towards makes angling with his men. The enemy in front is already turning around and running away panting. The elite infantryman at the end of the team shouted, surround them, and had already entered the woods. For the enemy, this is the right way to break the situation. Since they were cut off and their command was in disarray, they made mistakes. Half of the people in the front charged straight towards my Xiongling, and the other half of the people in the back carried out an encirclement. Even if the casualties are greater and the method is clumsy, it will be difficult for Leong to handle. Leong made a quick decision. Withdraw! Then he opened the way as a pioneer and ran into the woods again. The archers followed closely behind their lord. Close's stormtroopers reared behind. And dozens of people quickly disappeared again. The lord's goal has been achieved. 
the half of the enemies behind will carefully search for the sneak attacker, while the half of the enemies in front have already charged quickly. This place is only a few miles away from my Xiangling, and they can charge. This is probably because they will not be able to cooperate with Bai if the delay continues. Over there at Deer Castle. However, this also means that there are only less than half of the enemies that my Xiangling has to face at the same time. But Leon did not leave this section. He was not satisfied with this result. After leading the men to wait quietly for two minutes, he returned the same way through the woods again, returning to the road strewn with corpses. The enemy in front ran away, and the enemy behind was still slowly searching the woods. This short stretch of road was now only there are only a few enemies left. These people obviously did not expect that Leon would leave and come back, and ended up dying under a rain of arrows in an instant. Close! Take the archers and follow the enemies at the front. They haven't had much rest, and they don't have enough physical strength to outrun you. Shoot arrows after them. If they chase you, retreat. And if they retreat, chase them. Leon quickly explained the essence of guerrilla warfare. Close nodded to express his understanding, but he was a little confused. Sir, what about you? Leon whistled to summon Alice, and then began to peel off the armor from the corpses of the knights on the ground. He answered again and again. I want to deceive the people behind. Go quickly. Um, Summer, come and help me. Wear armor. Close obviously understood the Lord's intention. Although he was a little worried, he still obeyed the order and took the people away. Summer and two people helped Leon drag the bodies of the three knights into the woods, and then watched from the side. Alice also ran to Leon from the woods not far away. This smart little mare was not discovered by the enemy. She even knew how to avoid the crowd and wait until no one was around before running over. Fortunately, the knights all had the same equipment. With the help of two tough men, Leon spent five minutes piecing it together and finally put on a complete set of armor. After wiping a handful of blood on his armor and rubbing it onto his face, the Lord completed the transformation magnificently. Okay, take my equipment away. You go find clothes. You can't keep up with me on my horse. Leon mounted his horse, gave an explanation, and then left the woods and started running towards the road behind. Retreat. The entire army retreats. Everyone in front is dead. Follow me. Leon shouted as he ran. Bandits gradually emerged from the woods, looking at the lonely night with doubts in their eyes. Leon ignored it and ran while shouting to gather, as if he was conveying instructions. Gradually, some gangsters left the woods and followed Liang's horse, panting and eating ashes behind. But Leon didn't just run back all the time. Occasionally he would run back and forth, as if he was calling everyone to retreat. From time to time, they even encouraged. Show with me, all troops retreat. Hurry. Save the lives of our brothers. Come. The entire army retreats. The entire army retreats. Soon. A large group of people followed behind Liang. All of them running back panting and shouting to retreat. Until another knight appeared. The one who just escaped from the great swordsman and ran back. This knight had lost his horse and was walking slowly, surrounded by dozens of infantrymen. It was obvious that he was the one directing the team to search the woods. Seeing Leon running towards him on horseback shouting, Retreat. The knight was a little unresponsive. What's going on? Why are you retreating? Leon did not stop and shouted, Everyone in front is dead. They are all dead. Retreat quickly. The knight said something was wrong. What nonsense are you talking about? After speaking, he drew his sword, but the infantrymen beside him looked at each other, looking full of confusion. They did not realize that Leon was pretending. Leon ignored him and still shouted loudly. The whole army retreats. All the people in front are dead. Then he slowed down in front of the knight. Run away. You will die. This is a trap. Let us die. The gangsters who had been following Leon just now were gradually running over, and they could already hear their voices shouting. Retreat. The nearby infantrymen also panicked, and one or two even started to run away. The knight finally heard that something was wrong with Leon. You bastard. You are? Before he finished speaking, Leon quickly raised his sword and chopped off his head. Blood flew two meters high like a fountain. The nearby infantry were defenseless and unresponsive. They did not expect that the two knights would fight among themselves. Leon shouted angrily, This bastard. He still wants to trick us into dying. Then he faced the infantryman next to him and shouted, Run quickly. All the people in front are dead. The entire army retreats. After saying that, he drove his horse and left. 
The unidentified gangsters behind them also happened to run by at this time. Shouting, retreat, retreat, as they ran. It does look like a complete defeat. So, except for a few infantrymen who looked puzzled, everyone else started running back. Most of the enemies searching in the woods were called out by the bandits and started running away. At this time, Liang turned around again and rode towards my Xiangling, still shouting, All troops retreat! As he ran, this rabble really just retreated. Chapter 79, Attacking the Heart First Fortunately, this was just a makeshift ragtag group of people. The detailed information Rizaldrin reported really made a difference. From the fact that they chased Lisa Dillon for nearly a hundred miles, it can be seen that the dead face is their real leader. These knights and their people gathered in Trubrin. And they must have been waiting for the dead face to appear. According to Rasadlin's experience, these gangsters were just newly recruited gangsters from various villages. They come from various villages in the kingdom and are the manpower added by the knights within a month. Judging from their behavior by the river, these people just gathered in a hurry and didn't have time to do any training. They just listened to the command of the few knights. And they didn't seem to be very obedient in their control. Otherwise, they would not have rushed into the woods when they were first harassed. The knight and his infantry would not have entered the woods. Moreover, they are not very familiar with these knights, and they are not even together during breaks. Obviously, these knights did not like these bandits. In other words, these gangsters are cannon fodder used to compete for quantity. And there is a high probability that there will be no lower level management. Reliable junior officers are an important factor in maintaining the stability and reliability of an army. A unit without junior officers will be reduced to disarray once it loses its leader. Those knights seem to be unable to get rid of the constraints of their thinking. If they disperse the elite infantry among the bandits as grassroots officers, the reliability of this thousand-man army would be multiplied several times, probably reluctant to part with it. This is a common problem among most people. They always think that elites should be used alone to avoid being dragged down by cannon fodder. In fact, the elites mixed in with the cannon fodder are often more useful. But now, these mobs easily retreat just because of Liang's instigation. The infantrymen were probably not too affected. But they obviously couldn't command the army. And the bandits wouldn't listen to them. The enemies behind him were no longer of concern. And Leon began to fly towards my Xiangling. The distance was only six or seven miles. And it only took a few minutes for him to catch up with clothes and the others again. Makes the angling can already be seen from a distance here. And it is already an open area. There are no woods nearby. The trees near the village have been cut down, and houses in Makes the Angling have been built. Close is leading the archers to confront the enemy. In fact, the knight leading the enemy was a little frustrated. The half of the team he took away from the front consisted of about 400 people. The army was still huge, but the tail behind him could not be shaken off. My Xiangling arranged a car formation, and the military appearance looked very neat. The more than 60 recruits could even be considered elite infantry based on their equipment. He knew that it would be unlikely to capture them for a while. So he wanted to turn around and deal with Close's group of people who had been following him. But as soon as he turned around in a big move, the tailman ran back and his men ran a hundred miles without a good rest. So they really couldn't catch up. When he wanted to attack my Xiangling directly, those tails came and fired arrows again. Divide the troops? He divided it. He assigned more than 80 men to deal with exactly twice the number of the tail group, including 20 elite infantry. As a result, the heavy-armed archers first shot down a small half of the gangsters. And the elite infantrymen were still hacked to death by those big guys. But most of them were killed. Then the remaining 30 or so people collapsed, turned around and ran away. And more than half of them were shot to death. And then they fled back. There are only a few people. But those tails only lost 7 or 8 men. With a battle loss ratio of 110. Close is not Leon. As long as he thinks he can fight. He will definitely fight. He will not pursue zero battle losses. So he was in a dilemma. Or rather a dilemma. Because he saw two Nolder arrows. He didn't dare to take the lead. And he didn't dare to let the few elite infantry leave his side. He didn't dare to attack directly. Makes the Angling's defense was well arranged. This knight didn't know that Makes the Angling's side was just a bunch of noobs. He thought that Makes the Angling's defenders were as strong as these tails. And he couldn't retreat or escape. If the dead man's face was caught, he might be exposed if he couldn't take down my Xiangling. As a traitor to the Lion Kingdom, he would definitely be hunted down by the whole country. Now he could only wait for the rear army to come quickly. So he was on guard at both ends a few hundred meters away from the village entrance. 
A team of more than 300 people was strangely on the defensive when faced with two small groups of about 100 people led by Mai Xiang. However, before the rear army could wait, Liang came first. After Liang arrived here, he looked at the situation on the battlefield and felt relieved. Oh! When Close and the others saw Liang coming back, they also raised their weapons and cheered in cooperation. They trusted the Lord. Since Leon came back with a normal look, it naturally meant that Liang's goal was achieved. The enemy soldiers cheered when they saw Close and the others, and they all looked at each other. Naturally, they recognized this kind of cheering movement that they would only have after winning a battle. And the scene became quiet for a while, seeing that the enemy's infantry were defending with shields and no crossbows. The Lord calmly rode his horse to a position about a hundred meters away from the leading knight. The knight wore a giant helmet and couldn't see his face but he stood out among the crowd. He was the only enemy wearing plate armor and was protected by a group of infantry. Which hero is attacking my weak collar? Sign up! Liang's voice was still very loud. The noise was not loud at the moment. And he should be able to hear it from a hundred meters away. A few gangsters raised their bows. But Liang didn't care about the distance of about a hundred meters. If he could be shot to death by an inferior wooden bow, it would only be a bad fate. Of course, if the quality of the bow on the opposite side was better, the Lord would not be so close. In fact, if those infantrymen had not raised their shields, Leon might have shot them with one arrow, and he would certainly not have bothered to talk. No one spoke on the other side. That's fine. Leon stopped asking and directly started to disturb the opponent's military morale. Are you waiting for the people behind? They have been defeated. They are all scattered. Do you understand? They are finished. You are finished too. After speaking, Leon waved to Summer. Summer understood and took Liang's equipment over. Then, the Lord started to change back into his own equipment carelessly, throwing the knight's plate armor on the ground piece by piece, and replaced it with his own lightweight half armor. I even changed it while wiping it, which was very slow. Summer and Close were helping on both sides. Of course, they were also ready to help the Lord block the arrows. However, no one fired arrows on the opposite side. Everyone just watched Liang slowly changing equipment in a strange way, and no one said anything. It wasn't until several minutes passed and the equipment was completely changed that Liang spoke again. You understand now? The people behind you are finished, and my reinforcements are coming soon. Liang is using this method to increase his persuasion. Your rear army is really gone. The Lord is eager for you to waste your time. Makes Angling must have reinforcements. No one would doubt it. It's hard to say anything else. Sooner or later, the trumpet summons the rangers. My shemling has been blowing the horn. And sooner or later, someone will hear the rangers. Whenever a ranger hears it, a horde of rangers is brought with him. It will take time for reinforcements to arrive. But in fact, does Leon really want to waste time? Skipping chapter 80 does not affect viewing.